Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. You know, stories start out in many different ways. Tonight's story started when I walked into a nice little guy's private world and it blew up right in my face. Nightbeat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. When the streetcars and the subways spill out their thousands of tired ones who scurry off into a million directions to find home, that's when my job begins. I start walking, looking for my story so that you can read about it in your morning newspaper and feel good because it didn't happen to you. Tonight I got my story fast. Just walking down Madison Street, west, away from the center of things. I kept walking past the shooting gallery... The nickel arcade with the peep shows and the fortune-telling machines. The jukebox taverns. (laughs) Madison Street, the quick route to happiness with the world's worst hangover. And then straight ahead of me was Pop Gordon's training gym. That's where the public pays 30 cents to watch fellas training to beat each other's brains out. You know, when I got inside, it looked like just one of those fights. And then I heard one voice over the other. It was a voice I knew. Somebody call the cops and get that punchy loon out of here. You yellow stupid bones out of your life at me. What's the matter, Pop? Randy. Yeah. This crazy owl's gone clear off his rocker. Oh, that's Billy. Yeah. Somebody call the cops. Wait a second, Pop. He's all right. Sure, sure. Listen to him. I'll kill you. Anybody leaves a glove on me gets killed. Only one place for a loon like that in the bughouse. I'm going to get the cops and have this owl tied up. Oh, now, wait a minute, Pop. Let me talk to him. Randy, you stay away from that lug. Five of us couldn't hold him. He knows me. Randy, the guy's gone nuts. I... Yeah. Yeah, like I said, everybody's scared of getting the same... Hey, Billy! Billy! What? Hi, Billy. How's it going? Uh, you coming in with me? No, sure, sure. Make me a big man getting into the same ring with a champ. Well, that's me, champ. And you're a two-bit bum. Well, that's a thumbnail description if I ever heard one. Admit it. The truth. A two-bit bum. Admit it. I admit it. I admit it, Billy. Yeah, but you don't mean it. You're laughing at me like the rest of them. You're laughing at me. Billy, I never laughed at you in my life. You're laughing? Well, I'll show you what happens to anybody who laughs at Billy the Kid. Stand <laughs> As the world flew away in all directions, I dimly remembered how the sports writers used to speak so respectfully of Billy's fast left hand. But brother, if they knew what I just found out about his right. When the fog finally cleared, Pop Gordon was bending over me, and there were a lot of other faces, too. But I didn't see Billy when I stood up. You okay, Randy? Oh. This is being okay. I don't want any part of it. He slugs you, but good. Where is he? He took off before the cops come. Took off before anybody could grab him. I don't blame him. Yeah. I let that bum come in at Jim and sit around. Everybody else pays 30 cents but him. I let him free. What's he do, huh? What's he do? He busts loose. He blows his top. But why? What happened to Billy? Oh, I don't know. Tonight, I catch him putting a bite on my customers. Two bits here, a dime there. Billy was panhandling? Sure. Like I said, I didn't like it, so I tell him. And then when? I don't know. I'm over at the other side of the gym. I hear somebody laugh, and the next thing I know, the owl's swinging like a windmill. He's going to kill everybody just for being around. He ought to be tied up. Uh Uh-huh, just like that, huh? Yeah, he ain't safe. What do you want, the black Mariah to come around, cart him away like a load of rubbish? Yeah, but for his own good. Oh, Pop. Remember when he was champ? He packed him in every club where he fought. He had a dollar or five dollars for anybody who held out a hand. So? What are you getting at? Well, now he's got no one, Pop, and now he's out in the cold. Uh... Yeah. Oh, I'll forget the cops. But we still got to put them away. Well, all right, sure. But let's do it as painless as possible. I'll, uh... I'll keep him with me tonight, and then tomorrow... We'll... You going after him? Yeah, which way'd he go? Uh, straight up the streets, but watch out, Randy. He blows his lid. Yeah, I know. Don't worry. I don't want any rematch. I'd like to know why he blew his lid in the first place, and my jaw in the second place. 
I'd known Billy a long time. A sweet, gentle guy who always seemed to be living in a world all of his own. A world that nobody else knew about and cared less. And now he was in trouble. In his mood, he might hurt someone. Or worse, he might get himself hurt. I must have walked for half an hour before I finally spotted him. He was standing on a corner. I stopped and watched him for a couple of minutes. I watched his hesitant and embarrassed panhandling. Then I walked over to him slowly. Hello, Billy. What? Oh, hi, hi, Randy, old pal, old pal, hi. You want some company? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> good, good. Randy, wh- where you been keeping yourself? I-, I ain't seen you for a couple of weeks. You haven't seen me for a couple of weeks? Well, I, I thought maybe you'd forget an old pal, huh? No, you're <laughs> not the kind of a fellow one forgets, champ. Mm-mm. Now, what was the uh, trouble back at the gym? Gym? What gym? Pop Gordon's. Pop's place? Yeah. Well, well let's go. I, I got to help Pop. He, he's a good joe, you know. He never charges me nothing. Wait a minute, hold on a second, Billy. Hold on. Yeah? Weren't you at the gym tonight? Oh, no. Not tonight. I, I've been here. And you didn't, uh... <laughs> Massage my chin? You, you're you giving me a rib? Well, what you looking at me for like that, Randy? Forget it, Billy. You, you was just ribbing, huh? Oh, sure. I'm just kidding. Yeah. I, I like ribs. I'm not giving a hot foot nothing like that. But funny ribs that, that don't hurt nobody. Oh, sure. <laughs> can I ask you a $64 question? Well, sure not. You, you can ask me anything, Randy. Anything. I saw you a minute ago, Billy. What? I never seen you ask for a touch before. Uh, I, I, I ain't never gonna do it no more. But, but Randy, I, I got it tonight. I, I gotta get a few bucks, maybe fifteen. I already got two dollars. Maybe. Why do you need fifteen dollars? What? I, I gotta get a new suit. A new suit? What's so special about tonight, Billy? What? That? That? There's something I, I gotta do. It. I just gotta do it, Randy. I gotta have fifteen, but. Hey, them scars. Hey, is that you, Randy? Yeah. Oh, Sullivan. Yeah. Randy, don't let him pick me up for panhandling, please. No, I won't, Billy. Now, you wait here. Wait here. I'll be right back. Yeah. That's Billy back there, isn't it? Yeah, that's right, Sullivan. Why? Heard you had a little trouble with him back at the gym. Mm. Maybe we ought to put him in the tank for the night. Keep him out of trouble, huh? Look, uh, look, Sullivan. Uh, He's going away tomorrow for a long time. Oh, like that, huh? Yeah, that, that's it. This is his last night out. Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, good. It's the way I do it myself. I see you around, Randy, but keep an eye on him. Yeah, I'll watch him like a hawk. Thanks, Sullivan. So long. Uh, well, what they say, Randy? They, they ain't gonna pick me up for mooching on it. They, they ain't gonna... No, no, no. Of course not. Uh, look, uh... Billy, how'd you like to come to my apartment for a while? Oh, I can't. I told you. I gotta get 15 bucks. Well, we'll talk about it. Well, I gotta get it tonight. Now, I gotta get a new suit because... Because... Yeah, go go on. Why? I, I can't be wearing this crummy rag when when I see her. Not when, when I see her. I didn't know what he meant. But whatever it made him go crazy at the gym, whatever it made him hit me was tied in with her. Who she was, I didn't know, and I wasn't sure that he knew. I finally talked him into going to my place, and when we went in, I watched that slow, gentle smile come over his face. Hey, this place is a number one. Yeah. Sit down, Billy. Uh, I ain't got much time. Just a couple of minutes. Uh, Yeah, okay. Uh, uh Uh-huh. I, I'm awful tired, Randy. <laughs> Seems like a lot of things has happened tonight, you know. I, I, I'm kind of tired. Sure. Want a drink, Billy? Oh, no. I, I, I never touch it, you know that. Yeah. And you never panhandled before. But I, I, I ain't gonna do that no more just tonight. I, I never bummed off of nobody. I paid my own way. Come anything, I, I paid my own way. Yeah, that's why I want to know why you're putting the bite on people tonight. I ain't gonna tell you. You 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 laugh. I won't laugh. You will. So somebody else laughed when I told you. Some somebody laughed and well, when when somebody laughs at me, I, I don't like it. I All right, easy, you, I, easy, buddy. I, easy, easy. I, easy. I, Come on now. That's better. I, I tell you, I, I I gotta get fifteen bucks. Hey, hey, look, look, look at this. What's that, Billy? I, I cut it out of the paper today. I, I seen it. Hey, you, you take a look at it, huh? 
Here, you read what it says. Right. Mrs. Walter Compton and her husband... Yeah? Yeah, go on. That's more. Prominent society leaders of New York will be in town tonight. They're staying at the Lake Shore and... I can't go there in this crummy rag. Well, why do you have to see her? What? Well, I, I gotta tell her something. Hey, this is getting late, Randy. I, I gotta get... I'll lend you the $15, Billy. You? Oh, no. No, I pay my own way. Well, pay it back whenever you get a job. No, I don't want any handouts. It's just a loan, Billy. It's a loan. What? <laughs> Uh, thanks, Randy. You, you're a champ. Now, now tell me why you got to see her. You, you ain't gonna laugh. I, I can take anything but that. Anything. I won't laugh, Billy. No, I, I, I guess you wouldn't. Okay. You, you remember once I was champ? Oh, right? everybody knows you were champ. Now, what about her, Mrs. Compton? Yeah. Well, it's one night after a fight, see? I ain't champion, but I'm punching right up to the top, see? Okay, but this one fight, she ain't there. So I go to see her at her place. She's there. She's there. And so when I... Who's there? It's me, Billy. Where are you? Yeah, out in a minute. Sure. Hey, I win tonight. I said I win tonight, didn't I? Yeah, I heard on the radio. Well... Well, what? It don't mean a thing? Sure. Means a lot, I guess. You guess. <laughs> a kid for a dollar who's going to marry the next middleweight champ, you sure take things like a lump of ice. Yeah. Edna, anything wrong? No. Nope. Oh, there is. Okay, something's wrong. Have it your way. <laughs> you, you, you wasn't at the fight tonight, baby. I, I looked for you. It took me three, four rounds to get going because I didn't see you. You won. Oh. Kid, look at me. Sure. The eye got torn open again, huh? Oh, oh that's nothing. Collodion fixed it. Collodion huh? fixes everything, huh? Get cut up, use collodion. That's nice. That puts you all together again. How long do you think you'll stay together? What, what's eating on you, honey? The last two, three weeks. The you, last been... two, three weeks. The last two, three years. Yeah, that's right. I hate it. You hate what? Oh, shut up. Oh, kid. Kid, what's wrong? You and me. <laughs> I don't get it. The only thing you do get is a measly few bucks for getting your head knocked off. Oh, I'm a fighter, So you're honey. a fighter. All right, fight. But count me out. Oh, now, wait a I've minute. I've been waiting. I've been waiting for him to carry you home. Me? <laughs> me? It can't happen, huh? Well, all of a sudden, you start blowing your top. It's not all of a sudden. You said it. You said there was something wrong for the last two, three years. Okay. Okay, spill it. I'm through, Billy. Washed up. Finished. What? You and me. Done. Since when? Since right now. <laughs> oh, baby, it's just the eye. You see me this way and you... <laughs> the eye. <laughs> Don't laugh at me, Edna. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. I take anything but being laughed at. It is a laugh. Oh, now listen, you listen, honey. I don't care if you get punched all over the state. I don't care if you get your brains rattled so hard. It's Edna. me I care about from now on. Okay. So I'll be champ. So, so you'll get your fur coat. Not from you... you. Not from a guy who's beginning to look like a punching bag instead of a man. Look at me. Take a good look. I am. Yeah, I am. I got looks. I got class. I can do all right. I still don't get it. All right, I'll lay it on the line for you. Want me to? Go ahead. I'm not going to tie myself to a punchy character. I'm not going to have to walk in nice places with a guy whose face is... Well, look at her. Go on, take a look in the mirror. You see what I mean? You want me to quit? I don't care if you do or not, because it's too late, Billy. It's too late. Edna, you, you shouldn't say things. <laughs> Please, Edna, don't go. That, that's the way it was, Randy. That, that's the way it was. Yeah, I see. Look, Billy, you don't want to go and see her after that. Uh, I, I tell you, Randy, I, I got to see her. There's something I got to tell her. It's got to be tonight because tomorrow she, she'll be gone. Billy, how do you know that she'll... 
Well, it's you'll see. Oh, I know, I know, because there's something I, I ain't told you. There's something, something I ain't never going to tell nobody. And, uh, Rand, Randy, please, please, don't, don't try to stop me. Please don't let nobody try to stop me, because, because if, if they do, I'll, I'll kill them. He said he'd kill anybody who tried to stop him from seeing Mrs. Walter Compton. I looked at his scarred face and into his eyes. A wild fever you see in the eyes of a dog everyone says is mad but only wants a drink of water. And then... Uh, I guess I, I shouldn't have said that, Randy. Well, let's forget it for a minute, Billy. Now tell me, why do you want to see her? <laughs> you don't understand dames, huh? <laughs> No, my mother never told me. Well, well, she gives me the brush, see, like I tell you. She, she gives me the brush, but, but she does it for me, see? She, she don't want me to get my brains knocked out, see? Yeah, I'm, I'm beginning to see, Billy. Sure. But me, I got no sense, so, so I don't see it her way. So I, I, I let her walk out, and I don't see her no more. Not until I get hold of that paper today. And tonight you want to see her? To say what, Billy? Well, but don't you see? She loves me. All these years, she, she never lets up, and I... I I, I want to tell her it's okay, that maybe her and me, we can start all over like, see? Uh, what's the matter, Randy? Nothing. Nothing, Billy. Look, don't let anybody kid you, pal. You're still champion. Oh, I ain't nothing. But, uh, oh, I, I gotta go now. I, I gotta get 15 bucks for us. Now, look, look, you're tired. You need a shave. Maybe take a shower. You thought of that? No. All right, now you wait here and take a shower and a shave, and I'll bring a suit back for you. Is that a deal? Oh, gee, you, you, you're a champ, Randy, a real champ. I might be gone for a little while, Billy, but when I come back, everything will be okay. Sure. Okay. There was only one thing for me to do, go and see Mrs. Walter Compton. I made sure that Billy couldn't leave my apartment. I locked the door from the outside. I didn't want him picked up before he had the chance to see her. To see the woman around whom he'd built a whole world of fantasy in which he'd lived for so many years. I didn't want that world to come down around his ears. My newspaper pass got me in to see Mrs. Walter Compton in her suite at the Lakeshore. You're Mr. Stone? Yes, I am, Mrs. Compton. You're from the newspaper. Well, I'm not on newspaper business, uh, Mrs. Compton. Not tonight. This is more personal. Really? Well, what can I, um... Uh, do for me? Uh, nothing. Then please get to the point, Mr. Stone. My husband will be here shortly with guests. How soon? An hour. Why? Well, uh, because it concerns someone you used to know. Really? Who? Billy Candell. Billy Candell? As he was better known as Billy the Kid, once middleweight champion of the world. <laughs> oh, I'd forgotten. <laughs> and I was glad to. Uh, Mrs. Compton, he's coming here tonight to see you. What? He's coming. <laughs> How stupid can you get? Well, for a lot of people, it's not hard to be stupid <laughs> or uh, heartless. Yours must be a rather sentimental column, Mr. So. Uh, yes, it's about people. You better go. Look, uh, please see, Billy, what can you lose? It's out of the question. Listen, all he wants is to tell you something. He wants to tell you that... that he knows that you still love him. What? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, now, listen to me, please. <laughs> Now, tomorrow he's going to... Well, he's going where he can rest. He's sick, Mrs. Compton. He's desperately sick. Let's not be so polite. The word is punch drunk, I believe. You want me to see a lunatic? No, he's not. And I'll be here when he comes. We'll keep it between us three. Do you know what you're asking? Yes, I'm asking you to give a guy a few minutes of his world. Make it real for him. Tell him anything. Uh, tell him you still love him. Then he'll go away. After tomorrow, you'll never see him or hear from him again. You're asking me to receive that... That... Thing to bring him into this hotel where everyone can see him? Do you know what that means? Well, to him, yes. I'm talking about myself. Myself, Mr. Stone. Yes, I'd like to get off that subject for a it's moment. It's the only subject that matters. If you don't see him, he'll crack up all the way. That happened long ago. Good evening, Mr. Stone. Three minutes of your time. I said no. Did you hear, Mr. Stone? I said no. Okay, lady, I'm going. Uh, thank you for everything that's been lovely. You needn't be sarcastic, Mr. Stone. Oh, needn't I be? Look, Queenie, I got a little spot announcement for you. 
Billy owes you a vote of thanks. You'll never know it, but you gave him the biggest break of his life when you walked out on him years ago. Oh, really? Yes, positively. Tonight you're giving him even a bigger break. <laughs> tell me about it, Mr. Stone. Yes, I'll tell you. <laughs> the only thing that poor guy's got left is his memory of a girl named Edna. Any resemblance between that memory and you was strictly coincidental. Goodbye. <laughs> I was glad to get out into the fresh air. All the way back to my apartment, I kept thinking of what I'd tell Billy. How I'd tell him. Then as I walked across the lobby toward the elevator... Mr. Stone, Mr. Stone! Uh, oh, what is it, Charlie? Hey, here's a message for you. Okay. Yes, you are, Mr. Stone. Thank you. How long ago he leave this? Oh, what, just a few minutes after you left. <laughs> did you know you'd left him locked in? He called down. He asked me to open the yeah, door. Yeah, did he say where he was uh, going? No, no, no. Just that he couldn't wait for you any longer. Now, that is on the note. How'd he look? How'd he look? Well, I mean, anything unusual about him? No, I... He had on one of your suits, uh -huh. I remember now. That, that pinstripe one. He must have stolen. No, he right didn't steal anything. Now, listen to me. Uh, I'm going to the Lakeshore Hotel. If he comes back here, get in touch with me there. Mrs. Compton Suite. Mrs. Compton Suite, yes. Oh, and listen, I think you'd better call the police. But as for Kalski, remember that Kalski? Kalski. Tell him to meet me at the Lakeshore Hotel and quick. I took a cab and I took the shortest way to the lakeshore. I watched the pavements looking for Billy, but I didn't see him. He had some money on him and he must have taken a cab himself. And then I was back at the lakeshore talking with the clerk at the desk there. Yes, sir, there was a, a man here of that description. He asked that a call be put through to Mrs. Compton's suite. And was it? Well, sir, he... He was a rather... Well, yes, yes, I, I know, I know. So he didn't get through. Oh, I called Mrs. Compton Sweet myself and told her. That is, I described the man. I... Yes, go ahead. What'd she say? That on no account was I to put him through or send him upstairs. Oh, well. Okay, that's something. What'd he do then? He left immediately. Which way? Oh, I'm afraid I didn't notice, sir. I was registering some new guests and I paid no attention. Okay, to thank you very much. I had to find Billy before... Uh... Well, before what? What would he do? Where would he go? I asked myself those questions as I walked slowly along, watching for him, hoping to see that pathetic figure in my pinstripe suit, hoping I'd get to him before someone else stopped him. I was afraid of what might happen or could happen. And then I saw him, just past the Lakeshore Hotel, shambling slowly along, his shoulders hunched against the wind that cut in off the lake. I ran and caught up with him. Billy! Billy! What? Oh, hi, you ran. Hi. What, what you doing over here? Oh, I just, uh, looking around. Why'd you leave my apartment? What? Oh, well, well, you was gone so long and I had to get gone, see? Oh, sure. Come on, let's walk. Yeah. Hey, I, I borrowed one of your suits. It, uh, it's a, a real champ suit, all right. You, you mind, huh? You mind? No, no, Billy, none at all. Did you see her? Oh, oh, sure. What, you did? Yeah, I, I see her. Billy... They wouldn't let you go up, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, but, but, uh, I, I went up the back. The back, Billy. Now, look at me. Are you sure? Oh, sure. And, and, and she still loves me, right? I, I said everything was okay. She's crazy about me like, like she always was. What did she tell you? Well, she, she didn't want to talk to me. You know how she is. But then I told her I love her and, and she loves me. Yeah? And, Billy. And, Billy. I'm tired, Randy. Lots of things happened tonight. Lots of things. Yeah, I know. What do you say we go someplace for coffee? Yeah, yeah, I'd like that. I'm awful tired. And uh, when I get real rested good, I'll go back to see her. Her and me, we'll start over again. Hey, hey, this is where she lives, you know. Yeah. Look, I, I, I got to see her once more, Randy. Maybe she'll talk to me this time. Huh? Not tonight anymore, Billy. No, but I, I want her to talk to me. Well, I don't sure. Yeah, she will. She loves me. Billy, now listen to me. You let me go up there first. I'll talk to her and fix everything, okay? Well, tell her not to act like a kid. Tell her to talk to me. Yes, sure, sure. I'll tell her, but you must put... Hey, Stone? Yes, Kolsky? You put in a call for us? Oh, yes, I did. It's okay now. I found him. What'd she call the cops for, Randy? Oh, Kolsky's not a cop. He's a pal of yours. Huh? He thinks you're the greatest fighter that ever lived. He always wanted to talk to you about your big fight. Oh, sure, sure. But but we're busy now. I, I'll talk to you about it later, Kolsky. I gotta see somebody. Billy, I promised you I'd see her, remember? You... you... You're gonna tell her I'll be waiting? Sure, sure. Now, you just stay with Kolsky here. Tell him uh, about the night you won the belt. Anything the matter, Stone? No, no, no. Just keep him here. I'll answer questions later. Now, Billy, 
Yeah? Promise me you'll stay right here. You, you won't stay long, huh? J- just tell her she loves me and, and and I want her to talk to me. Sure, I will. Okay, now you wait here. I didn't think it would do any good to see her again, but I wanted to give Billy a good memory to take along. I saw her all right, but she didn't talk to me either. I went back downstairs and out to the street. I hadn't been gone more than five minutes, but they were the longest five minutes of my life. Brother, I was beat. Hey, hey, Rhonda, you see her, huh? You see her? Yeah, I saw her, Billy. What did she say? Uh, you tell me what she said, huh? Well, I told her. Hey, Stone, how long does this go on? This is a proud car, not a bus. Yeah, we're coming along with you. Yeah, what's the idea? Get in the back, Billy. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kind of tired. I, I'd kind of like to ride to your place, Ryan. Sure. Take us to the precinct, Cosmo. Listen, Andy. Did you see his girl? Yes, I saw her, but she didn't talk to me either. I guess she laughed once too often. She's dead. Huh? All right, now just take it easy, Skalski. The poor guy doesn't even know that he killed her. are going out all over the city, even those neon signs on Madison Street. I've got to write my piece and put it in a slot, but what can I say? The story of a one-sided love? Well, if that's what love does to you, I'll stick to Pinochle. It's a funny thing about love, isn't it? Let someone get up and talk about hate, and he's hailed as a new leader. Let him speak of love, and he's ridiculed, he's spat upon, and... Even nailed to a cross. Love is the greatest thing, the oldest yet the latest thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Copy, boy. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. You know, the lives of Holmes and Watson were not always filled with action. They spent many a quiet evening at home in Baker Street, discussing the problems of the world over a glass of port. You know, it seems that no wine is more expressive of friendship and hospitality than port. And I'm sure there's no port wine more enjoyable than Petri California port. Try a good glass of Petri port after dinner some evening, or any time you get together with your friends. You'll love the rich, ruby-red color of that Petri port. You'll love its smoothness and full body, its remarkable and wonderful flavor, a flavor that comes straight from the heart of luscious, hand-picked grapes. Serve that Petri port alone, or serve it together with cake or cookies or with fruit. Yes, and serve it proudly. You can, because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now I'm sure our old friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's tap on his study door. Come in, come in. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Come over here by the fire. I was just having a cup of coffee. Would you care to join me? Thanks. That'd be nice. Uh, it'll prevent you falling asleep during my story tonight. <laughs> There's no chance of that, Doctor. From the hints you gave us last week, it sounded like quite a story. It began in a circus in Paris, you told us? Yes, my boy, the circus. A colorful world of sawdust and spangles. A world, Mr. Bartell, that I may tell you confidentially always held an irresistible fascination for me when I was a youngster. Me too, Doctor. In fact, when I was eight years old, I fell desperately in love with a a lady bareback rider, a stunning creature who wore pink silk tights with gold sequins on them. Unfortunately, my mother caught me writing her proposal of marriage, and I'm afraid that... uh, Well, that's another story, and one that you probably wouldn't find very interesting. (laughs) I'm sure I would, Doctor, but... 
I think it would be safer to stick to your Sherlock Holmes yes, story. Yes, you're probably right, my boy. Well, it was a winter in the 1890s, and Holmes and I were in Paris. On our second day there, Holmes suggested we attend that night's performance of the Cirque Royale. Needless to remark, I was delighted, Mr. Bartell. And shortly after nine o'clock that night, I found myself seated beside Holmes in a box near the ringside. It was an incredibly vivid scene, even for that city of color and light. The gay costumes of the women and the gaudy trappings of the ringmasters and clowns looked like a giant kaleidoscope under the blazing glare of the arc lamps. As we sat there, a brass band nearby blared forth some popular music of the day, and yet he didn't appear to be enjoying himself. And so I leaned across and touched his arm. What is it, Watson? Well, you're very quiet, Holmes. Aren't you having a good time? A good time, oh, I suppose. Well, chap, I was just wondering where Mr. Edwards is. Mr. Edwards? Who, who's he? An extremely distinguished client who was to meet us in this box at nine oh, o'clock. Oh, client. Oh, this little excursion was on business. After all, yes, I might have known it. No worry, old fellow. In your case, I think you'll be able to combine quite a little pleasure with the business. Well, can't you be a little more explicit, Holmes? Shh, shh. Here comes the ringmaster. La grande vedette du cirque, Mademoiselle Giselle Girondet, équestrienne incomparable. Giselle Girondet, yes, I've heard of her. She's a bareback rider, isn't she? Honest in France, old fellow. She also has quite a reputation as a femme fatale. Three duels have been fought over her. A young English officer in the Grenadier Guards committed suicide last year because of her. And a famous French banker is at present languishing in prison because her extravagances drove him to appropriate funds that did not belong to him. Yes, Watson, she's an extremely colorful personality. You know, Holmes, the funny thing, when I was eight years old, I fell violently in love with a lady bareback rider. She wore pink suit tights with golden sequins on them, but uh, unfortunately... Yes, she is, old fellow. Yes, she is. Look at the way she's jumping from the back of one horse to the other. Sheer poetry of motion. The lady appeals to Watson. By George, yes, indeed she does. In fact, Holmes, I don't mind telling you that if I weren't a married man and a yeah, poor you'd man... Yeah, you'd like to court the lady, eh? Uh, yes, I, I should Excellent, indeed. old fellow, excellent. That's the very reason for our attendance at the well, What in heaven's name are you talking about, Holmes? Ah, there you are. Good evening, Mr. Edwards. Holmes, my dear fellow, how are you? I haven't seen you since, uh, since that little affair at... Windsor Castle, when Mother... Uh, excuse me, sir. I am Mr. Mycroft, and this is my friend, Sir William Nigel. Sir William Nigel? Oh, of course, of course. And I am Mr. Edwards. We must uh, respect each other's incognitos, eh? How do you do, Sir William? Uh, well, I'm extremely honored to meet you, Your, your Royal... Uh, 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 Mr. Edwards. How do you like Giselle? Isn't she a stunning creature? Yes, indeed she is, sir. The four of us to have supper together after the performance tonight, I understand, Mr. Edwards. Well, unfortunately, I can't be there, Mycroft. There's some stupid affair at the embassy which I have to attend. We must postpone the dinner until tomorrow night. Oh, very well, sir. Uh, come over to my hotel a little early and we can discuss the whole business. Personally, I think a lot of fuss is being made about nothing. Now, if you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I must go back and see Giselle for a moment and tell her that I can't keep our appointment for tonight. I'll see you tomorrow, Mycroft. Good night, sir, will you? Good night. Good night, uh, good sir. Night, sir. Et maintenant, pour votre plaisir, les frères Salini, les jongleurs internationales. Holmes, what's all this mystery? That wasn't Mr. Edwards, it was the prince of... Shh, Watson, please. Discretion, old fellow. Mr. Edwards, as you know, is extremely democratic. Too much so, possibly, when one considers his position and responsibilities. He's become quite seriously involved with Mademoiselle Giselle, the lady bareback rider who has just left the ring. Oh, so that's it. The foreign office, quite naturally, I suppose, is deeply concerned over the matter. And I've been entrusted with the delicate mission of protecting Mr. Edwards. Oh, does Giselle Gironde know that his true identity, do you suppose? That's the first thing that we have to find out. It's possible that she is simply captivated by having a rich Englishman at her feet. If on the other hand, uh, she knows who Mr. Edwards is, 
then we may be in for a great deal of trouble. But how are you going to find that out? By tempting her with a richer Englishman. And one with a title. That, my dear fellow, is why you are Sir William Nigel. You mean that... Uh, your I... job, old what? fellow, is to do your utmost to steal Giselle Girondet from Mr. Edwards. But, uh, well, I, I don't even know the girl. We shall remedy that defect in a few minutes. As soon as the performance is over, my dear chap, I shall take you to her dressing room and arrange an introduction. I must say, Holmes, the backstage life at a circus is even more colourful than in the ring. What makes you say that, old fellow? Well, I just saw Pinhead having tea with a, a bearded lady while a sword swallower was standing behind him practising his act. Oh, hello. See that man standing talking to the girl in tights? Yeah, attractive, isn't he? Uh, the gentleman is Inspector Bernay of the French police, an old friend and a distant relative of mine. Bernay! How are you? Ah, Holmes, <laughs> mon cher ami, comment ça no, no, va? No, 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 Bernay, please. On this occasion, my name is Mycroft, if you don't mind, and this is my friend, Sir William Nigel. How do you do, Inspector? Enchanté, Sir William. Uh, permit me to introduce Mademoiselle Yvette Marat. How you do? How do you do, Mademoiselle? How do you do? Uh, uh, what brings you behind the scenes at the circus, may I ask, mon cher Mycroft? Uh, my friend, Sir William, is most anxious to make the acquaintance of Mademoiselle Gironde. But, of course, every man wishes to meet Giselle Gironde. Why not ask Bernay? He will present you to her. In those away. Oh, no, Yvette, chérie, do not begin that all over again. You are in love with her. You have always been in love with her. I, I, I wish you were dead. Sometimes I... Sometimes I think I could kill her myself. Well, my soul, Inspector, she's a fiery little thing, isn't she? Ah, ça c'est vrai, ça, Sir William. <laughs> Many times I've told her that Giselle Gironde would never waste her time with a simple police inspector. Uh, uh, she prefers a wealthy foreigner. But Yvette ne comprend pas. She does not understand and she does not believe. Mademoiselle Nara was dressed in tights, Berne. And what does she do in the circus? Uh, she walks the tightrope. Oh, She's yes, a queen of the high wire. Mm -hmm. A charming and a talented girl, but a most, most, most jealous one. Uh, Berne, my distinguished friend, Sir William Nigel, is most anxious to meet Giselle Gironde. Uh, will you introduce him? I should prefer not to appear on the matter at this stage. Oh, mais certainement. I, I will take you to her dressing room. Uh, please come with me, Sir William. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll see you later, Holmes. I'll be waiting for you, old chap. Good luck. Hey, you're a lucky man, Sir William. Giselle has quite a penchant for the Englishmen. And when they are rich and have a title, I am sure she finds them irresistible. You really think so? Poor, but of course. Ah, quel dommage that I'm only a poor policeman. Ah, hey, here we are. Entrez. Giselle Monchot, permit me to present to you Sir William Nigel. He's a great admirer of yours. Yes, indeed, madam. Ah, Sir William Nigel. Come and sit here beside me, Sir William. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, shall leave you. Au revoir. Uh, sit closer. There. That is much more cozy, no? Oh, it's nice of you to see me, Mademoiselle Gironde. Oh, don't <laughs> be so formal, my Englishman. You may call me Giselle, and I shall call you... Let me see, I shall call you... Sir William, not... Willie! I shall call you Willie. You do not mind? <laughs> mind? I think it's very delightful. Quite delightful, my dear. I was hoping perhaps that you'd care to have a little, little supper with me tonight, Giselle. <laughs> uh, so what about some, some oysters, a cold pheasant, and a bottle or two of Pommery and Green 072? You get to taste rather well, don't you think? <laughs> oh, Willie, I can see you are a perfect horse. Oh, I don't know about One that. One more, more. I get my clock. Uh, well, you, you know, Giselle, it, it, it's a funny thing. What is a funny thing, Willie? When I was eight years old, I fell violently in love with a, a lady bareback rider at a circus. History seems to be repeating its... Pierre! Arthur Pierre, do you no longer knock when you come to my door? Who is this man? My name is Nigel, Sir William Nigel, my good man, and who may you be? I am Alfio Alfieri. I am Alfio Alfieri. And what is he? Huh. A trainer of wild animals. An imbecile. What tone? You must not speak to all you are not where you belong. To me. Send this stupid Englishman away. You found it impudent. Grossier. Belong to you. She said belong to no one. Do I have to take my whip uh, to put you? Put down that way. Put it down, you scoundrel. <coughs> That's the time it will be your face, Carl. You me. infernal blackguard. Raising your hand against a woman. Shocking. Bravo. Monsieur Willie has knocked him down. Uh, he certainly deserved it. Oui. And... 
you intend to say of something, Willie. Oh, what was that? Come close, Willie, and I give it to you. A little kiss. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thanks awfully. <laughs> So strong, so resolute, so brave. Oh, it was nothing, my dear Giselle, nothing at all here. More champagne, Gus. More champagne. Oh, Willie! Really? Giselle? Oui, Monsieur Edwards? I have a box for the opera tomorrow night. I was hoping that perhaps... Oh, I'm sorry, Monsieur, but my time is occupied. I am showing the delights of Maman to mon cher Willie. Mademoiselle est mieux le collier de perles à cinq rangs ou celui à trois rangs? He says, which do I prefer? The five string color pearls or the three string color pearls? What does my Willie think? So that you can't hang too many pearls on a pretty neck like yours. I'll take the five string color, my good fellow. You're doing splendidly, Watson, splendidly. Yes, but Holmes, I felt such a blasted fool handing that jeweler fellow a check. Signed by Sir William Nigel. Are you quite sure that it'll oh, be honored? Oh, don't worry, old fellow. Remember who our client is. Money is the least important concern in this matter. On with the masquerade, old fellow. On with the masquerade. More champagne, Gusso. <laughs> Willie, you are such a headstrong boy. <laughs> More champagne. Citadel, you dear little thing. Oh, <laughs> Good evening, Bernay. Has Mademoiselle Gironde come in for the evening performance yet? Yes, Monsieur Holmes. I escorted her to her dressing room an half an hour ago. Uh, Monsieur Edwards is in there with her now. At last, it seems, she has used for a poor policeman. Last night, she found a threatening letter on her makeup table. Since then, she has been most grateful for my company. A threatening letter, eh? Any idea who might have sent it? Oh, yes, of course. I'm afraid I have, Miss Holmes. Uh, I told her to pay no attention. Uh, by the perfume of the notepaper, I recognized the sender. A jealous tightrope walker called Yvette Marat. Oh. <laughs> poor Yvette. She would make a very inferior criminal, I'm afraid. Still, Giselle asked me to stay outside her dressing room till the performance starts. Uh, uh, you wish to see her? Uh, yes. Oh, good evening, Mr. Redwood. Evening, Mycroft. Evening, Inspector Verne. Uh, come on, sir, Mr. Redwood. Look here, Mycroft. I think this little game's gone far enough. Giselle has just refused another invitation of mine. Now, I know who Sir William Nigel is, and I swear I'll tell her. Uh, don't you think, sir, that the lady is hardly worth bothering about? Surely this whole incident with Sir William proves that she's a scheming little adventuress, a fictitious title, and... An apparently bottomless purse have shown her up in her two colors. <laughs> I could have told you the same thing without such an experiment, my friend. Well, I suppose you're right, Mycroft. I've been a fool. An idiot who lets a pretty ankle turn his head. A conceited dope. <laughs> Let us just say, monsieur, that you have been a man. Uh, good evening, sir. Oh, good, hello, evening. good evening. Good evening. Uh, just going back to see Giselle for a moment, I brought us these flowers for her. Oh, I'll be back in a jiffy. Uh, just a minute, Watson. I, uh... I hate to dampen your ardor, old chap, but uh, the masquerade is ended. Ended? What, what do you mean it's ended? It is no ended. longer necessary for you to impersonate Sir William Nigel or to pay court to Giselle. Oh, really? Oh, 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 really? Really? Well, that's, that's a great relief, sir. Great relief. I've hated the whole business. Oh, yes, yes, I'm sure you have. Uh, we um, appreciate the sacrifices that you've made, don't we, Sir Edward? Yes, yes, indeed. Well, I must go back and see her once more, though. We had a rendezvous for tonight, and I must cancel it. A gentleman thing to do, you know, um... I, I won't be a minute. <laughs> Never have I seen a man more downcast. Obviously, with him, my dear Holmes, business was a pleasure. Alfieri, where are you going? That Englishman. I just saw him go into Giselle's room. To whom are you referring? That the man that called himself Sir William Nigel. Oh, yes. Two days ago, he strike me. I have to settle with him. No man may strike Alfieri. Do not cause any more trouble, Alfieri. From what I've been told... You thoroughly deserved what happened yeah, to you. Here he come now. You, English, you. I'll share he challenge you to a duel. Holmes. Holmes. What's old chap? What is it? You're as white as a ghost. It's... It's Giselle. 
What's wrong with her? She's dead. She's lying there in her dressing room. Strangled. Strangled. And only half an hour ago, I spoke with her myself. Since then, I've been standing in this corridor, guarding your door at your own request. Only two men have entered Giselle's dressing room since then. You, Monsieur Edwards, and you, Sir William Nigel. What are you suggesting, Bernay? I am suggesting nothing. I am stating that these two gentlemen are under arrest for suspicion of murder. Dr. Watson's unusual story will continue in just a few seconds. Time I'd like to take to remind you that one wine that seems to be the outstanding favorite among the ladies is Petri California Muscatel. That's probably because, like a beautiful woman, Petri Muscatel is subtle and intriguing. Petri Muscatel is the color of burnished gold. And its flavor, well, it's the flavor of big, plump Muscat grapes. Picked by hand carefully and tenderly, and they're just full of wonderful, delicious juice. If you want to show that you really know the wine that women prefer, serve Petri Muscatel. Serve it after dinner or later in the evening. It's wonderful. And why shouldn't it be? It's a Petri wine. Well, Dr. Watson, so you and the mysterious uh, Mr. Edwards got yourselves arrested on suspicion of murder. Huh? Yes, Mr. Bartell. Holmes did everything in his power to persuade Inspector Vernet to release us, but it was useless. And so, while Mr. Edwards and myself were languishing in detention cells, the local Sûreté, Holmes, and the French inspector were examining the dressing room of the dead woman. I'm, in sh I'm sure, Inspector Vernet, that... Uh... Being as keen a detective as you are, you must suspect the true identity of Mr. Edwards. Of course, my cher Holmes. But that is the danger of incognitos. If he chooses to assume the identity of plain Monsieur Edwards, then he must run the risks of plain Monsieur Edwards. And you are convinced that either he or my friend strangled Mademoiselle Gironde? It is obvious. Then I'll have to prove to you that they didn't. Let me examine the body again. No. If she had been strangled by either of my friends, why would her body be lying here under the window? It's as far away from the door by which they left this room as possible. That proves nothing. No, but it's odd. Giselle was a strong girl. Uh, there might easily have been a struggle. Uh, perhaps she tried to get away through the window. And yet there are no marks of violence on her throat. Just this piece of very fine cord that did its deadly work so cleanly. <laughs> Cut with a knife. Uh, please do not remove the cord, Monsieur Holmes. The body has not yet been photographed. Jeremy Vernet, you're making it very hard for me, aren't you? Uh, you notice, of course, that the window is open. Yes, but we have examined the snow outside. There were no footprints within three yards of the window. The murderer must have entered by the door that I was watching. Yes, it would be hard, even for a professional acrobat to jump in. An acrobat? There may your young friend, Mademoiselle Yvette Marat, is a tightrope walker. Yvette, but... Yes, she certainly had a motive. She'd even sent a threatening letter. I heard her express hatred and jealousy for this dead woman. It's conceivable that she could enter... A room by a window without leaving footprints in the snow. Where was she at the time of the murder? I do not know. I was waiting for her in the corridor. And I suggest that we investigate her alibi at once. And after that, Inspector, I must pay a visit to the Sûreté. I don't want my friends to think that I've deserted them. Excuse me, sir. Yes, Holmes. I'm afraid it looks rather black. As I was telling you, Yvette Marat, the tightrope walker, was able to establish a completely satisfactory alibi. Vernet still suspects you or Dr. Watson. Well, that's ridiculous. May I ask you a very straightforward question, sir? Of course. I can well understand that if you had gone into the dressing room and found the woman already murdered, you might easily be tempted to conceal the fact, to avoid a scandal involving your person. Will you swear to me, sir, on your true identity, that Giselle was alive when you left her? She was, Holmes. I swear it. Thank you, sir. That's all I wanted to know. Holmes, I'm glad to see you. You know, I've been thinking. All this depends on Vernet's evidence. But supposing he was the murderer. He told us that Giselle had turned him down, you know. I thought of that, but Mr. Edwards swears that Giselle was alive when he left the room. And yet that means that Mr. Edward... Oh, no, 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 it's unthinkable. Holmes, you're not suggesting... Holmes, if I thought that that were possible, I'd confess to the murder myself. My life wouldn't matter if, 
If it'd save us cattle like that, great Scott, it'd, it'd shatter the empire. Dear old Watson, you will not sacrifice yourself. You're as valuable a British institution as the lion himself. No, my dear fellow. It will never sacrifice you, not while my mind is still capable of... My mind? That's it. Thank you, Watson. You've given me the answer. Holmes, what are you burbling about Be patient, now? old fellow. In half an hour, you'll be out of this cell and the real murderer will be in it. Questions, questions. Why must Alfieri answer so many questions? Because he will not yet tell the truth. You murdered Giselle Girondet. How many times I have to tell you I did not kill her? Why should I want to arm her? Because you were jealous. Because she humiliated and tormented you. But I was not in her dressing room. I've already proved that fact. Am I a magician that I can kill somebody without entering a room? Alfieri, I know how you killed Giselle Girondet without its necessitating your entering this room. And uh, you're a very smart man. Please, to tell me. I don't need to tell you. With the aid of Bernay, I'll show you. Open the window, Alfieri. Uh, what game is this? Very well, then. I'll open the window myself. Put your head out. Come on. So... Uh. Who do you see? Inspector Vernet, standing three yards away, where you stood, and he's got your long training whip. No, no! Don't move! Stand there, the inspector hasn't your skill with a whip, but he wants to try a little experiment. No, leave him alone! All right, Vernet, I'm holding him! Mr. Edwards, I mean, I mean, well, sir, this is a pleasant change from a prison cell, isn't it? It certainly is. <laughs> Holmes, I can't tell you how grateful I am. I still don't quite understand how you did it. Watson, in uh, rather a roundabout way, was responsible for giving me the clue. Oh, how was that, Holmes? Well, on more than one occasion, old chap, I've had cause to deploy a rather florid style of writing. Tonight, I was very thankful for it. Uh, when I began to speak of the capabilities of my mind... Uh, suddenly I remembered a phrase of yours in which you referred to uh, its whip-like rapidity and accuracy. That, of course, made me think about Fieri, the animal trainer. Exactly how did he kill the poor girl? Uh, well, sir, he stood outside the window, uh, far enough away to leave no incriminating footprints. Called to Giselle, probably persuaded her to lean out, then snapped the whip around her neck, pulling it tight and strangling her. Well, then I suppose he cut the cord and let the body fall back into the room. Precisely, old fellow. We found a whipstock among his tackle, a whipstock from which the lash had been cut. The stub of lash left matched the cord around the dead girl's throat. Amazing business. And I don't mind telling you, fellas, I'm very thankful to be through with it. Yes, so am I, sir. In fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if this whole incident cures me of my love of circuses. Oh, I didn't know you had a predilection in that direction, Watson. Oh, oh, oh yes, sir. Yes, if you don't mind my saying so. Uh, uh, when he was eight years old, he fell in love with a lady bareback rider. <laughs> didn't you, Watson? <laughs> Indeed. What happened? Well, sir, I, I don't remember her name, but she wore pink silk tights with the golden sequins on them. And I wrote her a rather hot-headed letter... Unfortunately, my mother... Well, Doctor, that was one of the most unusual stories you've ever told. And, and I might say you played a very prominent part in that case yourself. Oh, I suppose I did it. That, Mr. Bartell. Giselle was a beautiful girl. Beautiful. Boy, I sure love that nickname she gave you. Wheelie. Yes, I thought it was rather nice myself. Well, that is, uh, I, I, I mean... I... <laughs> Don't get embarrassed over a nickname, Doctor. You should hear the nickname I had. When I went to school, all the girls called me Bottles. Bottles? Oh, oh I see from Bartell. Bartell? Bartell. Hmm. <laughs> Some nickname, like a prophecy. What do you mean? Well, they called me Bottles, and now that's what I like to talk about most. Bottles. Bottles of Petri wine. Oh, I should have known. <laughs> and I'd like to talk about Petri wine because, as far as I'm concerned, it's the swellest wine that ever poured from a bottle. That's because the Petri family really knows how to make good wine. Well, they ought to. They've been making good wine ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And since the Petri family has always personally owned and operated their business, they've been able to keep that fine art of winemaking right in the family, handing it on down from father to son, from father to son, 
from generation to generation. So it's no wonder, whenever you want a good wine, you want a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you going to tell us about next well, week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you of a strange adventure that Holmes and I had in the swampy Fenlands of Norfolk. It concerns a gypsy encampment, a child that vanished, and a horrible death in the murky depths of a fearsome quagmire. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Three Students. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. Pat Novak, for hire. what the sign out in front of my office says, Pat Novak for hire. It's an easy way to put it, because if you're going to make a living down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you got to do everything but run for office. I rent boats and kick around a few scruples if the price is right. It's a living, and if anything goes wrong, you can always get your mother a visitor's pass. If you do get in trouble, you go first class all the way. I found that out when I first met Doreen Wilde. It was almost dark, and I was sitting in the office with the door open when she first showed up. Showed up's the right word. The wind was blowing outside and pushed her dress tightly against her legs as she walked in. She was young, and from what I could see, she made Cleopatra look like Apple Mary. She had a voice like a bowl of warm stew. Hello. Are you Mr. Novak? That's my story. I'm Doreen Wild. Mind if I sit down? On your desk here? You'll block the view. You'll get used to the new one. There. Now lean back and let me look at you. Hmm. I want to hire you, Mr. Novak. After the look or before? You've got a power complex, darling. You know a man named Joe Condono? Well, he's a gambler out on Geary Street, friend of yours. I don't dislike him that much. We have business connections. That's why I want to hire you, to give him some money tonight. A needy case or a bad debt? A bad debt. Condano has an IOU from my brother for $10,000. You can go from there. Not if I'm supposed to say it was a fixed game. Condano's been around a long time. Yes. That's right. There are only two kinds of gamblers in this town, honest ones and dead ones. So if your brother owes ten grand, he better pay. That's why I'm hiring you. Just pay off Condano and make sure you get the pictures. Pictures of the Grand Canyon, huh? We'll talk about my past some other time. Well, for the moment, we'll just say you're photogenic. That's right. Your brother can't get the ten grand, so Condano's shaking you down. Yes. Yeah. I'll bet you make a nice rattle. How did Condano get the pictures? My brother gave them to him. You got a charming brother. You see only his better side. Will you do the job for a hundred dollars? 
How long is it going to take? Two hours, maybe. You'll have to meet with my brother. To meet with your brother, a hundred bucks is coolie wages. He'll give you the information, then you can see Condono. Where do I meet your brother? Room 729, the Dixie Hotel. He'll be there about 8.30. That packing crate down on Powell Street? Your brother's a cutie. I know why knows it wouldn't go in there. We'll meet you there at 8.30. Oh? You gonna be there? Yeah. Do you mind? I can stand it. Good. Do you carry a spare battery for that gleam in your eye? Your hundred bucks covers that, too. See you at 8.30. She smiled at me, and I felt like a guy that just found an oil well in the basement. Oh, there were a lot of things about the deal I didn't like, but she kind of made you forget. I kept remembering her as she walked out of there with a slow, easy gait. She had knee action that'd make a Nash jealous. Well, I hit the Dixie Hotel about 8.25. It was the kind of a hotel that has a 4 a.m. checkout rule. There were two or three guys sitting around reading tip sheets, and... Over in the corner, a couple of well-upholstered gals were talking about recipes, I guess. The desk clerk was the worst of the lot. He looked like a guy that might have been expelled from Alcatraz. Nobody looked up as I walked through. When I got to 729, I knocked. There was no answer, so I opened the door and walked in. There was a bed lamp on and a lot of smoke in the room. Through the smoke, I could pick out the committee. They were crazy about me. Come on in. Looking for someone? Yeah, yeah, but she's got a better figure than you. Close the door. No, she's not here. I'll just run along. Close the door, mister. You need the ventilation. I said close the door. Now sit down. Sit down on the bed there. You're a tough host. So I'm broken hearted. Just be a good boy now and give it to me, huh? You got the wrong guy. You give it to me fast, mister. I don't know what you're talking about. I came up here to meet somebody. Already met him. I've run across better people in sewers. Now, look, meathead, I'm only going to say this once more, so make a copy. You got the wrong guy. You think I got something? I haven't got it. No. No, so you and your playmates swing out of here in your tails. I never saw you until three minutes ago, and I'm tired of the friendship already. All right. Eddie. Yeah? Go through this guy's coat. Yeah, sure. Now, wash your hands, Junior, and then put them in your own pockets. Oh. Uh, you, uh, you got a favorite profile, fella? Hmm? Because I'm going to put this gun on one side. Take your choice. <laughs> Grab him, hold him up. All right, Eddie. Now you don't have to wash your hands. I woke up with a head the size of Rhode Island. I rolled over and tried to get up, but I was about as strong as a moth in a wind tunnel. The room was dark, and I couldn't see very well. It was a stale, musty odor. Could have been a marathon dancer's dressing room, with a little fixing up, the sort of place you wouldn't be found dead in. There was a guy lying next to me who didn't feel that way about it. One look at the guy, and I could see he was dead from the crew cut down. Somebody wrapped a towel around his throat and forgot to say when. I should have got out of there right then, but I used my brain like a bottle of medicine, a small dose every three hours. I stood there, looking down at him, and felt like a guy that's just rolled a seven the second time out. A small chunk of light squeezed through the door, and I could see particles of dust settling on his face. He was lying there, straight and white-faced, with a little bit of scowl as if he didn't like the idea. I went through his wallet and found a few bucks and some identification. Enough to prove he was Frank Wilde, Doreen's brother. Oh, it looked nice and clear. They'd done everything but pin the IOU on his shirt. Well, I couldn't wait around because when Homicide got there, I was going to be as popular as a can of salmon on Friday. Homicide meant Inspector Hellman, a guy that couldn't even make the vice squad. We were as close as a piccolo and a bass trombone. I got to thinking about him and decided to get out of there. It was a good idea five minutes ago. Hello, Novak. Oh, Hellman. Small wake, huh? Just a few close friends. You always drop by room 729 this time of night? I got a bad memory for faces. Who's your friend? His name's Frank Wilde. That's one answer. 
I was supposed to meet him here at 8.30. That's another. You got a third? Hmm? Who killed him? I don't know, Hellman. Maybe three or four people. Maybe a pack of lugs from Joe Condano's. Yeah? I think you're modest, Novak. I think maybe you killed him. Oh, yeah, sure. I wrapped the towel around his neck, beat myself to death with a pistol, and jumped into the same grave. Maybe. Oh, stop it, Hellman. That isn't smart. That still leaves you in the running. I came up here to make a hundred bucks. That's all I know about it. Check down at the desk. They'll tell you. I checked on the way up. The desk clerk says room 729 is in your name. Get your dough back, Hellman. You've been hijacked. Yeah? Look up a gal named Doreen Wilde. Who's she? The stiff sister. He got in a jam with Joe Condano and bailed himself out with some pictures. Oh. What kind of pictures? <laughs> you just look her up and find out where she was at 9 o'clock tonight. I got a bird in the hand. And call on Joe Condano. His gunsel's held a convention here tonight. That's too much legwork. You're handy, Novak. I can't afford a bum rap, Hellman. Get yourself another boy. You get me one. It's your hotel room. There's a dead guy in it and you got a bad record. I can make that add up for the D.A. You can't add a pair of zeros without crib notes, Hellman. I can try hard, and I'll be all through in 24 hours. That's how long you got, Novak. You got one day, and you're not going to be lonesome. Because I'm going to put a tail on you the whole time. Well, that'll be fun. I'm going to know where you are every minute. Stop posing, will you? You couldn't follow an elephant across a basketball court. Just stay handy, Novak. I'll be ready. I'm going to fingerprint this room and run that towel through a test. And then I'll be ready. Yeah, you better watch out for that towel. Huh? Remember, when it comes to towels, Hellman, you have to start from scratch. Well, when I left, Hellman was smiling like an Academy Award winner. I didn't blame him, because from my side of the road, things looked rough. From here in, he could play a pat hand and come out all right. There were only two other people, Joe Condano and that girl. I was real worried. So I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. Well, he was all right for a guy who tries to drink all the whiskey in the world every night, only some night he's going to make it. I finally found him at the Bellevue Hotel, holed up in the hunt room. He was getting the most he could out of a bottle, old whiskey and young ideas. It was 10 o'clock, and he was carrying a bigger load than the Berlin airlift. Oh, ho! <laughs> a drink for Mr. Novak, and one for me. I'll have to catch up. Skip me. You busy, Jocko? I'm deep in the labor of love. What happened to your face? I got a better offer. I'm in a jam, Jocko. You gotta help me. Well, you're always in a jam. You're the eternal patsy. Also, you're my solitary reason for going on. Forget it, Jocko. Well, you're the last project Providence has allowed me. An hors d'oeuvre that fate has thrown me to nibble on. I'm your conscience, you know. Yeah, all right, all right. You have no conscience of your own. Oh, you have fleeting moments of fright which you confuse as moral sense, but no conscience. All right, let's get off the platform, shall we? I need help quick. Uh, what kind of jam? A big one? Yeah. I woke up about an hour ago holding hands with a dead man. Where? Room 729 at the Dixie Hotel. I hope you changed rooms. Hellman walked in and found me praying for the dead. He's got an idea I did it. A shrewd policeman. That was the second feature. We opened with a pistol whipping by Joe Condano's gunsels. Oh, you gotta help me. Would uh, a drink help? Hellman's got a guy tailing me. I gotta go slow, Jocko. I want you to hit Condano's place and pick up every scrap of dope, will you? Oh, I'd look out of place in the gambling joint. There's a bar. Tour the joint and find out when the boys got back, huh? Where do you plan to be? Uh, hiding under a rose bush? I'm going up to see a girl. She's the dead guy's sister. Are you going up to extend sympathy? Uh, she's mixed up, too. Condano's holding some blackmail pictures. Mm. Let's reverse the assignment. Now, look, you see Condano, I'll tag by Doreen Wilde's place. Huh? She must be Harry Wilde's daughter. Who's he? The money crowd, to use a low term. What's he like? A retired octopus. After he got sick of chasing cigarette girls, he settled down to be a social worker. Yeah? Now he's like all social workers. A guy who's embarrassed because he wasn't born poor. And for years, he's been annoying the poor by trying to help them. Hit Condano's place. Now, if you hit anything good, phone me at her apartment. And keep out of trouble. Well, I'd say the same to you if it weren't futile. Good night, lover. <laughs> When I walked out, Geary Street was cold and deserted. The fog had moved in and staked out a claim all the way down to Market Street. There were two Marines across the street arguing, so I didn't hear it at first. When 
I got out of range, I began to hear the footsteps behind me. I stopped once and the footsteps broke off. I walked on a few yards and the footsteps were right behind me. They had a familiar ring and I was sure it was either Hellman or a water buffalo. When I stopped and waited, Hellman walked up. You're out late, Novak. What happened to that tail? He asked for more dough. I put our best man on it. Where are you going? Well, now, I'll bet you get some real good answers on that question. Where are you going, smart boy? Doreen Wilde's apartment. Yeah, why? To find out where she was at 9 o'clock tonight. It won't do you any good. Why? Coroner's report. The guy got knocked off about 7 o'clock tonight. Well, he took a long time dying. That towel was a joke. If he wasn't strangled, he would have been red-faced. He wasn't. Oh, well, now, let me guess, Hellman. He died of lingering malaria. Yeah, he was poisoned. That means he was dead when you brought him in. Oh, that changes things, doesn't it? A little. Don't let me keep you, Novak. I'm busy anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Checking your alibi for 7 o'clock. I had no alibi for 7 o'clock. That was right after the girl left my office. Oh, I might be able to dig up a witness, but I wasn't sure. It's like asking a horse if he's going to win the derby. Well... Questions were piling up, so I dropped by Doreen Wilde's apartment. I began to wonder. It was right next door to Condano's place. When she opened the door, I found out what the right kind of breakfast food will do. She was wearing a slack suit without much slack, and she was swaying slightly in a warm, slow way. Well, if there was any rhythm there, it's the kind you hear a thousand miles down the Amazon. And when she said hello, you knew it was all chemistry. Hello, Mr. Novak. I missed you at room 729. This will do just as well. Come in. Yeah. Mm. You're wearing your face a different style. Yeah, Condano's boys didn't like it the old way. I like it. I like it very much. Yeah, what happened to you tonight? Frank was supposed to pick me up. He didn't come by. I see. Your brother finally showed up at the hotel. Yes? Yeah. He paid off that IOU. Is that a quaint way of telling me he's dead? I suppose. Oh, don't sob so loud. You'll wake the neighbors. You know by this time that to me, Frank was a poor excuse at best. Nothing more. Besides, I knew he was dead. Father's down there now, identifying the body. Just for the record, who has those pictures now? Condano, I suppose. His boys piled me tonight looking for something. I got the idea it wasn't my social security number. Oh, you've had a busy evening. Yeah, they're going to book me for Frank's murder. Just call me Patsy. You need a drink then, darling? It can wait. Now, look, you're going to save some time if you tell me right now. No, I didn't kill Frank. Though I'd be willing to contribute to a shrine for the man who did. How about Condano? I don't know. In fact, I don't know Mr. Condano. Thirsty yet? Yeah, go ahead. Patsy, I'll give you $5,000 to find out who killed Frank. Hmm? Oh, I'll admit it was a good idea killing him, but I want to see the family name cleared up. Why don't you change names? That's easier. Oh, don't be crude. Will you do it? I may hang, and you can save your five grand. Here's your drink. The money might help. Should we call it a bargain? Suit yourself. Good. You don't want to stand there balancing that drink. No. That's it. Sit down. You know, you're an interesting guy, Patsy. I like you. Yeah? Yes, don't snowball the statement. Why'd you make it, then? Seems safe enough. You sure? You're a little close, Patsy. Are you sure? At this point, I don't care. Come here, baby. Patsy. What's on your mind? Where I can buy a desert island cheap. Looks like you got an offer. Oh, father, he'd forgotten his key. Excuse me. Come on over, Father. I want you to meet Mr. Novak. Mr. Novak? Yeah, they think I killed your son. Hi. He's the one I told you about. Oh, yes. Yes, now I remember. Oh, it's probably for me. Hello? Oh. Oh, yes. Yeah. I think so. I'll... I'll be right there. I've got to run, darlings. Only be gone a while. Father, keep Mr. Novak sober, hmm? I'll pick up from there. Good night, Father. See you soon, Patsy. 
A remarkable girl. She's active, too. Does she always sail out for a night camp? A remarkable girl. More so than Frank? Yes, I, I'm afraid so. You seem to like him better dead. Well, at least he's more harmless that way. But perhaps that sounds unbecoming of a father. Well, if he looks better that way, suit yourself. Well, I've never made any attempt to camouflage my feelings. I'm fond of my daughter. And my son, I've loathed. In a casual way. He's a mishap of nature which for years I've been content to blame on his mother. This matter of the gambling debts, uh, case in point. You know about that? Oh, yes. Plus Doreen's liberal contribution to the problem. By the way, Mr. Novak, who did kill him? I thought maybe you did. No. <laughs> I'm not a doer. I just cheer from the grandstand. Uh, excuse me. Hello? Um, it's for you, Mr. Novak. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Patchy. I'm down at Condano. I know that. What'd you find out? Never played two and eight on a roulette wheel. All right, drop the clowning. Well, I found out about your friend. Yeah? They came in about 10 o'clock, so that puts them right in line. No, not anymore. The guy got knocked off at 7 o'clock. Oh, impatient, wasn't he? In that case, you better start looking for a tie-up between the girl and Condano. Not a chance. No? She doesn't even know Condano. She makes friends very quickly, then, because she just walked into his office. <laughs> things were beginning to fall into place. If the girl and Condano were that chummy, they were using those pictures. To squeeze the old man, probably. There was only one thing about it that didn't make sense. Why did Condano's boys beat my brains out if he had the pictures all along? Well, I talked to the old man a while, and then I headed for Condano's joint. They were closed when I got there, so I went home to bed. Oh, I'd have given a good price if Tamara never rolled around. But the sun was eating through the haze the next morning when I walked into Condano's place. A sad old biddy with a mop told me Condano was in his office, so I knocked on the door. Yeah? Hello, Condano. I'm the guy your boys pistol whipped. Novak, come on in. I wouldn't worry. Maybe you'll heal handsome. Thanks. I'm sorry about that, Novak. I'll bet you are. Well, that's the way you'll get it. It won't come engraved. If I say I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, you're full of tears. You gonna shed one when they send me up on a bum murder rap? No, I'll buy you a handkerchief, though. If you got the time, you might tell me what Doreen Wilde was doing in here last night. What do you care? Maybe we're in love. And maybe you're putting the screws on old man Wilde. Hello? Yeah. Did you tell anybody you were coming here? No, just a birdie. It's for you. Yeah. Hello, Jocko. When? Well, from where I'm sitting, it doesn't make sense. Oh, of course not. Yeah, yeah, I'll let you know. Well, how you feeling, Condano? Get to the point, Novak. They found a dead guy out in the marina this morning. He was shot and banged up badly, but they identified him. What's that to me? Nothing, except they identified him as Joe Condano. Confused? No. It was a guy named Eddie Darrow. Friend of yours? Yeah. Yeah, I guess he was. What does that prove? It proves lots, Novak. It proves unless you find her in a cemetery, never trust a woman. Well, with a good assist from Deep Short, we could make it now. I knew that. Condana was mad about something and the lid was going to blow. I called Hellman. His lid was gone ten minutes ago. He had the murder gun, and it belonged to old man Wilde. A messenger walked in and put it on the sergeant's desk a few hours ago with no explanation. Well, that was the clincher. From here on in, it was cakes and ale. I told Hellman what I knew. He picked me up at Geary and Taylor, and we headed for the Wilde apartment. The girl and the old man were in the living room when we walked in. Everybody had breakfast? Patsy, I didn't know you came out till after dark. Well, we just wanted to call on your old man. Wilde, this is Inspector Hellman. Mm. Is there anything I can do? You're ambitious, Wild. Hellman's here to arrest you for murder. I'm amused, but not frightened. They might have gone easy on you for killing your son, but not Eddie Darrow. And who is Eddie Darrow? The guy you thought was Condano when you killed him last night. Your daughter was helping him put on that squeeze. She even sent in your gun this morning. Please, Doreen, tell these men 
Well, the starting backfield. Hello, Condano. Step aside, Novak. You don't need that gun, Joe. Not for long. All right. Push the girl out there. Push the girl out there. For a gambler, these are bad odds, Joe. Just keep talking. Just keep talking loud. And when you stop, all of a sudden, you'll know I'm through it. You made the first switch, Joe. I didn't trust you, so I sent Eddie Darrow up. He was a good guy, and I liked him. I didn't kill him, Joe. You made it easy, though. Say him fast, baby. Here it comes. Look out, Tony. Watch the old man. And give me that gun. Yeah. We keep shooting the wrong people around here. I'm sorry, Hellman. I bungled, huh? Yeah. Yeah, you bungled, Joe. How's the old guy, Novak? He should live so long, Hellman. He's dead. You're gonna need me soon, Hellman. Yeah, right now. Come on, Joe. Tag by headquarters, Novak. Sure. Well, it was fun while it lasted. Yeah. I'm sorry he jumped in front of me. He didn't have to do it. No, but you expected it. I suppose. I'm made to expect things, Patsy. Uh huh. And you're not going to mind this. <laughs> I expected that, too. You can slap me, but don't leave me, Patsy. I don't want to be alone. You got a cigarette? They're on the table. I see. A match, Patsy? You go build your own fire. I'm leaving. Please, Patsy, I don't want to be alone. You won't. I'll send you a whistle. Goodbye. Sweet double cross right from the start. Frank pitched the first curve. He stole the pictures from Condano's office the day of the payoff. He was going to wait for the dough from his sister and skip. In the meantime, the old man found out about it, killed the son, and left him in the hotel after Condano's boys had cleared out. Oh, it would have worked out all right, but Doreen found the pictures in the old man's room and guessed what happened. She gave him back to Condano and then made a deal with him to put a squeeze on the old man. And then she double-crossed Condano by tipping off the old man that Condano was on his way up. I guess he figured the girl for a fast play and sent a pal instead. The old man didn't know the difference. He really thought he killed Condano. And then the girl wrapped it up by sending his gun to headquarters. Well... Things had gone right, she'd have been right in the middle of that gravy boat. Her brother and Condano would be dead. Her father would be up on a murder rap. Once it started to unravel, it moved real fast. The first tip-off I got was when she offered the dough for her brother's killer. She'd have all that dough, and on the book she looked like a field of Vermont snow. She was feeling around between somebody's shoulder blades and... From then on, all the cards fell just right. Condano was probably right. If they're not in the cemetery, watch out. Well, Hellman had only one question. Why would a guy want to kill off a dame like that? After I saw the pictures, I wondered myself. <laughs> The Armed Forces Radio Service has just brought you Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced by William P. Russo. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. Be with us again next week when over most of these same stations we'll bring you Pat Novak for Hire.
I have another story to tell you today. This one is about a crime in which a murderer is trapped by one of the most powerful forces of nature. Do you want to hear it? Now starring Paul Frees as your teller of tales, another story from The Black Book. Yes, from the world's most fabulous collection of strange and unusual stories, The Black Book, I have selected a story called The Vagabond Murder. Eric Patterson was growing desperate. He'd been there for over two hours, waiting waiting with less and less patience for the door in front of him to open. He listened intently for the warning sound of the key in the door. Eric needed to be warned because when the man he was waiting for entered the room, Eric was going to kill him. As the seconds ticked past in the darkness, Eric thought back to the beginning of all this. It was in New York. He had taken his wife, Karen, along on a business trip. It had been quite successful, and one of the best contacts he'd made was Henry Drucker. Drucker, the richest, most influential man in the whole investment business. And he seemed to like Eric from the start. And with Karen, they made a gay trio the last few days. Rounds of cocktail parties, the theater, endless nightclubs... And then on the last evening of all, Drucker had said, Look, Eric, why not join me on the Bermuda trip? The best thing in the world for you and Karen. My yacht sails tomorrow. What do you say? At first, Eric thought it was just talk. But he was wrong. And the next day, they sailed for Bermuda on Drucker's yacht, the Vagabond. It wasn't until the return trip that Eric began to suspect that it wasn't him Drucker was really interested in. But Karen. And then the night before they were to dock in New York, it happened. The three of them were sitting at the small bar after dinner when Karen got up, said she wanted some fresh air, and went out on deck. A few minutes later, Drucker excused himself. I think I'll go to my cabin, Eric. But I won't be long. Uh, Wait here for me, will you? Well, yes, if you like. Good. Then we'll have a nightcap together. And so Eric was left alone. As he sat there, disturbing images began to form in Eric's mind. Pictures of Drucker, handsome, virile, wealthy. And of Karen, young, beautiful, and oh, so impressionable. With a suddenness that overturned the bar stool, Eric was on his feet. And half running, he crossed the room and went down the corridor to Drucker's stateroom. Drucker! Drucker, open the door. Drucker, do you hear me? Open this door, I'll break it down. Just a minute, Eric. I'll be right there. Just take it easy. I'll take it easy till I count to five, then I'm coming in. One, two... Th- All right, Eric. Where's she? Where's my wife? Well, you must be drunk, Eric. Karen isn't in here. Was she in here, Drucker? Tell me the truth. Don't be a fool, Eric. Of course she wasn't. Then why was your door... Oh. Oh, I... I guess I have made a fool of myself. I'm sorry, Drucker. Forget it. I'll tell you why I locked the door. You see, Eric, I'm diabetic and have to give myself an insulin shot about this time every night. Naturally, I don't talk about it, nor do I like anyone barging in while I'm at it. Eric stood there feeling like a fool while Drucker washed the hypodermic needle and put it away in a box. Eric watched him place the box next to a packet of insulin capsules in the drawer of the night table by his bunk. I can understand your jealousy, old man, with a wife as lovely as Karen. But I know women, Eric, and Karen is in love with you. She always will be. Look, I, I'm terribly sorry about this, Drucker. Oh, now, let's just forget all about it. Matter of fact, I've been wanting to talk to you about something I've already told Karen. And it should prove how I feel about you, Eric. Here, pour yourself a drink. Thanks, I need it. Um, you know anything about uranium? Oh, it's expensive. Know anything about Peru? <coughs> what are you driving at? Uranium in Peru, Eric. Big. 
really big. And the payoff is so big that I was going to put in $750,000 on my own. But I'll let you have 250000 of it if you want it. Hmm. That's a lot of money. Mm. So is a return of 23%. Yeah. But I haven't got that much. I'd have to borrow on everything. 180 days should see the first dividends. You'll have a certified check within two weeks. Back in New York, Eric and Drucker spent hours poring over graphs, reports, charts, surveys to make certain their investment was sound and they could find no flaw. But six months later, Eric learned that even the most guilt-edged promotion can fail. Uranium in Peru didn't make him a millionaire. It ruined him. It took his entire personal fortune. And because he'd borrowed so heavily, his business and his credit were ruined. Eric suddenly found himself without a single capital asset. In desperation, he went to see Drucker. So that's the picture, Eric. There isn't a thing I can do. Yes, of course. I understand your position. All my cash assets went, too, and everything else of mine is tied up. You can't touch it for years. Well, we took a chance, and we both lost. Thanks again, Drucker. Um, Eric, do you have any plans? Well, I've had an offer from the coast. Oh, Small investment house in Oakland. Well, I'm sure it'll work out fine. Uh, tell me about Karen. How is she taking all this? Karen? Oh, she's... She's really great, Drucker. Now she decided to go back to modeling in New York for six months or so. Just while I'm getting started, you understand. She's a fine girl, Eric. You're very lucky. Yes, I know I am. Well, goodbye and thanks again. Out in California, Eric thought often of Drucker. After all, it was part of the game. They'd miss this time, but maybe the next. More often, however, he thought about Karen in New York. He'd heard from her regularly at first, and then the letters stopped. For six weeks, he heard nothing. He phoned long distance again and again, but nothing was able to find her. And he was beginning to be beside himself with worry and fear. Then one night, his phone rang. Yes, hello? Uh, Mr. Patterson? Yes? Uh, this is Oliver Fay. I do a little gossip column here for the Herald. I hope you read me. No, I don't. Uh, well, anyway, perhaps you'd like to make a statement. Statement? What are you talking about? Well, it's about the marriage of Karen, your perfectly lovely ex-wife, and Henry Drucker. Where'd you hear this? <laughs> I never reveal my sources, Mr. Patterson. But they're driving Mr. Drucker's Nash Healy out from Reno tomorrow. They'll be married aboard the Vagabond. Oh, it'll be terribly romantic, sailing off to the seven seas in search of happiness, nursing their newfound love under the Southern Cross. Oh. And... At first, Eric thought it was all a lie, that perhaps he was the victim of a cruel prank. But he had to find out. And an hour later, he was standing on a fog-wet pier, looking at the sleek white outline of the vagabond. And suddenly, as waves of nausea swept through him, he understood everything. Drucker had deliberately ruined him, and undoubtedly with Karen's knowledge. These last six weeks, Karen had been in Reno, divorcing him by default. Everything had been taken from him. His money, his wife, his pride, and he hated them for it. Derek stood there raging, his eyes fixed on the porthole he knew to be that of Drucker's own cabin. And suddenly he realized that he was going to kill Drucker. And a second later he knew how he was going to kill him. He returned to his rooms and dialed the number of the Herald, asking for Oliver Fay. Fay speaking. Mr. Fay, uh, this is Eric Patterson. Oh, yes. Uh... Look, I, I want to apologize for my rudeness earlier this evening. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Patterson. People are often harsh. Yes, well, I'm sorry. I would like to give you a statement now. It's simply that Henry Drucker and I are close friends, and, well, there's no ill feeling between any of us. You understand. I certainly wish them the best of everything. Well, good. I'll print that, and I'll show it to them tomorrow night. And, you know, there's a pre-wedding party aboard the Vagabond. Oh, what time are they sailing? I 
Might want to send them a wire. Well, I have my little notes right here. Let me see now. Cocktails at 5.30, then dinner at about 8, and finally the sailing uh, around 2 a.m., I think. You know, it's going to be such fun. I'm the only one of the literary crowd they've included. Oliver Fay gushed on, but so Eric wasn't listening now. There, he had all the information he needed. Henry Drucker was as good as dead right now. About 6.30 next evening, Eric stood in the shadows of the pier and watched the last of the guests arrive and board the vagabond. Then he walked quickly across the open area directly to the porthole of Drucker's cabin. He was unobserved. The porthole was on a level with the pier, and Eric had to lie on his stomach in order to crawl through it. A moment later, he was safely inside. He closed the porthole and waited for his eyes to become accustomed to the darkness. Then he found the night table by Drucker's bunk and removed the hypodermic needle and insulin. Quickly, he filled the syringe with more than enough insulin to kill a man and placed it carefully on top of the table. Next, he found a towel and rolled it lengthwise. With it, he could choke Drucker into unconsciousness without leaving a mark. Now he was ready. An hour passed. Then two. And a third, more slowly than ever. And for the first time, Eric grew nervous. Another hour and the towel in his hands was wet with perspiration. What had happened? Had Drucker, in the excitement of the evening, forgotten his injection? Panic began to rise in Eric, and he fought it back desperately. And then suddenly, he heard a key in the door. He stood back and waited. The door opened, and Drucker, a black figure against the light of the corridor, entered the cabin. Eric waited until he'd locked the door behind him. Then he moved. The towel went around Drucker's neck and Eric twisted it with a frenzied strength. After a moment or two, Drucker ceased to struggle and Eric finally released him. He might have been dead already, but to be sure and to make it look like suicide or an accident, he injected the overdose of insulin. Then it was over. Perfect. Eric sighed deeply with relief and satisfaction. Mr. Drucker? Uh, Mr. Drucker? Oh, come now, I know you're in there. You promised me an interview, you know. Terror-stricken Eric moved to the portal. His hands trembled as he opened it and prepared to climb through. But something was wrong. The portal was open, but he couldn't get out. Blocking it six inches from his hands was a solid wall of pilings. Great timbers side by side. The floor of the pier was now two feet above him. For a moment he was dazed. And then he knew. The tide. The tide was going out. And the ship had dropped a few feet with it. The tide had cut off Eric's only escape. He was hopelessly trapped. He sat down heavily. Almost ready to cry. I'm still here, Mr. Drucker. And I'll wait right here all night if necessary. (laughs) Uh, Do you hear me? Black Book stars Paul Frees as your teller of tales, assisted today by the noted Hollywood actor John Daner. The Vagabond Murder was written by Norman MacDonald and John Meston and directed by Mr. MacDonald. The special music is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Every Monday night, a top Hollywood star plays the leading role in a thrill-packed story on suspense on most of these same CBS radio stations. Clarence Cassell speaking. Remember, Broadway Playhouse brings you top stars and top stories Sunday nights on the CBS Radio Network. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. stone structure on the Thames which houses Scotland Yard is a warehouse full of souvenirs where everyday objects a skipping rope, a glass an iron a stepladder 
All are touched by murder. Now you take this key. This was on the floor beside the body, sir. A door key. The kind that fits only one lock. But whose? Perhaps the murderer, sir. Today, this key can be seen in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear the Black Museum starring Orson Welles. Museum starring Orson Welles. Well, here we are in the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Here lies death, arranged neatly on the shelves and tables open to your view. Now, here's a spoon. It's a simple household spoon. Our murderer was meticulous. With this, he measured out a careful dose of poison. That oar up there on the wall, that was used by the stroke of a famous rowing aid at Henley. Later, it was used in anger, swung at a man who stood on the edge of a pier, stunning him. The man drowned in the Thames very quickly. Ah, here we are. Here's the key. An ordinary key the kind used to open most of the front doors in London. Once this key was in the pocket of a man who was waiting for another in his room at the Kingsley Arms Hotel in Surrey. Regan? Oh, I, I'm sorry. Excuse me, sir. I'll, I'll just turn the bed down. Uh, certainly. I'm waiting for Mr. Regan. You don't happen to know what time he'll be back, do you? No, sir, but if you wait here, you're sure to catch him. Thanks, I will. I particularly want to see him. The conversation lapsed. The visitor sat down again. The maid completed her work and left, stealing a glance at the young man as she closed the door behind her. Night fell. Lights came on in the guest bedrooms. But in one room, the number on the door was 22. A man sat alone in the darkness, waiting. The night passed, and morning came. In the hotel, there were beds to be made. Rooms to tidy. No answer from room 22. The maid was pleased her work could be accomplished without interruption. She was thinking of this as she opened the door. Stepped in. The bed was unused, turned down just as she'd left it. Sunlight was flooding through the two windows. And on the floor, a man lay dead. <laughs> The manager called the police. The police requested the assistance of Scotland Yard. And Inspector Sidney Russell and Detective Sergeant Hobbs were sent down to Surrey. This is the room, sir. 
Number 22. Has anyone been in there since the maid found the body? No one, Inspector, except myself and the local police sergeant. On his orders, I kept the room locked. Good, ma'am. There you are. Thank you. I'll let you know when we need you, sir. The two detectives covered the room, and in their quick survey of the murder scene, they found several leads. His wallet, sir. Let's have a look at the identity card, Sergeant. There you are, sir. Hmm. Name's Thomas Regan. What else have you got there, Sergeant? Uh, roll a note, sir. The killer either missed that or the motive wasn't robbery. Oh, I don't think it was robbery, sir. His watch is still on his wrist. Going? No, sir. It stopped at 7.25. That might have been the time the murder took place, though on the other hand, the watch might have run down this morning. He was shot through the head, sir. Surely somebody must have heard that. You would think so? Well, here's a shell I found on the carpet. Hmm. Point 22. We'll keep this for ballistics. What else, Sergeant? Oh, some silver taken from his trouser pocket, a handkerchief with the initials, initials T.R. in the corner, and a cigarette lighter. With the initials T.R. Hmm. He's well labeled. And uh, this was on the floor beside the body, sir. A door key. The kind that fits only one lock. But whose? Perhaps the murderer, sir? Unless it belonged to Regan himself. Oh, it's not the kind they use in the hotels. No. Was he wearing or carrying a keychain? No, sir. Then the key would have been carried in his pocket along with his money. Which hadn't been spilled onto the floor. You may be right, Sergeant. But to make absolutely sure, that key should be checked against every lock in Regan's home and his office and everywhere he might have occasion to visit. If it does not belong in any of those places, then it seems to me that when we find the door that key fits, we find the murderer. <laughs> The detectives went downstairs to talk once more to the hotel manager. Inspector, this is a terrible business. Listen to those men in the bar. What about them? Though? They're newspaper reporters. Oh, this is really dreadful. The notoriety, the reporters, the headlines. It'll ruin my business. It wasn't very nice for Mr. Regan, either. No, I, I suppose not, poor devil. What can you tell us about him? Only that he was a commercial traveler. He'd stayed here before? Oh, several times. A traveler, eh? Did he work for any firm in particular, would you happen to know? Yes, I do know, because they always paid the hotel bills. He worked for a London firm, Hardy and Sons Limited. Thank you, sir. Now, I'll leave the room upstairs locked until we have it photographed and checked for fingerprints. Oh, Inspector, there's one other thing I'd better mention. I think it's important. Yes? A man called to see Mr. Regan last night. Did you get a good look at him? I didn't see him at all, nor did the desk clerk. The maid found him waiting in room 22 when she came in to turn the bed down. Unusual, isn't it? Knowing Regan's room number? It suggests an acquaintance. Not necessarily, Inspector. Why do you say that? We have a register here in the foyer. It's on that wall over there. A room register? Yes, just a card opposite the room number. Some people don't bother with it, but Mr. Regan always put his card up. So that made us the only one who saw this man? Yes, Inspector. Then I'd like to talk to her, sir. Oh, I'll go and get her for you. The hotel manager returned almost immediately with the maid. She was a young girl, very pale, her eyes still fearful from the sight she'd seen on the floor of room 22. Annie Mitchell, Inspector. How do you do, Annie? Uh, this is Inspector Russell from Scotland Yard. How do you do, sir? Annie, what time did you turn down the bed in room 22 last night? It was going on for six, sir. And I believe Mr. Regan was not in his room. No, sir, but there was a man there. Could you describe him to me? Well... He was tall, fairly young-looking, and dark hair. He spoke uh, educated-like. I see. What did he say? Just that he was waiting for Mr. Regan, and he particularly wanted to see him. Tell me, would you know this man if you saw him again? Well, yes, I think I would. The inspector was well satisfied, but Sergeant Hobbs, who had been questioning the guests, had not fared so well. Uh, now, sir, I'm sorry to trouble you, but I have to ask you a few questions. Uh, really, this is most annoying. I've been kept here all the morning, and it's extremely inconvenient. I quite understand, sir. Now, uh, can you tell me whether you heard any unusual noise or disturbance during the night? The only disturbance of which I'm aware is the disturbance created by the police this morning. You uh, didn't hear a shot, for instance? Certainly not. And you were in your room the whole evening? Yes. Can I go now? Yes, that'll be all. Uh, thank you very much. Well, it's certainly... Certainly not been a pleasure. It seems nobody heard a shot last night, sir. Nobody at all. Not a single guest, even those occupying adjoining rooms. That's funny. 
Anyway, I'm leaving you in charge here. The police right, surgeon will be arriving to carry out a post-mortem. All right, sir. Are you going back to London? Yes, I think the case winds up there. The next move is to London to check that key against every lock in Mr. Regan's home and his office just to see if it fits. I'm uh, really sorry to bother you, ma'am, but I'd like to go right over the house, if you don't mind, trying the locks and... Uh, if there are any cases or cupboards, etc., that I might miss, I'd be very pleased if you'd point them out to me. I've uh, come along to see if you can help me, sir, in connection with Mr. Regan. I want to know if there's any desk or a cupboard in his office, uh, or the office door itself, which has a lock for which this might be the key. <laughs> I believe you've uh, a lock-up garage here, formerly rented by Mr. Regan. It must, of course, have a lock, and I'll be glad if you'd allow me to compare the lock with this. No, sir. I've checked every conceivable place connected with Regan, and the answer's the same everywhere. The key does not belong. Mm. In that case, we have our answer. Somewhere, someplace, Sergeant, there is a door, and behind that door we'll find the murderer. You know, if I was a philosopher, I would say that it's rather symbolic that we have a key to which we must fit the lock. Still, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a detective, and it's our job, Sergeant, to find the lock, to find the door, and to find the murderer. And that's just what we're going to do, Sergeant. We're going to find the door that this key fits. In time, they were to find the door... By patient, methodical methods, they came to the front door of a small flat. The key fitted. The same key that can be seen today in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with the Black Museum starring Orson Welles. <laughs> And now we continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Inspector Russell went back to London, certain that the crime had motive, and that the motive would only be found by a search into the habits and associations of Thomas Regan. His first call was to the offices of Hardy and Sons, Limited, where he was speedily ushered into the presence of the reigning Mr. Hardy. Come in, Inspector. Sit down. Thank you, sir. Shocking business. Now, who could have wanted to kill poor Regan? That's what we're trying to find out. Of course. Shocking. One of our best travelers. What do you know of his personal life, Mr. Hardy? I may be able to help you there, Inspector. I believe in taking an interest in my employees... I've uh, always encouraged them to bring their troubles to me. And Regan had troubles? Yes. He was a bachelor. Rather a gay one at times. I suspect he, uh, he was having trouble over a woman. Yes? A married woman. She kept on ringing up to speak to him, and the thing spread in the office. He was rather embarrassed and slightly worried about it all. Do you happen to know the woman's name, Mr. Hardy? I'm afraid I can't help you there, Inspector, though, uh... Wait a minute. Yes? He did mention something. That's right. I've got it now. Uh, he didn't want to tell me her name. That's a pity. 
But in admitting she was married, he did tell me that her husband was a doctor on hospital duty. A doctor? Yes, and uh, one other thing I recollect. He mentioned her first name. It was Lindell. And I have information that the man we want to interview is young. That suggests a hospital in turn. Yes, with a wife named Lindell. Hmm. Not very much to go on, Inspector. It might be quite a help. He never told you, I suppose, whether it was a London hospital or not? He never said so, but I'm quite sure it would be. At least the wife lives in London. What makes you think that? Well, the number of telephone calls that woman made to Regan. Nobody could afford that many trunk line calls. So they began in London, St. Bartholomew's Hospital. An intern or a young doctor whose wife's name is Lyndall. The registrars of the big hospitals consulted their records, made special inquiries. St. Thomas's, Westminster, Guy's. Each one of them returned to shake his head. There are several hundred hospitals in the London area. Big general hospitals, small private nursing homes, special hospitals, children's hospitals, maternity infectious orthopedic hospitals. At the first 42, they drew a blank. Then, at the London Royal Hospital at last. A young intern whose wife's name's Lindell. That's a funny one, Inspector. It's all the information we have, Doctor. It's useless to ask, I suppose, whether you might have this man on your staff. But we do have him. What? Well, at any rate, one of our interns has a wife named Lindell, uh, Dr. Bowen. Dr. Felix Bowen. I'll send for him, shall I? No, wait, Doctor. Could you give me some idea what this Dr. Bowen looks like? Yes, I think so. He's he's young, 31, I, I think. Uh, quite tall, uh, dark hair. Would you have his address here in your records, Doctor? Certainly. I'll, I'll get it for you, Inspector. Thank you. And shall I send for Dr. Bowen? No, I don't want to see him just now. And I don't want it known that any queries have been made about him. Uh, very well, you can depend on me. Is he in some kind of trouble? Nothing to worry about just yet, sir. Now, if you'll get me that address... Patience had paid off. The 43rd Hospital. Now, to interview Lindell Bowen. Inspector Russell went to the address he'd been given a small flat in a good residential district. The lock on the door fascinated him. The urge to try out the key in his pocket was almost overwhelming. But instead, he knocked. Mrs. Bowen? Yes? I'm Inspector Russell from Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard. May I come in? Yes, of course. Thank you. She was young, an attractive woman, but her eyes were frightened. Mrs. Byrne, when did you last see Thomas Regan? Regan? Tom Thomas Regan? I think you know who I mean. But I don't, Inspector. I'm very sorry. Not at all, ma'am. Perhaps I'm mistaken. Well, of course, I've read about him in the papers. That is, if it's the same, Mr. Regan. It is the same. Mrs. Byrne, with your permission, I'd like to conduct a small experiment. Experiment? I, I don't understand, Inspector. It's quite simple. This key. Key? I'd like to try it in your front door. But I... Of course, if you choose to say no, then I won't be able to try it. You won't? But I, I also ought to warn you that I can return in a very short time with a warrant. All right. Try it. Thank you, Mrs. Byrne. I'll just open the door... And insert the key. <gasps> the key turned effortlessly and easily. Hope died in the woman's eyes. The inspector from the yard took out the key and closed the door again. And now, Mrs. Byrne, you and I are going to have a talk about Thomas Regan. That afternoon, several significant events took place. A gun was found beneath a pile of medical books. It was taken to Scotland Yard to the ballistics expert there. The gun checks up. That's a murder weapon right enough. Little wonder nobody heard the shot in the hotel. It's fitted with a silencer. A silencer. Evidence of premeditation. Late that afternoon, the record of its purchase was uncovered. The second significant event. The gun was bought at a shop in the Soho district, sir. A second-hand shop two weeks ago. By whom, Sergeant? The description covers Dr. Felix Bowen. And the proprietor says he could recognize the man if he saw him again. We'll give him that chance. Come on. Where to, sir? The hospital. 
to pick up Byrne. The third event was Bowen's flight across London. Somehow, in some way, the doctor learned of the net that was closing about him and made a run for it. He was gone when the detectives reached the London Royal Hospital. They drove to his home, but he wasn't there. Now across England, the vast network of police communications went into action. The teletype carried the news of the fugitive. Central to all stations, general alarm for one Dr. Felix Byrne, age about 31, six feet tall, dark hair, educated voice, quietly spoken, wanted on suspicion of murder. The search was on. In a thousand stations, Vigil and I searched for Bowen. On the streets, on trains and buses, in restaurants and hotels. Within 24 hours, he was picked up. I, I really must insist. This is a terrible mistake. I really don't know what, what this is about. Uh, and I'm sure you've got nothing to worry about, sir. Uh, just answer a few questions, that's all. Well, of course, I'm perfectly prepared to cooperate with the law. But I must insist on an explanation at once. Yes, yes, of course, sir. You see, unfortunately, your appearance coincides with the description of a man wanted by the police. It's oh? uh, just a routine matter, sir. Uh, if you'll give me some proof of your identity, we can clear the matter up in a few minutes. But I explained to the constable, it, it's no longer compulsory to carry an identity card. Yes, I know that, sir. But before we release you, we must have proof of your identity. Yes, but how can I... Uh, you see, sir, we must be sure you're not the wanted man. But I told you already... Uh, now, Mr. Bowen. Yes? Yes. Dr. Bowen. Inspector Russell? This is Sergeant Thompson, sir. Hide it. We've picked up a man who we believe is Dr. Felix Bowen. Hold him, Thompson. I'll be there in a matter of minutes. It was Bowen right enough. But if Inspector Russell hoped for an easy confession, he was disappointed. The doctor was defiant and tight-lipped. I know nothing, I tell you. Nothing whatever. This whole thing is an outrage. I must remind you, sir, that your wife has made certain admissions. My wife? What has she told you? That she and Regan were having a love affair. That you found out. And the day before last, you went down to Surrey to see Regan. You returned late that night. Did I? And under a pile of medical books in your bookcase, we found the gun you used. The game's up, Bowen. The game is never up, Inspector. Until it's lost. The evidence they had accumulated was impressive. But juries are cautious, and defense counsels are often very smart. There had to be no loopholes. There had to be complete corroborating evidence. I think we've got our man all right. The next thing is to prove it beyond all shadow of doubt. What's the uh, next move then, sir? Well, Sergeant, there's one person who got more than a passing glimpse of the murderer. Oh, you mean Annie, the maid at the hotel. Right. We'll see how Mr. Byrne fares on our identification parade. I have a feeling he won't fare too well. Now, Annie, I expect you've heard of an identification parade. Yes, sir, like they have on the films. That's right, Annie, but this is not a film. This is the real thing. Before we go into the next room, I want to impress on you how important it is that you make no mistake. A man's life may depend on your judgment. So when you answer me, make sure, absolutely sure, beyond any shadow of doubt, the man you identify is the man you saw on the night of the murder. Yes, sir. Right, then. Now, in the next room, there are eight men. I want you to follow me into the room, take a good look at each of them, and see if you can pick out from amongst them the man you saw in room 22 waiting for Mr. Regan. Very well, sir. It's not the first gentleman. Nor the second. But... This is the man, sir. That's a lie. Yes, and that's his voice. I'd know it anywhere. This is the man, Inspector. Well, Mr. Byrne, would you like to make a statement to us now? I have nothing to say, except that I doubt that the evidence of a silly maid is likely to give you conviction, Inspector, whatever you may think. We're depending on more than that, Mr. Byrne. 
There are other witnesses, including a silent witness, a door key. That was careless of you, Mr. Byrne. Very careless indeed. Byrne was identified also by the owner of the second-hand shop as being the man who had bought the gun some two weeks before. With that, the case was complete. A door key had helped to find a murderer. And that self-same key can be seen today in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. Now here in person is Orson Welles. Bowen killed the man who had stolen the affections of his wife. His was not a clever crime. It was premeditated, without a doubt, but clumsily conceived. For the young doctor was no student of the art of murder. Yet he might have escaped justice had not a key fallen from his pocket. A key which ultimately brought the police to his front door. And now, until we meet next time in the same place, and I tell you another story about the Black Museum... I remain, as always, obediently yours. The Black Museum, starring Austin Wells, is presented by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Radio Attraction. The program is written by Creswick Jenkinson, with music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers. Threats will get you nowhere with me, Mary. You know that. Oh, you won't take me to the circus? <laughs> not tonight. Some other time, maybe, but not tonight. Tell you what I'll do, though. Mm. I'll get tickets for... Um, mm-hmm. The telephone, Blackie. Tickets for the telephone? Now, uh, what would a telephone do at a circus? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Just no. a second. Hello. Blackie, this is Faraday. Inspector, this is a pleasant surprise. What can I do for you? As if you'd do it. <laughs> Blackie, you know where I am? 
Do you know? Of course I do. I'm at the circus. Gosh, how much does it cost to see you? You can see me for nothing, but I don't want to see you. Do you understand? I don't want you near this place. A murder at the circus, Friday? Yeah, murder at the circus, Friday. A guy named Rondo, a magician, got himself killed. You didn't have to be a magician for that. All I wanted to tell you was to keep away from here. Now, so long, Blackie. Oh, what was that all about? I think I know, but I'm not sure. Mary, what did you want me to do tonight? Why, take me to the circus, of course. Mary, my girl, you've talked me into it. Now on to Dick Colmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Bolton will be here in just a minute, Louise. He knows we're waiting for him. Don't worry about the ringmaster. He knows better than to be late. The police are all over the circus. Yeah. There are a lot of things they mustn't find out, Louise. You know that. Poor Rondo. Cut Poor that Rondo. out. Come in. Hello, Louise, Charlie. Well, what's going on? Look, Bolton, we want to talk to you. Go ahead. It's about Rondo's murder. It's murder? The police say it was murder. It was made to look like an accident. But Inspector Faraday thinks somebody cut the rope that held Rondo's trunk in the air. Yeah, that must be what the inspector wants to see me about. Now, why he wants to see me, I don't know. Now, look, Mr. Bolton, you don't know what I want to see about either, so I'll tell you. This killing was done in the circus. And I guess it was done by one of us circus people. Well, no matter what we know or think we know, let's keep it in the circus. It might be a very good idea for everybody concerned. Step right up, please. There's Faraday over there, Mary. I don't see him, Blackie. Over next to the monkey cage. Huh? The one who needs a shave is the inspector. Oh, no, <laughs> Come on. No, I'd rather stay here and look at the animals. I didn't come to the circus to see the inspector. All right, please. I'll pick you up in a little while. Don't get too close to the lion's cages, Mary. Why not? I like lions. Sure, but maybe they're like you. See you later. Bye. Hello, Barney. Oh, hello, Blackie. It's about time you got here. What are you talking about? You told me on the phone to stay away. Sure I did. That's the quickest way to get you here, isn't it? You want me on a case, Inspector? Well, that's a switch. I don't want you. So happens, I need you. Inspector, how will I ever explain this to Mary? Now, shut up, Blackie, and listen. All right. The magician that was killed was named Rondo. Yeah. They used to handcuff him, put him in a trunk, lock it, put ropes around it, then hoist it over a big tank full of water. And they put a screen around the water, they lowered the trunk into the water, and a second later, Rondo came swimming up to the top. That's right. Thank you. Only last night, while the trunk was being pulled up in the air, the rope that was pulling it was cut. It fell into the water. By the time the workman got into the tank and raised the trunk, Rondo was drowned. I understand what happened. Uh, the arena was in darkness, of course. Yeah. There was a spotlight on Rondo until he got into the trunk. Then the spot stayed on the trunk. Now, uh, why I wanted you here was to tell me how that trunk gimmick worked. How Rondo got out? How he should have gotten out. I understand he's the only guy around who does the trick, and you know all about things like that. So tell me, uh, how is it done? You think that might be a clue to the killer? To whoever cut the rope? Well, I don't overlook anything. Although I'd be glad to make an exception in your case. No? That scream came from that dressing room right over there. Come on, Faraday. That's true. All you have to do is show up. Things start to happen. Here's the dressing room. Okay. All right, what's going on in here? What happened? Apparently the young lady on the floor is in no condition to answer you, old pal. Just a second. Miss! Miss! She's alive, isn't she? She's just fainted. Hand me that water. Come on, Inspector, move! Okay, now I'm taking orders from the guy. Miss. Miss. Uh, Never mind, Faraday, she's coming too. Oh. What happened to you? Tell me what made you scream. What made you scream, Miss? Huh, there's an echo in the place. Somebody opened the back door. Threw a knife. Just missed me. Screamed and faint. Well, here's the knife, Blackie, in this closet door. Did you see who did it, Miss? No. I just saw a figure at the door. Oh, just a figure. That's a big help. Well, Blackie? You know what? want to know what the answer is? Yeah. No. Apparently, as soon as I help this young lady up, I'll help you out. <laughs> ah, I'm getting pretty 
good. Oh, must you practice throwing knives, Charlie? Sure, if I expect to be a knife thrower with a circus I do. What's the matter? Make you nervous? Oh, you know somebody threw a knife at me a couple hours ago. Mm-hmm. You know that I screamed and it brought that detective in Boston Blackie into my dressing room? Which one did you make a play for, Louise? Oh, stop it, Charlie. I quit all that when you and I got married. Shut up, shut up. Oh, it's all right, Charlie. There's nobody here but us two. Mm. Oh, suppose I do have to be single to keep my job on the trapeze. I don't have to keep my marriage a secret from my husband. You never told Rhonda you were married to me. I didn't tell anybody. I got an idea why you didn't tell that magician. Because he was making passes at you ever since we went into training in Florida. Oh, he didn't mean a thing to well, me. Well, he doesn't mean anything to anybody. No. Charlie. Yeah? Was it you that threw the knife at me a little while ago? Yes, it was. Charlie. Oh, don't Charlie me. I threw it and I missed you on purpose. Just to show you who's boss around here. Next time you give me reason to throw a knife, I won't miss. And that'll be on purpose, too. Well, Fernie, I've looked the circus over. I've sent Mary home, and I have a couple of ideas for you. It's about time. All right, how did that guy get out of the handcuffs in the trunk? I'll explain that later. It's got nothing to do with his death. I'll guarantee that. Mm -hmm. Who's going to guarantee you? Me. If that has nothing to do with his death, what has? I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. What's the matter, genius? Slowing down? Look, I think... Hey, Bolton! Come over here, Bolton! Right, Inspector. Who's that guy, Bolton? You mean there is something you don't know? That's the ringmaster. His name is Bolton. Oh, Bolton. I'd never have known uh, Bolton, yeah. Yeah, this is uh, Boston Blackie. Hello. All right, glad to know you, Blackie. You won't be. I'm glad to hear, Bolton. I want you to tell me the details of Rondo's routine. Yeah, me too. Uh, how he made his entrance and everything. Okay. The arena was in darkness with a spotlight following Rondo as he walked to the center of the ring where his assistants handcuffed him and bound his ankles and then placed him in the trunk and locked it. Then what? Well, then Rondo, handcuffed and bound, was placed in the trunk. It was locked. And then it was raised and swung over the water tank over there. Yeah. Then it was supposed to be lowered into the water. But the rope running from the pulley to where the fellow was pulling it up was cut about uh, halfway up. I saw the rope. The rope was cut halfway up? Yes, according to the inspector, but nobody could have climbed up to cut it. Well, then it must have been partially cut beforehand. Or a knife thrown at it, which reminds me of the knife that was thrown at that trapeze performer, Louise. Hey, that's right. You know... Inspector, I... look out! Hey, what was that? The knife in that pole over there. It came from the entrance over there. Thanks, Bolton. Come on, Faraday. All right. Let's see who's throwing knives at us. Careful, yeah, Blackie. There might be more where that came from. There's a guy over there, and with a knife in his hand. What looks like a blindfold in the other hand. Hey, you. Stay where you are. What happened? Where'd that knife go? I threw it blindfolded. I didn't hear it hit anything. It hit something all right. A pole out in the arena. But it almost hit Inspector Faraday on the way. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, who are you? Charlie Peterson. I work here. Yeah, I remember. I talked to you. You didn't tell me you're a knife thrower. Well, I'm not. I'm just practicing to be one. I'm just a circus hand right now. Oh, no, you're not, Peterson. You're not just a circus hand. Huh? You're my number one suspect in the murder of Rondo. Who is it? Boston Blackie. May I come in? All right. You're Louise Brainerd, aren't you, the trapeze artist? Yes, I am. I haven't had a chance to thank you for helping me when I fainted. No trouble, Louise. I have a message for you from Charlie Peterson. A message? Yes, he said you were his girlfriend and he wants you to know. <laughs> I know I'm his girlfriend. That isn't the message. Charlie wanted me to tell you that he's been arrested for Rondo's murder. Charlie? The police think he killed Rondo because he threw a knife that almost killed Inspector Faraday. He claims it was an accident. He was throwing blindfolded, he said. Well, he practiced throwing knives, but he didn't kill Rondo. Charlie was with me, back here in my dressing room during Rondo's act. He was? Yes. Would you tell that to the police at headquarters? Sure. Will you wait outside while I change into street clothes? Of course. I'll be right outside, Louise. Whoa. What, uh, oh. Oh, uh, hello, Blackie. Bolton, is it a part of a ringmaster's job to eavesdrop? Oh, I couldn't help it, Blackie. I was there when Charlie was arrested, and I wasn't surprised, but... I wanted to hear what his girlfriend had to say. You weren't surprised? Why not? That Charlie was jealous of Rondo. Rondo was always trying to date Louise. Oh, then you think Charlie killed Rondo, do you? I don't know anything about that, Blackie. But I do know there's 
I heard Louise say that Charlie was with her in this dressing room when Rondo was killed. That's not so. It isn't? Where was he? Standing next to Rondo at the arena entrance when the spotlight went on. I saw him there myself. And now, back to Boston Blackie. Rondo, circus magician, is drowned when a trunk in which he is bound and handcuffed is lowered into a tank of water by a rope. Ordinarily, the trunk is lowered only halfway down in the tank. But this time, the rope breaks, and the trunk crashes to the floor of the tank. Both Boston Blackie and Inspector Faraday think Rondo has been murdered, and an amateur knife thrower, Charlie Peterson, has been arrested for the crime. As we return to our story, a circus barker and peanut vendor are working. Uh, peanuts, popcorn, uh, chewing gum, peanuts, popcorn, and chewing gum. Hey, Bobby. Peanuts. Yeah? What do you think of the mess Charlie Peterson's got himself in it? Ah, uh, they say he might think of any mess. His girlfriend Louise is in it with him. Yeah. And she told this fellow Boston Blackie that Charlie was with her during Rondo's act, but that was a lie. Where's Charlie now? In jail. Yeah, they, they took Louise down and made her admit she was lying. No kidding. Yeah, she said it was just to protect Charlie, but I don't know. Huh. Yeah, all I know is I guess we'd better get back to work. Yeah. <laughs> so long. So long. Peanuts! Popcorn! <laughs> Walton, I know you're through work for the night, but I still have to talk to you. Oh, can't it wait until morning, Blackie? No, it can't. Now, you went through a whole routine about Rondo's act, and it was swell, except for one thing. Well, what's that? I have no reason for holding out anything. Maybe Faraday and I didn't ask you the right questions. I'm taking care of that matter right now. Well, I'm pretty tired. From what? Being a ringmaster isn't too much of a strain on you, is it? Well, that's out of your mind, Blackie. You told us that Rondo, inside the trunk, of course, was hoisted up over a tank. Now, how was that done? Well, there was a pulley set up over the tank. A rope went down one side of the pulley and was wrapped around the trunk. Then it went down the other side of the pulley, and one of the roustabouts pulled the rope up to raise the trunk and released the rope to lower the trunk. Yeah, that's what I thought. I wanted to make sure. Which roustabout did it, Bolton? Which one? Is there something wrong with the way I speak or the way you hear? Well, the rope was handled by a fellow named Joe Marcole. He handled it every performance. Thanks. Now I'm going to see Mr. Marcole and just ask him one question, and that is, what do you know, Joe? Who is it? Fellow who wants to talk to you. Come on in and talk. Hello, Joe. Who are you? Besides the guy who don't know enough to go home, the circus is closed for the night. Maybe the circus is closed, but this case isn't. And Boston Blackie. Huh? I understand you worked the rope that dropped Rondo's trunk into that tank. Yeah, what about it? Well, you were holding it when it broke. That's right. But I've held it a hundred times when it didn't break. But why did it break this time, Joe? You ought to know. What makes you think so? It broke because it was frayed, didn't it? And you knew it. I did? Yeah. You think I'd have used it if it was frayed? If you wanted something to happen to Rondo, you would. I could punch you in the nose for that. What are you waiting for? No, you... Now, do you want to get up off the floor and try that again? Or did that settle the argument? What do you want? Was that rope frayed before the act, or wasn't it? I don't know. I forgot to inspect the rope this time. You don't know whether it was frayed or not, huh? Joe... It wouldn't be that you were afraid to tell me. Hey, Mr. Bolton, you awake? Yeah, yeah. Who is it? Me, Joe. Hey, what do you want? Got to talk to you. I got something you want to hear. Well, what is it? Let me come in and tell you. It's important. Yeah, it must be if you have to talk to me at this time of night. All right, come on in. Come Thanks. In. All right, what is it? And what happened to your jaw? Austin Blackie knocked me down because I wouldn't tell him what I know. Huh? What was that? You know. It's what I saw. What you saw? When? When that rope broke, Mr. Bolton, and Rondo was killed. Joe, go back to bed and stop dreaming out loud. It wasn't any dream, Mr. Bolton. I saw you do it. I was standing in the dark, and so were you. 
But you were between me and the spotlight on that trunk, and I saw what you did. Uh-huh. And you told Blackie what you saw? No. And I won't. If, uh... If what? You know. A little money now, a little then. You know what I mean? Yeah. I know what you mean. Joe, do you know what can be done with a whip? Sure. A lot of things. Yeah. You ever seen me take my whip like this and wrap it around someone's neck like this? No. No. That you saw me was an accident, Joe, but it's nothing like the accident that's going to happen to you. They found uh, Joe's body right here, Blackie. Whoever killed him wanted it to look as if he'd fallen from the trapeze platform up there. Yeah. He was obviously strangled, though, Fernie. Yeah, I know. We're having a lot of trouble with rope on this case, aren't we? We'll have a lot more trouble proving Charlie Peterson did this killing. Maybe. Let him go, Faraday, and his girlfriend, too. Oh, I let her go last night. She was here last night? Who knows? I'll know, as soon as I see her. Which will be right now if she's right here. Come in. Packing to go somewhere, Louise? Hello, Blackie. Yeah, I'm packing. Quitting the circus. Why? Ah, uh, because of the way everybody looks at me. They think I'm the reason Charlie killed Rondo. Oh. You know you can't leave town, don't you? I'm going to stay in town until Charlie's freed. That sounds like love to me. What would you say if I told you that Charlie might have a wife and two or three children? <laughs> Not possible. What makes you think that? Because I'm Charlie's wife at... And? Well, all right, you know about it. Doesn't matter now. Did Rondo know about that? No, and I should have told him. Then he'd have quit trying to date me and making Charlie so angry. Did he hate Rondo enough to kill him? No. Did anybody in the circus hate Rondo? No, Rondo was... Wait a minute. Rondo and Jim Bolton had a terrible argument the other day. What about, you know? About cards. They always played cards together, just the two of them. An argument over cards, huh? Thanks, Louise. It may be over that little game of cards that Rondo drew the ace of spades. Faraday, you're sure nothing's been taken out of Rondo's dressing room since the murder? No, the place has been under police guard ever since. What are you looking for, Blackie? I'm not sure. Fine. Look, you don't have any case against Charlie until we find out why Rondo was killed. Mm. And that's something we might find here. Something like this pack of playing cards. Okay, you got cards. So play solitaire. Leave me alone. Wait a minute. And if my hunch is right, I think... It is right, Faraday. What's right? My hunch. Rondo was a cheat. These cards are marked. See the little design on the back of each card? Uh, that's a code telling him what's on the other side. I know a mark deck when I see one. Okay, so Rondo was a cheat. So what? Wait a minute. Somebody else might have marked the cards. Rondo found out about it, and that made him a marked man. Uh, Bolton, I know you have to be dressed before the circus opens this afternoon, but you can spare a few moments for Faraday and me, can't you? Yes, of course, Blackie. Do anything I can to help. Well, you can help a lot by letting me borrow that, uh, that whip of yours. Oh, okay. There you are. And, Blackie, you can help by saying something that makes sense. I'm going to do something that makes sense, Faraday. Look at that rope over there, both of you. Yeah, what about it? Uh -huh. I brought it in with me, but before I did, I cut it apart. Part of the way through. I can see that. This is the kind of rope that was thrown over the pulley to yank Rondo's trunk up into the air. All right, we know that. The rope broke. Well, maybe it was partially cut, too. But how was it made to, right, to break at just the right moment? Unless a knife was thrown at it. This is how it was made to break, just at the right moment. One good, well-placed crack of this whip. And there, it's cut as cleanly as if I'd use a knife. Okay, so a whip was used to cut the rope all the way. It's possible. The part of the rope that came over the pulley was in darkness. Yes, Inspector, it was. Bolton, you realize you were the only one in the arena with a whip, don't you? Well, there are a lot of whips in the circus. There weren't a lot of people who played cards with Rondo, though. Oh, you know about that, huh? Yes, I found a little black book in Rondo's dressing room listing the money he lost to you. 
He threatened to expose you, and so you killed him. All right. I cheated him at cards, and he found out about it. But now it's my turn to cheat. Thank you, Shotgun. Neither one of you are going to move. Don't reach for a gun, either one of you, because I'm getting out of here. You, Faraday, keep your hands away from your pockets. You're watching the wrong guy. I'm going to throw it flat. That whip back the gun out of his hands. Hold it. Now. He'll hold it, or I'll wrap this whip around his neck. You know, Faraday, you always complain about my jokes. That's all, Bolton. But you'll have to admit that this whip just made the best crack of the year. Well, we're back at the circus, Flanky. But this time, let's watch it. Okay with me, Faraday. Now, look, Flanky. Our case is washed up. We know Bolton killed Rondo. He also killed Joe, the guy who handled the rope that hoisted Rondo's trunk. Now, will you tell me how the trunk gimmick was supposed to work? Sure, Inspector. The performer is handcuffed, and his legs are tied before they put him into the trunk, right? That much I know. Braggart. No. Anyhow, <laughs> they put him in the trunk, lock the trunk, and put ropes around it. Mm-hmm. Then they raise the trunk up in the air and place it above the tank of water. Yes, so? So, while the trunk is in the air, the performer slips out of the handcuffs. They are not real cuffs, of course, and unties his leg. Now, now here's the tricky part. At the bottom of the trunk, there is a gimmick which has to be worked from the inside. A false bottom, huh? That's right. So when the trunk hits the water, it's suspended halfway down on the tank, and the performer opens the bottom of the trunk, crawls out, slams the bottom shut again, and swims to the top. Inspector, you're wonderful. There's more. When the rope was cut and the trunk went to the bottom of the tank, there was no way for the false bottom to be opened. So Rondo drowned, just as Bolton knew he would. Faraday, it pains me to say this, but you're right again. But you know what broke the case, pal. What? Finding the marked cards that gave Bolton a motive. That was the big tip on the murder in the big top. You know, of course, we never did get to see the circus, Blackie. Oh, maybe not, but we had more fun than a circus, didn't we, Mary? Mm-hmm. One of us did, you mean? <laughs> oh, I didn't mind working a little bit. Oh, well, I meant you had all the fun and you know it. <laughs> what do you do about taking me to really see the performance? Not tonight, Mary. Uh, those words are vaguely familiar. And some other time, maybe, but not tonight. Mm-hmm. I seem to have heard that somewhere before, too. Oh, Blackie, what will I have to do to get you to take me? Commit a murder, I imagine. If I killed anybody, I'd do it too simply. You'd catch me in no time. I'm not the clever type. I don't know why you say that. You picked me as a boyfriend. I picked you? Why, you chased me for two years. And then you caught me. Oh, now, Blackie, I, I, I don't... All right. I... All right, Mary, I well... apologize. And we will go to the circus tonight. <laughs> Maybe. Just a second. Mm-hmm. Hello. Uh, Blackie, this is Faraday. Who told you? Uh, Blackie, we never did get to see much of the circus, and my feet are tired. So come on down with Miss Wesley. I've got three tickets. I'll meet you there. Bye. Well, Mary, we're going to the circus. Oh, another murder, Blackie? Yes, Faraday's feet are killing him. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Lovely day for drive, ain't it, Edward? And there's a car going even slower. Yeah, so it is. Well, there's a smart fella driving. That's all I... Say, that's a real jalopy, ain't it? <laughs> yeah, it is pretty old. Well, I'll give him plenty of room. But, <gasps> mother! Oh, that, that, that car went off the rod. But we never even touched him. He must have lost control. Look, mother, the driver jumped out. He didn't go over with his car. Oh, thank Providence for that. Oh, he's coming over here. Maybe we can give him a lift. Hello there. Hi. Well, you sure had an error escape, stranger. What happened? The brakes go bad on you? You're Mr. and Mrs. Mills, and you two just ran my car off the road. How'd you know our name? What do you mean, we run your car off the road? We never come close to you. Yeah, that's your story. It's the truth. Mine is that you ran it off the road. And, brother, I'm not insured. What are you trying to do? Oh, nothing much, Mrs. Mills. Just trying to make you and your husband a present of 500 bucks, that's all.
13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Hey, look, boss. Look at this. An ad in the Star Times out of town newspaper. Yeah. Box 13, Adventure Wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. <laughs> well, this looks like the right answer, Tony. Yeah. I think I'll write a letter to Box 13. The letter was postmarked from a city in Nevada. It came airmail, special delivery to Box 13 and me. It sounded like a great chance to grab a change of scenery and maybe a little fun. <laughs> fun? Brother, how wrong could I be? And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Triple Cross. Just run an advertisement in the Star Times, one that reads, Adventure Wanted, will go any place, do anything, and see what you get. A lot of them can be interesting, like the one I listened to Susie read. The one that came airmail, special delivery from Nevada. And closed is enough money to buy you a plane ticket to Los Maros. You want adventure? All right. Come to Los Maros, register at the Paradise Hotel. Wait in your room until you're contacted. And that's all it says, Susie? That's all, Mr. Holliday. There's not even a signature, even. It's what's called an ominous letter. What kind of a letter, Susie? Ominous. Uh, you know, that means it's not signed by anybody. The word you mean is anonymous. Oh. But you could be right after all. Well, Susie, lock up the office and look for me when you see me with a new plot and a nice tan. <laughs> plot and a nice tan, I said. Hmm. I got the plot, but the tan almost turned into a beautiful white pallor, the kind that goes well with lilies. The plane trip was smooth. The trip from airport to the Paradise Hotel was nice and easy. And the hotel itself? Well, it was the only one I could remember that looked like the ads in the travel folders. Oddly enough, there was a room reserved for me in my name. Okay, somebody checked and found out who I was. I explored the suite, thinking maybe I'd get a lead on what this was all about. But it was just a fancy set of rooms, all newly decorated. I sat down, and then about a half hour later... Come in. Message for you, Mr. Holliday. Oh, thanks. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Uh, just a minute. Who gave this to you? A man, sir. What kind of a man? What do he look like? Oh, just a man, sir. Oh, I see. A head, two eyes, nose, two ears, and a mouth. That is description? Yes, sir. That's exactly what he looked like. Good. But not knowing when I see him. <laughs> oh, did he ask for an answer? Uh, no, sir. He just told me to bring the envelope to you. Will that be all, sir? Oh, oh yes, yes. Thanks. Well, two $100 bills and a message that said, buy a red carnation in a flower shop and put it in your lapel. After dinner, go to the casino roulette table, buy $200 in chips and put them on number 18. If you win, walk away, wait 10 minutes and put half the winnings on number 22. After you play, wait in the casino. So with a carnation in my lapel, I had bought $200 in chips and walked to the roulette table. There weren't many players. It was a little too early for the big crowd. So I waited a minute and watched the play. Took a look at the croupier, but I might as well have been in Timbuktu. He didn't give me a tumble. Okay, the best way to see what was going to happen was to see. I shoved the whole 200 on number 18. One or two of the other players placed bets, and then... No more bets, please. No more bets. Number 18, red and even. Your chip, sir. The croupier shoved the winnings across to me. I, I watched his face. If he had any expression, it was on the soles of his shoes. Well, maybe $7,000 win was coming around here. I left the table, sat down, and did a little problem in arithmetic, which figured out to be $126,000. That's what I'd have if number 22 came up. 
And brother, it looked from where I sat as though it would. The ten minutes went by, and I walked back to the table. Waited until the wheel stopped. Number 16, red and even. Place your bets, please, ladies and gentlemen. Slowly, I shoved 3,500 in chips to number 22. This time, the others around the wheel did look. 3,500 to 35 to 1. Then the wheel began to slow up. No more bets, ladies and gentlemen. No more bets, please. That croupier was as cold as the floor of a mausoleum. Somebody dropped a pin and I heard it hit the floor. A white ball clicked, clicked, clicked its way until... Number 22, black and even. Your chip, sir. I cashed in the chips and there I sat, with $126,000 tucked away in my inside coat pocket. Somebody had that wheel fixed for a killing. I began to wish I was back in my office. I didn't like it. A crooked play. Why? Who? I made up my mind to go to the owner of the place and wash my hands of the whole thing when... Oh, there you are, Mr. Holliday. I've been looking for you. I have a message for you. Yeah? Well, it's verbal this time, Mr. Holliday. Oh, what is it? You're to go into the bar and wait. Is that all? Yes, sir. The same man gave you this message? Yes, sir. Did he still have a head, two eyes, a nose, and two ears? <laughs> yes, sir. Hmm. All right, here you are, kid. Oh, thank you. You know, if this keeps up much longer, you'll be able to retire my tips alone. Thank you, Mr. Holliday. Will that be all? Oh, uh, how much did this character give you to forget what he looked like? Well, nothing, sir. Nothing at all. And a smart boy like you should have taken a good look the second time. Huh? Especially since I asked about him after the first message. Oh, he was big, dark, a little mustache, and had a little white scar over his right eye. Would you take $5 for that information? That's all right, Mr. Holliday. No charge for that service. Mm. Good boy. I'll see you later. Yes, sir, Mr. Holliday. I walked toward the bar, wondering what was coming next. I didn't like that fortune burning the cloth in my pocket. The bar was like my suite. Fancy, rich, and expensive. I climbed up on one of the stools, and the bartender came over. And... Yes, sir. May I serve you, sir? Got any ginger ale? Yes, sir. What with, sir? Oh, by itself. Just a glass of ginger ale. Just a ginger ale? Oh. You see, I like the bubbles. <laughs> Champagne has bubbles, too. Ah, uh, but they're still around the next day. Just a ginger ale. Yes, sir. Of course. Excuse me. Is someone sitting here? Hmm? Oh, no, no. I don't think so. Thank you. Here you are, sir. Ginger ale. Thanks, the usual, please. Okay. Yes, sir, may I? You got a light? Of course. Thank you. Don't mention it. Here you are. Thanks. Why do you drink ginger ale? I like it. Why do you drink martinis? Same reason, I guess. <laughs> it's a brilliant conversation, isn't it? Well, I've heard better. You're not very friendly, are you? A uh, Boy Scout is always friendly. And does good turns. So I hear. Do you want to be helped across the street? <laughs> All right. I'll shut up. I took a good look at her. There was something scared looking about her. And she was nervous. Well, so was I because the minutes were passing and I still had that money. And I wanted to get rid of it. But I wondered about the girl, whether she had any part in this. I watched her out of the corner of my eye. She picked up her bag, reached for a lipstick, and then... Clumsy. So it's true what they say about women's handbags. You get the stuff on the bar, I'll pick up the kitchen sink off the floor. <laughs> I'm I'm so sorry. Did the powder spill on you? No, it's all right. Yeah. Here you are. The, the mirror didn't break, did it? Nope. You're still good for seven years more. Thanks. Thanks ever so much. I told you I was a good boy, Scott. You have a nice smile. Want a toothpaste commercial to go with it? <laughs> Don't be nasty. I'm sorry. I guess I'm just as nervous as you are. I... Let's talk about something else. She chattered away. And it really is. I listened with half an ear. Once in a while, through in a yes or a no. And the clouds began to gather. The mirror at the back of the bar went back and forth. The people got bigger and shrank the midgets. Somebody drove a plane through my head. It buzzed around and made a bad landing on my brain. And... Uh, 
There you are. Feeling better now? Uh, oh. You'll be all right. Just lie there and take it easy. Sure, I... Hey. Hey, I'm in my room. Of course. We brought you here. We? I'm the hotel physician, Mr. Holliday. Oh, what happened? And just a fainting spell. Nothing serious. Fainting spell? What are you talking about? They're fainting spells. Your wife told me you get them. My what told you what? No, no, no. Just lie back. Whose wife said what? Your wife. She's got to have a prescription filled. Now, listen, Doc, I... Hand me my coat, will you? Uh, it's better if you lie here. It's better if you hand me my coat. Give it to me. Oh, very well. There you are. What's the matter? Was my wife in this room? Of course. She came up with me. Uh-huh. Doc, what would you do with $126,000? What? A hundred... <laughs> That's an odd question. What would you do with it? I don't know. Because I haven't got it anymore. Now, back to Triple Cross. Another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. So there I was, 126000 in the red. If it was meant to be taken from me, then somebody was working it the hard way. Sure, the girl slipped something in my ginger ale when I picked up the stuff that fell out of her handbag. She took the money. All right, I want to know more of it. I was going to head for the nearest exit, running, not walking, when... Come in. You Holiday? Yeah. Do I know you? Call me Tony. I'm the guy who wrote the box 13. Oh. All right, goodbye, Tony. Sit down. What's the idea? Funny, I was going to ask you that. We're playing 20 questions. Let's skip the other 18, Tony. I got a big one left. Where's the dough? You tell me. Give it to me. Well, I didn't like him. I didn't like the gun he was playing with either. And I didn't like the little white scar over his right eye or the little black mustache. I was willing right then and there to cross him off my friendship list. But I told him what happened. It's a great story. Ain't heard one like it since I read fairy tales. Well, I don't care if you believe it or not. You got no regard for your health, Holiday. Look, Tony, I'm leaving this place You'll now. be too heavy to carry out if you take one more step. That's better. Now, what kind of a frame is this? Once more, you tell me. I played a crooked wheel downstairs. I don't like that. You got adventure, didn't you? I don't want anything that's crooked. Now, look who's talking. Who was the girl? Believe it or not, I never saw her before. What did she look like? I don't know. Yeah. Ever try to take a good look at anyone in that bar downstairs? It's too dark to even see a lighted match. You're smart, Holiday. The game with the girl is neat. Awful neat. You get the dough, play doggo. Act like the girl slipped your mickey. Later she turns up with the dough and you two split. Now talk sense, Tony. I didn't know why I came to Los Morris in the first place. I didn't know how I was going to get that money. How would I have time to dream up that frame with a girl? Yeah. Yeah, I never thought of that. Okay, Halliday, maybe you're telling it straight. Okay. Now can I go? No, no. You get that money back first, then you can go. I don't think I'll stay for the ninth inning, Tony. The game has not started yet, but you get that dough. How? That's your problem, but get it. Look, Tony, I'm backing out of this. You know I can go to the sheriff. Oh, no, you won't. Because there'll be a tail on you from now on up. One move like you're going to the law. Understand? Okay. Okay, I get it. And there'll be somebody in this room to see that you don't use the phone. You'll be covered like a pool table, Holiday. What if I can't find the girl? What if I can't get the money back? The boss will be awful mad. And? There are worse places than Los Moros to spend a lifetime. If you live. Ever have one of those dreams in which you try to run away from something and can't? Well, this one, with my eyes wide open, was really something. Tony and I went downstairs. Two other characters detached themselves from chairs when Tony nodded at them. Brother, I was covered. It looked hopeless. With Tony not far behind, I asked the doctor if he'd ever seen the girl who said she was my wife. Well, there was no dice there. Then I remembered something. I told Tony I was going back into the bar. Bar? What for? Now, look, Tony... Let me do it my way. I'm the one that's on the spot, so let me play it the way I want. Okay. 
I'll watch. And don't try for a quick steal, because the boys outside know who to look for. Go ahead. Thanks. What would I do without you, Tony? I don't know. Because you're not going to be without me. Remember, I'll be watching. Yes, sir. May I serve you? Well, feeling better, sir? Well, much. Where were you when, uh... When I fainted. At the other end of the bar, sir. Oh, yeah. yeah so you were. It wasn't our ginger ale, sir. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I just have a loose head, and when I shake it, it comes off. <laughs> May I serve you something, sir? Yes. An answer to a question. Well, what's that, sir? Who is the girl who sat down next to me? I don't know, sir. Oh, yes, you do. I beg your pardon, sir. Quit the sir business. You knew that girl. Why do you say that? Because when she sat down, she asked for the usual, and you brought her a martini. And you said okay when she asked you. What does that prove? The martini proves you knew who she was. The okay means she wasn't a guest of the hotel. No bartender as polite as you are would say okay to a lady guest. That makes sense? Why do you want to know who she is? Does that make any difference? Yeah, because I wouldn't want to see her in trouble. I'll try to keep her out of it. I won't tell you. Ever see a picture of Alexander Hamilton? Hmm? What are you talking about? Well, here's one. And funny enough, it's on a $10 bill. In fact, his picture's on all five of these bills. Yeah. Her name's Kathy Lee. I think she has a place at the Las Palmas courts. Thanks. Put these pictures in frames, will you? I found the Las Palmas courts. And, of course, Tony behind me all the way. The name list in front said Kathy Lee lived in number eight. I looked around before I turned in the walk. Yeah, Tony was closer to me than varnish on a tabletop. I found number eight and stopped for a second. Looked for a phone line, but there wasn't any. I knocked at the door. No answer. I tried it again. Then I heard Tony whisper from the shadows. Try the door, Holiday. I did. It was unlocked. Tony coached from the sidelines. Go on in. I went in and closed the door behind me. It was dark. I decided to risk a call. Kathy? Kathy? Kathy Lee? She wasn't there. I fumbled my way to what felt like a dresser and a lamp. Turned it on and... What I saw made me turn that light off fast. What's the matter? She's dead. What are you talking about? You heard me, she's dead. You sure? Well, go in and look. You go back in and look for that dope. Go on. Now look, Tony, I don't know any more of this. That poor kid's dead, murdered. I want you to call the sheriff. No, you don't. I said you go back in there and look for that dope. You look for it. Leave my fingerprints all over the place. Now you go back in there and hunt. Don't be a sap. Whoever killed her took the money. Don't you see that? Maybe. But we'll play this angle all the way. Now stop talking and get in there. I hated to turn on that light, but I had to. I didn't look at her. I looked through the room. Then I found something. A plane ticket to San Francisco. Leaving that night... And a boat ticket for South America. They were in an envelope, but the information on the envelope said there would be two reservations. I put it back where I found it because I didn't want Tony to find it on me. And there was something else. A locket. With a man's picture in it. I took it off his chain and shoved it in my pocket and I left. Well, Helene? It's not there. I told you it wouldn't be. Stand still. Back toward it. <laughs> A frisk, Tony? You don't trust me, do you? Shut up. No, I told you. Who killed her? Find that out and you'll know where the money went. Come on. <laughs> What's so funny? Holiday, right now I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. Tony was right. People at the casino saw me win that money and somebody must have seen the girl with me. Then I got the Mickey. The money was taken. The girl killed. Who did it? Mm Mm-hmm. Me, Dan Holliday. Because the girl clipped me for the money. 
Well, this was a beautiful frame. Any art gallery in the country would be proud to hang it. But I knew something Tony didn't. The plane and boat tickets. Two seats. One for Kathy and her murder. Somebody who left her tickets in her bungalow to make it look as though she was in on the $100,000 job by herself. Sure. Now her killer was taking a plane. In one hour. Then a boat to South America. I could have told Tony, but I wanted to wrap it up myself. Besides, I wanted to get the whole thing to the law. On the way back to the hotel, I figured something out for myself. But I'd have to see the boss of the casino, and I thought I knew how to do that without Tony tagging along. The casino was full. I stopped. Tony stopped. What's the idea? What now? I've got to think. Up to your room. No. You want to get hurt? Sure, go ahead. Shoot me. Now. In front of all these people. You know, Tony, you, you wouldn't get ten feet. Smart, ain't you? Okay, what's now? I'm going to play blackjack. What? Want to watch? I sat at the blackjack table. I had as much interest in the game as Aunt Mamie back in Iowa, who never saw a deck of cards in her life. But I had an idea. And I played it for all it was worth. Look, uh, dealer, yes? I didn't like that last deal. I beg your pardon, sir. I said I didn't like that last deal. Well, we'll return your money, sir. Never mind the money. Who runs this place? Hey, what is that guy trying to pull on over there? It? it worked. In three seconds, I was surrounded by muscle boys, and Tony was hotter than a New York sidewalk in August. But he couldn't touch me. A minute later, I sat across the table from the owner of the casino. I told him what happened, and when I finished, he stared at me and said, You're trying to tell me somebody let you win that money on my wheel? I am? You're crazy. The wheel's straight. But you know I won that money. Sure I do. Any time a hundred grand slides across, I know it. But... Uh... But this time it was fixed. The croupier was tipped I was to win. Wait a minute. Marty, send Frankie up here right away. Huh? Oh. Okay, forget it. What's the matter? Frankie, the croupier. Went off duty just after you won. He's not back yet. And he won't come back. Now, somebody planned to take the house this evening for that money. Somebody who couldn't risk getting it himself. So I'm the logical one. No one knows me here. I'd look like just another player. Later, Mr. Fixit plans to pick up the money and beat it. Who? Someone besides yourself who could get to the croupier and bribe him to fix the wheel. Got any ideas? Yeah. One. My partner. Well, that's it, then. It's got to be. But the girl, she doped you. That was a hard way to get the money from you. Listen, I've got an idea, but I'm a little cramped for room. Some of your partner's boys, particularly a guy named Tony, are glued to me. Get some of your boys to shake them off, and I'll bring that money back to you. How do you know where it is? I know. Okay, Holiday. Remember, fast play, and I'll find you if it takes the rest of my life. It's a deal. Now, uh, how about the boys? They won't follow you. Marty, a guy will leave my office. Some mugs are telling him. Stop him. Got it? Good. All right, Holiday. You're on first base. Go ahead. I was sure he'd be at the airport, and I wasn't wrong. He was sitting in the shadows on the outside. I walked over to him, and he looked up. Holiday. I thought you would be... Thought I'd be framed, huh, Frankie? What are you doing here? I've got a message from Kathy Lee. Kathy? She's... You ought to know you killed her. Ah, <laughs> you're crazy. Not only that, you've got $126,000 in that bag. $126,000 that looked like easy money. Shut up. That money doesn't mean a thing. It's the girl who counts, the girl who was willing to do what you told her to do. The girl you triple-crossed and killed after you double-crossed your boss who bribed you to fix the wheel. It's too bad you're so smart, Holiday. It's too bad you led with that right, Frankie. Somebody call the police to uh, come and clean this up. was... Oh, please hurry, Mr. Holliday. I, I want to hear the ending. All right, Susie, all right. 
What do you want to know? Well, how did you guess that Kathy Lee was the croupier's girl? Well, her locket had his picture in it. Oh, they should have given you the money as a reward. No, thanks, Susie. They can have it. But there's one thing I don't understand, Mr. Holliday. And that's? You didn't get a tan at all. You're just as pale as when you left. Oh, $126,000. A murder and a tan, too, she wants. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his new picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Production supervision is by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production. Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Walk this way, Diamond. If I do, well, I tell my friends. Hey, this is the morgue. Yeah, wise guy. You should feel right at home here, Otis. Oh. Hello, Rick. Hi, you all. What goes here? I want you to take a look at someone. You know who this is, Rick? Oh, the poor little devil. He was murdered, huh? Yeah, shot right in the back. Here's another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Yeah, yeah, you've done something. Uh, how do you do? Are you the manager of this little uh, haven of rest? A boarding house, boarding house. I run it, I run it. I heard you both times. Uh, what do you want, huh? What do you want? Information, information. Your move. You nuts or something, huh? You nuts? I'm looking for a girl. I What's thought... the matter? Read the sign, read the sign. It says rooms for rent. Rooms. Beat it, beat it. You know, if you ever get around to running at 33 and a third, you'll save a lot of breath. Smart guy, real smart guy. No, I got to work. Got to work. Wait I... a minute. Now, wait. Here's $5 if you can tell me about a girl named Elaine Tanner. For 10 bucks, I couldn't tell you a thing. Don't know her. Don't know her. She lived here? So, it's a secret from me. A secret. Now, it... Here, 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 here. Take a look at the snapshot. A man and a girl. Do you know the girl? Mister, I got maybe 10, 20, 30 different people every month. Every month. They come, they go, they pay rent. That's all I care. They pay rent. All right, all right. Did this girl ever pay rent here? Maybe I remember her face. I never remember no names. No names. Is anybody living in her room now? Why you want to know? Huh? Huh? Well, I'll tell you a secret, Bud. The girl is my sister. When we were little kids, my mother and father ran away from home to become acrobats in a circus. This broke up my sister, and she left too. Now, Mama and Papa are back, and I want the whole stinking family together again so we can take the light out of the window. <laughs> sure. For ten bucks, for ten bucks, maybe I show you her room. All right, you're in business. Now, here's your ten. Thanks. The fingers are mine. Uh, this way, down this way. How long does she live here? Oh, not long, not so long, maybe two weeks. Then what? <laughs> then comes an old guy one day. Yeah, an old guy, and... Uh... And what? She goes away with him. And you know what else? Yes, I know what else. The old guy was the same guy in the snapshot I showed you a minute ago. He was with a girl. Sure, sure. Okay, okay, look around, look around. She ain't any of them drawers she ain't. Oh, that cupboard she ain't. She ain't no place. Now, tell me, did she leave anything here at all? Just junk, junk. Newspapers, magazines, newspapers. So she was a bookworm. 
Ah, uh, okay. I guess that's it. Let's go. Let's get out of here fast. Who are they shooting at? Who's in that house next door where the shots came from? People. Thanks. Uh, they're shooting at you. They're shooting at you. No, anybody who wants to get rid of you. Nobody, nobody. Oh, mister, please go now. Now. Look, look. There's 20 bucks more if you do me a favor. I do you one favor and get shot at. Who knows what'll happen for 20, huh? Who knows? Twice as much fun. Now, look, go through the stuff she left here. And I then... told you there wasn't nothing, nothing. Well, go through it anyway. If you find anything that might give me a lead, call me up. Here, here's my card. Uh, but, but, uh... Oh, it's a diamond private did that. Hey, it says you're a dick. A dick. Strictly private. Now, is it a deal? Twenty bucks now? There'll be more if you find something for me. Okay, okay. No, no, no. Please beat it. And don't come back here no more. No more. Window glass costs dough. I knew it wouldn't do me any good to look at the house where the shots came from, because whoever played me for a clay pigeon would get out. Fast. Now... Only one person knew I was likely to visit that boarding house, the man who sent me there. And his name was Morris Clinton. Vocation, multimillionaire. A vacation, or hobby, wolf. And an old one at that. But why should he take a shot at me? Thinking like that figured out to a heart-to-heart talk with Clinton, so I went to see him. But if he knew anything, he played it straight. Suited you? But that's ridiculous. Well, I agree, I agree, Clinton, but look at my side of it. This morning, you sent your chauffeur to my office to bring me here. Then you hired me to find a girl for you, a girl named Elaine Tanner. And she wasn't there. Right, right, she wasn't there. Just an empty room in a boarding house. uh, That's all the information I could give you about her. I'll even buy that. I've worked on less information before, but here's my point, Mr. Clinton. I was shot at. I'm used to it, but I don't like it. I told you, I know nothing about that. Believe me, Mr. Diamond, I know nothing about it. I do believe you. We'll just say someone doesn't like my poking around that boarding house. Have you got any idea who that might be? No, I haven't. I swear it. Hmm. Okay, okay. I'll wrap it up right now. As I said, I've been shot at before, but uh, you've been so pleasant, Mr. Clinton. From here, the price goes up. You uh, you don't want to go on with the case? Not at these prices. All right, forget it, then. I gave you $100 this morning. Keep it. And forget you ever saw me. Oh, you're so sweet. It'll be a pleasure. Uh, Diamond, just a moment. Yeah? Uh, What has happened is uh, between you and me? Oh, oh, yes, but yes. Oh, I I will have to report those shots. All right. Sure. The police don't like to have people taking pot shots at each other. It makes for confusion in a big city. Uh, wait, Diamond, wait. Something else, Mr. Clinton? I, I I have my own reasons for not wanting anyone else involved in this. I, I'm sure you and I can come to an agreement. Oh, well, it's just possible, Maury, that you and I may not see wallet to wallet. But uh, what would you say if... Uh... If I offered you a thousand dollars bonus to, to keep on the case. Offer or a suggestion? I'll I'll make it a deal. Put it on paper. A check. Can I trust you? <laughs> ah, okay, Clinton, if you feel that way about it. Post date the check. A week from today. If I don't show up with Elaine Tanner by then, the check is yours again. Uncashed. Very well. Here you are. Thanks. So long, Mr. Clinton. I'll keep in touch. Where are you going now? Back to my office to wait for a phone call from the little guy at 118 Parker Avenue. Oh. Oh. Well, well, hello there. Did you hear everything you wanted to? I I beg your pardon, sir. I was just coming and asked Mr. Clinton if I should drive him anywhere this afternoon. Oh? Mr. Clinton, I'm in here. Right away, Mr. Clinton. Uh, Excuse me, Mr. Diamond. Yeah, sure. So long, Christopher. The minute I left Clinton and Chris, I began to get that lousy feeling again. The only thing that made me feel anywhere near normal was the thought of the thousand bucks that would be mine in seven days. For a thousand bucks, I'd stand up for target practice for the big mole. I didn't have much to go on, just the knowledge that old man Clinton wanted me to find Elaine Tanner and that somebody, who up to now had proved to be a bad shot, didn't want me to find her. With that peaceful thought in mind, I sat in my office hoping for a call from the little manager of the boarding house on Parker Avenue. I'd been waiting about an hour, and then... Ah, save your knuckles and use a fire axe. Come on in. Hello, Mr. Diamond. Well, 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 Christopher. All your driving finished for the day? Mr. Clinton sent me to see you, Mr. Diamond. This is the second time today. What's he trying to do, make dear friends of us? Not exactly, Mr. Diamond. Uh, He wants that check back. What? He's changed his mind. Oh, from what I know of him, it needs it. He wants to call off the whole thing. Something happened. Elaine Tanner show up? No, Oh, and he sent you to get the $1,000 check back. That's right, Mr. Diamond. Oh, I know an easier way. Why doesn't he just stop payment on the check? I'm only carrying out Mr. Clinton's orders. Are you? 
Why do you ask that? That seems a little offbeat, Chris. This morning he hires me, then he fires me, then he hires me, now he fires me. Monotonous, isn't it? May I have the check, Mr. Diamond? Not before I call Clinton and ask him a few things. You just don't seem to understand, do you? I want Mr. Clinton to explain. Take your hands away from that phone. Oh, oh, gun. Uh, I know how I hate him. No need to be afraid of this one unless you get stubborn. Let's give Clinton a ring. Keep your hands on top of the desk, palms down. So we're going to play table tilting, maybe? And stay sitting. Listen, Chris. How do you like your hair parted, Diamond? On the side or right in the middle? When I opened my big blue eyes, my office was dark, and the neon light on the hotel across the street flashed the news that it was dark outside, too. I'd been out cold for a long time. When the room stopped spinning, I reached out, grabbed a piece of it, pulled myself up, went to the water cooler, splashed myself alive. I started toward the light switch when... This time, I was going to be ready. I got behind the door and waited. Yeah, yeah. Hey, let go. Oh, for the love of my God, uh, Sergeant Otis. Uh, well, who you expect, gorgeous George, maybe? Oh. Let go my neck. Oh, I'm sorry, Otis. I, I, I guess I just can't resist you. You crazy shamus. Hey, it's dark in here. It was a lot darker a couple of minutes ago. Hit the light, will you? Yeah. Thanks. Oh, I got enough troubles, and the first thing I see when I wake up is you. Holy mackerel. What you been doing with your head, Diamond? I got mixed up in a handball game. Oh? Yeah, some friends needed a ball. It's hard work, but you get used to it. Oh, got worked over, huh? Well, them bum jokes you pull catch up with you sometimes. Yeah, I would... Hey, wait a minute. What are you doing here? I come to get you. Lieutenant Levinson wants to see you. Well, go back and describe me. That's all he gets tonight. I think you better come, Shamus. It's important. I think you better go, Otis. That's important. Now, look. Well, Lieutenant Levinson sends me over to get you. There's something he wants to ask you. All I know is name, rank, and serial number. Now go back and tell Walt I don't want to play games. Yeah, uh, Shamus, I got news for you. Murder ain't a game no more. That's all Otis would tell me, but I didn't like the way he kept looking at me all the way to see Levinson. Then we got to headquarters, not to Walt's office, but down the long marble corridor that led back to other places. He wants me to bring you back here, Diamond. Where to? The morgue. The morgue? Yeah, you heard of it. I heard of it. What's this all about? You'll see. In here, Shamus. Lieutenant. Back here, Otis. Come on, Diamond. Hello, Rick. I... Well, how's the other head look? I'll let you know when it speaks to me. Yeah. Meantime, I want you to take a look at someone. In here? Yeah, in here. You know who this is, Rick? Oh, the poor little devil. The poor devil. What do you know about him? Well, he was manager of a boarding house. Cheap walk-up on Parker Avenue. That we know. What else? He was murdered, huh? Shot right in the back. Mm. Rick, unless I knew you were tied in, I wouldn't have you here. You want to talk about it? Uh, somewhere else, Walt. Sure. Come on. Before I answer any more questions, Walt, how'd you tie me in? He had one of your business cards in his hand. He was shot while he was standing at the phone in the hallway of that boarding house. Did he call you, Rick? I didn't get a call from him. Got any idea why he wanted you? Maybe, maybe not. All depends. On what? Walt, listen. I will in my office. Wait outside, Otis. And I'm busy. Get it? Sure. Sure, I get it. Wait a second, Rick. Now, here's a gun. 38 police special. Take a good look at it. I've seen it before. It's mine. How did you get it? The ballistic support says this gun killed the little guy back there. Did you check it for fingerprints? Yeah, and they were all yours. Hmm. Will you have Otis come visit me and bake a cake with a file in it? Oh, cut it out, Rick. I know you didn't kill him, but I've got to tell the commissioner something. He's funny that way. I was in my office when the guy was shot. I was out cold. You got any proof? For you or the commissioner? For the commissioner, you egghead. Uh, listen on the way. To where? Have Otis bring the car around front. We're going to make a call on a guy named Morris Clinton and his errand boy, Christopher. <laughs> On the way out, I told Walt the whole thing, how Christopher caught me off base, put me out, and then must have taken my gun to kill the little manager. But neither of us could come up with an answer to why. Why murder to keep me from finding Elaine Tanner? What was the connection between Clinton, his chauffeur, and the girl? 
I thought maybe Clinton would give her the answers when he learned there was a murder tapping at his door. So you want to see Christopher, Lieutenant Levison? If you don't mind, Mr. Clinton. Oh, no, no, not at all. <clears throat> I'll call him real loud, Mr. Clinton. Of course. Christopher? Christopher! You're sure he's here, Mr. Clinton? Oh, yes, yes, I am, of course, Lieutenant. Call again. <clears throat> Christopher! Christopher! I don't think he'll hear you. Why not? I'm not deaf, Mr. Diamond. Hmm? Rick, is that Christopher? Yeah, yeah, this is Chris, all right. And I owe him a haircut. Now, lay off, Rick. I'll handle this. Christopher. Yes, sir? Where were you about two this afternoon? Why, right here, working on the car. Correction. Working on me. I beg your pardon. Oh, come on, come on. Let's have it straight. Mr. Clinton, what about this? Uh, Christopher is, is right, Lieutenant. Yes, <clears throat> he's right. Oh, you're scared stiff, Clinton, and you're lying. I'm not. I, uh... I wanted to go into town to, to keep an appointment. And the fuel pump on the car was stopped up. I had to take it apart. Oh, uh, sure. And while you fixed it, Clinton stood right over you. As a matter of fact, he did watch. And it took all afternoon to fix it. No, but when it was finished, it was too late for Mr. Clinton's appointment. Uh, he decided not to go. How about that, Mr. Clinton? Oh, yes, yes, Lieutenant. Uh, Christopher, uh, uh, Christopher hasn't been out of my sight all afternoon. That's good enough for me. All right, Diamond, let's go. What? Are you crazy? No, that's why I'm putting the cuffs on you. I thought there was something fishy about your story. Gun taken away from you. People coming to see you, hiring you, firing Watch, your stomach has gone to your head. Never mind my stomach. Otis. Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. Put the cuffs on this Shamas. Cuffs? On him? Close your mouth, Otis. Put the cuffs on. Ward, what in the world? Diamond, I've been waiting for a chance like this to comb you out of my hair for good. Otis, the cuffs. Uh, yes, sir, Lieutenant. All right, Shamas, pull them out. Mr. Clinton, thank you very much. Goodbye. Come on, Diamond. Oh, so, uh, uh, Lieutenant. Otis, I told you to close your mouth. Oh, I gotta breathe. Oh, shut up and come on. Walt, outside, Diamond. Get going. You big bubblehead. What's the idea of making like a cop of me? I kind of liked it. How'd I do? What? Good performance, eh? Good performance. <laughs> oh, you big ham. You great big ham. Well, Lieutenant, are we going to put the shamus in the jug? Shut up, Otis. Take the cups off him. What? Here, Otis, start working. Oh, you're right, Rick. Clinton was scared stiff, and for some reason he backed Christopher's alibi. Well, I've, uh, I've got an idea. You better have. If I don't have something to tell the commissioner, I'll have to give up my ideas about a pension. I, uh, I'm going back to that boarding house. Why? Well, the manager was going to call me. It's just possible he got a hold of a lead on Elaine Tanner, but Christopher killed him before he had a chance to tell me. Well, that makes sense. Uh, have you got a man there? Yeah, a happy. Oh, good. Well, I'll see you later. Rick. All right. Please. For the sake of my stomach, don't slip up. You're my only suspect without an alibi. Thanks, Walt. See you later. Yeah. No, oh, Walt. What? Bottoms up on the bicarbonate. <laughs> all the stuff there was in the basement, Diamond. Oh, thanks, Mahaffey. Mm. Everything neatly bundled but this one pile. The little guy must have gone through it. Got any idea what you're looking for? No, give me a hand, will you? Sure. Hmm. Newspapers, magazines. Oh, Mahaffey. Uh-huh? No one's been in here since the murder? Nobody. I've been on the door. Oh, and the manager had nothing on him? Only your card. That's funny. Very funny. He wouldn't have tried to call me if he hadn't found something. Maybe he came across something in this pile of stuff. Didn't take it out and then... Find something? Yeah, yeah. The chief of withholding tax statements. Mm hmm. The kind that come on the bottoms of paychecks. Made out to Elaine Tanner, paid by the Blue Falcon Nightclub. That ain't far from here. That's where I'm going. Sure, now I remember a kid that named Tanner. Yeah, used to work here in the line. Thanks, bartender. Where's she now? Well, Mr. Me, I know from nothing about her, but she was good friends with one of the dolls in the line, a gal named Gladys. Where can I find this Gladys? Dressing room, straight back, turn left. And knock on the door, huh? Well, for oh, they dressed that way for the show anyway. I'll keep both eyes closed. <laughs> sure, straight back like I said, then first turn left. <laughs> What you want with her, handsome? Why don't you get off here? You tempt me, sweetheart, but give me a rain check. Who waits for rain? But, um, why do you want to see Elaine? Well, maybe I want to tell her about some oil wells that came in. Yeah? <laughs> you don't look like the type talks about oil wells. Honey, honey, don't let the tassels on my shoes fool you. Oh, you're cute. <laughs> yeah, I know where Elaine is. Want to give? 
Information? Sure. Oh, you've got a one-track mind. Maybe I can't switch it over yet. Okay, so I'll get a couple of days older meanwhile. Anyhow, I never did like her. So, I don't mind letting you know. No what, Gladys? Well, maybe a month ago she quit this job. This dump. Uh, all right, she quits. Go ahead. Yeah. But uh, before she quits, she's acting funny. Like the night we're going home together, walking along. And she's so... Oh, this is the last time I take this walk. So, gonna fly to him from work? I'm quitting. Well, if you like to eat grass, go ahead. <laughs> I won't eat grass. You had a real mink coat, Gladys? I coulda, but his lawyer settled out of court. I'll have one. I'll do all right. You thinking about that guy Clinton who comes in the club? Uh huh. Honey, there's wolves and there's wolves. I want to pick one with teeth. He likes me. Sure. Every time he sees you, he's got to push his eyes back in his head. Chris is working for him. His chauffeur. So this is news? So what? Money. Lots of it. Shake down? Oh, now look, honey. They can give you trouble for that. <laughs> Not a shake down. This is safe and sure. Chris figured it. He figured it and I... And what? Nothing. Just forget it. Come on. Let's get some coffee. That's all she says. Uh-huh. Now, where can I find her? Oh, I'll tell you where I think she is. Here's the address. I wrote it down. Thanks, Gladys. I'll see you again. Yeah. See more of me. Is that possible? This costume's for the first show. We save up for the second. I'll be here for the last show. Oh, what you said. So long, Hampton. <laughs> A little while after Gladys gave the address, I was buzzing at an apartment door. I kept my fingers crossed and then uncrossed them when the door opened. Yes? Hello there, Elaine. Who are you? Oh, the name's Hangtooth. Elmer Hangtooth. Who? Oh, I better come in. Hey, hey, what's the idea? Oh, can't hear a thing you say, honey. My hearing aid just shorted out. Now listen, wise guy. Oh, Elaine, Elaine. Chris sent me. Chris? Yeah. He said to tell you everything's okay. The heat's off. How about that private eye? Diamond? Richard Diamond? Yeah, that's the one. Honey, you'll never be any closer to him than you are right now. Uh, I was afraid he'd quit. Hey, when's Chris coming? Soon, I hope. Oh. Uh, I've never seen you before, have I? Well, you're young and life's full of surprises. Uh-huh. I like surprises. Nice. Chris, work you in on the deal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did him a favor. I took care of Diamond. Like doing it, too. Mm. Well, by the way, what goes with you and Clinton? Oh, honey, we had a common interest. Oh. Books, dearie, books. Hmm. He had one I wanted. <laughs> when I finished with him, I could have walked out with the furniture. Yeah, I guess you could, baby. I guess you could. Think so? Why not? Uh, what did you say your name was? Well, the name's Appleknocker, Harold Appleknocker. Well, that's not what you said before. Oh, so you have been listening. The real name is Diamond, Richard Diamond. <laughs> I see a kidder, huh? Well, if that makes you laugh, this ought to bring back Marjong. Here, take a look at my license. Huh? My membership card, the Hopalong Cassidy Club, my Flash Gordon beanie. You dirty shamus, you stinking cop. Easy, baby. Let go, easy, baby. Easy. Let go, you dirty. Easy. Let go, Simon. Chris! Chris! Jackpot. Chris and Elaine all at once. Simon, get your hands off her. Get them off. No. That's better. Huh? Now, Elaine, before I fill him full of holes, huh? tell me what he's doing here. He, he said you sent him, Chris. Sure, he would. Elaine, you ready to get out of here? Yeah. Okay, hand me a cushion from the sofa. Okay. Gonna take a nap, Chris? I'll laugh at your funeral, Shamus. Hold a cushion over the gun. Nobody hears the shot. Better not, Chris. Elaine, start out. I'll be right behind you. Yeah, all right, Chris. Got the book? Yeah. What book? Shut up. Get going, Elaine. Chris, uh, let's talk this over. Funny, you just finished talking, Diamond. Chris! Elaine, what's Elaine, Give me my book. Give it to me! Clinton! Clinton, duck. Get out of the way. Diamond, you... Get... Oh, Chris! Well, I... I owed him that partner's hair. All right, Elaine. Just creased. I wouldn't think of depriving the hot seat of such a good customer. My book. Where's my book? I want it. Give me my book. Give sure, me... sure, sure, Mr. Clinton. But I'm afraid you'll have to explain to the police first. A telephone call to the 5th Precinct brought Walt and Otis to my rescue. Otis used the siren. Loved it. I told Walt the book old man Clanton kept screaming about had me a little confused and that I wouldn't be able to relax until he found out just where it fitted in the case. He promised to find out the answers as soon as he took Chris, Elaine, and Clanton back to the 5th Precinct. 
I told him to call me at Helen's. Rick, what about that check for $1,000? Is it any good? Well, the check's post-dated. I doubt if Mr. Clinton will honor it now. It's too bad. We, we could have celebrated. So all you got for your trouble was 100 a day in expenses. Mm, I'll get it. Grant's tomb, the general speaking. Rick? Yeah, Walt? Yeah, you sitting down? Why? You can tear up that check Clinton gave you. He won't honor it. He's mad about having to go to jail. Oh, I was way ahead of you about the check. Why did Clinton go to jail? What did he do? You know that book he was yelling about? What about it? Well, it's an original Sir Francis Bacon manuscript. How would you know? I hate to admit it, but Otis told me what it was. You know, Otis is a... a, bib, a bib, uh, excuse me, Lieutenant. It's bibliophile. Shut up, Hammerhead. Okay, so I work for nothing. Uh, Rick. Yeah? The book is worth $30,000. It was stolen 18 years ago from the Fine Arts Library in Washington. Old man Clinton bought it from a fence. That's why he couldn't go to the police. Oh, so Chris and Elaine uh, hijacked it, huh? Probably had a sale for it. Yeah, uh, Rick. There's a $1,500 reward for that book. So what? It's yours. Hmm? Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Walt. Helen. Hmm? Put your ear next to the receiver. Oh, all right. Walt, say that again. Say what again? What you just said. Did I say anything? Well, sure you did. Are you sure? Oh, now cut it out, Walt. Say it again about the reward. Oh, that. There's a $1,500 reward for the book. Thanks, Walt. Bye. Bye. Well, baby. Well, we're going to celebrate after all. $1,500. Oh, Rick, that calls for a real celebration. Sure. Well, don't go away, darling. I'll be right back. I won't be long. Oh, uh, Rick, there's a new song on the piano. Why don't you try it? Okay, uh, I said my pajamas and put on my prayers. Well, that's pretty silly, but... Hmm. My baby kissed me goodnight And I am glad to relate That by the time I got home I was feeling great I climbed up the door and opened the stairs I said my pajamas and put on my prayers I turned off the bed, crawled into the light And all because you kissed me good night Next morning I awoke and scrambled my shoes I shined up an egg, then I toasted the news I buttered my tie and took another bite And all because you kissed me Good night By evening I felt normal So we went out again You said good night and kissed me I hurried home and then I climbed up the door and opened the stairs I said my pajamas and put on my prayers I turned off the bed, crawled into the light And all because you kissed me Good night. By evening I felt normal, so we went out again. You said good night and kissed me. I hurried home and then I lifted the preacher, called up the phone, spoke to the dog and threw your maw a bone. It was midnight and yet the sun was shining bright and I think how you kissed me. Oh, that was lovely, Rick. Well, how do I look? Oh, my, my, wonderful. What are you so dressed up for? For the celebration. Oh, that's right, yeah. Come on, let's go. Oh, where are we going, Rick? Oh, the Blue Falcon nightclub. We'll be just in time for the last show. The Blue Falcon? Oh, but why pick that place? Oh, but they've got a wonderful floor show. Yes, but the costumes are... Oh, they're nothing. Oh, what you said. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Ed Begley played Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Francis Robinson, Ted Osborne, Gene Bates, and Paul Dubov. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Today's show was written and directed by Russell Hughes. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. (laughs) 
What's on NBC today? Ezio Pinza, dynamic singing star, plays his first starring dramatic role today on Theater Guild on the Air with Madeline Carroll and Linda Darnell co-starred. And you'll also want to listen to the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show and the Adventures of Sam Spade right before Theater Guild. Don't forget, it's the Opinza on Theater Guild on the air today. It's all great entertainment today on NBC. You're tuned for the stars on NBC. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. Columbia's parade of outstanding thrillers, produced by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. Notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Tonight's story, by the noted American author T.S. Stribling, deals with a crime of murder on an exotic and atmospheric island with ragged beggars who slept in a Hindu temple and awoke with gold in their pockets and a dead girl lying near them and with a strange and mystical entrance into the life of hereafter, which was the experience of an American psychologist. For your suspenseful listening... We invite you to join us for A Passage to Benares. In Porto, Spain, in Trinidad, at half past five in the morning, Mr. Henry Pagioli, an American psychologist, stirred uneasily, became conscious of a splitting headache opened his eyes in bewilderment, and then, with a shock, saw where he was. He got up, arranged his clothing. He tried with his neat psychological mind to recapture his dream, to bottle up again the little smoking wisps that still floated about within his aching head. By seven o'clock, he had found his way back to the house of Mr. Lowe, his host in Port of Spain. Lowe was already about his coffee, with an interested spoon poised above the morning paper. Ah, there you are. Good morning, Bargioli. I say you are quiet. Didn't hear you get up at all. Have some breakfast? Oh, thanks. I have uh, been out for a breath of air. What's the news today? Well, the new governor will arrive in Trinidad on the 12th, and, uh, uh... Hello. Now the natives killed his wife. Tell me, Pajoli, as a psychologist, why do coolies kill their wives? Oh, for various reasons, I imagine. Let's hear some of the facts. Oh, I say this is a coincidence. Really putting on a show for you, Pajoli, on your first visit to Trinidad. How so? Well, you... You remember that wedding procession you and I watched last evening down, yeah. the, down at the Hindu temple? The temple? Oh, of course, the... Cream-colored little bride with the breastplates and the linked gold coins and the anklets and all the finery. Mm -hmm. And the bridegroom. What did you say his name was? Budman Lal? Yes. Well, do you know what's happened? Budman Lal is in jail this morning and his cream-colored little bride is dead with her throat cut. No. Do they think he did it? No doubt of it. That's why he's in jail now. He always seemed like a sensible fellow, too. One of our best patrons. Which only proves my contention, Pajoli. A bridegroom of only six or eight hours killing his wife without any reason at all. Oh, there's usually some reason for murder. Maybe. 
But I say, oh boy, you're, you're missing the point completely. How? Well, suppose you actually had gone and slept in the temple there last night. Mm-hmm. You wanted to, you know, remember? And I said, no white man ever stays all night in a coolie temple. You remember? Yes, I remember. You said it simply isn't done. Well, if... If you had, Pajoli, I say, uh, that would have been a pretty kettle, wouldn't it? Yes. Yes. Well, I'm afraid I'll be mixed up in this. Both Mr. Lal and his uncle, Hira Das, are clients of mine. Old Hira Das has upwards of $5 million in my bank. Hira Das? Didn't you tell me he built that temple where the murder took place? Yes. It's what the Hindus call a temple and rest house. Hira Das gives rice and tea to any traveler who comes in for the night. It's an Indian custom to help mendicant pilgrims. A rich Indian will build a temple and rest house just just as you Americans erect libraries. Ah. What does it say there about the murder, though? Um, Budman Lal, nephew of the famous Mr. Hira Das, was arrested early this morning at his home for the alleged murder of his wife, whom he married yesterday. The body was found at six o'clock this morning in the temple where the wedding ceremony took place. The temple attendants gave the alarm. The victim's head was severed completely from her body and all her jewelry was gone. Five coolie beggars who were asleep in the temple when the body was discovered were arrested. They all claimed ignorance of the crime, but a search of their persons revealed that each beggar had a piece of the bride's jewelry and a coin from her necklace. Mr. Budman Lal and his wife were seen to enter the temple at about 11 last night for the Hindu rite of purification. Mr. Lal, who is a prominent curio dealer, declines to say anything further. Doesn't tell you very much, does it? No, not much. What do you make of those beggars? Oh, that's simple enough. Those devils laid in wait inside the temple until the husband went out and left his wife. Then they murdered her and divided the spoil. Ah, but she had enough bangles and gee jaws to give a dozen to each man. Yes, yes, you're quite right, Pajoli. That's a fact. Why should they continue sleeping in the temple after they'd killed her if they did murder her? Well, why shouldn't they? They knew they'd be suspected and they couldn't get off the island without capture, so they thought they might, might as well lie down again and go back to sleep. Hmm. You may be right, Lowe, but that doesn't look like the solution to me. Well, I'm satisfied that's how it occurred. You mean the beggars killed her? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't think so. I rather fancy that the actual murderer took the girl's jewelry and went about the temple thrusting a bangle and a coin in the pockets of each of the sleeping beggars to lay a false scent. Oh, come now. That, that's laying it on a bit too thick, Pacho. <laughs> My dear Lowe, that's the only possible explanation for the coins in the beggar's pockets. I say, oh boy, Ian, you've had lots of experience in these things. Come along with me and we'll go up and see Mr. Hira Daz and see if we can't help his nephew. I'll be glad to. But we'll go to the temple first. Then we'll call on Mr. Hiradas. Well, here we are. In spite of the police guard at the door, the temple doesn't look sinister in the daylight. Yeah, it just looks dirty. Well, let's go in and question the beggars. Hey, excuse me. Uh, did any of you fellows hear noises in this temple last night? Oh, much sleep, Saeed. No noise. Policeman Pancho's wake this morning makes it still here. What's your name? Shuda Chan, Saeed. When did you go to sleep last night? When I ate rice and tea, Saeed. Mm-hmm. Do you remember seeing Boudman Lal and his wife enter this building last night? Uh, yes, remember, Saib. Did you see them go out? Uh, no, Saib. No one remember go out. You were all asleep then, huh? Yeah, all asleep, yeah, Saib. Did you have any dreams during your sleep? Hear any noises? Uh, I dream bad dreams, Saib. Huh? When policeman punched me awake this morning, I think dream has come true. And me, Saib. Me, too. Me. Did you all have bad dreams? Yes, all oh, have yeah. bad dreams. Look here, Pajoli, I, I, I don't see where this is getting us. I do think we ought to be getting on to old Hara Das's house. No, I think we can now entirely discard the theory that the beggars murdered the girls. On what grounds? They told you nothing except that they all had bad dreams? That's the reason. They all had wild, fantastic dreams. 
That suggests that they were given some sort of opiate in their rice or tea last night. It's quite improbable that five ignorant coolies would have wit enough to concoct such a piece of evidence as that. Mm, that's a fact, but I don't believe a Trinidad court would admit such evidence. We're not looking for legal evidence. We're after some indication of the real criminal. Now I suggest that we get onto the house of Hira Das. Please come in, gentlemen. I've been expecting you. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you. A most mysterious murder in the life of my poor nephew will depend upon your exertions, gentlemen. Tell me, what do you think of the beggars that were found in the temple with the bangles and coins? Well, I'm afraid my judgment of the beggars will disappoint you, Mr. Hiradas. Huh? My theory is that they are innocent of the crime. Really? Why do you say that? Because they told me of dreams they had. And all their dreams were very nearly identical. You are not English, sir. No Englishman would have thought of that. No, I'm American with a backlash sprinkling of, uh, of Italian. My name's Pagioli. What is your profession, Mr. Pagioli? You are a detective? No, Mr. Das. I'm a psychologist. Oh, your soul is at least groping after knowledge. However, it gropes as a blind worm, Mr. Poggioli. And we must find the criminal who committed this crime and thus restore my nephew, Boodman Lal, to liberty. You can imagine what a blow this has been to me after I arranged this marriage for my nephew. You did... Arranged a marriage for a nephew who is in his 30s? Yes, Mr. Poggioli. Mm. I wanted him to avoid the pitfalls into which I fell. Ah, he was unmarried, and he'd already begun to add dollars to dollars. I did the same thing. And now, look at me. An empty old man in a foreign land. What good is this house where men of my own kind can't come and sit with me when I have no grandchildren to romp and play? No. I've piled up dollars and pounds. I, I've eaten the world, Mr. Pajoli, and found it bitter. Now oh, here I am, an outcast. And why don't you go back to India, Mr. Hyradas? Why, Mr. Pajoli, my mind is half English. If I should return to Benares, I'd walk about thinking what the temples cost. How much was the value of the stone set in the eye of Krishna's image? If I would ever be one with my own people again, Mr. Pajoli... I must leave this Western mind and body here in Trinidad. That's um, very interesting and moving, but uh, we were discussing your nephew, Budman Lal. Wait. In searching for the criminal, I would suggest you look for a moneyed man. Let me tell you my suspicions, and you can work out the details. What are they? I went out of the temple this morning to have the body of my poor murdered niece brought here to my villa for burial. I talked to the five beggars, and they told me there was a sixth sleeper in the temple last night. Was there indeed? Yes, Mr. Lowe, a white man. A white man? Yes, Mr. Lowe. All five of the coolies and my man, Buddha, told me it was true. But, Mr. Hiradas, decapitation is not an American mode of murder. American? I... I was speaking generally. I mean a white man's method of murder. Uh, that is indicative in itself. I meant to call your attention to that point. It shows the white man was a highly educated man who had studied the mental habits of other peoples than his own. So he was enabled to give the crime an extraordinary resemblance to a Hindu crime. But what motive could a white man have? Possibly robbery, Mr. Pajoli. Or if he were a very intellectual man, he might have murdered the poor child by uh, way of experiment. A murder for experiment? Yes, Mr. Lowe. 
to record the psychological reaction. Why? I can't entertain such a theory as that, Mr. Harrida. Oh, no. It is too far-fetched. However, it is worth investigating, is it not? Yes, yes, but I'll begin my investigations with the man Guka. By all means, Mr. Poggioli. And in your investigations, gentlemen, hire any assistance you may need. Draw on me for any amount. I want my nephew exonerated, and above all things... I want the real criminal apprehended and brought to the gallows. Well, what do you think of that, Pajoli? White man in that temple. Ah. Sounds like pure fiction to me, to, to shield Bob and Lau. You know, these fellows hang together like thieves. Say, it's a jolly good thing we didn't decide to sleep in the temple last night, isn't it? You know, in my opinion, Lo, the actual criminal is Boodman Lau. Uh, same here. I've thought so ever since I first saw the account in the paper. Somehow these fellows will chop their wives to pieces for no reason at all. Well, what do you know about Boodman Lau? Well, he, he was born here and has always been a figure because of his rich uncle. Lived here all his life? Uh huh. Except when he was in Oxford for six years. Oh, he was an Oxford man. Huh? Yes, yes. Uh, there you are. That's the trouble. I don't understand. What do you mean, Pajoli? And no doubt he fell in love with some English girl, but when old Hira Das chose a Hindu child for his wife, Budman couldn't refuse marriage. No man's going to quarrel with a $5 million legacy. And then he chose this ghastly method of getting rid of the child bride. Uh, I dare say you're right. I feel sure Bowman Lyle killed the girl. George, I'm getting tired of walking. There's a cab. Let's hop it and ride the rest of the way. Hi, cabby. A cab. I see. Oh, hi. Well, aren't you coming? You know, I don't feel that I can conscientiously continue this investigation trying to clear a person whom I have every reason to believe guilty. But, man, don't leave me like this. At least come as far as police headquarters with me and explain your theory about Guga, the temple keeper, and the rice. Well, I... I thought I'd go back to your cottage and pack my things. Pack your things? Well, your boat doesn't sail until Friday. Yes, I know, but there's a daily service to Curacao. It struck me to go there. Oh, but... no. Come, you can't run off like that just when I've stirred up an interesting murder mystery for you to unravel. Why, well, Jolie, you ought to appreciate my efforts as a host more than that. Well, all right, then. To the police station. Yes, sir. Hunter, Chief Vickers, uh, this is my friend, Mr. Pajoli. Mr. Pajoli, Mr. Vickers is chief of Trinidad's police force. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, chief Vickers, I've, um, I've asked Mr. Pajoli's counsel in the Budman Lal murder case. And he's already developed a theory as to... Who is the actual murderer of Mrs. Budman Lal? So have I. Now, in this matter, Chief Vickers, I want to be perfectly frank with you. I'll admit we're in this case in the employ of Mr. Hiradas and are making an effort to clear his nephew, Budman Lal. We felt confident you'd use the skill of the police department of Port of Spain to work out a theory clearing Budman Lal just as readily as you would to convict him. Our department usually devotes its time to conviction and not to clearing criminals. Yes, yes, I, I know that. But if our theory will point out the actual murderer... What is your theory? Mr. Poggioli's deduction is based on the dreams of the men who were found in the temple. So Mr. Poggioli's deduction is based on dreams. It would be a remarkable coincidence, Mr. Vickers, if five men had lurid dreams simultaneously without some physical cause. It suggests strongly that their tea or rice was doped. Now, if you find out what soporific was used, then have your men search the sales record of the drugstores in the city to see who has lately bought such a drug. You will find the murderer. Uh-huh. How do you like Trinidad, Mr. Pajoli? I'd like it very much indeed. You've just arrived, haven't you? Yes. In uh, what university do you teach back in the States? Ohio State. A chair of criminal psychology in an ordinary state university? I'm not a professor. I'm simply a docent, and I haven't specialized on criminal psychology. I, I quiz on general psychology. You're not teaching now? 
No, this is my sabbatical year. You look young to have taught in the university six years, but then you Americans start young in your land of specialists. Now, are you, uh, Mr. Poggioli, I suppose you're wrapped up heart and soul in your psychology. I am. You'd uh, do anything in the world to advance yourself in the science. I rather think so. Especially keen on original research work. Ah, <laughs> that's what he is, Chief Vickers. Do you know what he asked me to do yesterday afternoon? No, what, Mr. Lowe? Oh, I don't think we ought to burden Mr. Vickers with our household anecdotes. Oh, but I'm really curious. Just what did Mr. Poggioli ask you to do yesterday afternoon, Mr. Lowe? Oh, well, really nothing, nothing at all. It was just a little psychological experiment he wanted to do. And did he do it? Oh, no, 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 I wouldn't hear of it. Oh, as uh, unconventional as that? Oh, it was really nothing, nothing at all. I think I could guess your anecdote if I tried, gentlemen. About a half an hour ago, I received a telephone message from my man stationed at the temple to keep a lookout for you and Mr. Pargioli. A lookout for us? Yes, because one of the coolies under arrest told him that Mr. Pargioli slept in the temple last night. Oh, but that's not true. That's exactly what he didn't do. He suggested it to me, but I said no. You remember, Pargioli, you... You didn't do it. Did you, Pargioli? Did you? You see, he did. Gentlemen, I I had a perfectly valid and important reason for sleeping in the temple last night, and so I, I can only ask your sympathetic attention to what I'm about to say. Go on. You remember, Lowe, you and I were down there watching a wedding procession. Well, just as the music stopped and the procession entered the building, suddenly it seemed to me as if... as if they'd vanished. Naturally, they'd gone into the building. Oh, no, no, I don't mean that. I'm afraid you won't understand what I do mean. That the whole procession had ceased to exist, melted into a nothingness. You see, that's really the idea in which the Hindus base their notion of heaven, oblivion, nothing. Yes, I've heard that before. Well, our medieval Gothic architecture was the conception of our Western heaven, and I thought perhaps the Indian architecture had somehow caught the motif of the Indian religion, you know, suggested nir- nirvana. That's what amazed and intrigued me. That's why I wanted to sleep in the place. I wanted to see if I could further my shred of impression. Does that make any sense to you, Mr. Vickers? We are not interested why you went, Mr. Poggioli. We know a murder took place in the temple. You, you don't... You can't think that I committed a horrible murder as an experiment. You intellectual chaps do some pretty weird things, Mr. Poggioli. Why, only the other day I was reading about two young oh, intellectuals. Yes, these fellows I read about also tried to turn an honest penny by their murder. I don't suppose you happened to notice yesterday that the little bride, Maila Ran, was almost covered with gold bangles and coins? Of course I noticed it. But I had nothing whatever to do with her. I I, I did sleep in the temple. By the way, you say you slept on a rug just as the coolies did. Yes, I did. And you didn't wake up either, Mr. Pajola? No, no. Then did the child's murderer happen to put a coin and a bangle in your pockets just as he did the other sleepers in the temple? I don't know. I... I haven't looked in my pocket since then. Then please do so now, Mr. Poggioli. Oh, yes. Here they are, Mr. Vickers. You don't happen to have any more, do you? No. I've already been through all my pockets and I haven't any more. Well, that's something. Of course, you might have expected just such a questioning as this and provided yourself with these two pieces of gold, but I doubt it. Somehow, I don't believe that you're an experienced enough man to think of such a thing. However, we shall see. I suppose you have no objection, Mr. Pajoli, to my accompanying you over to have a little search of your baggage in Mr. Lowe's cottage. Now then, Mr. Pajoli, be so kind as to open your trunk. Mm-hmm. Just as I thought. A trunk tray full of bangles and coins. I'll say one thing for you, though, Mr. Pajoli. Your nerve almost got you by. But you... You can't believe that I did it. Well, you don't believe I did this, do you? I... I, I don't. In your trunk, Pajoli. If I did it, I was sleepwalking. Got to think that it's possible that right here in my own... Well, we might as well start back, I suppose. This is all. I'll I'll go back with you, Pajoli. I'll see you through. Somehow I can't... I I won't believe you did it. Thanks. Thanks. 
You know, Pajoli, you set out to clear Boatman Lal and, well, dash it all, it looks as if you had. No, he didn't. Boatman Lal was out of jail at least an hour before you fellows came into police headquarters to see me. Out? You mean that you turned him loose? Yes. How's that, Chief Vickers? Because, Mr. Lowe, he didn't go to the temple at all with his wife last night. He went down to Queen's Park Hotel and played billiards till one o'clock. He called up a few friends and proved that easily enough. My word, that, that leaves nobody but... Yes, Pagioli. I don't know anything about it. If I did commit the murder, I was asleep. I don't know anything about it, that's all I can say. I don't know anything about it. Perhaps a rest in jail will help restore your memory. Well, we'll see. Come now, Pagioli, old man. Don't be too downhearted. I promise you, I'll do everything I can. In the case against Henry Pajola, having been duly tried by a jury of your peers, you have been found guilty and by the powers invested in me, I herewith sentence you to be hanged by the neck until you are dead. To recall a lost dream is the most tantalizing task ever a human brain was driven to. But if I lie still long enough on this bunk, perhaps I can recapture the dream I had in the temple last night. Yes. Yes. It seems to me that the image on the altar moved, and suddenly the dome overhead was opened and left me staring upward into a vast abyss, where I was alone in endless space, where all creatures and all matter that had ever been or ever would be were wrapped up in me, Parcioli. That was my dream. That's an odd thing. Six men dreaming the same dream in different terms. There must be a physical cause for such a phenomenon. Cause! I've got it! Vickers! Flo! I have it! I've solved it! Get me out of here! I know who killed the girl! What is it, my friend? I know who murdered the bride. Old Hira Dust did it. Now listen. Listen. Go tell Vickers to take the gold he found in my trunk and develop all the fingerprints on it. He'll find Hira Dust's prints. Also tell him to follow out that opiate clue I gave him. He'll find Hira Dust and a man to put the gold in my trunk. See if they don't find brass or steel filings in my room where the scoundrel sat and filed a new key. But they've already done that long ago. They have. But certainly. And old Hyradas confessed everything. Though why a rich old man like him should have murdered a pretty child is more than I can see. But why did he pick on me as a scapegoat? Oh, he explained that to the police. He said he picked on a white man so the police would make a thorough investigation and be sure to catch him. He did? Aye. But what I can't see is why the old boy wanted to be caught and hanged. Why didn't he commit suicide? Why? I know why. Because according to his religion, in that case his soul would have returned in the form of some beast. He wanted to be slain because he expect to, expects to be reborn instantly in Benares with little Maela Ran as his bride instead of his nephews. He hopes to be a great man with wife and children. All the things he was not here in Trinidad. Yes, yes, you must be right. Why didn't you come and tell me about Hiradas' confession the moment it occurred? What do you mean keeping me here when you know I'm an innocent man? Why didn't you tell me before this? Because I couldn't. Old Hiradas didn't confess until a month and ten days after you were hanged. So ends A Passage to Benares, T.S. Stribling's tale of mysterious death and death mysterious. This was tonight's story of 
Suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. John Dietz was our guest director this evening. Tonight's radio drama was written by Carol Case and scored by Bernard Herman. Paul Stewart was Pajoli, Barry Kroger was Mr. Hira Das, and Horace Brehm played Mr. Lowe. Others in the cast were Alan Hewitt and Guy Rep. Next week at this time, Columbia will bring you another selected story from the world's great literature of thrills, another study in suspense. This is Barry Kroger, and this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Stories start many different ways. This one started, strangely enough, with the flame of a match whose feeble glow lit up a lightened face in the darkness. A frightened face, twisted by an agonizing fear of death. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. The night is a thief, some poet once wrote, that steals the colors from the day. It's kind of pretty if you like words, but for my doll, they're not exactly true. Because there are colors at night. The burning red of passion, the angry green of jealousy, and the ugly, terrifying black of fear. This was one of those nights when pickings were slim. I'd cover the town from Henrici's Bar in the Mart, out to Hyler's on the North Shore, and back downtown again with nothing to show for it. I was taking a shortcut through Lincoln Park to pick up my car. At that time of night, the park was pretty deserted, except for this girl walking up ahead of me. Not a bad silhouette, I might add, against the distant light. We were about halfway through the park when suddenly she stopped and threw herself onto a bench at the side of the path. There was something almost desperate about the way she did it. I ran up to her. Mm. Excuse me, are you all right? Yes, I'm all right. Well, I thought maybe you were sick or something. I told you I'm all right. Now, you please let me alone. Oh, now, look, lady, it's not what you think. I, uh, well, this park at this time of night, it's no place for a girl to sit around by herself. I don't need any help. Just go away. Oh, sure, sure, I'll get lost. I can see you're all right. Only you don't mind if I just sit here and smoke a cigarette before I go. It's a public park. I don't care what you do. Thank you. You care for a cigarette? No. Of course, in order to really enjoy a smoke, you've got to have a match first. <laughs> I said in order to enjoy a smoke, you've got I to... heard you. Here. Thank you. Here. Keep the book. No, no, you better hang on to these. I won't need them. Well, you might need them later tonight. After tonight, I won't need anything. Oh, now, wait a minute. That's no way to talk. The only time you're not going to need anything, sister, is after you're dead. Why did you say that? What? That about being dead. For no reason. Why? Because after tonight, I will be. The girl jumped up and started running. Here was a kid that was afraid. Afraid of death or afraid of life. But then, isn't everybody? I turned the matchbook over and looked at the ad on the cover. Penguin Club. A little all-night jump and jive place over on Clark Street. That's one I've been missing lately. On a hunch, I ambled up North Avenue in that general direction, turned up Clark a ways, and there it was. It was good to get inside out of that wind. Check your hat and coat, mister? No, thanks. I'm just looking around. Can I get your table? It's almost the end of the floor, sure. Well, anywhere in the back will be all right. Okay. The hat check girl, hostess or whatever she was, walked me through the bar to the edge of the main room. And then I stopped and really did a take. 
Out in the middle of the dance floor, under a little baby spot, singing in front of a five-piece band, was Little Miss Desperate from the park. Nice voice, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. Who is she? What is Fanny? Fran Fowler. Have you been in here before? Not for quite a few months. Of course, she hadn't got much experience yet. From out of town, hmm? Someplace over in Wisconsin. Not bad looking, huh? Mm. In everything. Hey, what's wrong with her? She, I don't know. I can't. Well, how do you like that? Come on, folks, come on. Let's give the little girl a great big hand. Nothing like a real sad tone to light up a real sad act. Especially for a real sad tomato like tomato. <laughs> Hey, guys and girls, get over here. Hiya, Peggy, you got some alive one, huh? Hello, Tommy. <laughs> this is Tommy Mason, ain't he the one? Yes, yes, he's quite the one, all right. Gee, Tommy, you, you sure covered up for Franny, all right. Never let down. Keep him going all the time. That's show business. You know how it is, mister. Oh, yes, yes, I've heard. The show must go on. It's a new thing. Uh, you yeah. gotta keep him laughing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, the time. What a joker. Now, look, about that girl. Franny? Yeah, Franny. What seems to be the trouble? Well, that's hard to say, pal. Maybe she just found out she ain't no dinosaur. And she sure ain't. Tommy, <laughs> you killed me. Now, seriously, fella. <laughs> fella, why would a girl break up that way in the middle of a number and start to cry? Ah, uh, could be she got a cinder in her eye. But just to make sure, I'll go ask her. See you later, Tommy. Come on, fella. How's about buying a girl a drink? Oh, sure, sure, in a minute. Um, about this Franny. Look, do we have to talk about her? I, I thought you came in here for some fun. Maybe I get my fun wondering about people. What time's an explore show? Next one's at two, then four. Oh, they're not kidding about this all night business. And still another one at daylight. She's singing all of them? How should I know? She missed most of the 12 o'clock show. Just got here for that last number. Any idea where she lives? The Lumen House around on Erie Street. Know the number? 391. You know you ask an awful lot of questions. <laughs> well, that's my business. I'm a reporter, Randy Stone. I might have known it. Look, you're, you're not going to bother her tonight, are you? Of all nights? Tonight? This is the night that Charlie Dane is being executed down at Joliet. What's that got to do with her? Well, how would you feel? Look, Mr. Stone, she's human. This is the night her boyfriend's going to die. <laughs> I went up to the front of the bar to a phone booth and called the paper. There was something about this in the back of my mind somewhere. Something I ought to remember but couldn't. I had the girl on the board put me through to Gabby in the library. Library? Oh, hello, Gabby. This is Randy. Yeah, Randy? Uh, what have you got on the Charlie Dana case? Still a little early, Randy. Execution's not set until 1.30. No, no. I mean old stuff. Good. Anything on a girl named Fran Fowler? Yeah, let's see. Charlie Dana, small-time gambler, killed a guy named Tonelli. Oh, yes, yes. I remember that. A gambling beef. Execution originally set for November, but he got a couple of months to stay. Oh, here she is, Fran Fowler. Singer in a nightclub was supposed to be his alibi, but the DA blew her up in the witness stand. She admitted she wasn't positive, but when she'd been out with the guy... Oh, yeah, yeah, that was it. I knew it was something. Anything more? Oh, details, Randy, details. Okay, Gabby, thanks. I'll catch up with you. Oh, Mason. Excuse me, were you waiting to use the phone? Uh, no, I was uh, waiting to talk to you. Why, certainly, but this time, no jokes, if you don't mind. I'm expecting a headache. <laughs> You're not funny, Stone. Who are you talking to? Well, isn't that uh, kind of my business? Uh, Peggy says you're a reporter. Yes, of a sort. You were asking about Fran, where she lived? That's right. You've got to let her alone, see? you printed enough about her. Uh, just a minute, Mason. Those are my lapels that you're hanging on to. Peggy shouldn't have given you Fran's address. I don't want you bothering her. I said let go of my lapels, funny man, or something's liable to explode in your face. <laughs> now, you stay out of my way or I'll ruffle that shiny hair. Where are you going? See about a cinder in a lady's eye. You're not going to see her. I won't let you. Can't you see this whole thing's driving her crazy? Tommy, believe me, I'm not interested in harming her or anyone. I'm just a guy trying to do a job. Now, if you'll step out of my way... You're please. not going there. I won't let you. I won't let Tommy, you. Tommy, did you ask for him? My, my, that's a real nervous fellow. Now that he'd made such an issue out of it, going around to see Fran Fowler was a definite must on my schedule. 
I picked up my car and drove over to Erie Street. 391 wasn't much different from any of the rest of the rooming houses on the block. I got the number of her room from the mailbox and started down the dingy corridor to room eight. I knocked at the door, but there was no answer. I knocked again, and then I smelled gas. Hey, anyone in there? Miss Paula! Friend! I put my shoulder to the door, and the flimsy lock snapped open. I rushed into the gas-filled room, holding my breath until I could smash open the window and let in some air. And then I saw Fran Fowler, the girl from the park, lying across the bed. And on the table beside her, one of those two burner gas stoves with both jets wide open. I turned them off and started shaking the girl. Miss Fowler, Franny, come on, get up. you got to get out of here. How come I'm going to have to carry you? Put me down. You little fool, this room is filled with gas. It's not my purse. Where? On the table. <laughs> Okay, I've got it. Oh. Fine thing with a gun in it. Give that to me. Outside, baby, outside. It was six seconds flat when we hit the sidewalk in the fresh air. I put Fran in the front seat of my car and then ran around and climbed in behind the wheel. I headed out to Sheridan Road along the lake. The cool, clean air felt good in my lungs and I could see Fran drinking it in, realizing now how close she'd been. I didn't make her talk until we were a long way out of town. And I pulled over to the beach side of the road and killed my motor. We, uh, seem to keep bumping into each other in the strangest places tonight. I... I guess I should say thanks. No, no, not at all. I'm the one who should say thanks. I still haven't returned your matches. Please don't make fun of me. No, I'm not. You see, I know now who you are. Charlie Dana's girl. Why don't you say it? In my book, you're just a kid on that in the park. What time is it? It's quarter to two. Then... Yes, it's probably all over by now. Like me to turn on the radio and... No. No, I don't want to hear about it. You must love him an awful lot. Love him? I despise him. Just... But still you were willing to alibi for him on a murder charge? I wasn't, I... I told him I wasn't sure of the time I was out with him, but he made me say it was the exact hour when the man was killed. Didn't you realize you might have been perjuring yourself? I didn't lie. I just didn't remember. It might have been like he said. When you're not sure, what else can you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How'd you happen to get mixed up with him? I I didn't know anybody when I first came here. I was lonesome. And he was nice to you? He was. A lot more decent than most of the men who want to take you out when you're working in a club. And why do you hate him now? I didn't know what he did, and a lot of people gamble. I didn't think too much about it. Then we got to going out evenings, doing shows at the club, on my nights off. And the killing happened when you and he were supposed to have been out someplace together? That's what he said. He wasn't arrested until a few weeks after the... the trouble. I couldn't remember if I'd been with him during that particular time or not. Well, it's all over now. You did what you had to. That's about all any of us can do. But you got to forget about it. Put it out of your mind. There's nothing more to worry about. Oh, that's just it. You don't understand. There is. What are you talking about? He promised. He promised, and I know he'll keep his promise. Promised what? I, I want to see him in prison. In the death house? I had to. I wanted him to understand, but he said I tricked him. What, by telling the truth on the witness stand? He said I double-crossed him. But now he, he didn't care. Why would he say that? He said he didn't care because the night he died, I would die. And I'm afraid. You are listening to Nightbeat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Brandy Stone. This was real. This was no act. The sound she made it tear you to pieces, like some pitifully frightened animal who'd lost everything in the world. I let her cry it out. After all those months of strain, she'd have to get it out of her system. He said the night he died, I died. Sure, sure. So you were scared. Who wouldn't be? But don't you see, that's just a cruel boast made by a cheap hoodlum who's trying to hurt you, make you feel responsible for his own plight. But he meant it, I know he did. Well, maybe he did at the time, but you've got nothing to worry about now. You had nothing to do with it. 
He paid for his own crime. Now he's dead. And you're still alive. He'll keep his promise. How can he? He's dead. I, I, I know you think I'm crazy. No, 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 no. But has anyone really tried to harm you? Oh, but this... This wasn't the night he was supposed to... Yes, I know. The execution was originally set for November. It was that night in November. I hadn't been afraid before. I thought it was like you said, because he was bitter. But all that day, I was upset. I, I told him at the club I couldn't work. And late in the afternoon, I got a note from Peggy saying, why didn't I go out to her cabin at the dunes for a couple of days? Nobody would bother me. No reporters, and I, I could get a good rest. So I, I drove out there that evening. It was quiet. Nothing around. Just empty sand dunes and her cabin all alone on the edge of the lake. I... I Oh, Peggy, at the club to let her know I got in all right. Oh, hello, Fran. Where are you calling from? Why, from your place. My apartment? No, your cabin. At the dunes? It was swell of you, Peggy, to let me come out here. Well, of course, Franny. You're, you're welcome to use the place, but I, I don't quite know what you mean. Well, your note this afternoon telling me to come out here. I didn't write you any notes. Oh. Come on, Peggy, you did. You even told me where the key would be, under the flower pot. But, kid, that's where we always keep it. Everybody knows that. Peggy, I... I... Now, don't worry about it, kid. One of the girls probably sent you the note and just hasn't had a chance to tell me about it yet. I should have thought of it myself no, in the first place. No, wait, Peggy. I'm scared. Well, what in the world else? You remember what I told you about what... what Charlie said the last time I saw him? Prisoner? It was about tonight that he said... When he died, cut I... It. Franny, now cut it before you drive yourself Peggy, back. I'm all alone and I'm scared. I don't know what to do. Franny, you've got to hang up right away. You shouldn't be out there all alone tonight. Get in your car and come back to town as fast as you can. I'll, I'll wait for you here. All right, Peggy. All right. I hung up the phone and ran out of the house to my car. I turned on the ignition key and stepped on the starter. It wouldn't start. My car wouldn't start. I looked at the gas gauge. Empty. Somebody had drained the gas out of my car. I got out in a panic and started toward the highway. But there was a car out there. Parked behind the big sand dune. I turned and ran back to the house. It was like some crazy, frightening nightmare. I didn't know what I was doing, but somehow I managed to get inside and lock the door. And then suddenly I was at the telephone. Operator? Operator, answer me. Operator, you've got to answer. I want the police. Operator, please help me. Someone. Operator! It was no use. The line was dead. While I was outside, someone had pulled the wires away from the wall. Crawled over to the window. Looked out to the highway. There was a car out there. Its lights were on. But as I looked, they went out. And now, I was alone. In the dark. With him out there. When I came to, it was morning, and, and Peggy was there. She and Tommy had driven out after the club closed to, to find me. But you see, you didn't die that night. But neither did he. Could have been your imagination, you know, this man in the car. No, no, no. The news about the day of execution was on the radio. The men in the car must have heard it and gone away. Did you call the police? They didn't believe me. Just because I'm a nightclub singer, they said I was trying to get publicity. How about the car not starting and the telephone being dead? According to them, my car was just out of gas, and I must have pulled the telephone wires off the wall myself. In the panic you were in, you could have. But I didn't. I tell you, I didn't. All right, all right. Anyway, it's tonight that we're concerned with. I don't know what to do. I... I just don't know what to do. Well, if it's true, this fear you have, you've got to find it out tonight. If you don't, it'll haunt you the rest of your life. Oh, I know, I know, but how? You've got to go back to your room. Oh, no, I'm afraid. I'll be with you. Still got your gun, remember? By the way, what were you going to do with that? I... I didn't have the nerve to use it, even on myself. Well, if anything is going to happen, it'll happen tonight. Not tomorrow or any time after that, but tonight. We'll go back to your place now and wait until it's daylight.
I drove Fran back to the rooming house on Erie Street. There were no lights on anywhere in the building. We tiptoed down the empty corridor to Fran's room, listened at the door a minute, and went in. The door closed all right, but it wouldn't lock. I must have sprung it when I forced the door. We settled down and waited. For what? Once I thought I heard steps on the sidewalk far out front. It was that still. And then I did hear steps, slowly coming down the hall. There's someone... in the hall. Keep it down. He stopped outside the door. Don't move. Go ahead, kid. Go ahead. You got it coming. I, I'm sorry. I'm all right. No. Nothing to be sorry about. I was kind of scared myself. It's a funny thing about fear. It's catching. Look out the window. I, it's almost light. And this all night has gone for good. You see? It was all in your mind. Things you were frightened of. It was nothing, really. You won't be afraid if I go now. No. I've caused you an awful lot of trouble. Oh, now you cut the hell or you'll get me going. And the kids at the club, I guess I should go back there and let them know I'm all right. What the doctor ordered for you is a little shut eye. I'll stop by on my way and give them a word. Good night. Good night. Oh. Here's your gun. You might want to pawn it for a couple of pair of nylons. Yes, a real nice tomato-type tomato, as the funny man at the club would say. On the way over, I got thinking about him and that girl, Peggy. Come to think of it, that was one point Fran had forgotten to clear up for me about the note that sent her out to Peggy's cabin at the dunes that night. Yeah, my mind wouldn't let go of that. When I got to the club, it was daylight, and they were folding up the joint, and Peggy was sitting alone at the bar. Well... You got a nerve coming back here after... How's your boyfriend? He's not my boyfriend. It's a figure of speech. Where is he? He just left. Okay, I'll settle for you. If you don't mind, it's a little late for small talk, mister. Okay, I'll give it to you fast. It's about that note you wrote to Fran Fowler last November on the night Charlie Dana was supposed to die. What note? <laughs> a little late for small talk, remember? I don't know what you're talking about. You don't know anything about a note inviting Fran to stay out at your place at the dunes? I told her. I didn't know who wrote it. Were you telling the truth? Yes. Yes, I was. Okay, okay. Maybe you were. But you found out later who wrote it, didn't you? No, I... Now, tell me the truth. Or would you rather tell the police? All right. I did find out, but it wasn't like you think. Well, who was it? Tommy. Tommy Mason. Tommy Mason? The funny man? His idea of a joke, no doubt. A hilarious joke that might have scared a poor kid to death. No, no, you're wrong. It wasn't a joke. Well, then why? Why did he do it? Because he's in love with her. He made me swear I wouldn't tell her. He, he wanted to wait until the time when she needed him, and, and then he'd tell her himself. Until she needed him? That's How was he going to make her need him? Use a condemned murderer's empty threat to frighten her out of her sanity so she'd need him? Is he crazy? He is where Fran's concerned. Where is he? I don't know. He's been like a maniac all night since you left here. After every show, he's gone over to Fran's place looking for her. He's crazy jealous. Jealous? Of whom? Of you. He thought she was with you. But what if she were? This was the night. This was the night he was sure she would need him, and instead she turned to you. Don't you see? Yes, I do now. Thanks. It was only about a half mile to France, but it seemed more like 20 miles until I turned off Clark up Erie Street and slammed into the curb. There was no one on the street. I was hoping he'd walk, and I'd pass him on the way, but there was no one. I ran down the narrow hall, not daring to think what I'd find, and I flung open the door. Are you alone? Well, you... You're frightened. Are you alone? Well, yes, I've been sitting here since you left. I'm too tired to undress. Come on, let's get out of here. Grab your coat. But never where... mind, never mind, never mind. I'll tell you on the way. I shoved Fran out the door and we started cautiously back down the hall. 
I got about halfway when I grabbed her arm. The front door was opening slowly, and a man made a dark silhouette against the gray light of the dawn. It was the funny man. The man with the slick, shiny hair and the permanent smile and the fast jokes. Only the smile was gone, and he had a gun in his hand. Keep coming. Keep coming. We started towards him slowly. Tommy. Tommy, it was you. You who were going to kill me. You didn't know. You didn't know that I had a heart, too, just like Charlie Dana did. Tommy, you never told me. You never let me. You didn't need me. You would have laughed at me like you laughed at my jokes. It couldn't have been you at the dunes that night. I followed you out there. And then drove back to the club. No, Tommy, no. You were lonesome, but you didn't need me. You needed Charlie Dana. I thought if you were afraid, you'd need me. And then you were afraid, but still you didn't need me. But I'd make you need me. I'd make you. Step by step, we moved closer. Keep coming. I could see his face twisted with jealousy and hate. His eyes wild, as though a spark might make him explode. And tonight, when you were afraid and should have needed me, you didn't. You turned to him. Tommy, please. But now you need me. Now that I have my finger on this trigger, you need me more than you've ever needed anyone in your life. You need me. You need me, Fanny. You need me. Say it. Say you need me. I, I can't shoot. I can't shoot. He started to shake, and I ran forward to grab his gun. Look out. Drop it. Drop it. It's all right. I've got the gun. I can't. Is he hurt? Not to what he will be. Get up, funny man. No. Don't be too hard on him. He didn't realize. No, no, I... I guess maybe he didn't. It's funny, isn't it? You never really know what's going on in some of the best combed heads. <laughs> Well, that's the way it goes. A little later than usual this morning. The day shift has already moved in and let the night crew wander off to their own private little beds. Well, at least I got to see the sun come up. And here I sit, still trying to make it all add up. But no matter how I figure it, the only answer I get is, you never know about people. <laughs> but bless them, maybe that's why we love them. See that man walking towards you with a smile on his face? What's he smiling about? Or is it just so you won't notice how he's screaming inside? <laughs> Ooh, the trouble with me is I haven't had my coffee yet. Coffee, boy. Night Beat, a dramatic series stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone... Night Beat is edited by Larry Marcus and directed by Warren Lewis. Music by Frank Worth. The part of Fran was played by Joan Banks. Paul Dubov played Tommy. Others in the cast were Georgia Ellis, Ken Christie, and Carol Richards. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Rock Bottom, released by Warner Brothers. Throughout the week, NBC brings you the best adventure mystery dramas on the air. You'll hear action-packed, fast-moving plots to hold your interest right up to the smashing climax on such thrilling programs as Big Town, Mr. District Attorney, The Big Story, and Dragnet, every week on most of these NBC stations. On Dragnet, you'll hear documented cases from the Los Angeles police files. The Big Story brings you true tales from the front pages of America's newspapers. Mr. District Attorney, the champion of the people, takes you through an exciting episode in the conviction of a criminal. And tomorrow night on Big Town, you'll hear crusading editor Steve Wilson crack down on the forces of evil. For the best high-tension dramas, hear NBC's great mystery and adventure programs. Listen next week at this same time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. The stories that come out of the shadows to find their way into Night Beat. Now, 
stay tuned for Brian Donlevy as a soldier of fortune on Dangerous Assignment on NBC. You stupid, bumbling fool. I'm sorry, mister, and no harm done. No harm, you see. I'll very well show you. Hey, Rocky, come over here. Hey, mister, what's the idea of the gun? You will never try that again. Never! Yeah, that goes all around, Buster. Give me that gun. Stop it, sir. Take your hands off of me. Not like get that gun. Yeah. How, how dare you, sir? How dare you? It always happens when customers come waving guns in the tambourine. You saw what he deliberately knocked from my pocket, scattered like chaff on the floor. Diamonds, sir. Diamonds of incredible value. So they're diamonds. Rocky, I was just carrying a tray past this table. I happened to bump into them. Happened indeed. You haven't heard the last of this, sir. Not for one moment. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Yes, Del Monte, the best-like brand of canned fruits and vegetables in the whole wide world, takes you now to the Cafe Tambourine in Cairo, gateway to the ancient east, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against the backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's Rocky Jordan story, Foolproof. They always pick my cafe tambourine. Like the fat guy who had draped his 300 pounds over a chair at a corner table, sipped at a drink, and waited for something. I kept watching because I'd seen him slide a gun under his coat lying on the table, and I didn't like it. When Chris bumped the table going by, a leather pouch hit the floor, and what came pouring out sparkled like a kid's eyes in a candy store. Mr. Fat whipped up with a gun, and it took me a good three seconds to get it away from him. Do you realize, sir? You have no right. I make all the rules in the tambourine, mister. They don't include guns. Honest, Rocky, it was just an accident. To deliberately knock the diamonds from my coat? Just pick them up, whatever they are. Yes. Yes. Here. Uh, I'll help you. Uh, no. No, no, don't touch them. Don't touch them. Uh, have it his way, Chris. Uh, 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 you got them now, mister. You know what to do. Uh, I, I suppose there's no harm done after all. Sure, it's past history. So before there's any more trouble... Wait, sir. Perhaps I should apologize. Nobody's asking it. I'm Mr. Hegeman, Sidney Hegeman. Carrying such valuable gems on my person made me nervous. When they were knocked to the floor, I, I automatically pulled the gun. I didn't mean anything by it. Well, the next time you may automatically pull the trigger, so just move along. But uh, I had an appointment here. Not anymore, you haven't. You give me no choice. About my gun? Now, wait a minute. Won't hurt anybody now. All right, take it and get out. Thank you, sir. Good day. It had all the elements. A fat guy, a gun, and a fistful of diamonds. They were gone, but I figured the forgetting wouldn't come so easy. Things don't happen that way. It took just 15 minutes for more to come. An excited, slim-built fellow with five feet six of nervous blonde clinging to him. They stood looking around like they expected somebody. And I didn't have to guess who. Eddie... Eddie, I don't see him. Take it easy, Marguerite. This is the place. He said the tambourine. Well, yes, I know, but... Hey. It... Hey, you. Some folks call me that. You seen anything of a guy, a big fat guy? Called himself Sidney Hageman? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. He been in here? He's been in and out. Out? That was my idea. But I don't get it. He said to meet him here, it was all set. What was all set? Eddie, don't you no, see it? No, no, no. It's all right, baby. You heard what Hageman said. He wouldn't let us down. He could have changed his mind. Please, let's just go away and forget about it. Sure. Why don't you do that? He's right, Eddie. Don't you see now, it? Now, look, Marguerite. You wouldn't ask me to pass up my big chance, would you? It's the kind of deal I've been waiting for all my life. It'll put us on easy street. Us, Eddie? Of course, baby. You know I'm doing this for you. Well, I just wish I could be sure. Well, just give me a chance, then. All we got to do is sit down and wait for him. Yeah, suit yourselves. Oh, hey, wait. He didn't ask for me. Eddie Gamble? Didn't say a word. Yeah. Well, maybe he'll phone and tell me where to meet him. You'll let me know. Yeah, I'll let you know. Uh, Rocky, come over here a minute. Where's it now, Chris? Behind the bar. I want to show you something. Yeah. Have a look at this. I just found it. One of Hageman's diamonds? Yeah. Must have rolled behind the leg of a chair when fat stuff dropped him. 
Accidentally missed it when he was picking them up. A beauty, ain't it? It looks real enough. Of course it's real. Anybody could tell that. Big one, too. Just like all the rest of them he had. Well, I'll take it, Chris. Oh, uh, keep an eye on that couple at the front table. One diamond could mean enough, but when people start getting dramatic about a whole fistful of them around my place, it's time the police were in on it. So my destination was Captain Sam Sabaya. But along the way, I decided to stop by a little jewelry shop run by the trusted Abu Simbel, just in case. Ah, oh, Effendi Jordan, is he not? Hi, Mr. Simbel. Allah has been gracious. And you? The same. Say, would you mind looking at this for me? A diamond, Effendi? I want to know what you think. Oh, permit me to observe it under the eyeglass. But a moment. What do you see from there? The diamond of great brilliance. And quite perfect for one of such size. Then it's real. Say, a whole bag full like it would bring quite a price, wouldn't you say? Mm-hmm. A very great sum. If uh, you wish me to name a price, I must make further tests. Oh, don't bother for now. Thanks, Mr. Symbol. You would guard it carefully, Effendi. Why so? It has been said that the diamond is but a star sent to Earth to give happiness. Should we not keep it so? Sure. I'll remember that. Well, George, and what brings you to headquarters this time? Maybe nothing, maybe a lot, Sam. <laughs> Must you always prepare me for what you have to say? Come, Jordan. That's about this diamond. It's a real one, too. I had it checked. What about it? A big guy named Hagerman had a whole sack full like this at my cafe this afternoon. He uh, happened to leave this behind. Then you have only to return it to him. I'm wondering, have there been any big diamond thefts lately? No, none that has been reported. Just the same, you better look up, Hagerman. Why, Jordan? You must know that diamonds are not uncommon in Africa and surely not in Cairo. What do you expect me to do? Nothing you don't want to do, Sam. If you wish to leave the stone for lost and found... No, no, no. If Hagerman comes back, I'll give it to him. It was just a hunch. (laughs) Jordan, be patient. You never need search for trouble. It will find you. Sam's advice made some sense, and I went back to the tambourine. Chris was switching on the front lights when I got there. Hagerman wasn't around, and neither was Eddie Gamble now. Only the girl still seated at the front table. She turned quickly as I came in, then looked disappointed. Oh, what happened to the boyfriend, Marguerite? Why, uh, he wanted me to wait. For what? Where is he? Well, Mr. Hagerman phoned shortly after you left to arrange a new meeting place. Where? Oh, I don't know. Eddie talked to him. Sure. This time he wanted you to stay here, out of the way, so you wouldn't queer the deal. Eddie knows how I feel. Marguerite, Hagerman has it set up to sell Eddie something, right? Why, A lot of diamonds, like this one here. Mr. Jordan, how did you find out? All sorts of ways. But this one isn't... Don't worry about it. Hagerman has plenty left. How much is Eddie paying? A hundred thousand, maybe? Well, he wouldn't want me to say. Fifty thousand? Well, much less than they're actually worth. You know, people don't deal in diamonds this way unless there's something wrong. Of course, but what can I do... Ever since the deal started, Eddie's thought and talked about nothing else. I can't reason with him. Sure. It happens to people. Yes, greed can change a person so much. Oh, Chris. Yeah, Rock? Eddie Gamble got a phone call a while ago. Did you hear any of it? How could I help it here? All about a fistful of diamonds. At a good price, he kept saying. Did you get where he was going, Chris? Sure, the Dervish Bar. You know, that joint down in the Nile toward Bullock. Ah. Come on, Marguerite. I think we'd better join them. Hmm. I locked the jewel carefully away in my office safe, and then we were driving for the Dervish Bar. It took a half hour to make it through the dark streets, and we got there just too late. Sidney Hagerman was in front at the curb, squeezing himself into a taxi that was off and gone. So it looked like the deal was finished, and we were sure of it when we saw Eddie Gamble standing under a dim streetlight a little way down, jostling a leather pouch in his hand. We were too late again as two natives with gleaming knives swung toward him out of the shadows. Eddie! Eddie, look out! Fought back without a chance. We kept running, but before we got there, the natives suddenly turned and vanished. Only one of the knives was still there. Eddie, Eddie, darling. Very easy with him. Oh, what's happened to you? Mark, Mar- Marguerite, they didn't get the diamonds. 
They try. I don't care, darling. It's you. It's you. Here. Take, take them. I... Huh. Eddie! Oh. Why didn't he listen to me? You'd better come away, Marguerite. Give me the pot. No. Give it to me. Come on. No, nobody will ever have them. What do you mean? These awful diamonds caused Eddie's death. They're to blame for everything. Nobody will ever have them. Marguerite, wait. Come back. She kept going wildly right toward the bank of the Nile. And she didn't stop till she was at the water's edge. Before I could stop her, she tore open the pouch and threw the jewels out over the water. Scattered pinpoints of fire that disappeared into the black, swirling river. Del Monte Foods is presenting tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Friends, I know most of you like tomato juice. Maybe you like it with a squeeze of lemon or a dash of Worcestershire sauce. But the first time you try Del Monte tomato juice, try it just as is. And I think you'll get the surprise of your life. I know I did. I just didn't think it was possible for a tomato juice to be so fresh tasting and natural tasting. Really, Del Monte is a remarkably good tomato juice, friends. Just notice the fragrance when you pour it. If anything ever reminded you of a plump, juicy, fresh tomato picked fully ripe off the vine, that's it. You simply can't mistake that Del Monte presses this juice from the finest tomatoes. And they've packed it so fast and under such close quality control that what they've delivered in the way of rich, tangy, natural flavor is something very special. Why, it's so refreshing. My family drinks tomato juice between meals now. And think how good it is for them. Yes, if you like the flavor of fresh, ripe tomatoes, friends, you ought to be drinking Del Monte tomato juice. Get several cans at your grocer's tomorrow. And now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's Rocky Jordan story, Foolproof. The jewels were gone now, somewhere in the mud at the bottom of the Nile. All I could do was call Sam Sabaya to pick up the late Eddie Gamble. We got Marguerite to her hotel. She was in no shape to talk about anything just then, so we called her tonight. I was sure there was something more here than an attempted robbery murder by a couple of Arabs. But it wasn't until the next evening that Sam buzzed me to come to headquarters. Marguerite was there. We went over what had happened, but I could tell Sam had something else in his mind. Jordan, you are sure you could not identify Eddie Gamble's assailants? No, Sam. They look like any of a thousand others. And you, Marguerite? I'm afraid not, Captain. It was so dark. Everything happened so quickly. Hmm. Nonetheless, we will make every effort to find them. Doesn't matter now. If I only could have stopped Eddie before... Yes, yes, I know. Most regrettable. All just for a handful of diamonds. How could we think it was worth it? Who can answer? It is written that avarice is the brother of misery. Well, that seems to be all. And what about Hageman, Sam? He was in on the beginning. Kindly keep me advised of your whereabouts, Marguerite. I may wish to see you again. I'll be at my hotel. Goodbye, Captain. Mr. George. Good day. Goodbye, Marguerite. Sam, don't tell me this is all. Most certainly not, Jordan. Now come with me. I followed Sam out and we got into his limousine. He likes a waiting game, so I held up the questions as we drove across to the Azbikia sector. We pulled up in front of a big mansion, half Egyptian style, with a few columns thrown in for the right effect. A servant let us in, and Sam asked for Mr. Claude Morgan. The name was familiar. A wealthy member of the British crowd. He came down right away. Captain Sabaya, it's very kind of you to give my call your personal attention. A valuable diamond theft demands my attention, Mr. Morgan. Diamond theft, Sam? Uh, uh, this is Mr. Jordan. A pleasure, Mr. Jordan. Hey. If you'll step into the library. Please be seated. Thank you. Now, Mr. Morgan, if you will tell us exactly what happened. May I explain that I've been on a business trip to Italy. When I got back, the diamonds were gone from my wall safe. Would you have any idea when the theft occurred? No, Captain. I was away for almost a month, returning only yesterday. I did not discover the theft until this afternoon, when I called you. It begins to look like my hunch was right, Sam. As you say, Jordan. 
I was not aware of this when you talked to me yesterday. I do not understand, Captain. A man known to have a large number of diamonds on his person was in Mr. Jordan's cafe yesterday, a very fat man named Hagerman. Hagerman? Then you know of him? Why, yes, I've had some association with him. Like I, I said, don't... Sam, find him. I shall, Jordan. But the perplexing problem remains that of the evidence. We know that he had some jewels, but how can one say that they were from Mr. Morgan's safe? Yeah, I see what you mean. The jewels are now lost at the bottom of the Nile River. But that's incredible. If what you say is true... Hey, wait, the... Sam. They're all gone except one. Still in my office safe. Oh, yes, of course. I'd quite forgotten. Say, Mr. Morgan, could you tell if the diamond I have is one of yours? Oh, I could, yes. The stones were insured, each piece listed and described separately. I could surely tell. Let's get it, Sam. Jordan, I have matters at headquarters. Please bring the stone there for Mr. Morgan to see, say, in two hours, if that is agreeable. By all means, Captain. Two hours. I'll be there. Sam and I went out together. He dropped me at the tambourine, and I promised to let him know what cooked. The night crowds were just coming in, but Chris wasn't around. I wondered about that as I went through the cafe and opened my office door. Chris! Rocky! Uh, take it easy. I'll get the gag off. Ah, uh, that's better. Boy, am I glad you got here, Rock. The cords in my wrists are killing me. Uh, just a sec. I'll have you loose. Come on now. What happened? Well, I heard a noise back here. When I came in, a couple of Arab natives were tearing up the place. Uh, you're lucky they didn't put a knife in you. Don't I know it. They grabbed me and tied me up. Yeah. What about the safe? Well, they couldn't get in there. Well, we better make sure. But I'm telling you, Rock, they didn't open the safe. Chris, think again. The diamond's gone. Gone? But ain't that it? No. There's a stone here, all right. Same size, but not the diamond. Look at it. Yeah. Not so clear. No sparkle like the other one. Well, what the heck goes? I was here all the time. That's what I want to know. How could anyone get in the safe, take the diamond, and on top of that, leave this one in its place? Maybe somebody switched them before you put it in the safe. Yeah. Oh, what I put in there was the diamond, I'm certain. Well, you sure got me, Rock. It all makes sense. Everything makes sense, Chris, when you get the answer. I made sure Chris was all right, sent him out front to help catch up with the customers. I closed the safe, put the stone in my pocket, and went out the back way to get to my car. I was as far from any answer as the Earth is from Mars. But somebody could tell, including a couple of native Arabs. I met them sooner than I expected. Hold him at the wall, Jehoshaphat. As you say, Negab, the knife is at the throat. Yeah, I saw the other one. For each man, there is the knife. Sure. Like the one you used on Eddie Gamble, huh? We love life, Effendi. We would not like to take yours. You weren't so squeamish the last time. We kill only when we are told. So give it to us. Quickly. Give you what? The stone. The stone which you have. Search the Nile. you find a lot of them. Only the stone which you have. At once, Effendi. It's in my right coat pocket. Make up a look. So. Yes, Jehoshaphat. This is the one. You two guys collect rocks for a hobby? <coughs> we have another. But we love life, Effendi. So we spare yours. I'll send you a thank you card. Where to? No address. We fold our tents like the Arabs. And they silently stole away. Now it was about as plain as a Chinese puzzle with all the pieces missing. A diamond is taken from my safe. A new stone is put in its place. Undoubtedly one that's worthless. Then they steal the new one. That's how it looked. And if that wasn't it, what was? I didn't know, but pretty soon I was pounding at the door of Abu Simbel, the jeweler. His wife finally let me in, and I waited till he came down, pulling on a robe and straightening his fez. Ah, oh, Mr. Jordan again. You have brought the diamond to my place of business. Now, the diamond's gone now, Mr. Symbol. Then why do you wake me at this hour? Because another stone showed up in its place. Only, uh, it's gone too. Uh, if in the... Uh, perhaps the sleep is not yet from my mind. Look, you said something about making further tests. Was that to name a price or to make sure it was a diamond? Even the humble jeweler is sometimes fooled by what he first sees. I put the diamond you saw in my safe yesterday. A while ago, I found another stone in its place. But the sparkle was gone. So, I was mistaken. What do you mean? Tell me. The test would have shown a diamond is double refractory. Not so the jargon of Ceylon. Jargon? Some call it the zircon. 
When placed in silver sand and subjected to great heat, it becomes clear and takes on great brilliance for a time. For how long? Mm, two days, perhaps. The luster then fades. So you're telling me the stone I had was a jargoon. It never was a diamond. No, a star sent from heaven. I am most sorry, Mr. Jordan, if my mistake has brought you trouble. Oh, no, no trouble at all, Mr. Symbol. You've told me just what I wanted. I left Abu Symbol and got to my car, and I knew where I was going. So the whole fistful of diamonds Hageman had sold Eddie Gamble weren't diamonds either. Only jargoons from Ceylon. In just ten minutes, I was pressing on the buzzer to Marguerite's hotel room, first floor rear. She was still up. Oh, Mr. Jordan. One last visit, Marguerite. Please, what are you doing? You didn't say you were coming here. I was until now. But things change, don't they? I don't understand. Like a lot of hopped-up jargoons. Jargoons? Yeah, like the ones you deliberately plan to throw away right into the Nile. You know better than that, Mr. Jordan. Why would I plan such a thing? Just so they wouldn't be found till too late, if at all. But I was beside myself. I didn't know what I was doing. You saw yourself. Wasn't I supposed to? Why, anyhow, the jewels are gone. Sure. Hageman makes the sale for plenty of money, and then you get rid of them. Only it happens the jewel stuff is penny ante. There's a murder involved. Your boyfriend, Eddie Gamble. Not as far as I'm concerned. A couple of stray Arabs did that. All foolproof. I thought they were strays, too, at first. But when they jumped me for the jewel this evening, I saw they were working for somebody who tied in with a diamond job. I wish I knew what you were talking about, Mr. Jordan. You know, Hageman made quite a mistake when he left that phony diamond on my tambourine floor. It put a big hole in your scheme. Somebody had to get it back. Did they? Come to think of it, who knew I had that jewel? You did. I showed it to you in my tambourine. Well, you're not trying to accuse me You're of up the... to your ears in murder, Marguerite. Maybe there are a few things you'd like to tell me now. Why should I tell you anything? It's either me or Sam Sabaya. Make your choice. Why, if I tell you, you'll... Mr. Jordan! She was looking at the window, but before I turned, the shots came. They were for Marguerite, and she dropped. And without thinking, I ran over to the shattered window. A man was running up the passageway to the street, and I went after him. When he turned, I ducked back. The slugs cut the wall over my head, and I was moving again. So was he. The next shots were thrown wild over his shoulder. After the last one, he dropped the gun. And we did the 440 till I reached him a block and a half further on and tried for a flying tackle. It took his wind, and the fight was over. But I kept it up, dragging him to his feet and over under a light where I could see who it was. I got a surprise. The kind that finally told me what it was all about. He was the man from the big house in the Azbekia sector. Claude Morgan. In just a moment, Rocky Jordan returns to conclude tonight's story. It's a sure sign of spring when people start breaking out the picnic baskets and polishing up the barbecue forks. That means outdoor meals ahead. And that means Del Monte catsup to me. There just isn't a catsup made that does as much for a picnic sandwich or a grilled hamburger. Yes, and from the way Del Monte catsup is disappearing off the shelves at the grocery store, plenty of women must think so, too. Try it yourself. Pour it out, bright and red and tempting. Get the fragrance of those fine spices and just taste the special richness of flavor Del Monte gets out of ripe tomatoes with that wonderful ingredient, pineapple vinegar. You'll say you have absolutely never enjoyed catsup flavor like this before. Well, I'd say it's just the catsup you'd expect from Del Monte. Why, I doubt if there's a woman in the West who doesn't know what that name means in quality and flavor. You'll like everything about Del Monte catsup, friends, including its low price. If you haven't tried it, how about tomorrow? Back now to Rocky Jordan for the conclusion of tonight's story. Claude Morgan came along to headquarters peaceably enough. By the time he was able to think straight again, he was already booked and in a cell for the murder of Marguerite. Right quick after that, Sam went out looking for Sidney Hagerman. I went back to the tambourine, and just before closing time, Sam came in and joined me at a back table. I will only be a moment, Jordan. Oh, no rush, Sam. Sit down. A couple of coffees here, Chris. Right away, Rock. Oh, an excellent idea. 
Jordan, you will be interested to know that we have found Sidney Hagerman. Oh, good. That leaves only a couple of stray Arabs. There's a call out. They will be found. However, a few things are not quite clear to me. Better check my ideas with Claude Morgan. Figures he's the kingpin in the whole scheme. Mm, yes, the scheme. An insurance jip, Sam. A big elaborate setup to convince us that Morgan's diamonds were stolen. He probably has them tucked away in Italy someplace. Hey, you might contact the police there. If Morgan himself does not tell me. Ah, uh-huh. the coffee. Oh, thanks, Chris. Sure, Rocky. <clears throat> now, Jordan, this strange tale of the jargoon. Oh, it isn't important where Hageman got them. The idea was for me to see them at the tambourine and then to know of their sale to Eddie Gamble. Mm. Then Gamble was not a party to the scheme. No, just the fall guy. Marguerite knew how to use him, too. Gamble gets killed, Marguerite goes wild and throws the jewels into the Nile. Now everybody thinks Morgan's jewels are gone. And there's all the proof he wants. I see. Meanwhile, what is at the bottom of the Nile are only jargoons. Morgan has the real one and can still file an insurance claim. With all the proof he needs that the diamonds are stolen. Except for one big slip. The stone which Hagerman accidentally left on your floor. Sure. I take it they had put the heat to the jargoons to make them look like diamonds the day before. If he'd gotten back the one I had before it changed to its original color, we still might not have the truth. A great deal of trouble for only a faded jargoon. Well, the insurance scheme and Morgan's part in it was new to me till Marguerite got killed. And when I caught up with Morgan, it all cleared. Hmm. It seems that Marguerite and Hagerman chose a dangerous employer. Yeah. I'd guess Morgan planned to knock off Hagerman just like he did Marguerite. Then nobody would know. <clears throat> this is excellent coffee. Tell me, how do you make it? <laughs> My professional secret, Sam. But I'll, uh, I'll trade it for some of your professional secrets. <laughs> Need you find that necessary, Jordan? You have a way of learning what you would know without my help. For the finest in tomato flavor, enjoy the whole family of Del Monte tomato products. Del Monte catsup and chili sauce. Del Monte tomato sauce and tomato juice. And Del Monte whole peeled tomatoes. Remember, buy wisely. Buy for flavor. Buy Del Monte. Del Monte, the brand you trust for flavor in so many good foods. Rocky Jordan, written by Larry Roman and Gomer Cool, stars Jack Moyles in the title role with Jane Avello as Sam Sabaya and is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music composed and conducted by Richard Arunt. Remember, you have a date next week at the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Same time, same station. And the story is The Strange Fate of Professor Amar. When it's real corn patch flavor you want, just ask for Del Monte corn, either golden cream style or vacuum-packed whole kernel. Yes, if you want rich, sweet, melt-in-your-mouth butter tender corn, look for Del Monte, the brand that always puts flavor first. Larry Thor speaking. Rocky Jordan is presented over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. There's a saying in the West that a cowboy is a man with guts and a horse. This is the story of one. His name was Slim. Frontier Gentlemen. Herewith, an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. 
Now starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. I had bought a horse in Cheyenne and was riding to Laramie in Wyoming Territory. I wanted a chance to really look at this grazing country and the thousands of head of cattle dotting its plains. I rode north of the railroad tracks until the telegraph poles lining it were lost in a dusty haze. And I saw clouds, heavy and bronze, over the distant mountains. It was during the afternoon that I came upon the cowboy, a lean man of about 30, with a cigarette hanging from his lips. He was examining the right foreleg of his horse, and he looked up as I approached. Hello. Howdy. You need any help? That yeah, fool horse stepped in a gopher hole. Don't seem to be no spring, though. Ah. Uh, Fine-looking animal. He ain't a bad old buzzard head. Hey, you English? <laughs> yes. You a ranch man? No, no. A newspaper correspondent. Oh. Thought maybe if you was a ranch man, you'd be looking for a hand. Uh, I'm sorry. You don't make no never mind. I'm chasseying over to Laramie. They girl get me a job on them new layouts I hear tells open up. I'm bound for Larry me myself. You mind if I ride with you? Well, I take it as real friendly. Quit it, you moon-eyed <laughs> son of a gun. Hold still. You think we'll have rain? Eh, don't feel like it. Of course you can't tell with them clouds. I've been on the range and there ain't been nothing but blue up there. And wango, down she comes. Tail as big as your fist. I tell you, nature's a skittish beast. Ain't no how bridle wise. Oh, incidentally, my name is Kendall. Slim, all right. Slim? Been in these parts long? Oh, a few weeks. I came down from Montana Territory by way of Deadwood. That's so. Yeah, here, Wild Bill Hickok got plugged a while back in Deadwood. Yeah. I was there when it happened. That's so. Mm. What happened to the feller that done it? McCall? Yeah, that was his name, Jack McCall. He, he was tried. The jury found him not guilty. That's so. Mm. Mm. Did you know him? No, just here. Oh. What do you write about in your newspaper? What I see, people out here, their way of living. Kind of different in England, huh? <laughs> yes, it's quite different. Ain't no plains, or mountains, or rivers. Ain't nothing back east or in England like we got here. That's true. Don't figure how come a man went to live back here. Well, it's a different kind of country, a different kind of life. It's a... Well, uh, didn't sound like no regular shooting. Oh, oh still, horse, I'll mash your sides in. Seems to come from the hills. Yeah. Reckon someone's in trouble. Let's go. A range of hills, low-lying, somber, about a mile to our north. It was from that direction we heard the shots. Slim's horse easily outdistanced mine, and by the time I reached the first slopes, the cowboy had disappeared into a canyon. matter with him? Looks like he's been locking horns with some Indians. I was just riding up to him when it fell down. There's half an arrow in him. Broke off. Now, take it easy, part. <coughs> Kendall, you better take his rifle. Keep an eye out. Mm. Mm. Uh, no shells in it. Rappahoe's... Rappahoe's got it. Where? Where? Where did they go? Up the canyon trail. Wagon horses. Clara. Oh, that's too bad. Too bad. He ain't gonna have no breakfast again forever. That's for sure. Well, what about the woman? Clara. Well, I guess she's still alive. Though maybe she'd rather not be. Indians keep captured white women around. Sometimes for hostage. Sometimes for other things. Well, do you think we'd have a chance of catching up with them? It might. 
Depends on how long a start they got and how many. I'd kind of like to bury him first. Ain't fitting for a man to lie out in the open after he's curled up. But it'll take time. What about the woman? It won't go no better or worse with her for the time. That ground's too hard for hand digging. I'm going to have to make a rock grave. Tell you what, though. You start on it. I'll work up the canyon a bit, see if I can find signs. Now, if you hear three shots, come a-running. I'll do the same for you. Right. Wait. He may have some shells left for the Winchester. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's something. Eight of them. You better keep the rifle here. So long. I began the task of burying the dead man. From letters and a homestead deed in his pockets, I found that his name was Theodore Belding. There was also a tintype of a young, rather pretty woman whom I gathered to be his wife, Clara. It took the better part of 45 minutes to complete the grave, and it wasn't until almost an hour later that Slim returned. There, I found the trail, followed it away up. There was four Indians in the wagon. They cleared the wagon and left it burned. Took the horses, though, and the woman. What are our chances? Can you shoot? I'm fair. Well, I ain't done any trailing since five years back, but we ain't got nothing to lose. Be getting dark by and by. We'll keep going till light gives out. Do you know this country, Slim? Not much, but a man can read a lot of things from places he ain't been. Here. That's where they stopped the wagon, see? Oh, you mean those double wheel ruts? Yeah. Must have ambushed him from over there. And the feller fell here. See the blood spot? Guess he made things hot for him for a spell. Were you an Indian scout, Slim? Yeah, for a while. Worked with Custer. Oh? What do you think of him? For him, I got a can of cuss words and I best keep the lid on it. Yeah, we'll save our breath for breathing from here on. I want to be able to hear what there is to hear. We went on up the canyon, Slim reading the ground, or, as he put it, following sign. For a mile or more, the trail was obvious, even to the most unpracticed eye, but after we passed the burned-out wagon, it became more difficult to follow. For another hour, we rode in silence. The sun was beginning to set. A cool breeze was sweeping down the canyon. Oh, oh now. You hear that? Could mean Indians made a camp. Those crows ain't flying. Figure they're sitting in the trees waiting for a handout. Uh, unless they're feeding on carrion. It wouldn't be corn if there were. Sounds as if they're in those trees. See, just over the rise. Don't seem smart enough for Indians to make a camp this early. Or they know we're following and they're waiting for us. Shut your mouth, you glandered, spaven coyote. Oh, smells them. Now, we better tie the critters up. All right. Pull down that injured rubber neck of yours. Pale pink wall-eyed son of a gun. I'll skin you alive. Did you think that slim? That it might be an idea to work our way through the trees instead of along the canyon wall, huh? Yeah, I sure do. That old sun's right behind us. We make awful pretty targets. Keep in the shadows as much as you can. We'll just figure they got no weapons except in bow and arrow. That gives us a mighty advantage. You all set? Yes. Come on, then. And watch out for twigs and dry leaves. Walk soft. Ahead of us, through the trees and shrubs, lay the brow of the rise. We made our way upward until we were within ten yards of the top. That's when I saw a glint in the sunlight and a trickle of sand moving down the slope toward us. Get down! In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Does that sound go with this music? Sure it does, when it's the sound of the shutters coming off the summer place in the woods, in the mountains, or at the shore. Only five more days from now, all America opens up the summer place as we swing into the three-day Memorial Day weekend, the first great outdoor holiday of the year. 
But first, what does your summer place need? In the refrigerator, on the kitchen shelves, the bathroom shelves, round the grill. Check now. Make a list now. Buy at your grocer's, your druggist, your hardware store. Then you'll be all set for that great big three-day weekend. And say, don't forget to have your portable radio checked and ready. Wherever you spend your happy holiday, there's a CBS radio network station to keep you posted on the weather and the news. And now we return you to the Anthony Ellis production of Frontier Gentlemen. Phew. Uh, you got good eyes, Kendall. I sure could feel the sawdust in my beard that time. Where are they? Well, one of them's between the boulders. A little to the right of the clump of alders. There, you can see the rifle sight. Want to try a shot with a Winchester? No, not yet. Only eight shells. We better save them. How many rounds you got for your gun? About 20. I got near the same. Say 50 rounds between guns and rifle. Not bad if it don't take too long. How many you figure we're shooting? Two, from the sound of it. Sharps repeaters, that's for sure. Well, we sure cut a big gut that time. Seems to me the only thing to do now is to wait until it's dark. There's no other way to get at them without being seen. I'm wondering what our chances are after dark. We ain't in the best position. Might be we ought to pull back down canyon, wait for morning before we pick up the trail. And what about the woman? Well, if she's still alive, she knows there's help around. Nice man! Come out from trees. We make medicine. <laughs> Here's an Indian couldn't drive nails in a snowbank. He's trying to draw a fire. Locate us. Well, let him. You want to make medicine, Siwash? You come down here. Yeah, that came from the left, higher up. One of them must be in a tree. I think I can see him. Yeah, there's enough sticking out. No, gone now. Not on this side. Now there's one good Indian. Where'd you learn to shoot like that, mister? Odd places. Uh, I'm hit. Where? Oh, I'm hit in the arm. Oh, man, that hurts. Oh, that hurts. Let me see now, Slim. Oh, well, it ain't the gun hand, anyhow. Can you, can you bind it up? Yes. Oh. I keep down now. White man! You want white woman? We talk. Maybe you pay gold get her back. Come down here. We'll talk. How does it feel now, Slim? Like a brand in irons inside. Well, there's not too much bleeding, though. That's something. I sure wish we had more cover. I feel naked as a painted cat laying right, out here. man. We come down talk. You shoot, woman die. What do you think? Yeah, we might have him buffaloed. Let him come. But watch him for tricks. They got a hundred. Come down. We'll hold our fire. There's only one of them. Now, if he ain't a setting duck against that sky... Well, there's two more, though. They must be with the woman. Yeah, maybe. Keep your eyes peeled. White man has been wounded. Huh. Indian has been killed? We are many. You are two. Climb down, Siwash. There were four of you, now there's three. I have Little Knife, chief of the Arapaho. Your Little Knife, a renegade dog who steals women. Little Knife, not renegade. Fight with crazy horse. Little Knife, not steal woman. Take woman. Like white man, take Little Knife land. Maybe kill white woman. Like white man kill Indian woman and child. The war is over. There's no more killing on either side. White man say war is finished. Not Indian. Quit your coyote around the rim, Indian. What about the woman? You give me your guns, rifle, and gold. I give her to you. I'll see you hung up to dry first. Not our guns or rifles, but perhaps some gold. How much? How much you got? A hundred dollars? Not enough. That's all there is? All guns and a hundred dollars? No. I go back. 
Maybe you hear a woman die. Then you pay. Maybe you don't go back, Siwash. What about that? Like all white men, break word of truce. You speak of honor and murder with the same breath? We can kill you all. We wait for night, then we kill. I got a finger it's itching right now to wait for nothing. Little knife not afraid to die. Little knife, you... You took the belongings in the white man's wagon. Return the woman, and we let you keep it all. That and a hundred dollars in gold. You let Little Knife keep what he already has. Not a trade. Listen, you double distilled son of a gun. I seen a fair sized anthill down the canyon away. How'd you like to be staked out? I make good offer. Woman for guns and hundred dollars. You say no? I go back now. Soon as the night. Then we take your guns and the gold. <laughs> The Indian turned and moved back up the slope. For a moment, I had an uncontrollable desire to shoot. Then I thought of the woman, of what would happen to her. I lowered the rifle. We shifted our positions a few yards to the right, and we lay there, waiting. And the darkness settled into the canyon. Funny thing. Huh? What? We ain't heard no sound from the woman. Yeah, I was thinking of that myself. Wonder if she's all right. Well, should be better in three quarter moon tonight. Coming up in a while. They gonna try something. It'll be afore the moon. Slim, I think we better sit back to back in case they circle around us. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking. Wish I had me a drink of red eye right now. I know a place in Dodge. I tell you, Kendall, a shot of that tornado juice would draw a blood blister and a raw high boot. <laughs> I'd like to see that. Mm, shucks, that ain't nothing. Feller what runs the saloon. He serves a free snake with every drink. Shh. 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 Ah! That ain't what you think. It ain't no woman, that's an Indian. I know. I heard him before. They want us to think it's her. Are you sure? I'll show you. Hey, you crow bait dogs! Which one of you's a squaw? See what I mean? Yes. One thing I don't understand. What's that? Why do they stay here? Why not ride off with the woman? Yeah, I figure there's two reasons. First, Little Knives probably left the reservation. He ain't got no particular place to go. Second, they want our guns. Indian will do a lot of fool things to get hold of a gun. Come to think of it, there's... There's something else. Oh? Yeah. Maybe they're low on bullets. You reckon? Yeah. It's quite possible. That's why they haven't attacked. Sure. Sure, they're using sharps for Peters. That feller's Winchester ain't the same caliber. So whatever shells they picked up in the wagon ain't worth a thing. In which case... We don't wait for them to attack us. Oh, I know what you're getting at, but it won't work. Why not? That wouldn't be no good. Not with his busted wing. Slim, you stay here. Cover me with the rifle. Uh-uh. No, he'll hear you before you get ten feet up the rise. Slim, I'll admit that I'm a comparative greenhorn in your territory, but I've had the dubious pleasure of slitting a number of throats under similar circumstances in India. Those chaps didn't hear me. I'll take my chances with these Arapaho. Oh, yeah. You gonna use a knife? Oh, if I have to, yes. <laughs> you sure are a funny kind of Englishman. Here, take the rifle. Mister, I sure hope you know what you're doing. <laughs> so do I. I crawled out of the hollow and inched my way up the slope. I had seen the flash of the Indian's rifle and knew his approximate location. In the direction I was taking... I planned to reach the top of the hill some yards from where I had last seen him. It was slow. Slow. Then as I raised my head over the summit, I saw the great orange glow of the rising moon and silhouetted against it the crouching form of an Indian half turned from me behind a boulder. I drew out my knife. died without a sound. 
Then I made out Little Knife and the remaining Indian. They were a few feet away, standing over a gagged and bound body. And in the constantly growing moonlight, I saw the chief bend down, the glitter of steel in his hand. This time I knew it would be a woman's scream I was going to hear. Little Knife! It's all right, Slim. She's alive. She's all right. I cut the ropes, loosened the gag from the woman's mouth, and for a long moment she only looked at me. Then she began to cry. I carried her down the slope to where Slim was waiting. Then I went back to get the Indian horses and the things which had belonged to Belding and his wife. After that, Slim and I took her to Laramie in Wyoming Territory. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jack Moyles as Slim and Lawrence Dobkin as Little Knife. Join us again next week for another report from... The Frontier Gentleman. Dan Coverly speaking. Today, here Jack Benny on the CBS Radio Network. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed, from the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat. These are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! about the frontier, maybe you know my hometown, Dos Rios. I'm Chad Remington. Not alone the one practicing lawyer in town, but almost the only lawyer in the county. Our section of the country was settled by the early Spanish. And although that was in the days of the old vaqueros, the Spanish influence still is evident wherever you go. And believe me, it's not at all unusual because of it for a lawyer to get into trouble. Gun trouble. But just a while back, I was riding toward Dos Rios with Cherokee O'Bannon. He owns the town livery stable now that we've convinced him it's safer and more permanent than peddling his genuine Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil from the back of a wagon. Well, Cherokee and I will open along and suddenly... Geronimo's ghost, Chad. Did you hear what I heard? Not only did I hear those gunshots, Cherokee, but now I can see where they came from. Hey, look over there. See that smoke rising just over the roof of that hay barn? Why, that's that widow lady's place. What's her name? Bessie Dryden? Yeah, that sure is Bessie's place, Cherokee. Since this sounds like a pitched battle, maybe it's open to the public. Come on. As we rounded the clump of aspens which shield Bessie's house from the road, we saw a sight which stopped us for a moment. 
Bessie was standing on her porch, a Winchester in her hands, its barrel aimed at two men who seemed to have stepped out of an illustration from some old Spanish book. And the team of two black horses which pulled the carriage they rode up in wore plumes over their silver encrusted bridles. Well, Cherokee were off our horses and running toward the porch just as Bessie raised the rifle to her shoulder and took aim at the taller of the two strangers. Blessed you to blazes, I'm not telling you to get off of my place again. Bessie, Bessie, put down that gun before someone gets hurt. You keep out of this. Senor, your intervention is most fortuitous. You might even have saved this woman's life. Yeah, well, I'm now, well Excuse me, to... Bessie, excuse me, but I'm taking that rifle before it goes off again. Now, here, Cherokee, you keep an eye on it. I'll keep an eye on her, too. And we both keep eye on La Mujer, huh? See, amigo? Okay, both watch her. Now, now, would someone mind telling me what this is all about? This overdressed oaf come out here and had the brass-bound gall to tell me I'd have to pay him rent for this place I homesteaded myself, or he was going to throw me off. And despite your threats, madam, I fully intend to. This land, all of it, belongs to the Chavez family. Uh, the Chavez family? Perhaps I'd better introduce myself. I am Don Alfredo Chavez Nagel, recently from Santa Fe. And this is my servant, Palmero. And you, sir? Oh, I'm Chad Remington, Mr. Nagel, and I would like to know what you mean by you own all this land. I personally know that Mrs. Dryden and her late husband homesteaded this section more than 20 years ago. I'm not questioning the homestead, but only two weeks ago this came to light. Oh? Huh? Grant from the King of Spain to my maternal grandfather, Don Alfredo Sepulveda Chavez y Dominguez. Yeah, you expect me to believe that? Oh, wait, you may have to believe it, Bessie. Under the treaty by which we acquired this territory from Spain, we agreed to recognize all crown grants made by the King of Spain previously. Uh, may I see that parchment? I have no reason not to show it to you. Oh, thank you. Well, it looks legitimate enough. Are you implying that it may be illegitimate? Oh, far from it. Not at all. You, you see, Mr. Nagel, I happen to be a lawyer. A by lawyer? Nature. Then perhaps this meeting was more fortuitous than I at first believed. Senor Remington, for three days, Palmero and I have been driving constantly just to come to Dos Rios for the sole purpose of perfecting my title to this land. For that reason, I am in need of an attorney. And since you are one... Chad, I... if you take five cents of that land grabber's money, no, I'll... I haven't taken anything yet, Bessie, but... Well, since from the description in this deed, Mr. Nagel may hold title not only to your property, but to most of the ranches in this valley, I think it might be good business for all of us if we did ride into my office and talk this over. <laughs> Don Alfredo Chavez Nagel rode into town alongside of his overdressed driver, Palmero, and rocked Dos Rios like an earthquake. And then we went up to my office over Cherokee's livery stable. And after Nagel explained how he'd found the deed in an old trunk just a few weeks ago, he went on to tell me of his plans. So you see, Senor Remington, it's not a matter of money with me, it's a matter of pride. Hmm? Family pride. I see. I want this claim recognized, so my sainted mother's family name of Chavez will be perpetuated. I don't want to appear stupid about this, but if it's not a matter of money, why this shooting fray out at Bessie Dryden? Well, that old harridan didn't even ask how much rent I wanted before she grabbed for a gun and started shooting. You see, hers was the first place we came to on our way up from Santa Fe. So I told Palmera to stop in order that we could get acquainted. Well, uh, for how much money do you want for the land, Mr. Nagel? A token of me or nothing dollar a year will be more than enough to compensate me financially and at the same time legally make my deed effective. At least I should think it would under the law. Well, legally, you're perfectly right. If all of the people living on ranches covered by your crown grant would pay you nominally a dollar a year, it, it'd certainly be adequate evidence that they recognize your claim. And that, believe me, sir, is all I want. If you had ever known my mother, how beautiful and sweet she was... You would understand why I want to perpetuate her name by calling this the Rancho Chavez. Well, slice me thin and call me jerky. Chad, this man is a real humanitarian. He certainly must be, Cherokee, because at a dollar a year, the most he can make is something slightly in excess of $30. If you're saying that because you think it's too small an amount for me to pay you a fair fee, yes, Senor Remington, 
A retainer of $200. Oh, now, just a minute, Mr. Nagel. Uh, not only am I unable to take your retainer, but I'm unable to take your case until such time as we can establish the authenticity and validity of your deed. Oh? And how do you propose to do that? Well, normally it might be a long and tedious process. But it so happens that we have a judge living here in Dos Rios who not only has handled several similar cases, but, uh, well, he happens to be an especially good friend of mine. Especially good, he says. <laughs> Why, he's practically engaged to the judge's daughter, Libby. Well, if that's the case, we should be able to get through with this in just a few days. Oh, we might at that. And this being nearly noon hour, with the judge coming home almost every day for lunch, I think this would be as good a time as any to get his expert opinion. Well, Judge, what do you think? Seems to be no question about this deed, Chad. And, Mr. Nagel, everything seems exactly as it should be, even down to the seal and ribbons. Wouldn't those ribbons look lovely on a hat or a new dress? <laughs> You'll have to pardon my daughter, Mr. Nagel. She's just like all women. No matter what it is she sees, she tries to figure out some way of wearing it. <laughs> That's the way of all beautiful women. Well, thank you, Mr. Nagel. Did you hear that, Chad? Oh, I certainly did, Libby. All I can say is, in this case, the client is speaking for his attorney. Oh, excellent, Mr. Remington. Very well put. <laughs> I hope I can do as excellent a job in convincing the ranchers around here to pay you that dollar a year and not combat your claim. But even with Mr. Nagel charging them only a dollar a year for rent? The folks around here, my dear Libby, have hair-trigger tempers, or else they wouldn't need a judge. Or a lawyer. I just got a thought. Most of the men affected by this Spanish grant will be attending the meeting of the Cattlemen's Association tomorrow to discuss driving their herds up to market. So if you'll come along with me and back me up, I, I think we can soon make them realize they're getting off mighty lucky. <laughs> getting off lucky... You'd have thought I was down there with process service trying to throw widows and orphans out of their homes. It took almost five minutes after I broke the news to bring any semblance of order back to the meeting. Folks! Folks! Won't you please quiet down? Chad and I are just trying to tell you facts. And apparently you don't appreciate how fortunate you really are. Fortunate? Is someone else taking our land out from under us? Now, Kirby, no one's taking anything out from under anybody. Matter of fact, the land doesn't even belong to you. Never did. Except that now Mr. Nagel's willing to let you keep the land by paying him a dollar a year. Yeah, but suppose he changes his mind two years from now. He can't, Bodine. I've drawn leases for everybody that guarantees a dollar rental for 49 years. I've seen Mr. Nagel's deed. It grants to his maternal grandfather in perpetuity the 12,800 acres north of Navajo Pass, as well as the 18,000-odd acres to the south of the pass by the Arroyo. And instead of charging you a dollar an acre, which would mean $30,000 a year to him, Nagel's just going to charge 27 of you ranchers a dollar apiece. The good grief, men. My own father settled here before most of you did. The ranch he left me is north of the Navajo Arroyo on Mr. Nagel's property. You're no better off nor any worse off than I am. And I'm tickled to death to sign this lease, just as I'm recommending to you all that you should. Well, I'm not going to spend all week arguing about these leases. If we don't get our cattle up to market, the buyers will have gone back east. And then we won't even have the dollar to pay for the lease. You got the lease with you, Chad? I'll sign. Well, now you're really talking. If you'll step up here, Mr. Nagel, and sign these leases as owner of the land, I'll see that these men execute them as the tenants. <laughs> What's wrong with you, Buck? You'd make a perfect laughing hyena. <laughs> oh, how you put it over on them. Oh, look, my friend. <laughs> These lapses into your native English aren't necessary at all. Yeah. Not alone had you better stick to that Spanish dialect, but as my driver, Palmero, you better practice it, too. Oh, see, uh, see, si, si. I practice it good, I think, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, when that judge got up and started talking about the north side of Navajo Pass and then the south side, 
I thought sure the game was up. I thought somebody had tumbled to what you were going to pull. <laughs> My dear Buck, uh, I mean Palmero. I've engaged the finest lawyer in the county, and I had the support of the judge. They are reputable citizens. But what their reputations may be after they've found what we've done with Navajo Pass is something I'd rather not contemplate. <laughs> <laughs> We'll return to the exciting second act of our Frontier Town adventure in just about one minute. Now, Frontier Town. I don't know how much you know about women. The longer I live, the more convinced I become I don't know too much. But there's one thing I've started to learn about, and that's a woman's intuition. Take that night, the night of the meeting of the Dos Rios Cattlemen's Association. I'd gone over to the judge's house for supper and... After a while, when the moon came up, Libby and I wandered outside. With my success in having all the ranchers sign Nagel's leases, I, I was feeling pretty good. Uh, not to mention that it was a soft summer evening and Libby was there. You know what I was thinking, Libby? You're like a, like a honeysuckle. All alive and lovely during the day. And, well, at night, at least... Tonight, just as quiet and wrapped up in yourself. I'm worried, Chad. You worried? Well, I am. I wish you hadn't done what you did at that meeting today. Well, no fine future I'd have, we'd have, if I went around turning down cases and feeds. Mm, I've got a feeling about this, an awful feeling. What? Chad, I don't trust that man. I don't trust him a bit. Oh, Nagel? Uh, now, what in the world is there to mistrust about a man who did what he did? Now, I'm afraid you don't understand about those old Spanish families and their pride. Now, I'm afraid that I understand that man. Chad, he's too oily. He's too smooth. Oh, come here. What's the use of wasting our time talking about Nagel when we could be talking about, well, about the moonlight. Us. Oh, Chad, you... Oh, Libby, I wonder if you'll ever know how much I... Hey, Chad! Oh. Chad, I've got the horses here, and it's time to be riding back to the ranch. What a time for him to show up. All right, Cherokee, be there in a few minutes. Young fella, me lad, there's a cattle drive starting tomorrow morning, and if you want to be up at Navajo Basin with your herd at sunup, you better be getting some sleep. My master's voice. And I, I guess he's right at that, Libby. Goodbye. I'll see you when we get back from market. Be careful, Chad. Promise me you will. Be careful? What about? I, I don't know. Just be careful, Chad. Be careful about everything. Everything. Be careful, she said. But by then it was too late. However, I slept well and the next morning, Cherokee and I drove my little bunch of cattle that was ready for market up to Navajo Basin at the foot of Navajo Pass and joined the other ranchers. Chad, I doubt if I'll ever forgive you for taking me off of the back of that medicine wagon. Oh, maybe you'd rather have been lynched for selling that phony medicine. Phony, you're right. That rattlesnake oil is absolutely guaranteed 90 proof. <laughs> I still think I'd rather have been lynched than to play nursemaid to a lot of cows. Yes, indeed. I really believe I would. Oh, Come on, Chad, you're late. One of the boys went up ahead already. Well, it must have been a wide open rush, eh, Kirby? Who was it that couldn't wait and started off by himself? Uh, that was Jim Bodine. Said it'd be slow going through Navajo Pass, and we'd catch up with him anyhow. Oh. Everybody else here? Yep, now that you two are. There's Frank Sherman, Ty McCarthy, and uh -huh. your old friend, Bessie Dryden. Hi there, Bessie! 
You look beautiful even in the early morning hours. <laughs> That's the way you sell patent medicine. Well, don't you try to sell me none of it. Why should he? I'm paying him more as a cowboy than he made perpetrating that medicine fraud. One thing I don't like about cowboy is these clothes. Well, what's wrong with the clothes? Well, only got pint-sized pockets, and I'm a two-quart man. <laughs> what we ought to do is dress you up like a Newfoundland dog and put a keg around you. Shit, them shots. Seemed to me they came from up Navajo Pass. Navajo Pass? Well, that's where Jim Bodine just went with his cattle. Oh, for the love of Pete, look, isn't that a horse coming with its rider half off down out of the pass? Hey, look. Jim Bodine appears like he's shot. Hey, my Hey, I wonder what in blazes happened. Oh, we'll soon be finding out. Here comes that horse, wide open. Hey, Cherokee, come on, lend me a hand. Oh, there. Oh, hold it, you. Slow down. Hey, come on, now. Stand still. There. Hey, Jim, what in the world happened to you? Uh, pass is barricaded. Won't let no one through. Barricaded? Who barricaded the pass? Your friend, your client... Nagel. What? Why, doggone you, Chad Remington. I got a good mind to knock your brains out. Oh, now, if Jim's right, Bessie and Nagel did barricade the pass, I wouldn't blame you. That is, if I have any brains. Come on, Cherokee. We're going up in the Navajo Pass ourselves. Jim Bodine was right, except it wasn't exactly a barricade. It was more like the breastworks at Gettysburg. Wire had been strung up across the pass, and right below it were sandbags, each bag bristling with a rifle. Cherokee and I got within about 30 yards of it when... Oh, hold it, Cherokee. Whoa, whoa. This is far enough. This is too far. Now, Turn them horses and get out of here. Just a minute, Buck. This gentleman I want to talk to. Hey, Chad. That servant of Nagel suddenly talks regular English. Yeah, I'm afraid they both know a good deal more about English than we do. I suppose you can explain this, Nagel. Quite simple, Counselor. Nobody goes through Navajo Pass across my property without my permission. And my permission can be obtained only by buying it. Your property? But Navajo Pass is a public road. Oh, so? You know, if you'd take the time to refer to some of the old maps, Mr. Remington, you'll find that the arroyo here to my left, which is on my property used to be a riverbed and that the river flowed down through this pass. You trying to be ridiculous? There's no river here now. And what's that got to do with it anyhow? Well, it may have a lot to do with it, Cherokee. I suppose you realize, Nagel, that if you delay these ranches until the cattle buyers have gone back east, that every ranch is going broke. Naturally. And therefore, they should be glad to pay for the privilege of crossing my land. Let's say five dollars a head. You know something? I'm even starting to doubt that this is your land. You know, your doubts might have been well-founded before you so nicely drew up those leases. Now it's of record that every rancher around here has acknowledged in writing my title to this land. Why, you're a bigger thief than I am. I was. I used to be, that is. Nagel, all I can tell you is this. So far, you've succeeded in sucking me in, making a fool of me. But that cattle's going to get to market on time. All right, turn that nag around, Cherokee. We're getting out of here. You mean he can do that to us, Chad? Hold us up for $5 a head? What do you think, Judge? I think he's a blasted crook. I'll bet you even that deed of his is a phony. Well, now that I think of it, I remember a druggist I used to buy stuff from. He had a way of taking a piece of paper and making it look old, like parchment. And I'll wager that's exactly what Nagel did. Well, once we can establish that fact, we'll make short work of him. Chad, I'm going up to the state capitol at once. Yeah, you should, Judge, but well, in the meantime, since possession is nine points of the law and these cattle have got to get to market, Nagel's got us over a barrel. Unless... Unless what? Unless we can break through that barricade. Well, how in the name of Simple Simon are you going to do that? Uh, now, wait a minute. Remember the yarn about the Trojan horse? Now, listen to me. The Greeks got their soldiers into Troy by hiding them inside a hollow horse. I think we can do the same thing and trample down that barrier and the men behind it by using our cattle. Cherokee, get out there and call in those outriders. we got to get these cattle running. <laughs> Oh, 
Why, after what I'd let him in for, they even listened to me doesn't make much sense. Because the idea itself was as wild as a coyote that's been feeding on loco weed. But this was a desperate situation, called for desperate means. I knew that 50-odd ranchers and cowpokes wouldn't stand a chance against those rifles that stuck out of the barricade like quills out of a porcupine's back. About the only thing that could blast them out of the air would have been cannon. Or, I hope, the surging, irresistible charge of some 3,000 head of cattle. Well, since, as we lawyers say, time is of the essence, we didn't waste time arguing. We lined up the herds about eight abreast, packed close enough to just fill the pass so there'd be no turning back. And then with one wild whoop and the echo and roar of six guns, we started those cattle toward the barricade at a dead run. <laughs> Kirby, you keep back. Keep back of the cattle. They gotta break through first to make an opening for us. They're getting through, Tad. They're getting through. Don't let them get away. Come on. What are you packing left? Hey, the wire's down, Chad. Them gun hands and eagles are giving up. Cherokee, you come on with me. Nagel and Palmero are scrambling up those rocks like mountain sheep. Come on, you vagabond. After Chad, up to those rocks. Nagel, either stand where you are or we're going to run you down. Don't. Don't. I haven't even got a gun. All right, hold it, Cherokee. Hold it. Keep these two buzzards covered. Remington, this is something you're going to pay for personally. This is my land. Every foot of it is my land. Yeah, I guess it is your land to all intents and purposes, Nagel. Because you're going to be living here, right here, for about the next 30 years. But it won't be at the so-called Chavez Rancho. No, it'll be down in town in the county jail. Quiet! Quiet! There'll be silence in this courtroom while I pronounce sentence on the prisoners. Alfred Nagel... You will rise. This court finds you guilty of forgery, attempted homicide, and of operating a bunco game, and sentences you and Buck Palmer, alias Pomero, to state's prison for from 20 to 50 years at hard labor. Court dismissed. <laughs> Well, Libby, do you think your father was too hard on those crooks? Far from it. Nagel should have gotten an extra ten years for all those beautiful lies he told me the first time he came to the house. (laughs) Say, Chad, I hate to interrupt, but if it's all the same to you, I'd like to go back and take off these cowpunchers clothes. Mighty uncomfortable, mighty uncomfortable. What do you mean, Cherokee? They're too tight? (laughs) They sure are too tight, aren't they, Cherokee? With those pint-sized pockets, they sure choke a man who has a two-quart thirst. (laughs) Yes, indeed. Yes, Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler as a Bruce Ells production. Story and supervision by Joel Murcott. Direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmar. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. This is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood.
And now... The Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of Stone's Revenge. He let him stay out there in the freezing cold, pounding on the door and yelling, let me in. But Rose's daughter tried to let him in, but the old man wouldn't let her. So Jeff stayed there in the freezing cold, and the girl heard him say, I'll make you pay for this, Monroe. For as long as Monroe lives, I'll make you pay. And that's the end of the story? Yeah, not by a long shot, young fella. Ever since that time, people have died who stayed in that cabin. People up here say they've heard him pound on the door and yell, Now let me in. And when they do let him in, they die. Real strange-like, they die. The Hall of Fantasy will present Stone's Revenge in just a moment. And now for our story, an original tale of fantasy entitled Stone's Revenge. Jim Loring was my best friend. His sister Betty more than my friend, for we were set to be married the following November. We'd all been working pretty hard and we figured we needed a rest, so we took a two weeks vacation and headed up north. Before we left the city, Jim rented a cabin from a real estate broker about 400 miles north of here. We left about 3 in the morning and drove steadily. Hey, what uh, time is it? Uh, 11.30. Oh, we've made good time. Yeah, that's right. According to the last marker we saw, we ought to be pulling into Wood Lake in a few minutes. How far is the cabin from town, Jim? Well, Gehring, the real estate man, said it was about 6 miles out of town. You're, uh... Sure he said there were fish in that lake? Well, some of the best fishing in the state. That's what he said. <laughs> That's what they all say. <laughs> we'll have to stop in town and pick up plenty of food. That's right. Enough to hold us for a few days anyway. Oh, look, up ahead. I think we're coming to it. Oh, we are. It says, uh, let me see, a wood lake, population 709. Hey, big oh, town. You better slow down. You know these small towns. Yeah. The broker in the city said I could get the key to the cabin from the sheriff. It seems he also owns a store here, Sheldon's General Store. Well, if that's the case, we might as well pick up our food there. Yeah, might as well. Hey, look, there it is. Huh? Oh, yeah, I see it. Oh, open that door in a hurry. I I just hope my muscles haven't frozen in this position. Oh, Oh, that feels great. Oh, Oh, boy. Beautiful day, isn't it? Weather report said we're in for a storm tonight, though. Oh? Well, maybe it'll blow over by tomorrow. Oh, it's nice and cool in here. Yeah. Anything would be cool after driving in that hot sun. Oh, it doesn't seem to be. Oh, yes, there is. Leaning back in that chair with a paper over his face. Look. <laughs> <laughs> He's sound asleep. Pretty alert fellow, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. I heard that, young fella. <laughs> I was only joking. <laughs> Don't you worry, none, son. I can take a joke as well as the next one. <laughs> Uh, you'd be wanting something, maybe? Uh, yes, we uh, rented a cabin up here, and we need some food. And you come to the right place. <laughs> yes, sir. Now, what can I do you for? Uh, you'd better take charge here, Betty. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's see. We'll need some eggs. Uh, about two dozen. Coming right up. Yeah. You come in fresh this morning? Uh, where are you staying? Oh, the old Monroe place. A real estate man in the city said we could pick up the key from you. Yep. Yep, I got the key, all right. Yeah, what else, ma'am? Well, let's see, some bacon, a pound of coffee, pancake flour, pancake flour potatoes, potatoes, oranges, oranges, some cream, sandwiches. Yeah, wait, 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 wait a minute. Hold on, ma'am. I got what you said, but don't say no more, because if you do, I'll forget everything. <laughs> <laughs> so you're staying at the old Monroe place, huh? That's right. Let's see now, coffee, flour... You got a five-pound sack of potatoes here. Oh, that'll be fine. Yeah. Now, go over there and help yourself to some oranges, ma'am, and anything else you see. Just pick it up and set it on the counter here. <laughs> All right. I, I guess that will be the easiest way. Yeah. yeah. 
Hmm, so you're staying at the old Monroe place, huh? Uh, you uh, said that once before. Yeah, I know I did, I know it. I just wanted to be sure it was hearing right. Well, your hearing's all right, Sheriff. Uh, by the way, may we have the key? Sure enough, sure enough. It's right here under the counter. No. Yeah, long time since that cabin's been rented. Oh? How come? Eh, people just don't like to go up there. Oh, why not? Anything wrong with it? Not exactly. Still the best cabin around these parts. Got a nice refrigerator. <laughs> Indoor plumbing. Real nice place. But uh, you oughtn't to go up there. Why? Because of old Jeff Stone. People around here say they've seen him up there. Oh, he won't bother us. Eh, don't you count on that, young fella. Look, if he comes around the cabin, we'll ask him to leave. Only leaving that'll be done. It'll be done by you. Well, why? Is he dangerous? Yeah, yeah, he's dangerous. And he's dead, too. What do you mean? Just what I said. Well, you can't expect us to believe... I that. don't expect you to believe nothing. I'm just telling you what I know for a fact. The real estate man didn't say anything he's about... He's only interested in renting it. Now, you listen to what I got to say. So I don't think... Let that... him talk, Jim. Thank you, thank you. I'll tell you about what happened up there. About 15 years ago, it was. Old man Monroe hated Jeff Stone. Used to make life miserable for Jeff. And Jeff used to come in here and say that he was going to get even someday. And the hatred inside him would come out on the surface. And it even made me afraid. It was the winter time when it happened. Old man Monroe was in his cabin and there was a big storm outside. One of the worst we ever had up here. His daughter was with him. She was the one who told me what happened. <clears throat> Jeff got himself caught outside in that storm. He knew the only place he could reach was old man Monroe's cabin. So he fought his way through the blizzard, and he got to the cabin half froze. Yeah, he pounded on the door. Let me in! Let me in! Old Monroe knew it was Jeff outside. He wouldn't open that door. He let him stay out there in the freezing cold, pounding on the door and yelling, Let me in! Let me in! Well, Monroe's daughter tried to let him in, but the old man wouldn't let her. So Jeff stayed out there and froze to death. But just before he stopped yelling, the girl heard him say... I'll make you pay for this, Monroe. For as long as Monroe lives, I'll make you pay. Yes, sir. In the morning, when the storm was over, they went outside and found him frozen to death. And that's the end of the story? Yeah, not by a long shot, young fella. Ever since that time, people have died who stayed in that cabin. First Monroe's daughter, then him, and then others. Anybody who went up there. People up here say they've heard him pounding on the door and yelling, Let me in! Let me in! And when the folks in the cabin let him in, they die. Real strange-like. They die. We'll return to the Hall of Fantasy in the tale of Stone's Revenge in just a moment. Back now to the Hall of Fantasy in the tale of... Stone's Revenge. The sheriff leaned across the counter as he spoke to us. Even though the day was warm, I could feel a chill creep over me as he told us the story of one man's revenge. So I wouldn't go up there if I was you. Yeah, certainly a frightening story. Yep, sure is. Is there any other cabin around here for rent? Yeah, it's been a busy season up here. Most of the place has got people living in them. I got a place, though, I could let you have. Not too bad a place. Let you have it mighty cheap. Maybe we ought to... Nonsense. No, we'll go up to the cabin. Well, it's all right with me. Well, I think that about does it, Sheriff Sheldon. All right, let me see now. Ninety-five for coffee, fifty-seven for bacon. Are uh, eggs you sure we have everything we need? Well, as long as you two manage to catch a few fish we have. <laughs> if you don't, then we'll be making quite a few trips into town. Wait till we get out in the boat. Huh? I'll wait until I get the fish into the pan. Yeah, it comes to $11.92. You can check my figures if you want to. Oh, no, we trust you, Sheriff, here. Yep, out of 12. <laughs> <laughs> yes, me. Always good to have a little business on the side, like this here store. Here's your change. Thank you, sir. Hmm. Uh, you, look, you're sure you don't want to go to my cabin, huh? Oh, well, we're sure. Well, I warned you, warned you. You're walking in with your eyes open. I hope you walk out that way. <clears throat> that is alive.
certainly is far enough away from everybody. Mm-hmm. It's a good thing we have a map or we'd be lost. Hey, look, I can see it. Huh? Yeah, hey, so do I. Yeah, it looks pretty nice. Oh, and there's the lake. Oh, it's beautiful. Hey, can I pick him or can I pick him? Oh. This lake is so hard to get to that I, I bet it hasn't been fished much. I could hardly wait to get out there. They ought to be hitting pretty well this afternoon, huh? We'll get the boat off the trailer and whip that lake to a froth. Jim. Mm-hmm. I heard that story that the sheriff was telling you. You don't think there was any truth to it, do you? Of course not. You notice when he finished, he said he had a place that we could rent? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> well, I did. He just wanted to talk us out of coming up here. Always good to have a little business on the side, he said. I wonder how many people he's talked out of coming up here with that crazy story of his. Yeah. <laughs> Quite a few, I suppose. But it, it did frighten me. We found the cabin to be in excellent condition. We moved our things in, had a bite to eat, then Jim and I unloaded the boat and went fishing while Betty took a sunbath on the beach in front of the cabin. The big ones weren't hitting, but the panfish were. And when we came in, we had a stringer full of bluegills, crappies, and perch. Betty fixed dinner, and we had all the fish we could eat. The rest of the evening, we took it easy, listening to the radio we'd brought with us or reading. The weather report was right that day. And a little after 9 o'clock, it began to rain. Hey, we're right about the rain. Yeah, sounds like it'll be a good one. I hope we don't have rain the whole time we're up here. That would be just our luck. Hey, who turned off the radio? I did. Nobody seemed to be listening to it. Well, put it on, will you? Oh. I want to catch the rest of the news before I turn in. If we're uh, going to get up early tomorrow, we'd better think about turning in. Yeah, we'll hear the news and then call it a day. Okay. And that's the news of the world and the national scene. As for the local news, there's... Ladies and gentlemen, a bulletin has just been handed to me. Lawrence Graham, an inmate of the State Institution for the Criminally Insane, escaped from the grounds a little more than two hours ago. So far, he has not been apprehended. His description follows. Six feet tall, gray hair and brown eyes. Last seen wearing gray shirt and pants. This man is dangerous. If you see him, on no account, try to apprehend him, but get in touch with the local police of your area immediately. I repeat, this man is dangerous. Be very careful. Turn it off, Betty. The state hospital is for the criminally insane. That's pretty close to us. I think it's about... Five or six miles away. Oh, they'll catch you. Don't worry about it. He won't get away. I hope so. Well, no, I think I'm going to turn in. Yeah, sure. Listen. What's the matter? I I heard something. So did I. A crash of thunder. No, something else. I, I thought I heard a voice. Oh, nonsense. Uh, maybe you're right. Uh, maybe. Uh, there it is again. I heard it, too. Yeah, so did I. We'd better take a look outside. Yeah, all right. No, d don't go outside. We'll just stand in the doorway and see if there's anything out here. Huh? Do you see anything? No. Nothing. Then come back inside. Yeah. All right. Maybe it was someone lost in the storm. Uh, or maybe it was the man who escaped. Or Jeff Stone. <laughs> Someone is out there. Yes, there is something out there. We'd better go see what it is. All right, I'll... Let me in! He's outside the door. Let me in! Come on, let's see who it is. Okay. Let me in. Oh, I'm glad I found you here. What's the matter with him? I found him lying on the ground about half a mile from here. I've been carrying him ever since. Here, let me help you. Put him down over here. That uh, 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 does it. What's wrong with him? I don't know. He, uh, he doesn't seem to... What's the matter with him? He... He's dead. You are listening to the tale of Stone's Revenge on this week's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. We'll return to our story in just a moment. And now, back to our story, entitled, Stone's Revenge. The storm was getting worse. Outside, thunder roared and the rain fell in torrents. Inside, we turned to look at each other, for a dead man was lying on the couch. Are you 
sure? There's no pulse. He's dead. Was he dead when you found him? No. Then he must have died while you were carrying him. Yes. The storm's pretty bad. You'd better stay here until it blows itself out. Thanks. Gordon. Yes? Come over here a minute. All right. What do you want? Don't talk so loud. Do you see his clothes? Whose? But not the dead man. What's so different about them? Gray shirt and slacks? Remember the broadcast? Gray shirt and slacks. Six feet tall with gray hair and brown eyes. Well, that man fits the description of the one that, that they put out the warning about. Hmm. What do you think we should do? I don't know. The announcer said he was dangerous. But it might not be him. What if it is? Hey, uh, what are you two talking about? Uh, uh, we, uh, we were wondering if you'd like, uh, uh, something to eat, sir. No. You, uh, you live around here? At one time. Do you, uh, know who he is? I remember the face very well, but the name escapes me. What, uh, your name? I'd rather not say. <clears throat> well, um... Why don't you drive into town and, and get some cigarettes, Gordon? But we have... Uh, yes, we, uh, we're almost out. Uh, I'll go right away. But I don't... Understand. We don't have enough, Jim. Oh, all right, if you say so. You ought to wear a raincoat. No, I'll be uh, right back. I'll get back as soon as I can with the, with the cigarettes. Hurry, Gordon. Plenty. Did you hear the broadcast about the escaped killer? Yep. Well, there's a man at our cabin who fits that description. You sure? Yeah. He came to the cabin and he was carrying a dead man. What'd the dead man look like? Well, blonde, nice-looking fellow. He's dead, huh? Yeah. And we think the other man killed him. The lunatic? Yes. He couldn't have. Why? Because he was captured a few minutes after that broadcast. You must have turned your radio off right after the bulletin. Oh, yes, we... we did. But, Sheriff, then, who are the men in our cabin? The men in your cabin? I'll tell you who they are. The young one was Tom Monroe. He was going up to see you. Tom Monroe? Yes. Why? To tell you that it just wasn't a wild story I told you. To tell you to get out of that cabin before it was too late. Then the other man is Jeff... Stone. I told Tom not to go, but he wouldn't listen to me. He said he didn't want any more people to die up there. And so he died himself. Sheriff, Jim and Betty are still up there. With Jeff Stone? Yes. Well, we're going to have to move awful fast to save him. Come on! so slippery. I hope we can make it up to the top. Yeah, we're almost there. Keep driving. Yes. I almost didn't make it down. I got stuck once up there. We'll make her. Oh, if anything's happened to them, I don't know what I... Just do. pay attention to the road. All right. Here's the spot I got stuck in before. Ah, we're not moving. Rocker, little rocker. Right. Ah, oh, no. We're stuck. We're stuck good. Then leave the car here and we'll travel the rest of the way on foot. All right. All right. Let's get out. I can see the light through the trees. Come on, let's go. All right. It's slippery. Yeah. Watch your step. Betty! Jim, we're coming! I can't hear you, not with this storm and all. Oh, I thought if he heard me. Yeah, forget it. Just watch. Are you all right? Yeah, I guess so. Here, I'll help me up. Thank you. There you are. All right, let's go. All right. And we're almost there. Yeah. I hope they're all right. We'll go in quietly, huh? Just open the door and walk in. Right. The storm ought to cover any sounds we make. Right. And you just let me handle this. All right. Here we go. 
It's locked. We'll have to break it down together, then. All right. Well, that was Betty. We got to get that door down. Right. That's it. That's it. Betty, Betty, what's wrong? It's you. Of course. I brought the sheriff with me. Where's the man that was here? Oh, he's gone. I... I thought it was him returning when you crashed against the door. That's why I screamed it. I was afraid. Well, I want to be sure that... Yep, it's Tom Monroe, all right. You know this man? Yeah, he's the grandson of old man Monroe, who murdered Jeff Stone by letting him freeze to death outside. Jeff Stone's revenge is over now. But... But if he'd killed other people that came here, then... Why didn't he hurt us? Revenge is a strange thing, ma'am. In Jeff Stone's case, I think it was strong enough to bring him back from the grave to try to even the score. And so he killed old man Monroe over again every time someone died here. And when he killed young Tom here, then his feeling for revenge left him. Why? Tom was the last of the Monroes, Mr. Blake. Jeff Stone's revenge is complete now. Yes, sir, it's complete now. And he can rest quiet in his grave. So runs tonight's tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Police Headquarters in his famous cases of crime and murder. Mr. Chameleon, as you know, is the famous and dreaded detective who frequently uses a disguise to track down a killer. A disguise which at all times is recognized by the audience. Tonight we give you Mr. Chameleon in the locked room murder case. The scene opens in the home of a retired businessman, Harvey Watkins, who, while retired, still keeps a finger on his many business interests and operates an office in his home. And it is there that we find him angrily facing his confidential secretary, Arthur Finley, as he says the words that lead to a fantastic murder case. Finley, I've been going over your accounts. You're $5,000 short. There must be a mistake, Mr. Watkins. No, there's no mistake, Finley. You stole 5000 I want it back. I've taken a lot from you, Mr. Watkins. But you can't brand me a thief. You get that 5000 back before 3 o'clock this afternoon, or I'll have you jailed. Is that clear? Let me pay it back to you, Mr. Watkins, out of my salary. Hold out $100 every month. I said today, Finley. But I... Get out, Finley. 3 o'clock or jail. When you leave, ask my daughter, Rosalind, to come here. Here she is now, sir. Oh, come in here, Rosalind, and shut the door. Yes, Father, what is it? I just gave Arthur Finley until 3 o'clock to pay back $5,000 that he stole from him. Stole from you, Father? Well, that's awful. Rosalind, there's also some 20000 in bearer bonds missing from my strongbox. What? Do you think he stole those too, Father? No. You or your husband, one or the other, stole them. Bruce or I stole... What are you talking about, Father? I'm talking facts. 
You tidy up this room in the morning? That's because we haven't a maid now. I keep the whole house clean. We haven't a maid because you're too stingy to pay the current wages. Chances are you found the key to the strong box in my room, gave it to your husband, Bruce, and he used it to open the box and nip the bonds. This, this is fantastic. Find that husband of yours, Rosalind. I'll make him the same proposition I made Arthur Finley. Tell him to get those bonds back to me before three, or I'll have him jailed. But, Father... They've only been missing a couple of days. Chances are he hasn't cashed them yet. He never took them, Father. Bruce just wouldn't. You heard me, Roslyn. The bonds back before three, or jail for the both of you. Father, think what you're saying. Having your own daughter and her husband arrested as thieves. It's too horrible. It won't be if you return what you stole from me. Here by three or jail. <laughs> uh, stop slobbering, Rosalind. It's cold in here, Father. Shall I light the gas grate? You light out and tell your husband what I said. That's all you've got to worry about. All right, Father. Oh, Oh, you, Mr. Fisher. Hello, Roslyn. Your father sent for me. I'll say I sent for you, Fisher. Come in. Mr. Fisher, please intervene with father for me. I've done it lots of times, Roslyn. What's up, my dear? Get out, Roslyn, and shut the door. Remember what I said? Yes, father. What's happened, Watkins, old man? You look ready to break a blood vessel. Now, listen, Fisher. I'm telling you this because I'm surrounded by a pack of thieves. Pack of thieves, Watkins? <laughs> You've had these ideas before. I but... caught that confidential secretary of mine red-handed. Stole 5,000 from me. Gave him till three this afternoon to make good or I'd have him jailed. Arthur Finley, you mean? By George. I'll take the responsibility for that. I hired him for you. Ah, forget it, Fisher. That's not the half. And my own daughter, Rosalind, and her husband, Bruce, snitched 20,000 in bearer bonds from my strongbox. What do you say to that, Fisher? What would you do about that? I'd say Roslyn is your daughter. And that to err is human. And to forgive, divine. That's because you're a soft-hearted old fossil. I gave them the same treatment I gave Arthur Finley. Return what they stole before three or jail. No, not that, Watkins. You simply can't. I can and I will, Fisher. And I'll tell you another thing. Any of the three, including my daughter, is capable of killing me. I know murder when I see it blazing from people's eyes. Let me try to straighten this out, Watkins, old man. Look before you leave. I am looking, Fisher. Ah, here's a letter I've written the police. If anybody kills me, you give it to them. Or, or better still, stick it in the mailbox when you leave. I'll not mail any such letter, Watkins. Do as I say and don't argue with me. I won't mail it. I said to look before you leap. Now it is exactly ten minutes before three o'clock, the hour set by Harvey Watkins to have the money he accused his secretary, Arthur Finley, of stealing return to him or be jailed. And he dished out the same threat to his daughter, Rosalind, for her husband, Bruce, accusing them of stealing 20000 in bonds. Now we hear Rosalind saying, Bruce, do you smell anything in here? Smells like gas to me, Rosalind. That's what I thought. Rosalind. Bruce, what's wrong, Finley? Come quick. Gas is pouring out of Mr. Watkins' library from under the door. What? And I can't get in. The, the door is bolted tight. Bolted? Come on, we'll run outside and look in the window. I just hope Father isn't in there. He might be asphyxiated. Oh, here's the window. I, I'll try to lift you up, Finley, so you can look in. Okay, Bruce. Come on. Uh, here we are. Uh, yeah, I, I've got hold of the window ledge, Bruce. Steady now. Do you see anything, Mr. Finley? Your... Your father. Your father, Rosalind. He, he slumped down before the door. I... I think he's dead. No, he can't be. I'll break the glass in. Hand me that rock, Bruce. Uh, here, thanks. <laughs> That'll let some of the gas out of the room. Is... Is Father dead? Yes. I'm sure he is, Rosalind. 
Then he committed suicide. Call a doctor. I'll phone the police. Why the police, Finley? Because I think you and Rosalind killed him, Bruce. Killed him? What do you mean? How could we gas a man to death in a bolted room? Good afternoon. I'm comedian of the police. You called for us? Yes. My father committed suicide. Oh, please come in. Thank you. We had your call to that effect. I uh, take it that you are Rosalind Watkins Rogers? Yes. This is Detective Dave Arnold. How do you do, Mrs. Rogers? I... I can't understand why Father should have ended his own life, Mr. Chameleon. Well, after your call reporting his suicide, Rosalind, we had a second call reporting that he was murdered. I don't understand. Detective Arnold and I do not investigate suicide cases, Rosalind. Only murders. Nobody could have murdered my father, Mr. Chameleon. He locked himself in his study, turned on the gas logs in the grate, and... and died in there alone. The door is still locked. We couldn't get in. That's quite true, Mr. Chameleon. Oh, this is my husband, Bruce Rogers, Mr. Chameleon. How do you do, Bruce? That's the door there, Mr. Chameleon. Try it. You'll see it's bolted from inside. Well, I'll leave that to do, uh, Detective Arnold. Shall I smash it in? No, Dave. Uh, try your keys first. Okay, Mr. Chameleon. Hey. What do you think, Mr. Chameleon? I think the door was not bolted from the inside, as Bruce and Rosalind said, Dave, but locked from the outside by the murderer. What does that mean? If your father had locked himself in, Rosalind, Detective Arnold's key couldn't have entered the lock so easily. There's no key inside on the floor, Mr. Chameleon. I, I can't understand this. Nor can I, Mr. Chameleon. You wait here with your wife, Bruce. After Detective Arnold and I have seen the body and looked over the murder room, we may have something. Huh? There's the body, Mr. Chameleon. Died from gas, all right. See his color? Yes, Dave. I think I look over the gas grate. Well, well. The on and off lever has been tampered with, so the gas can't be turned off. And the damper to the chimney is dead shut. And that's not all, Mr. Chameleon. This murdered man was bashed on the head before he was bumped. What do you know? I know why I never believed in locked room murder mysteries, Dave. And that most murderers are stupid people. Sure, but where does that get us? Easy. Easy, Dave. I think I hear Bruce and Rosalind talking outside. Come, sneak over to the door. It's Mr. Chameleon. is suspicious of us. It'll be because you told him that door was bolted instead of locked, Bruce. I know how to handle that, Rosalind. I'll tell him a few things when he comes out. Open the door, Dave. Well, Rosalind, your father did not kill himself. He was murdered. How unspeakable. Mr. Chameleon, I've been thinking about that locked door. You have, Bruce? The only person who could have locked Rosalind's father in there to die was his confidential secretary, Arthur Finlay. Really? Father gave him until 3 o'clock today to return $5,000 he'd stolen from him. And threatened him with jail if he didn't, Mr. Chameleon. That's what I was leading to. Why didn't you tell me this before? Why, I had no opportunity, Mr. Chameleon. Oh, Oh, it's the phone. I'll answer it, Boswell. Hello, Chameleon of the police speaking. Oh, Chameleon, this is the commissioner. Oh, hello, commissioner. Oh, funny thing, Chameleon, but a special delivery letter just got here from the murdered man, Harvey Watkins. From the murdered man? Right. Want me to read it to you, Chameleon? Uh, no, tell me what's in it, Commissioner. Well, the letter says he caught his confidential secretary stealing $5,000 from him. Yes, I know that already, Commissioner. He also says that his daughter, Rosalind, and her husband, Bruce Rogers, nipped 20000 in bearer bonds from him. What? Uh, go on, please. He says he gave them all until 3 o'clock today to make good, or he'd have them jailed. And uh, follow this, Chameleon. What, Commissioner? The letter says he's afraid the daughter and husband, or the secretary, Arthur Finley may murder him if they can't make good. Says he saw murder in all their eyes. Well, he saw it in somebody's eyes, Commissioner. Goodbye. Bye, Chameleon. Well, Bruce, that was the Commissioner of Police. The Police Commissioner, Mr. Chameleon? Yes, Rosalind. And it seems I have a pretty clear murder case against you and your husband. No. No! 
He's bluffing, Roslyn. Don't let him frighten you. Oh, come now. You stole 20,000 in bonds and had until 3 o'clock to return them to the murdered man or jail. That is no bluff. And your wife reported a phony suicide at precisely five minutes before three. We never stole any bonds from father. That was pure imagination on his part. Oh, come on. We've got a letter at police headquarters to prove that you did. Written by your murdered father. Oh, no. No. Pull them both in, Dave. Hold them under tension. Okay, Mr. Chameleon. That's the doorbell. Let me answer it, Mr. Chameleon. All right. Open it, Rosalind. Oh, Mr. Fisher. Mr. Fisher. This, this is Mr. Chameleon, the detective. Tell him Bruce and I didn't murder father. Of course you didn't, you poor child. I can explain everything to Mr. Chameleon, dear. Well, if you can, you're good, Mr. Fisher. Incidentally, who are you? My full name is Jazzle Fisher, Mr. Chameleon. I've been the partner of Rosalind's dead father some 30-odd years. And this dear child or her husband didn't kill him. Well, whether you think so or not, Mr. Fisher, I'm holding them on suspicion of murder. You won't hold them after I tell you what I know, Mr. Chameleon. You'd be making a fool of yourself, sir. And I'll tell you why. All right. Why, Mr. Fisher? My murdered partner, Harvey Watkins, got me out here this morning. This morning? Yes, Mr. Chameleon. He was in a state of fury. Why? He told me his confidential secretary, Arthur Finlay, was short $5,000 in his accounts. And he's given him until three today to make good. Yes, I know. Or he'd have him jailed. Exactly, Mr. Chameleon. Then he told me Roslyn and Bruce here had stolen some $20,000 in bonds from his strongbox and that he'd given them until three to return the bonds. That is why I'm holding them on suspicion of murder, Mr. Fisher. But they didn't steal any bonds, Mr. Chameleon. Watkins later found the bonds in one of his desk drawers. Found them, you say? Yes. Dave, look through that desk in the murder room, please. Right away, Mr. Chameleon. I don't think Detective Arnold will find the bonds there, Mr. Fisher. Not there, Mr. Chameleon? Why not? Because of a letter the murdered man sent to police headquarters. What? Did Watkins mail that letter after all? He asked me to and I refused. He must have been completely insane. Chameleon, here are the bonds. 20,000 even. Oh, thank heaven, Bruce. That leaves us out. You bet it does, Rosalind. Thanks to Mr. Fisher. It's uh, too early for thanks, Bruce and Rosalind. You're both still under suspicion of murder. Father's confidential secretary, Arthur Finley, killed him. I know he did. I know he did. Give me his address. Leave it to me to find out if he did. All I know is that you insisted your father had killed himself in a locked room when he actually was murdered. Mr. Chameleon and the locked room murder case continues in just a moment. Now back to Mr. Chameleon and the locked room murder case. When Harvey Watkins, a wealthy retired businessman, is found dead in his study with a door locked and the room filled with gas, Mr. Chameleon discovers that Watkins' own daughter, Roslyn, and her husband, Bruce Rogers, might have murdered him. But now, shortly after, we find Mr. Chameleon and Detective Arnold confronting Arthur Finley the murdered man's confidential secretary in his modest flat. And we hear Mr. Chameleon say, Finlay, I wonder if you realize you are giving me one of the most ridiculous stories that I've ever heard. A kid just learning to walk wouldn't fall for that one, Finley. I'm telling the truth, Detective Arnold. Oh, come now, Finley. Are you trying to make us believe that 5,000 cash you've got there was lent you by a friend? To make good the 5000 you stole from your murdered employer, Harvey Watkins? Mr. Chameleon, I didn't steal, embezzle, or make off with a cent of Mr. Watkins' money. Oh, now, let's not be too ridiculous, Finlay. Why go back to Watkins' house to make good 5000 you didn't steal from him? It's nuts on the face of it. I tell you, rather than get pinched for a crime I didn't commit, I, I borrowed the 5000 to give Mr. Watkins. Oh, come on. I knew he'd give it back to me when he found out that my accounts were straight, Mr. Chameleon. So just as you were entering the house, you smelled gas, found the door to Mr. Watkins' room locked. That's what I said. I, I ran and called Bruce Rogers and his wife, Rosalind. We ran outside and I, I smashed in the window and saw him dead. 
Why didn't you unlock the door in the first place, Finlay? You had a key to the murder room, didn't you? Oh, I didn't have the key with me. I, I, I left it here. Who loaned you this 5000 Finlay? M- my mother. Where is your mother, Ham? I... I lied about that. My mother is dead, Mr. Chameleon. But I won't tell you where I got the money. Oh, you won't, won't you? Never mind, Dave. Come along. We put men up for murder on less likely stories than this bird's. You can't put me there, Mr. Chameleon. I'm telling the truth. Well, I've caught you in one lie. Tell me, did Bruce Rogers give you this money? What? Him? Why, he killed Mr. Watkins himself. Okay, Finlay, that's all for now. Let's go, Dave. Goodbye, Finlay. But don't get the idea that I finished with you. Oh, brother, what a cockeyed story that guy gave us, Mr. Chameleon. He's near enough to the electric chair to be singed by the sparks, Dave. I'll say he is. The whole case hinges on whether his accounts on the murdered man's books were off to the tune of 5,000 or not. Yeah, I get you, Mr. Chameleon. Now, I'll get back to headquarters, Dave, and start the wheels turning to find that out. Well, uh, what about me? Where do I go? Back to the murder house, Dave. Sneak in if you can and look for any clues that indicate who turned off the main gas line to the house near the meter. Hey, so that's why there wasn't much gas coming out of the grate in the murder room. Oh, what a dope I am. It was probably turned off by the murderer. Afraid, perhaps, that somebody might snap on a switch or light a match and blow up the house. And now, one hour later at Central Police Headquarters, we hear Detective Dave Arnold saying... Well, that turned out to be another dead end, Mr. Chameleon. The gas was shut off near the meter, all right. But otherwise, there wasn't a single clue. Get anything yourself on Arthur Finley's books? Well, I found out they seem to be in order, Dave. Didn't take you long, Mr. Chameleon. No, Mr. Fisher, the murdered man's partner, put me straight on that point. But, uh, that doesn't mean that Finley isn't our man. No, but if he is, that lets out Bruce Rogers and his wife, Rosalind, the victim's daughter. Nobody's out, Dave. Well, then who did it, Mr. Chameleon? Well, when I get out there disguised as a gas fitter named Al Hicks in the next hour, Dave... Oh, you want me to get everybody out to the murder house now? Yes, Dave. Especially Finlay, the young secretary. Mr. Fisher is going to be there waiting for you. Uh, Come in while I'm getting on my disguise. I'll tell you what part you play then. Okay. But I sure wish I knew who we're coming out with, Mr. Chameleon. I think I do, Dave. But it'll take some fancy footwork to pin the killer down. Shortly after, we see Mr. Chameleon in his disguise as Al Hicks, gas fitter in greasy coveralls, about to enter the murder house, and we hear him saying... Uh, Dave, before we go in, here's the voice of my disguise. That the gas grate Mr. Chameleon wants me to look at, Detective Arnold? Uh-huh. I got you, Mr. Chameleon. Okay, now I'll open the door. Who is this man, Detective Arnold? He happens to be a gas fitter, Bruce. Name of Al Hicks. A gas fitter? A gas fitter? Yes, that's right, Rosalind. Has uh, that the gas grape Mr. Chameleon wants me to look over, Detective Arnold? Yes, it is, Mr. Hicks. So start moving, will you? Uh, Mr. Chameleon wants me to find out his... If the off and on lever has been tampered with. Well, has it been, Hicks? Don't take an expert like Al Hicks to tell you that, Detective Arnold. Look at it yourself. Been fixed so it can't be turned off. Gas would keep coming no matter what you did. It hasn't been tampered with. Certainly it hasn't, Bruce. You're saying that, Rosalind, because your husband Bruce murdered your father. I saw Bruce fooling it with, with it. Myself, this morning. Well, if you did, why didn't you tell me that this afternoon, Arthur Finlay? I forgot it until this moment. Say, you're not a gas fitter. You're Mr. Chameleon in disguise. Well, that's right. That's right, I'm Chameleon. So you saw Bruce Rogers fix this gas grate so the gas couldn't be turned off, Finlay. I suspected as much myself. Oh, Bruce. Bruce, how could you? Bruce didn't, Rosalind, you poor child. Now, don't accuse your husband. Think what you're saying, my dear. Arthur Finley, your father's secretary, murdered him and then locked the door to deceive the police. You're a liar, Fisher. I didn't, Mr. Chameleon. Finlay, 
Who gave you that 5,000 I found you with this afternoon? Now answer fast. Nobody gave it to me. It, it was the money I stole from Mr. Watkins. But I'm not taking a murder rap for it. His son-in-law, Bruce, killed the old man. Mr. Chameleon, isn't that exactly what I told you? Isn't it evident Finley murdered my partner, Harvey Watkins, and now is trying to place the crime on these innocent young people, Bruce and Roslyn? Oh, Mr. Fisher, you're the kindest man I ever met. I don't think he is, Roslyn. Mr. Fisher killed your father. Uh, what's that, Chameleon? I killed him. Well, you've lost your head. I told you exactly what happened. You told me exactly nothing, Fisher. You told me that Finley's accounts were in order. That's what I believed at the time, Chameleon. You didn't believe anything of the sort, Fisher. You told me Finley's accounts were straight because your own were crooked. M my account's crooked, Chameleon. Ridiculous. Ever hear of the police auditors, Fisher? Here is their report. You drained your trusting partner of everything he had. Arthur Finley, his secretary, murdered him. That's what I got the flash on you in the first place, Fisher. When Rosalind Hare was saying that her father was a suicide, you said nothing about suicide. Why should I have, Chameleon? Because you knew it was murder. That's why. Those are guesses, Chameleon, and guesses don't hold up in court. Give me that key you have to the lock murder room, Fisher, or I'll throw you on the floor and take it from you. Quick, now let's have it. All right. Here they are, Chameleon. I'd like to kill you. Don't try it, Fisher. Don't try it. You put those bonds Detective Arnold found back in the murdered man's desk, hit him over the head from behind, and then turned on the gas, locked the door and left the room, right? If I confess, will it help me get a lighter sentence, Chameleon? Confess or not, you'll get the chair, Fisher. Dave, take him. The case of the locked room is over. And how, Mr. Chameleon? <laughs> And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. Listen next Wednesday night at this same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson, with dialogue written by Frank Hummert... From the original story by Frank and Ann Hummert. It is directed by Richard Leonard with music by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Drowning, Penniquit, Maine. While her sister stood helplessly on the dock, Abigail Thorne, 26, was drowned in the bay here at midnight last night. What? According to her sister Sarah, the older girl was about to board her ship. The Black Swan. What? Why, well, yes, that's the name. How did you know? How did I know? Because it had to be. It had to be. <laughs> Midnight, the witching hour when the night is darkest, our fears the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a moment in The Black Swan. <laughs> And now, Murder at Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror, by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. 
Our story by Leon Meadow is The Black Swan. It's odd, isn't it? How familiar sounds revive old memories. Listen to the waves against the dock. Yeah, it's six years since I, Amos Bradley, last heard this sound. Last stood here in the moonlight, looking out over Penniquid Bay. And there she rides at anchor, just as she did six years ago. A black ship against the sky. Forty-five feet of black hull beauty. Loveliest sloop ever turned out in the main shipyard. Forty-five feet of unholy black evil. The Black Swan, she was named. But a better name would have been Ship of Death. Yes, she was even launched in blood. Henderson! Oh, Henderson! See my son any place? Hello, Mr. Dorn. Left right on deck. Well, how do you like the Black Swan? Uh, Lighter. Fine talk about a ship built for Fred Thorne. Well, Fred thinks she's the trimmest job he ever turned out. Trim? Uh, a pleasure ship. Well, what are you waiting for? Will you tell Fred I'm here? Oh, yes, sir. I'll get him just as soon as we check the keel plate. Yeah, we're going to launch her in a few minutes. Stay around and watch her hit the water. Uh, stay around. Watch. Old, broken down Caleb Thorne. That's all he's good for, anyway. Stay around. Watch. Hello, Father. How are you? Stay around. Watch. Watch as good as buried. And built for a girl. Think your sister will like it? Abby will be pleased, Father. It's a fine birthday present. All right, men. He's just about ready. All set here, Fred. Okay, Henderson. I'm coming down, too. Want to check the clearance. I'll see you in a minute, Dad. Go on, go on. All right, over here. Captain Thorne will stand here and watch. The worthless, peg-legged old man. The sea is the Lord. The sea giveth a man his life and taketh his life. Stand aside, Caleb. Uh, what's taking him so long? Seems to be... What's that? Fred! One of the braces, Father! It slipped! Hey, Henderson! Henderson, you fool! Get down here! The braces are given away! Fred! Son! Get out! I'm trying to! I've got the sweat skin! If I move the other brace, I'm afraid! Henderson! I mean, Fred, just hold on! Hurry! She's starting to fall him! Yes, launched in blood. Murderer of Fred Thorne. The black swan never left the yard. For months she lay there on the waves like a stranded whale on a beach. There was talk in town about old Caleb turning strangely on the one thing he was supposed to love. His daughter Abby. But I dismissed it as idle village gossip. Actually, no one knew very much about the family. The Thorns kept themselves on that little island of theirs. You can just make it out. Yeah, they're beyond the breakwater. And then one day, about six months after Fred was killed, I ran into Philip Hazlitt on Main Street. Hi, Amos. Just the man I want. I'm looking for a first mate. Yeah, since when? Well, I had a note from Abby yesterday. She wants me to bring the black swan out to the island. The black swan? I thought the old man... Changed his mind, I guess. No, you never can tell with him. But, Abby, I, I mean, after what happened... I... Oh, come now. You certainly haven't started believing that old wife stuff. No, no, of course not. But the old man swore he'd never look at the ship again. Well, search me. Well, anyway, I'm to bring her out Saturday. You want to come? Yeah. I think I do. You, you take over the wheel. She handles like a dream. Well, Fred knew how to build them. Now, watch it. She's trigger light to the touch. Well, maybe this is the turning point. Maybe now, well, maybe now Abby will set the date. Now that she's put these childish fears behind her. You've been patient, Philip. I'd wait forever for Abby Thorne. How about the old man? You know how he feels about Abby or how he was supposed to. You'll just have to learn to like it. Cut her closer to the boy. That's it, Amos. All right. 
Now, a few points. Ah, there we are. There's the dock. Abby was standing there on the little dock, waiting for us, waving to us as we anchored in the cove and jumped into the dory. A dark-haired, willowy girl. Lovely girl. And next to her, next to her was Sarah, Sister Sarah, 14, a smaller, incredibly faithful replica of Abby, except for her eyes, her piercing, stony blue eyes, which were like Caleb's, frighteningly like Caleb's. Abby had planned a picnic for us at Arrow Beach on the other side of the island. She and Philip had set out first to get away from Caleb, I suspect, and I was to bring Sarah along later. Well, just as we were about to leave the house, Caleb stopped me. He'd scarcely uttered a word since our arrival. I want you to see something, Amos. Oh, all right. You come too, sir, to Fred's room. All right, Father, only I know what it is. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sarah knows. It's our secret. We keep it locked in Fred's room. We waited till Abby was gone. Abby's left us. Left? Oh, Father means she's with Philip. Yeah, Abby's gone. Abby's left us. See him? It's on the floor there. What? It's a tool chest, complete set. His tools, Fred's. All his tools, his planes and chisels and gouges. And all the bits and braces and mallets. All his tools. Aren't they beautiful, Amos? The way they shine? We keep them shining and clean. Just the way Fred always kept them. It's our secret. Uh, Abby doesn't know. Abby's left us. But Fred is back now. See all his tools. And someday, Father, take them and put them all in that big chest and bury them out at sea. <laughs> That's what Sarah and me planned. Only now I have a better idea. You didn't tell me, Father. You didn't. <laughs> there, Father. Where could there be a better place? <laughs> There's a better place, all right. Well, go on, go on. Get to your picnic. <laughs> There's a better place, all right. <laughs> I don't remember much about that picnic. Except Abby's unusual quietness. Philip's efforts to keep the conversation alive. And Sarah's strange restlessness. She stared at me constantly. Warning me silently with those intense blue eyes. Warning me about that secret of Caleb's. Well, I was glad, I know that, when we finally said goodbye late that night, rode out to the Black Swan and cast off. Amos, I don't get it. Get what? The ship, the way she's acting. She's not responding. She's sluggish. Ah, temperamental. Where do we get out beyond the cold? She feels the wind. Looks stiff out there. of a splintered mast. Lost in the darkness. Philip Hazlitt, second victim for the Black Swan. Somehow, I managed to get the swan back. And shortly afterward, I left Pennequit to work in Boston for my uncle's engineering firm. I heard nothing from or about the thorns for a year when I received a short, formal note from Abby. Her father had passed away peacefully in sleep. Well, I would have been less surprised had Caleb's death been more violent, had the black swan somehow been involved. 
And then, once more, Penniquit and Thorns receded into the past. Three, four, five years slipped by uneventfully before the black swan again revived my half-forgotten fears. I uh, had just returned from a conference to find Miss Brewster, my assistant, standing at my desk, glancing at the evening newspaper. Uh, she looked up as I entered the office. You're from Penniquit, Maine, aren't you, Mr. Bradley? Yeah. Yeah, what about Penniquit? Oh, well, uh, this little item here. Possibly you know the girl. Sounds positively spooky. Listen. Girl in mystery drowning. Penniquit, Maine. While her sister stood helplessly on the town dock, Abigail Thorne, 26, was drowned in the bay here at midnight last night. According to her sister, Sarah, 20, the older girl was just about to board her ship. The Black Swan. What? Why, yes. That is the name. The Black Swan. How did you know? How did I know? It had to be. It had to be. The dark of night. And the ship with the past that is just as dark. What would you expect of a ship that was launched in blood, but... Murder! At midnight! And now back to Murder at Midnight and The Black Swan. Who has the ship of death singled out for its next victim? Listen as Amos tries to find the answer. So you didn't think a ship could be a murderer? (laughs) First, Fred Thorne, who built the Black Swan for his sister, Abby. Then Flip Hazlitt, who loved that sister, Abby. And then, Abby. Lovely, dark-haired Abby herself. And who's to be next? Well, that's why I'm here now. Why I've come back after all these years to Penniquet Bay. I'm going to find out tonight. Yeah, I know. It's late and dark. Care to come? No? Can't say I blame you. What's that? May storm a bit later. Well, fine. That suits me just fine. I'm going out there, see? Sailor myself. Before this night is done, I am going to know the answer. Hmm. In pretty good shape after all this time. Somebody must be taking care of it. Somebody is, Amos. Very good, Carol. Abby! That surprises you, Abby, coming back here. It can't be. Do you need a flashlight to reassure you? Wouldn't Abby's ghost be more companionable in this pale, thin moonlight? It's you, Sarah. Little Sarah. For a moment, I... I thought I was Abigail. Yes, Amos, you were the one who always said I was the image of it. I am. A pale image. A reflection without substance. Come over here and sit down, Amos. After all, we have a lot to talk about. You want to know, don't you? You came back to find out about... Abby. The black swan? Yes, Amos. But the paper didn't say how or why, did it? It didn't tell about the fights we had, Abby and I, after Father died. The bitter fights we had about the black swan. Until one day, a few months ago, it was. Why not, Abby? Why not, Seller? What's so precious about that horrible ship? I won't, that's all. I won't. Hasn't she caused enough grief? (laughs) Let her rot to pieces in the harbor. I won't, Seller. You're afraid, aren't you? Afraid she might kill someone else. Yes. Yes, I'm afraid. Then make sure she never has another chance. Sure. How? Destroy her. In the harbor. Destroy her? Yes, Sarah. Yes, why not? We can gasoline at the house. We could burn her in the harbor. Tonight. 
And that's what you were going to do that night. Yes, Amy. We put two cans of gasoline in the dory and rode out to the Black Swan. But it said in the paper you were standing on the dock. I was. We were about halfway out when suddenly a strange feeling of terror swept over me. Put back, Abby. Put back. Not now, Sarah. No, this is the way it must be. No, I tell you, no, I don't trust that ship. You won't ever have to again. I can't, Abby. I can't. Take me back. Help me, please, or I'll jump overboard and swim oh, back. All right, all right. I'll put you ashore. And then I'll come back. And I'll do it alone. <laughs> I see. See what? Do you see me standing there watching the dory and that choppy swell? Do you see me standing there watching Abby get to her feet a gasoline can in one hand? Do you see it happening swiftly, without warning, the black swan rolling violently, swamping the dory? Do you see Abby pitching forward, her head striking the black hole? Do you see her plunge backwards, her knees catching the gunwale, her body snapping like a broken oar? Her head beneath the water. When I got there, she was dead. The black swan again. Yes, the black swan. And we're the only two left to care. And we'd come back to find out. Amos, who loved my sister in silence. And Sarah. And Sarah? I might have told you once. But you went away like the others. I've come back, Sarah. Yes. Because there's no rest for you either. No rest until we know. Look to the anchor, Amos. It's time we did know. My friend at the dock was right. It's going to storm. Yes, I think so. And we haven't learned anything. She's handling like any other ship. Only better. Fred Builder to handle. She's biding her time, that's all. What are you thinking? Do you remember the picnic that day? Yes, sir. That night, after you and Philip had left, I went to Fred's room. They were gone. His tools, the chest. Gone? You mean Caleb? Yes. Father had taken them away while we were picnicking over at Arrow Beach. Take them where? He wouldn't tell me. He said he found a better place. He kept saying that over and over, but he would never tell me where. Poor father. Yes, sir. He changed so after Philip was killed. How? Well, it goes back to Fred, my brother Fred. Don't you see, father commissioned Fred to build the black swan as a birthday present for Abby. It was one of the ways he thought he could, well, buy Abby away from Philip. And Fred was the first victim of the black swan. Yes. Then, Philip. And the more Father tried, the worse it became. Abby wouldn't talk to him, not a word. In death, Philip took Abby further away from your father than he could possibly have done in life. Philip's death? No, Amos. Philip's murderer did that. The Black Swan. Better put her back and head back, Sarah. I don't like the way she's blowing up. And I don't care, Amos. I feel so different now about everything. Now that the swan is behaving herself? Yes. Well, maybe so, but the weather isn't. Now that you've promised to come back to Boston with me and to leave all this behind you, I'm not taking any chance. Anywhere you say, Amos, anywhere. Because now I'm free. See how she's riding the storm. It's as if she were free, too. <laughs> Sign of that breakwater yet? I should catch it in the next lightning. It's somewhere off port. I know it is. It can't be far now. Keep your eye peeled. I am. Very much. It is. It's... What did you say? Off port now. Hold her till I tell you. Then cut in. I think we can make it on one run. Okay. Say when. All set. All set. No. Swing her in now, Amos. I. I am. I'm trying. Give me it every day. I... No, Amos. Quicker, we'll hit the rocks on the other side of the end. She won't. Oh, Put her about then, quick. She won't. She's not answering the helm. She's gone dead the way she did the night, Philip. <laughs> It's all right. It's all right. Hold on, Nate. 
You're safe. It's all over. Oh, Amy. Amy's the ship. Finished, dear. All finished. Can you sit up? Here, take my hand. Look, Sarah. I want to show you something. Over there. Can you see? See? See what? You mean the shiny... Yes, Sarah. It's half submerged. Why, there... No. No, they can't be. They are. They're his tools. Fred's tool chest and everything. Father. Father did it. Yeah. When Caleb said he knew a better place, he meant in the ship. Oh, Father. Father. Yes, he took the chest and nailed it up under the deck, up at the bow. That's why the black swan acted so strangely the night Philip and I left the island. But, Amos, tonight she was acting so beautifully until... I know. That's because somehow all these years she's been rocking there in the harbor. The chest worked itself loose, just loose enough so it would shift with the ship's motion. But then, I mean, what happened when we tried to bring her in tonight? Well, my guess is that the chest suddenly got itself wedged in tight in one place, off center. That's why she wouldn't answer the helm. Fred's chest. Yes, Amos. Yes, that's why she rolled so badly the night Abby and I... Don't, Sarah. It's all over now. Yes, it is over now, isn't it? It was almost over for us. And then no one would have known. We know now, Sarah. Yes, the black swan has been brought to justice. And by her own hand. A wild, strange family. And a ship that was launched in blood. With such a setting, it's no wonder that what was meant as a tribute and an act of love turned into... Murder! At with us again when death comes in with the rising tide and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. Our storyteller, Amos Bradley, was played by Lawson Zerby. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Broadcasting System presents Murder by Experts with your host and narrator, Mr. John Dixon Carr, whose books have been translated into 17 languages and have sold over 10 million copies, and author of the recently published detective novel, Below Suspicion. Good evening. 
This is John Dixon Carr. Each week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of crime and mystery which has been chosen for your approval by one of the world's leading detective story writers. Tonight, our guest expert is the noted mystery novelist, Craig Rice. In keeping with the spirit of the holiday season, Miss Rice, herself a witty and humorous writer, has selected a hilarious and suspenseful comedy mystery by Joseph Rusko. And now we present Carl Eastman in The Case of the Missing Mind. Again, Mr. Andrews? Doc! Aren't we the troublesome patient? Oh, Doc, you gotta believe me. It's all a mistake, a terrible mistake, you see, Doc? What's your angle, huh? I tell everybody the truth, the honest truth. So I'm a lunatic? What am I doing in a nut house? <laughs> now, now. Now, look. Our nice cousins are coming to visit. All the way from Two Forks. So let's be a good boy and watch our excitement curve, hmm? Good boy, huh? Just wait till they show up. I'll tell them the way I got shanghai here. They'll sue you for a million. They'll sue everybody. Meanwhile, if your hallucinations persist, those fantastic tales, that alleged man you murdered... But it was all real, I say. You got cotton in your ears. All that abracadabra, the Latin and the princess, Alibaba. There was no Alibaba. I never said anything about Alibaba, just the Latin and the princess. I can't help it if nobody believes me. It's true every word. Now, calm down there, or I'll be forced to put you in a straitjacket again. Now, we wouldn't like that at all, would we? Of course not. Pleasant dreams, Mr. Andrews. And remember, this is not the Arabian night. Oh, oh all this... All this can't be happening to me. Not me, Kenny Andrews. Everybody's known me before. I always know the right time. But I tell this story, they look at me queer. So it does sound screwy. So it's my fault? My golly, the thing dance by it, I swear it. Listen to me, someone, listen. All right. Only two weeks ago, everything's normal, see? Like always, I'm doing the best I can with an angle. Only the best wasn't so hot the last few months. I've been up the creek, the horses were dogs. My one unhocked suit was all ripped and torn by a certain Broadway bookie. That is important. Keep your eye on that suit. I was absolutely from hunger, sitting in the lobby of a cheap hotel in the 40s, when, lo, this strange-looking character walks into my life. Good morning, friend. Do you ever dream? Just like that he began, the strange-looking guy with the purple hat. Do you ever dream, my friend? I'd noticed this character before, shadowing me for days. On Times Square, I buttoned my shoe. How do you do? There he is. Lose him in Schubert Alley, and he's the man right behind me when I'm putting a slug in the automat. And now here's Mr. Queer sitting beside me. Do I ever dream, he wants to know. What is it you dream when you dream, my friend? I am interested in wish fulfillment. Say, listen, pal, are you for real? What's the idea telling me anyway? Go take a long drop. I'd like a word with you. You see, Mr. Andrews... How'd I... you know my name? I am a mystic, sir. I know all. Oh, yeah? Maybe you know where I was born. Two Forks. And now about your dreams, sir. Say, who are you, anyway? Oh, call me Aladdin. Huh? Caught you kidding. Aladdin? Yes. Would you like to try my magic lamp? The guy is strictly from a nightmare, I figure. But let him talk. Look who's selling who to Brooklyn Bridge. Answer, friend. You begin to rub my lamp the wrong way. Now, look at Mr. Aladdin. Suppose you scramble. Before... Freeze, fellow. Put up your hands. Reach for the moon. Suddenly, the crazy little guy had me covered with a little green gun. Reach. I, 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 what is this? A stick up, you fool. To throw away good fortune when it seeks you out. For the last time, sir, what is it you dream when you dream? The theme that keeps returning. Your heart's desire. Like a nightmare. Watch your step, Kenny, I says to myself. You're dealing strictly with a query. Humor him or you're a dead pigeon. Oh, okay, sure, bud. I get you now. 
I, I, I always dreamed that, that somebody suddenly handed me 50 grand and a beautiful princess. Ashkenazi! My gosh, I, I hardly get it out of my mouth when it happened. You got to believe me, you got to, I tell you. This weird character in the purple hat, he whips out a huge envelope, he counts out $51,000 bills, he hands them over to me, he shouts, The princess, my friend, will come later. And he disappears out of the hotel. <laughs> on my honor, on my mother's grave. That's the way it all started. I warned you my story would sound like a hophead's fantasy. I don't blame anyone looking at me sideways. I, I even examined my own head listening to me tell it. Such things don't just happen. A strange character in a purple hat. A green gun. And there it is. Fifty grand. First, I don't believe my eyes. A guy like me, sharp, knows what time it is. He's strictly from Missouri. Still, them green bags look like the real McCoy. I stumbled over to the bank on the corner and up to a bank teller. I had to find out. Hey, would you kindly uh, mind breaking this bill for me like a good fella? Well, uh, let's... Uh, uh, the guy stared at the bill. Stared and stared. And then at me, suspicious. Uh, say. Goodbye, Kenny Andrews. Ten years stretch. A thousand dollar bill? Well, uh, He's casing it, but good. Easy, Kenny. Keep that heart still. Keep that heart still. Keep that heart still. Well, here, you, here it comes. Yes, I... Uh, <laughs> you know, we don't get these very often at this branch. And uh, <sighs> uh, how would you like to have your change, sir? Clean. It was clean. 50,000 cabbages. A minute ago, I couldn't crash a knee stand, and now I'm king. My head spun round and round. I nearly passed out. Next thing I know, I'm spread out on a bed back in my crummy hotel room. I feel in my shirt. It's still there. I count the bills again. All there. Passports to heaven. Hold on to that green. Hold on. All the money in the world and the world at your feet. First buy a new suit. Don't answer. Get rid of these rags. The sweet at the Waldorf. Ignore it. You're not here. Don't talk. It's yours. The guy in a purple hat, he came over to you. So it's magic. So what? I heard of such a thing. I read of such a thing. You're such a wise guy. Maybe I'm dreaming. No. No, not that. No. No, please. The one time in my life. <laughs> Hello? It is real, my friend. Oh. Mr. Aladdin? You are not dreaming. Oh, wonderful. You were thinking of buying a new suit. I am? I, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, I am. You are not to do so. This is the only condition. You must always wear that suit. Disobey and the penalty is death. You are being watched. Remember. But everything else on heaven and earth is now yours for the asking. Happy joys, my friend. You see? This gets screwier and screwier. But Aladdin's my boy, see? No questions asked. Who cares about front when you're healed with 50 G's? Clothes make the tin horn, but when you're a prince, <laughs> that's how all my troubles began and headed me for this joint. When I can't resist anymore and go and tell the strange events to the boys along Broadway, they give me the quick brush of rule. It was unnatural. Am I dreaming, I says to myself? All right, if I am, I'm going to get rid of the silly sequence. The rags must go. I enter a ritzy dog shop. <clears throat> my good man? Yes? Uh, I was just torn to shreds on the stock exchange. You know, the highly boily Ah, uh, I see, sir. Yeah, you know the bulls? I <laughs> understand, sir. A new suit. Yeah, I want to order about a dozen, and I want them out of this world. Something with a little dash supreme. Yes, sir. Well, now, if you'd like to consider these numbers here. But just then, my eye caught something looking in at me through the window. It was another eye that had a mad stare, and over it was a purple hat. And the pocket was aiming at me against the window. And without seeing it at all, I knew it was a little green gun. These charming summer worsted, sir? Look, pal, uh, what are you showing me suits for? Who said suits? I said overcoats. You said overcoats? With a fur collar. A fur collar? In July? Are you mad, sir? 
Why not? If I got to wear a coat to cover my past, it might as well have a fur collar. They always vision me in one, but only in my wildest dreams. So, next, with a lot of haberdashery and gloves and this and that and a walking cane, I'm ready for anything. I'm out to live, see? Come what may. Even a dog catcher. That night in Manhattan finds me slumming at a private table in a midnight casino. The classiest spot in town. Where before I could never even afford the bar. You are the monsieur? I already had a few quickies all over the stem. By now, I am a god. Champagne, Charlie, and a bottle for every lady in a joint whose escort can claim a purple hat. All eyes were upon me with admiration, including the most gorgeous little number at the very next table. Uh, big pardon, monsieur. It's the way to smile and not be very polite. You forgot to check your coat at the door, monsieur. It is a rule of the establishment. Oh, yeah, we'll see about this. Call a head waiter. I am the head waiter. Oh, yeah, huh? Go drop that. Gentlemen, please. It's that luscious brunette with the creamy shoulders sitting alone at the next table. Pierre, your manner, you disappoint me. But he's wearing an overcoat. Silence. Uh... Why do you not take this gentleman's order? But uh, it is a rule of the house. Uh... Oh, rules are for the riffraff. Can you not see he is perhaps an eccentric millionaire? That he is moreover to be my guest. Oh, so, princess. In that case, princess, a thousand pardons, your imperial highness. Go ahead, say it. Tweet, tweet. Kenny Andrews got the DTs. All right, don't swallow it then. But will someone please solve it for me? I am lonesome, young man. Won't you join my table? So this is the princess I was foretold. We made it a twosome, this royal doll and me. We killed three bottles, never taking our eyes off each other. Each was too entranced. Now what are we doing? We're sailing along 57 toward Park Avenue. Her head on my shoulders. Oh, can you shine? In a sky blue limousine, driven by a little midget. You heard me, a little midget. Be kind to me, babushka. She is a Russian, it seems. Princess Julie, from a branch without the heads cut. And she gives off like a rose. Promise you will be very kind. Where are we going, princess? <laughs> you silly goose. Don't you remember? Oh. We are on our way to my apartment. And sit closer. <laughs> More vodka. My darling, mm. it is the champagne of the Volga. Sure, my man. <laughs> and what about some delicious joyva? What's that? Oh, joyva is the love candy of the Orient. Open your mouth, my little Kenyusha. Oh, it's wonderful stuff. <laughs> oh, this ain't happening. This ain't really happening, is it? Oh, hush, my life. Go on, tell me more of your philosophy. Hey, where was I, Princess Baby? Angle. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's all a matter of angles, see? I'm full of them, Your Highness. In this town, if you're sharp, cut your wits, never give a sucker an even break, one can rise to millions. Uh, now, taking two forks. Two forks? Who is two forks? In Oklahoma, where I was born. Ah. <laughs> Out there, they don't even know what time it is. If I stood out there, your worship, I'd commit suicide. Mm -hmm. I ran away when I was 12. More vodka, Kenyusha. You tell me about it. I must know all about you. Naturally. I live with my Uncle Iggy, see? Well, a poor yokel, he spends all his time digging, mm -hmm. digging in his backyard. <laughs> For what? <laughs> Can you tie that? <laughs> How quaint. Go on. You, my, my cousins, Your Excellency. Just as dopey, Joe and Fanny and all the rest. Mm -hmm. it, the cows give them milk today? <laughs> it stifles me, get it? There's no room for a smart guy with a niche in a place like that. You listen? Yes, drink up, my love. So I get my first angle. I organize a cousin's club, elect myself treasurer, buy me a ticket to New York, and shake the dust forever. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good, huh? Mm, your grace. Your grace, uh, the, the room's turning sideways. Oh, come closer, my heart. Hmm? And kiss me again. Hmm. Kiss me. Hmm, it's hot in here. 
Then why not take off your overcoat, Kenyusha? Oh, no, 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 no. I, I'm, I, I'm all right now. Sir Princess. Hmm? Whose cane is that over there by the piano? It's not mine. No, no, my sweet. It is my husband. Hmm? Some music. You what? Oh, don't be alarmed, Kenny. She's out of town. Oh, I hate him. Oh, I hate him, the beast. He abuses me so. Oh, he does, huh? Oh, Babushka, why am I telling you all this? Oh. Because always in my lonely life I am looking for someone. In my dreams I have seen him, and he has caressed my cheek. Uh -huh. But the days go by and the years, and he does not come. And yet, always I know that Someday. Oh. <laughs> and tonight it happened. At the midnight club. One blind. Oh, you're right, man. Do, do, do you feel that way, too? Oh, Kenny, you do love me. Oh, do I? Oh, Princess, I, I'm crazy about you, Your Honor. <laughs> With all my heart and soul and... It's a great privilege I never visioned. I, I do anything for you. You do anything. Anything, just to have you. Would you commit murder for me? What? Would you commit murder for me, can you? What? What's that? Shh. Speak low. This is a speaker. My husband. Hmm? It's his knock. Your husband? I, I, I thought you. Would you kill for me, can you, sir? Well, he's got his key. Then choose my gun. Take it. When he opens the door, shoot. Yeah, but, but, Do you but, love me, Kenyusha? Do you want me? Huh? Oh, my heart. Think only that monster stands in the way. The door. It's open. He's coming in. The, the, there he is. What are you waiting for? Oh, shoot. Shoot. Yeah. What do you dream when you dream, my friend? You killed him. My golly. It was him. Mr. Aladdin. Hey, Chief, you know the guy we've been getting complaints about all day with Aladdin's lamp? That raggedy bum with the fur coat in July? Casey, I want him picked up and put in a cage. He's right here now, Chief. He wants to see you. Oh, my gosh. Okay, wild eyes. I can't stand it anymore. I'm going to give myself up. Casey, don't go away. I don't want to be left here alone with this lunatic. What's up? He says he just bumped off a guy a half hour ago. What? Who'd he bump off? Aladdin. Aladdin? <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that a hot one now? <laughs> I don't know what made me do it. I, I killed him in cold blood. I, I don't know what come over me. But she's absolutely in a clear, I tell you. And I'm willing to fly alone. Hold on there. She? Who is she? The princess whom I was doomed to meet. The princess? Why, sure. Now, I don't give me any more of that Arabian Nights. What the devil are you wearing, a fur coat in July? I think you're crazy. I'm beginning to think so, too. Shut up. Stop shaking. Now, what about that 50 grand fairy tale? It's gone. After we killed him, we ran out of her apartment. I felt in my shirt and it was gone. We killed him? Where's the princess? She had an appointment with a hairdresser. What? Sit down. You mean that murderous... What murderous? I absolve her. I turned her head. For once in my life, I'm going to act like a man. I killed him. But I can't stand it anymore. My, my conscience has been haunting me. It's like a nightmare. You expect me to swallow that hocus pocus. What do I look like? Then don't swallow it, but please solve it for me. Where is the corpus, if any? Why are you dead and to be? All right, let's go. But if you're dragging me along on a wild goose chase, I'll put you away in a padded cell. Now, come on. <laughs> Vacant. Bare. No one even lives here. Where do you see a body? Can't understand. My gosh, officer, I was just here, but now it's empty. Hey, what are you trying to pull on Can me? I help you, gentlemen? Who are you looking for? Who are you? I'm Mrs. Podolsky, the janitor. Well, who lived here last? Do you know a Princess Julie? A Princess Witch? <laughs> I'm afraid, mister, you got the wrong building. 
No one's been living in this apartment for the last six months. <laughs> What about it, Pierre? You're the head waiter in this nightclub. Do you ever know a wait on such a dame? A princess. A princess Julie. Yeah. Uh, but no, Monsieur Inspector. She is utterly unknown in this establishment. That's a lie! You remember Don Well just a couple hours ago. My fur coat. She was sitting at the next table and... Pierre, you... do you know this eccentric jerk here? Huh? Take a good look at him. Monsieur, I have never before seen him in my whole life. Get back in my car, you. You're headed for the judge. Miss Princess Jewel. No, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. I remember something now. She gave me a piece of paper somewhere. A phone number. Hey, look, look, look. The phone number. A hairdresser's where, where I was to call her. Instead, I gave myself up. Honest, look. Let's see. Here, here. There's a phone in that store. Go ahead, call it. Ask for it. See if I'm crazy. All right. Kenny, just one more chance I'll give you. But if you're giving me the business again, I'll tear you limb from limb. Come on. Hello? Hello. Uh, is this a hairdressing parlor? What's it? What number do you want? Who is this? Describer. A ravishing brunette. Shut up. Uh, this is Inspector Ross, Police Department. Is this a hairdresser's? My dear fellow, this is a private sanitarium for the insane. What? Dr. Bennett speaking. Tell him her teeth are like a pile. Tell Shut him... up, you. <clears throat> Sorry, Doc, I guess this is just a bum steer. You see, I got a prisoner here told me that a Princess Julie... What? W What's that? What's your prisoner's name? Uh, Kenny Andrews. Kenny Andrews, that's him. Don't let that man away. Get him right back here. He's an escaped lunatic. What? Well, I'll be... Now this makes sense. Look, Doc, give me your address quick. I'm delivering him myself in person, and it'll be a pleasure. Is the princess there? What do they say, huh? What do they say? <laughs> Brother, you're going home. Let me go! Let me go! Is this your man, Doc? Yes, that's him. He escaped from here two days ago. You're a liar! I've never seen you before in my life. Now, Timmons, give me a hand, quick. Now, now, let me alone. What are you doing? I'll, I'll bust you. What? Hey, please, this is a terrific... Thank you, Inspector. It's lucky for the community you found him. Yeah, and am I glad to unload this baby. What a ride he took me for. What an imagination. Oh, he's definitely a schizophrenic, poor lad. Too bad. Well, of course, we'll just keep him here under observation until he's committed elsewhere. You notified his relatives? Yes. They're on the way now from Oklahoma. They haven't seen him since he was a child. I hope they won't ask for his release. That would be tragic. It'd be bloody murder. Why, he's a menace. I'm sure glad you're taking him out of circulation. And that's my story. See, the whole truth. I swear it, it all transpired. Listen to me, someone. You don't believe it, then at least solve it for me. Let me out, you hear me? Open this door and let me out. Just while my cousins get here. That sawbone's a liar. I tell the honest truth so I'm a lunatic. I'm Kenny Andrews. I always know the right time. What am I doing in the hospital? Such things shouldn't happen to a dog. Open up, I say. Let me out. You again, Mr. Andrews. Aren't we the troublesome patient? You just wait till I get here. Your cousins are here That's now. Let's wait. calm down so, so they won't dollars. get frightened. So we can so go home with them to Two Forks. So Otherwise, we'll dollars. spend the rest of our life here. That's the boy. This way, please. Kenny is ready to see you now. Oh, am I glad you guys came. If you only knew... You... What is it you dream when you dream, my friend? A Latin. You're dead. No. Cousin Joe, alive. Huh? Promise you will be very kind, can you, Sha? Princess Julie! Oh, your honor. No, Cousin Fanny, you're crazy. But my golly, what is this? Am I still seeing things? Hey. 
Say, you two been taking me for a sleigh ride? Oh, no, Cousin Kenny. How could we? Yokels like us take a sharp guy like you? Not your dopey cousins from Two Forks, Kenny. The cow's giving milk today? Oh, my golly, what's your angle? I, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. You will, Kenny. You remember Uncle Iggy? Huh? Digging and digging in his backyard? For what, Kenny? Wives. Right, Uncle Iggy. Died two weeks ago. You know from what, Kenny? What? Heart shock. Huh? You know what give him heart shock, Kenny? He struck oil in his backyard and became a millionaire overnight. Huh? You know who he left the six million to in his will, Kenny? Who? You. Huh? But you're not going to enjoy it, Kenny, because you're a non-compass menace. Get it? You're crazy. And that's where we come in, Kenny. You see, his will also reads that when you die or go crazy, the fortune's to be split among your other cousins. You always did suspect you'd suddenly do one or the other, Kenny. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This has all been a frame-up. Sure, sure, I get it, everything. I've been framed. You wanted to make people think I'd gone haywire. So you put up this whole, this whole mishmash. How did you know where to trail me? Easy. For a smart guy with a niche, only one place for him. New York. And we met up with a certain bookie, the rest was easy. Oh, I got a headache. I got things pounding in my ears. That, that gun I plugged you with. Blanks. That waiter at the casino. Cousin Georgie. The sawbones. Cousin Hank. The midget. Cousin Lou. The janitor. Cousin Bessie. Oh, this should happen to me. To me, you crooks, you swindlers. You admit it. You stay there and admit it all. Why not? What have we got to lose now? Who could do such a thing to your own cousin? <laughs> <laughs> you remember the cousin's club, Kenny? Oh. Well, now you angle your way out of this, baby. <laughs> Come on, Fanny, you weep. Let's go. Make with the paper dolls, Kenny. <laughs> no! No, listen, your robes, you can't pull us on me. Never, you'll never get away with it. You'll see. You think you're pretty slick, huh? Wise guys. Make with the paper dolls, huh? No. But they'll ever keep me here. Not Kenny Andrews. Such a thing shouldn't happen to a dog. What'll I do? Spray me, someone. Listen to me. All you punks tune in on my story. Do something. What are you just sitting for? This thing's funny. Help me. Advise me. For crying out loud. Give me an angle. And so the curtain falls on the case of the missing mind, which was chosen by guest expert Craig Rice. Miss Rice is the author of Having a Wonderful Crime. Next week at this time, Murder by Experts brings you a story of a New Year's Eve masquerade party with death as a guest in disguise, selected for your approval by one of the foremost leading mystery writers of the world. Until then, this is your host, John Dixon Carr, hoping you'll be with us again next week at this time. Case of the Missing Mind was written by Joseph Rusko. In our cast were Carl Eastman, Ann Shepard, Bill Zuckert, Ralph Camargo, and Bert Cullen. Music under the direction of Emerson Buckley, composed by Richard DuPage. Murder by Experts is produced and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan. Bill Tonkin speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Edwards, the coffee with the extra flavor lift brings you Night Editor. Night Editor with Hal Burdick telling another of his famous yarns from the newsroom. Tonight, a gripping human interest story titled, Big Day Tomorrow. The angry wind was like a whiplash on the car as it sped through the storm. The rain poured over the windshield in a blurring flood. The jerk of the rutted roadway almost tore the steering wheel from his numb fingers. But old Doc Carlton held stubbornly to his course. 
Well, it's that hour when Hal and Bobby usually go out for a mid-evening snack and a few minutes of relaxation from the newsroom confusion of telephones, clattering typewriters, and the grind of putting the next edition together. Back in the far booth in the little lunchroom around the corner... Oh, boy, does that coffee hit the spot. Yeah, that's good coffee. That's Edwards. <laughs> you can trust Charlie to make a good cup of coffee. He knows. Hmm, now do I need it? Boy, this has been one humdinger of a night, Hal. Yeah, it did seem to have a lot of news to handle, Bobby. A little bit tired myself. And from the look of that assignment sheet, a big day tomorrow, brother. Oh, boy. <laughs> big day tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know why, but you're saying that brings old Doc Carlton to my mind. Doc Carlton? Who might he be, Hal? Well, five years ago, he was a retired physician living quietly in the town of Dalesburg in the northern part of the state, taking pride in the way his son, Matthew, was carrying on the practice. Next thing he knew, the boy was on his way to war as a medical officer. And old Doc was back at his profession harder than ever in spite of his 72 years. Another of those unsung heroes of the home front. <laughs> you know, I'll bet there's a story back of that, that look in your eyes, boss. Well, yes, Bobby, I, I guess there is. The story of a real hero, though <laughs> Doc didn't feel so heroic that night last winter when he stood in the kitchen letting the glistening raincoat and the sodden old felt hat fall onto the chair. It was seven o'clock, and he'd been at it since long before dawn. No different than other days, of course, but tonight he seemed to feel it more. Tonight he was just a weary, bone-tired old man who wondered how much more of it he could take. He looked down at a scrawled piece of paper on the table. A note from Cassie, who'd been his housekeeper through long years. Her lodge was having a party. She couldn't wait for him. He'd find a big pot of leek and potato soup on the stove. Coffee was ready to heat. Custard pie and cheese in the cupboard. But right now, he didn't care whether he ate or not. He'd stir up the living room fire, stretch out in his favorite chair, and... and rest a while. Eat later if he wanted to. The warmth of the fire seemed to ease the ache in his body a little. The quiet of the old house was soothing. Through half-closed lids, he looked up at the photo of the young man in uniform on the mantel, smiling gently as he met the steady gaze from the pictured eyes. Ah, someday... <laughs> someday Matt would be coming home. Matt would take over again, and he could enjoy an old man's heritage of peace and quiet and, and freedom from body-shattering work. The strident jangle of the phone bell broke his reverie. He half rose, sank back in the big chair again. Ah, oh, hang the phone... Let it ring. A man could only drive himself so far. His eyes met those in the picture, and they seemed to be speaking to him in Matt's voice. There's the phone, Dad. Somebody's calling you. Oh, blast the phone. I, I'm tired. You once told me a good doctor didn't have time to be tired. But this is different, Matt. I, I'm not as young as I used to be. I, I need some rest. And some patient needs a doctor. No telling how badly. All right, all right, you young scallywag. I'll answer it. But I'm not leaving this house tonight. I don't care what it is. An excited voice speaking broken English came to him over the wire. Mrs. Vorslev, newcomers, lived on a farm five miles east of town. Her boy was sick. She was frightened. Doc leaned his head on one hand wearily, listening, asking questions. Finally, he spoke gruffly. Now, now look, Miss Vorslev, I, I can't come out there in this storm... Anyway, I'm all in myself. Uh, you get a pencil and a piece of paper and take down the instructions I'll give you. The first thing tomorrow, I'll get out there. Just you follow orders tonight. Back in the chair, he kept his eyes on the cheerful glow of the fire, while outside the rain beat with torrential fury against the house. At last, as if drawn by a magnet, his gaze returned to the photo on the mantel. And once again, he seemed to hear the voice. That uh, could be an appendix, you know. And it could be an old-fashioned stomachache. But you don't believe that, do you, Dad? I don't care what it is. I, I'm fagged out, I tell you. you. You don't understand, Matt, my boy. Sure, I understand, Dad. But I understand, too, there's a sick boy and a mother who's scared. They need a doctor, and... And what about all the other folks that need a doctor? There's only so much of me left to do the work, boy. I... I don't mean to let you down, Matt, but... Well, I'm old, and... And I'm just about done for. A hurt all over. I, well, I, sometimes we hurt all over out where I am. But we have to keep going. You're a soldier, too. And haven't I got a greater duty than killing myself? Maybe, Dad. And maybe not. The voice seemed to trail away. 
Then through the silence, another sound. The hollow beating of the knocker on the front door. Well, if this was a patient, at least they'd come to him. More likely a neighbor. The light from the open door revealed the dripping figure of a boy. Uh, telegram for you, Dr. Carlton. <laughs> telegram. Doc felt a little chill run over him. I, uh, I thought they phoned telegrams these days. Well, not this kind of a telegram, sir. You see, sure, sure. A sickening dizziness was coming over him. He had to steady himself against the door. Uh, here. He fished in his pocket for a coin, but the boy was backing away. Oh, gee, no, doctor. I, I couldn't take a tip for delivering a telegram like that. Thanks just the same. Uh, uh, good night, sir. Somehow he got himself back to the living room again. He stood there by the mantel, numb fingers tearing open the envelope, taking out the message. He knew what it would say. As next of kin, regret to inform you. The message fluttered to the floor as the trembling hands groped for the photograph. Oh, Matt. Oh, no. No, Matt. Matt, my boy. Again, the metallic clangor of the telephone. Mechanically, he stumbled across the room to answer it. The voice that came to him was frantic with fear now. The boy was worse, the mother helpless. But how could he tell this woman that he couldn't come now? That it wasn't age or weariness anymore? That his boy, his Matt... Then once again, that voice seemed to come to him. It's your duty as a soldier, Dad. Your place is there as mine was where the call took me. Someday we'll meet again. And you will want to tell me that you went where you were needed, too. Why... Well, sure. Sure, Matt. Someday we'll... we'll meet again. <laughs> Old Doc Carlton and his boy. And I promise you, wherever that meeting place is, you won't be ashamed of me. He lifted his head. All right, Miss Vorslib. The voice took on new strength. I'll be out there to see your boy. The angry wind was like a whiplash on the car as it sped through the storm. The rain poured over the windshield in a blurring flood. Time and again, the jerk of the rutted roadway almost tore the steering wheel from the grip of his numb fingers. But the old man bent over it, held stubbornly to his course. Then he was pulling to a stop. Through the downpour, he could see the glimmer of light from the farmhouse on the distant slope. And in the lights of the car, something else. The rickety wooden bridge over Sandy Creek, torn from its moorings by a bank full flood, leaning into it at a steep angle. Well, that did it. That was his answer. He could turn around now and go back home with a clear conscience. He reached for the gear shift, but the hand hung there. In the mirrored surface of the windshield, he saw the eyes again. Not smiling eyes now. Eyes in which there was the hurt of disappointment. Accusing eyes. His hand moved as if to shut them out. It touched a worn bag on the seat beside him. And then Doc was getting out of the car, the bag held high in one hand while the other gripped the swaying bridge timbers as the numbing chill of the icy water swirled around him, and old Doc Carlton was fighting grimly through the waist-deep flood to the far bank. It was after midnight when he crossed the backyard to the kitchen door again. At first he wasn't sure he could make it from the garage. All sense of feeling had gone out of his legs. The will to move was something apart from his body. The warmth of the room revived him a little. He saw Cassie swimming toward him through the blur that fogged his eyes. Why, what doctor? Where on earth have you been? Oh, out on a call. But land of Goshen, you're soaking wet. What happened? I, out to the Vorslip place. Boy, appendix. Bridge was out. Couldn't get him back to town. I did an emergency. Kitchen table. Had to wade the creek. Going and coming. Oh, you shouldn't have done that. You might have caught pneumonia. Well, I'll get upstairs, out of these wet clothes. Hot bath into bed. Yes, that's the thing to do. And I'll bring you some hot soup. You didn't have any dinner. No, no soup. I just, I just want to get to bed. Rest. I'm tired, Cassie. Tired and old and done for. Her arm was under him, and his weight sagged against it as they went on into the living room. The telegraph blank came into his vision, and his steps faltered. Oh, uh, Cassie, there was a telegram tonight about Matt. He, uh, he... I know, Doctor. I found it on the floor when it came in. I read it. I hope you don't mind. Isn't it 
Wonderful. Wonderful. His eyes blazed toward her. Wonderful. What are you saying? The telegram about Dr. Matthew. What? Well, Doctor, didn't you read it? No, I... I was going to, but I couldn't force myself to do it. And then the, the call came. Cassie! Cassie, tell me! Well, he's been wounded, but he's all right. And he's been awarded a distinguished service cross for going way out beyond the lines to save lives. For... For gallantry, it says, beyond the call of duty, like... like you did tonight. The room was whirling around him dizzily, but through the dimness he could see the eyes in the photograph. Smiling eyes now. Proud eyes. And then suddenly old Doc Crawton was laughing. <laughs> oh, Cassie, Cassie! Matt! Matt, he's all right, and, and he'll be coming home to me, and, and, and I won't have to be ashamed. Of course you won't have to be ashamed. And you must come now. I'll help you upstairs and then help me. He straightened, pushing her arm aside. Since when did I need help to get upstairs? You'll talk like I was a, 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 a tired old man. All I want to do is get out of these wet clothes and have some of that soup and, and custard pie and cheese. I need food, Cassie. I've got a big day ahead of me tomorrow. Well, friends, you too have big days ahead, days when a little extra enjoyment will be mighty welcome. For instance, the extra enjoyment you will find in every cup of Edwards coffee. Why? Well, because Edwards brings you an extra flavor lift. You see, Edwards is prepared from the richest coffee beans from the finest growing districts of Central and South America. The choicest beans carefully pre-selected for size, shape, and color, then skillfully blended according to Mr. Dwight Edwards' own personal formula. Not by weight, but by flavor. Next, every pound is roasted under Mr. Edwards' personal supervision by the modern, controlled, thermalo process to bring out the full, natural flavor. Edwards Coffee, remember, is ground only to your order at the store. Your guarantee of full strength, full aroma, and absolute freshness. Try Edwards Coffee. Discover its extra flavor lift. Your money refunded if you don't thoroughly enjoy it. Edwards Coffee is featured at all Safeway stores. Well, Hal, I think we'll all remember the story of old Doc Carlton for a good long time. Now tell us what's ahead for next week. Steve Delger marveled at the ease with which he was able to fool everyone into handing a $60,000 estate over to him. Even wise attorney John Atwell fell for Steve's dishonesty. Then someone came to call on him. A prim, gracious, elderly little lady. And before her call was ended, <laughs> but uh, that's the story titled On the Dotted Line that I'll tell you when we meet in the newsroom next week. Good night. Listen to Night Editor next week at the same time when Hal Burdick spends another of his newsroom yarns. This is Bill Baldwin saying good night for Edwards Coffee. Edwards, the coffee with the extra flavor lift brings you Night Editor. Night Editor with Hal Burdick telling another of his famous newsroom yarns. Tonight, the story of a crooked scheme that failed titled On the Dotted Line. Sitting in the living room of his hotel suite, Steve Delger, alias Morton Perry, marveled at the simplicity with which the scheme had worked out. A few papers to sign, a certified check for 60 grand, then the night train to Chicago, a meeting with Eddie, the mastermind, and Easy Street. <laughs> Well, the last mail edition has been put to bed, and before long, the hum of the presses will be an undertone to the telephones and typewriters and other excitement of the newsroom. For the moment, the work eases off a little, and Bobby has strolled over to Hal's glassed-in office in the far corner with, incidentally, a sly twinkle in his eye. All right, boss, I'm ready for the payoff. Huh? Payoff? What do you mean? The hush money. Of course, I'll go easy on you. Huh? Let's see, I'll settle for a cup of Charlie's Good Edwards coffee and a couple of donuts. Too cheap, but all being right, a all right, all right, all right. What's this all about? <laughs> you had a lady caller tonight. I could tell your wife about it. That is, unless you'd uh, rather... So that's it. Well, you're out of luck, sonny boy. My caller was Miss Cynthia Heggie. And the missus knows about her being here, so <laughs> you can buy your own coffee. Oh, and I thought you were ripe for blackmail. Just to turn the tables on you, if you'll offer to buy my coffee, I'll tell you a yarn about that quiet, gray-haired little lady you saw in here tonight. 
Might have known you'd outslicker me. You always do, but <laughs> I give in. Well, it happened back in the Middle West several years ago, Bobby. I didn't know Miss Heggie at the time, but I was in on another side of the story that finally got us acquainted. I'm listening, boss. Well, actually, it began the afternoon that Eddie York, a smooth operator in a number of big-time crooked deals, sat facing Steve Delger, a, a not-so-big-time crook, in Steve's hotel room in Los Angeles. There was the pressure of excitement back of Eddie's words as he said, Steve, I'm cutting you in on one of the fattest deals I've ever pulled, with better than 30 grand apiece in it. Steve shook his head. <laughs> no, no, thanks, pal. But I'm not looking for some. I'm very unpopular with the DA at the present moment. And uh, button up your lip and listen to me, kid. This is real and 100% sure. Before I'm through, you'll be fighting for a chance to come in with me. He pulled his chair closer, smiling. Then, as you remember, I headed east a couple of weeks ago. My car figuring I'd do better to work in some greener fields. I'm heading out through Arizona when I stop at a little eating joint one noon for a sandwich. I'm sitting there at the counter when a guy comes in and takes the place next to me. I glance at him. And, pal, I pretty near fall off the stool. I think it's you. Turn it up suddenly from nowhere. Well, on a second look, I realize it isn't. But believe me, it takes a second look because the guy is a dead ringer for you. Well, naturally, I explain why I'm staring at him and we get into a conversation. Seems he's working and hitchhiking his way back to the Middle West. So I invite him to ride along with me and he accepts. Well, while we're driving along, he gets more chummy. He tells me about himself. And the next thing, he's given me a line about being on his way back to a little burg to pick up an estate valued at better than 60000 left him by an uncle. Huh. You can imagine, Steve, I get interested when he mentions that kind of dough. So I begin digging for more facts. And what I hear begins to add up fast. The guy is an orphan who's raised by this uncle. When he's about 14, he runs away from home and never goes back. That's 17 years ago. None of the hometowners ever see or hear from him again. By accident, he sees an ad that they're looking for him to settle up the estate. He's broke. He's working his way east, gradually. Steve's lips curled downward in a cynical smile. Eh. And because I look like the guy, I beat him back there and grabbed the dough. Oh, fat chance, Eddie. Let me finish. I keep this bozo, Morton Perry is his name, with me for three days. By then, I've checked everything I need. The names of people, places, description of the old house, and, uh, everything I tell you. I'm all set to go. All I need is you. We play it right, and Steve, boy... We're on Easy Street. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> and just about the time I'm trying to collect the dough, the guy, the guy will show up, huh? No, Steve. Eddie's lips tightened into a thin, hard smile. The real Mort Perry never is going to show up any place. Uh, you mean, you, you croaked him? What do you think, Stevie? Oh, listen, Eddie, you can cut me out right now. Some games I play, but not when there's murder mixed up in it. You can forget about that, kid. I made sure nobody will ever know about it. From now on, you're Mort Perry. We can't miss. I've got all the dope we need, including letters from the lawyer, copies of the guy's signature for you to practice on. Why, what little anybody remembers about him, the resemblance will cover up. Once you get your hands on that dough, you'll be on your way with nobody ever to check up on it further. Oh, look, Steve. Steve walked over to the window, stood looking down into the street. When he turned around, his voice was tense. I ain't saying yes, I ain't saying no. For now, tell me more about how you expect me to work it. Sitting in the living room of a suite in Carberry's one best hotel three weeks later, Steve Delger, alias Morton Perry, marveled at the simplicity with which things had worked out. Shortly, attorney John Apple would arrive with some last papers to be signed. In return, he would hand over a certified check representing the final settlement. After that, an impatient three-hour wait for the night train to Chicago, the meeting with Eddie that would finish the job. Then, easy street. Oh, it had been almost too simple. People just accepted him for the grown-up version of the boy who once lived there. Eddie's preliminary work with the late Mort Perry had been perfect. A knock at the door interrupted his reflections. That would be the lawyer. The payoff was at hand. He opened the door, then recoiled a little in amazement. Instead of Lawyer Atwell, a small, gray-haired, rather primly-dressed woman was looking in at him. Um, uh, uh, how do you do? A pair of alert eyes sized him up through a long moment of silence. Then she was smiling. <laughs> yes, it's Morton Perry, sure enough. I would have recognized you anywhere, in spite of the years since I've seen you. Uh, uh, yes, I'm, uh, uh, sure, sure. You don't remember me? I'm Cynthia Heggie. Oh, oh, sure, sure. Uh, you kind of surprised me. It's been so long. 
I heard about you being here to settle the estate. I wanted to see you. I live over in Morley now. Steve knew he was out on thin ice, but he'd been there before these past few days. Just play it easy. Let her lead to him. She accepted his invitation to come in, sat down with her intent eyes still on him. You've grown up to be quite a man, Morton. Now you're a wealthy one. I hope life has prepared you to use your wealth wisely. Oh, uh, I'll uh, make good use of it, all right. There were times when I worried about you as a small boy. Then when you ran away from your uncle, I confess, I doubted you'd ever amount to much. Well, I was just a kid then, and uh, not the most promising one. She smiled and went on talking about Mort Perry's boyhood. Steve skidded dangerously around a few questions, listening hopefully for the arrival of Atwell. He was in a particularly tight corner when the knock came, and a moment later the attorney's big friendliness filled the room. He greeted Miss Heggie as an old friend. They chatted a moment. Then, well, Morton, <clears throat> everything seems to be in order. After the sale of the old home and other properties and uh, tax deductions, together with my fees, <clears throat> you have uh, uh, $62,428 and uh, <laughs> 17 cents coming to you. Yes, I have it here in the form of a certified check, as you requested, so uh, if you just sign these papers where I've indicated, the formalities will be over. This was it. Go easy now. The pen traced the signature he'd practiced so many times. Five times on as many forms. The attorney picked them up. Well, that does it, Morton. Now, I'll be on my way and let you and Cynthia finish your talk. But Miss Heggie was standing up, too. As she did so, a patent leather purse slipped from her lap. Steve picked it up, handed it to her. She murmured her thanks. Explained it was time she was leaving, too. Morton would want a little time to himself. She would walk along with Mr. Atwell. There were goodbyes all around. Then the door closing behind them. And Steve was alone. The last big hurdle had been taken. The check was in his pocket. A long, tiring wait until train time. Then he could be on his way. At eight o'clock... He ordered a cab and told the bellboy to come up for his bags as soon as the taxi was ready. The five minutes of waiting seemed like five hours now that the getaway was here. But at last, the knock on the door. He hurried to admit the boy, opened the door, but fell back with a sharp gasp. Mr. Atwell was there. A step behind him was a big, solemn-looking man. And further back, that... that heggy person. Steve tried to mumble excuses, a nerve-tightening fear growing within him. But the others were crowding on into the room. Uh, <laughs> look, folks, I'm uh, sorry, but... Well, it's close to train time. The kid's on his way up for the bags. It's uh, it's nice of you to call, but uh, we told boy he needn't bother. It was the big man who spoke, moving closer to him. Uh, and uh, uh, just who are you to be given the orders, mister? The folk pulled back, revealing a star with the word sheriff engraved on it. Steve knew his guilt must be written all over him, though he was fighting to control it. The sheriff was going on. Don't reckon you'll be taking that train, Steve Belger. Uh, Steve Belger? <laughs> What are you talking about? What goes? I'm talking about a darn fine set of fingerprints you left on Cynthia Heggie's purse. We developed them, phoned a description to Chicago. If you're Mort Perry, it's one of the seven wonders of the world. Because sure enough, you're wearing the hide of Steve Delger, who has a mighty unsavory police reputation. In spite of himself, Steve's voice was rising to an angry snarl as he backed away like a cornered rat. The $60,000 was melting in his pocket. The shadow of prison bars was falling across the room. He was half shouting incoherent denials, but Mr. Atwell's voice rose above them as the sheriff closed in with the handcuffs. You would have gotten away with it, Delger, if it hadn't been for Cynthia Heggie here. <laughs> you fooled all the rest of us, but <laughs> you couldn't fool her. And what makes her so much smarter than everybody else? Well, sir, Atwell was smiling at the little woman. I guess it's because uh, <laughs> she was a schoolteacher for 40 years. A schoolteacher? Now, well, what's that got to do with it? Cynthia Heggie's gray eyes had an almost friendly twinkle in them. There was one thing about Morton Perry I remembered above all others, as his teacher through all his grade school years. One thing I tried my best to break him of doing, and then never could. I recalled it when Mr. Atwell brought you those papers. It made me suspicious. I wanted to know more. Yeah? And just what was that? Morton. Her smile widened as she went on. Morton was uh, right-handed in everything but his penmanship. But he always wrote with his left hand.
Well, friends, when it comes to discovering the real thing in coffee, let me suggest this. Try a pound of Edwards coffee. That's the real thing for coffee enjoyment. Because Edwards gives you an extra flavor lift, a richness you will instantly detect and always enjoy. You see, Edwards' exclusive flavor doesn't just happen. It's the result of Mr. Dwight Edwards' own personal formula of years spent in the fine art of coffee making. Well, just to show you, Edwards' coffee contains only the choicest Central and South American coffee beans, carefully pre-selected for size, shape, and color, then skillfully blended in small batches under Mr. Dwight Edwards' personal supervision, and not by weight, but by flavor. That's not all. Edwards' coffee is always roasted by the modern thermal process to bring out the full, natural coffee flavor. And don't forget, Edwards is ground only to your order right at the store to ensure absolute freshness. Try Edwards' coffee for an extra flavor lift. Your money refunded if you don't thoroughly enjoy it. Edwards' coffee is featured at all Safeway stores. Well, Hal, Miss Cynthia certainly provided a surprising climax to tonight's story. Uh, can you tell us what's ahead for next week? Well, I think it may provide a surprise, too. As I tell the story of the search for the way information about convoy sailings was being passed along to the waiting sub-pack offshore, and to the amazing conclusion to which the search led. It's titled, No Stone Unturned. And I hope you'll all be with us in the newsroom next week when I tell it. Good night. This is Bill Baldwin inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Edwards Coffee brings us Hal Burdick in another night editor story. The Planet Man. The Planet Man. This is the fascinating story of Dan Tro, the Planet Man, troubleshooter for the League of Planets organization, the law enforcement body for peace and justice in the celestial world, whose headquarters and center of operations are situated on the capital of all the planets, Planaria Rex. From Mercury to Pluto, wherever danger threatens the universe, you will find Dan Tro, the Planet Man, fighting for fair play. In a moment, the Planet Man. Slats, Dantro, and the robot Barrel, mysteriously freed from the clutches of Klee on the planet Torino, found their ship thrown through hyperspace toward the constellation at the rim of their galaxy. There, the ship once again returned to normal space, only to be frozen in a static field. Actually, their escape and transportation to this constellation were the work of watchers of space who decided at last to intervene and help our friends. The static field, however, was the work of the Mardi, the race which inhabits this system and which has the power to help them against Marston. Slats and Danto, however, must convince them of the importance of their mission. They have just discovered the presence of one of the Mardi aboard the Alpha via a three-dimensional projector. By the way, I uh, might as well tell you who we are. I'm Dantro, the planet man, and this is Slats, my friend, and Barrel, the robot. I'm not interested in your machinery. Well, there's no need to get nasty about it. Barrel may be a robot, but he's a darn sight more decent than a lot of people I could name. I'm sorry if I offend you, but there's no time to spend in idle conversation. I have been sent to find out why you are here in our sector of the galaxy. Well, we come in search of help. What sort of help? Well, it's difficult to explain to a mere image. If you'll permit us to approach your planet where we could talk face to face, I feel I would be much better able to explain our mission. You may never be permitted any closer to our system than you are now. First, you must satisfy our council that your purpose is peaceful and that you will not be a threat to our well-being. Well, I assure you our purpose is peaceful in the extreme. We seek only assistance. We cannot possibly be a threat even if we so desire. Obviously, your science is an advanced one. There are only two of us. Surely you do not fear anything we could do. It is not necessary for us to explain ourselves to you. On the contrary, the problem of explanation is yours. I would suggest you proceed with it. What's she so huffy about? You'd think we were a couple of tyrants or something. Well, after all, Slats, as far as she knows, we could be. 
I certainly can understand her caution. By the way, how are you addressed? You may call me Rura. Very well, Rura. Our system has lived in peace for many years. But one of our people, an evil fanatic named Marston, has gained the control of this... These wonderful machines are mine, and the universe is Marston's. Judge Augustus, when will these creatures learn that Marston knows what's best for them? The name of Marston will resound through the universe. Marston! 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 Planet Man, you tell a touching tale. How do we know it's true? Say, will you answer a question for me? Are you the ancient race? Since I do not know what this ancient race is you spoke of, I cannot answer. Even if I did, however, I must point out again that you are not here to ask questions, but to answer them. Please be silent unless you have information to impart. Don't worry, lady. The less I have to say to you, the better I like it. Hey, what's bothering her now? Relax, Slats. What else can I tell you, Rura? I assure you we have nothing to hide. Everything I have told you is true. We can find that out easily enough if we desire to pursue this matter further. Well, what's the next step? I shall report at once to our council, and I will let you know our decision in time. Hey, she's gone. Well, at least we know a lot more than we did. Yeah, what, for instance? We know that our position here in space is no accident. Rura certainly indicated that her people were responsible for the immobility of our ship. I wish that woman would hurry back soon. Hey, Dantro, she's back. I see her, Slats. Yes, Rora, what has your council decided? They wish to determine the accuracy of your story before they make any decision. Well, how are they going to do that? We certainly can't get any witnesses way out here. You yourselves will be the witnesses. We have devices which will determine at once the truth of what you have told us, if indeed it is true. Would you mind answering a few questions now? If I consider them proper? I spoke to you before of the ancient race. It was a people who have apparently at one time or another dwelt in many sections of our galaxy. We have found traces of them in several constellations which we visited. Then we are not the race you seek. For our people have inhabited this system for many thousands and thousands of years. However, we too have legends and the remains of a race which dwelt in this system at some time before our civilization rose to its present stature. We believe ourselves to be the descendants of these people. Gosh, some scientist on Planaria Rex was telling me just before I left that he believed our people were the descendants of the ancient race. I guess that makes us relatives. That is a distinction I can do without. Don't mention it. It would be no pleasure for me either. I have told you what we seek, assuming our stories prove true and our cause just. Have your people the scientific knowledge to help us if they decide to? Our science has the power, but I doubt very much that our council will decide to help you. But I do not understand. Certainly, if what we're saying is the truth, we deserve your help. Deserve it is not the point, Planet Man. Unless we are mistaken, your culture is a threat to ours. Any contact between our races could only end in disaster. Dantro and Slat seem to have met a people who could help them, but who are reluctant to do so. Can our friends persuade them to intervene with Marston? We'll be back in a moment, so level up. When we left Danto and Slats, they were trying to persuade Rura, the three-dimensional image, that their mission was friendly. We find them now aboard the Alpha as they attempt to reason with her. Rura, how could you pick up our language so quickly? Our knowledge of semantics enables us to break down speech instantaneously and grasp the principles of any language. I needed only a few sentences to understand and learn the fundamentals of your language. That is my specialty among my own people. And the reason I was chosen to contact you. Well, now I understand your silence when you first appeared on our ship. You are correct. I could not answer you at first until I learned your tongue. 
However, I grasped it quickly enough to understand the unflattering references your companion here, Slats, made, and that I have not forgotten. Now, look, don't sulk about it. I wasn't serious. Anyway, you got me mad just standing there saying nothing. If you will permit me to explain, I was going to before. Your attitude is a particular affront to me and to my people, since in our system the women, not the men, are dominant. I doubt that they would agree to help you, for if our people and yours were to come in contact, one system or the other would have to change, and we will not tolerate any threat to the supremacy of our sex in our system. Well, in that case, what's the next step? With your permission, or for that matter without it, you are to be transported to our main planet where the council which rules our solar system makes its headquarters. There you will be subjected to the testing machines which will establish the truth or falsity of what you have told us. Will you release our ship from your static field? It will not be necessary. The ship and your robot will remain here in space. Oh, then you're sending another ship for us. You underestimate our science, Planet Man. It will not be necessary to send another ship. We have means of transporting you anywhere we wish. Hey, Dantro, you think that's what I think it is? Rura, have your people developed the dimension warper? My people discovered this principle and its use many generations ago. It is the least of our knowledge. And by the way, while you're on our planet, you will talk to no one unless you are asked to do so. And you will attempt, above all, to communicate with no male member of our race. Well, have no fear, Rura. We'll do whatever you say. Are you ready? Yes. Just say the word. Very well. <laughs> Hey, Dantro, you know something? I just realized the atmosphere on this planet must be exactly like that back on Earth. We're breathing the air fine, that window's wide open. Oh, you're right, Sluts. I hadn't noticed it myself, but then from the looks of Brewer's image, she certainly seemed completely human in every respect. Yeah. Sluts, look, it's a man. A man? Oh, brother. I've begun to wonder if there were any on this planet at all. Hey, Max, shake hands with a guy from Earth. What's your name? A conversation is forbidden. What? I'm here only to tend to your needs. Please do not address me except to ask for whatever you wish. Now, look, Buster, let's not be silly, huh? Just man to man, you can tell us the truth. Must be pretty rough around here, huh? So let's remember what Rura said. Oh, gosh, I forgot. I'm sorry. It's just that it felt so good to see another guy for a change. Well, that's quite all right. We will call you if we desire anything. At the moment, everything is satisfactory. Oh, very well. Uh, my name is Mala. Uh, there is a button in every room. Uh, you need only press it to summon me. Very well. Thank you. Sure, thanks for nothing. Like I said, Dantro, this is going to be awful tough to take. Our friends now face the problem of convincing the Mardi that they need help. Can Dantro and Slats convince them of this? We'll be back in a moment, but first, here is a message the Planet Man wants you to hear. Tune in again for more transcribed thrills and adventures. Rocket millions of light years into space with Dan Tro, the Planet Man. The Planet Man. The Planet Man. This is the fascinating story of Dan Tro, the Planet Man, troubleshooter for the League of Planets organization, the law enforcement body for peace and justice in the celestial world, whose headquarters and center of operations are situated on the capital of all the planets, Planaria Rex. From Mercury to Pluto, wherever danger threatens the universe, you will find Dan Tro, the Planet Man, fighting for fair play. In a moment, the Planet Man. Dantro, the Planet Man, and Slats are on the home planet of the Mardi, where women dominate the society. 
R.T. possessed scientific knowledge far in advance of Dantro's. Enough to help him defeat Marston if they want to. We find our two friends awaiting word of the council's decision. Ah, this sitting around gives me the jitters. Let's try and bust out of this place. No slats. Rura warned us not to try to leave these quarters. It's not just the waiting. It's knowing that the council has decided the fate of our solar system without our even being able to talk to them. That's what gripes me. Relax, slats. It could be worse. I don't know. From the way Rura acted and spoke, the odds are against us. Why do you say that? Don't play dumb, Dantry. You know that these gals want to keep the upper hand here in their system. They're probably afraid that once their own men see the way things are with us, they'll demand equality and the jig will be up. Well, I wish I didn't agree with your analysis, Slats, but I'm afraid you're awfully close to the truth. Sure, we just sit here and wait for the bad news. Well, don't be too certain of that. These women are a smart race. A lot smarter than we are in some ways. Maybe their intelligence will overrule their fears and prejudices. You're just hoping. See, I prefer action. <laughs> Slats, wake up. Someone's uh, coming. Oh, yeah, I must have dozed off. <laughs> Probably at Rura, gal. She's certainly no help at all. Oh, hello, Rura. Hello, Planet Man. Hiya, what's the good word? Has the council made up its mind? When they do, you'll know about it. Well, don't get so huffy. I don't know why it's all so secret. Why can't we talk to them at least? I don't feel it necessary to explain the actions of my people to strangers, particularly inferiors. Inferiors? Where do you get that stuff? Now, listen here, lady. Cut it out, Slats. Don't take him so seriously, Rora. We're used to direct action, especially Slats. Staying cooped up here after traveling across the whole galaxy is pretty hard to take. I can understand that. Would it make things easier if I took you on a tour of our capital city? How about it, Slats? Like to see the sights? Would I say anything would be better than just sitting here twiddling my thumbs? Let's go. Not so fast. There's something we had better clear up before we leave this room. I knew there was a catch somewhere. What is it, Rura? We will leave here and go directly to my ground car. The passage is high, and so is the gravity tube to the lower level. Once in the car, you are to remain silent and out of sight. The ports are one way. You can see out, but no one can see in. I get it. We're top secret. What's the matter? Are you afraid some of your men would get ideas? The reasons are not your concern. Unless you give me your promise to do as I want, we will not leave this room. You have our promise. That's good. But let me warn you. I am armed with a sonic disruptor, and I will not hesitate to use it if you try any tricks. Listen, where we come from, a man's word is as good as his bond. But this is not where you come from. Here, it's a woman's word that counts. Don't ever forget it. Okay, I'll remember it. But I can't pretend I like it very much. Let's go. Follow me. Man, oh, pardon me, Roar. Lady, this is really a city. Do you like it? Like it? I'm bowled over. I thought Planaria Rex was something, but this makes it look like a bunch of mud huts. Where are we going, Roar? Over to the administration building. I have an errand to perform. What about us? You're to remain in the car. I hope I can depend upon you not to try to leave while I'm gone. Well, I told you before, Rura, don't worry about us. We've given you our word and we'll keep it. It's in your own best interest that you do. I'll be back as quickly as I can. Hey, this is our chance. Stay where you are, Slats. You're just making things worse. Okay, okay, but I don't see how they could be much worse than they are now. Dantro and Slats are certainly in a peculiar situation. What will their fate be with the Mardi? Should they try and escape now? We'll be back in a moment. So, level off. When we left Danto and Slats, they were being shown the wonders of the capital city of the Mardi, the planet where woman is dominant. We find them now as they are waiting in a ground car for the return of Rura who left a short while ago to attend to a matter in the administration building. Hi, Stantor. Look at that cruiser coming in. Isn't she a beauty? Well, it's more than that, Slats. Look at the way that ship is landing. It's as perfect a job of navigation and control as you or I have ever seen. All right, don't rub it in. Hey, look. What? There. That gal, that jet scooter, she's coming this way. Well, it's no concern of ours, Slats. Just relax. I don't know. She's headed right for this car, and she looks as though she means business. Well, I'm afraid you're right, Slats. I don't know what this is all about, but for goodness sakes, remember where we are and just sit tight. Whose car is this? It belongs to Rura. Who are you and who gave you permission to address me? Well, don't get excited, lady. You just asked a question. We answered it for you. Who are you two and who is responsible for your insolence? 
You know very well that no man is permitted to address a member of the special patrol unless he is asked to. I think perhaps you'd better talk to Rura. She can explain all about this. Now you are venturing to give me advice. I think perhaps you need to be taught some manners. Come with me. Look, lady, why don't you lay off? We can't come with you. We were told to stay here. I've had about enough of your insolence. Come out of that car at once. Or you will never have a second chance. Hey, Danto, look, at some kind of blaster she's pointing at us. What can we do? I guess we'd better do as she says, Slats. Well, Come on. Ruhr's going to be sore if we do. She told us to stay put. We'll argue about that when the time comes. Right now, I think we'd better do as this gal says. She's not very patient. Right. Are you coming, or shall I use this? We're coming. What's going on over there? Wait a minute. Gee, it's about time she showed up. What's wrong, Lieutenant? Who are you? I am Ruhr, a special envoy of the council. Here, here are my credentials. Let me see them. All right, but that does not explain these two. Are you aware of their insolence? I can't explain it to you, but they are under the protection of the council. Under the protection of the council? Since when is the council protecting men against the authority of their superiors? I'm sorry, Lieutenant, but everything concerning these two is of the utmost secrecy. I must ask you to leave the matter entirely in my hands. Wait till my superiors hear about this. They may be in your hands for the time being, but I can promise you that it won't be for long. We shall teach them a lesson. I forbid you to report this incident to anyone. Forbid me? That's what I said. And if you doubt that I have the authority, you had better call Heru, chief of the council. You can be sure I will do it immediately. And if what you are telling me is not so, you will regret it. Get back into the ground car, you two. Quickly. Come on, Slats. This is a fine business. One tells us to get out, the other tells us to get back in. I said get back in. Don't get excited. I'm getting... Where are we going? Hey, didn't you hear me? I said, where are we going now? Why do you like that, Dan Troy? Isn't that just like a woman? I've warned you before, Slats. I will not tolerate that kind of talk. Every time you have something disparaging to say, you speak of women. I consider it a personal affront. Oh, he doesn't mean it the way it sounds, Ruhr. It's just the way of expression. I need no pointers from you, Planet Man. I am well aware of that fact. And because I am aware of it, I resent what he says even more. For to me, it's indicative of the role women must play in your society. I shudder to think what it would be like to live in such a situation where women who are obviously superior to men must play the role of inferiors. I think uh, perhaps I'd better explain something to you, Rura. Among our planets, women play a role that is fully the equal of the men. Neither dominates. They work side by side. But Slats is from the Earth. Is that planet not a member of your league? Well, it is, yes, but as yet it's not been made a full member. It's only recently developed to the point where its first interplanetary flight was possible. As a matter of fact, the customs on Earth may not be as advanced as those of the other planets. Slat speaks not for the League, but only for Earth. Look, you don't have to make excuses for me, Dan Tro. Maybe what I said sounded a lot worse than it should. You see, actually, back on Earth, things have changed a lot. I have no prejudices against women, Roar. It's just the way I talk, not the way I feel. Perhaps what you say is true. But I can only go by what you do. The things your speech indicates. Certainly you have shown prejudice against women, which I find intolerable. Okay, okay, I'll watch the way I talk. But it has nothing to do with the way things happened back at the spaceport. That wasn't our fault. That gal came over and ordered us out of the ground car and didn't even give us a chance to explain. I assume that was what happened. And I must apologize for her conduct. She is not typical of our women. It's okay, there's a bad apple in every barrel. However, don't let it give you any ideas about me. I'm not apologizing for my feelings. Nobody said you were. I think we understand each other, Rora. Now perhaps you'll tell us where we're going. Back to your quarters. Well, you said you were going to show us the city. We hardly seen anything. That's true, and I'm sorry. But I can't afford to take any more chances. I have orders that you are to be kept from contact from any of our people, other than myself and the manservant that tends your quarters. You mean we got to go back there and sweat it out? If by that you mean wait for the council's ruling, that's exactly what you must do. Oh, it's not so bad, Slats. It won't be for very long anyway, will it, Rura? I told you before, I'm not free to discuss the council with you. I will say, however, that you should not count too much on their support. Not count too much on their support. That's swell. You see, Dantro? You see? It's just what I told you. We're just wasting time while Marston gets stronger. <laughs> Marston gets stronger while our two friends wait the decision of the Mardi Council. When will this decision come? And what will it say? We'll be back in a moment. But first, here is a message the Planet Man wants you to hear. Tune in again. 
again for more transcribed thrills and adventures. Rocket millions of light years into space with Dan Troll, the Planet Man. The Planet Man. The Planet Man. This is the fascinating story of Dan Troll, the Planet Man, troubleshooter for the League of Planets organization, the law enforcement body for peace and justice in the celestial world, whose headquarters and center of operations are situated on the capital of all the planets, Planaria Rex. From Mercury to Pluto, wherever danger threatens the universe, you will find Dantro the Planet Man fighting for fair play. In a moment, the Planet Man. Slats and Danto are on the planet of the Mardi, the race run by women, with a science far in advance of the leagues. They hope that the council which rules will decide to help them against Marston, but things look black indeed. They certainly seem to be taking their time about making a decision. Yeah. Hey, Danto, look. What? Oh, hello. Hear the door open. Hiya, come on over, sit down. Don't be afraid, we aren't going to hurt you. We'd just like to ask you a few questions. What's the matter with that guy? Is he dumb or something? Look at him. He just stands there. Well, I guess he has orders not to talk to us. That's right. That's what he said before. Hey, look, fella. What's your name? Because we won't tell anybody. You can open up. What's the score around here? How do you guys feel about having women run everything? What's the matter? Oh, brother, look at that guy go. Hello, Aurora. Hello. Was that Mallow who rushed out of here so quickly? Rushed out? I didn't even notice that he was here. Please don't offend my intelligence. I heard you talking as I came in. What were you trying to do? Get information from him? Now, don't jump to conclusions, Rura. We were only trying to be friendly. After all, we've got to talk to someone. We've seen hardly anyone but each other for a long time now. I sympathize in your desire for conversation, Planet Man. But my sympathies are not the point. You and Mallow have orders not to communicate with each other. If you break or violate those orders, I will have no choice but to report back to the council. You mean you'd give the guy the business just for talking to us? We've discussed it far enough. You know what is expected of you. I trust I will not have to mention it again. Let me say that it is fortunate for Mala that I did not hear his voice. All right, Ruru. We understand and we apologize. Tell me, have you any word from the council? Yes, I'm afraid I have. Afraid? I guess I know what that means. Well, it doesn't come as a surprise. Let Ruru explain, Slats. Exactly what happened, Ruru? There's nothing to explain, Planet Man. The Council has decided to deny your request for aid. That does it. They never even give us a chance to tell our side and make a decision. What kind of justice is that? How do you expect me to have any respect for your ways of doing things, Ruhr, if that's an example of justice on this planet? It's not your place to question the decision of the Council, nor mine. I'm not free to discuss it. I respect your position, Ruhr, but surely this doesn't finish our case. There's nothing you can do. The Council has decided, and that is final. They are the highest government body in our system. There is no appeal. But do they know what they're deciding? What do you mean? I mean, do they realize that this is not just a question of whether they help us or not? It goes far beyond that. Marston has the weapons and the devices of the ancient race at his disposal. At this moment, he's involved in trying to gain complete control of our League of Planets. Even with his weapons, that will not be easy for him. The whole League will resist him in every way that they can, and so will all the people on all the planets. Yeah, a fine lot of resistance they can do against all the stuff he's got. That's right, Slats. You see, Rura, there's no question that sooner or later Marston will triumph. The League will be in his hands. Do you think a man like Marston will ever be content with one solar system? What do you mean, Planet Man? Well, I think my meaning is obvious. Once he has control of our system, his ambitions will grow. He will reach out for new planets, new peoples to conquer... It's only a question of time before he reaches this section of the galaxy, and what then? Are you serious? I was never more serious in my life, Rura. 
But you said yourself that our science has advanced enough to enable us to help you overcome Marston. Why, then, should we fear him? Yes, it is strong enough, enough to overcome the power that Marston has now. But as he conquers new peoples, he will gain the advantages of their scientific knowledge. Who knows what new weapons, new machines will be in his hands by the time they reach out for this system. Hey, you know, I never thought of that, Dan. Well, that makes a lot of sense. How about that, Ruhr? Do you think your council thought of that? I wish I knew. Truthfully, your words give me cause for great concern, Planet Man. That's good, Rora. And I'm glad that what I say makes sense. But what about your counsel? Can't we tell them what I've just told you? It's impossible. What do you mean, impossible? A year ago, I would have said it was impossible for anybody to leave the gravity of the Earth. Impossible for any science to do a hundred of the things that today are just routine to me. Nothing's impossible. Those words convince no one but yourself, Slats. I cannot change the customs of a thousand years with logic. No man has ever appeared before the Supreme Council of the Mardi. No man ever shall. It's unthinkable. Can't you speak for us? I don't know what to say. While it's true I'm a special envoy of the Council, I am not as important as you may think. Well, isn't there someone you can talk to? Yes, I think there is. This is worth at least the effort. Heru, the head of the Council, has always been quite friendly to me. Perhaps she will listen. At least I will try. Well, that's fine of you, Rura. Yeah, it really is, you know... You're a pretty swell gal. Don't forget yourself, Slats. My interest is not in you, but in my own people. Don't presume upon my concern to become familiar. You and Dantro are still my inferiors. I cannot forget that. There you go again. I guess I just don't understand women. This is hardly the time for an explanation of a very complicated question, Slats. We're both grateful to you, Rura. Do the best you can. I shall. If I have any word for you, I'll come back at once. Thank you. I guess we were right about her. She's pretty regular. Don't be too optimistic, Slats. It may do no good at all. You know, Marston sure must be making things miserable back at home. Getting stronger, knocking off the opposition, building up his own organization. What next? Well, Danto seems to have stirred Rora with his talk of Marston. Can Rora get the Marty Council to reconsider its decision? We'll be back in a moment. So, level up. When we left Danto and Slats, they were still confined to their quarters on the planet of the Mardi. We find them now as they await some word from Rora, who left to explain to her superiors Danto's thoughts on Marston. Here we are, waiting for a bunch of women to make up their minds, or rather to change them. And while we are, who knows what Marston's up to? I've thought about that, and it certainly must be rough back there, particularly for Judge Augustus. How Marston must hate him, and with me away, he's probably getting rid of all his hatred on the judge. <laughs> Judge Augustus, I think that Dantro would enjoy this organization as we have it set up now. They used to call him the fearless planet man. <laughs> he's so fearless, he's disappeared into space. <laughs> Hey, Dantro, listen, what are we going to do if Rora comes back to the news that the council's turned us down again? Go on with our ship slats. What else can we do? There must be a way to get to the council chamber to make them understand. There, there is a way. What? Who's that? Mala. Yes, there is a way. You mean you'll help us, Mala? I've been listening to you talk ever since you first came, and what you've been saying has made sense. You mean about Marston? About Marston? Yes, of course, and about our society, too. I've often wondered at the injustice of one group being forced to remain always as inferiors. But the position of the men in the society of Mardi seemed doomed. The women had the knowledge and the power and the weapons. There was nothing I or any other man could do uh, but obey. Oh, this must be pretty rough. It's not pleasant. But the things you and the planet man have said have given me hope. I do not know what I could do, but I will help you. Well, there's one very important thing you can do. What is that? You know about the decision of the council? I heard everything. You know how anxious we are to get before the council ourselves. I heard that, too, but I warn you, even if you could get there, it would be suicide. What do you mean, suicide? Oh, you would be cut down before you could speak. You mean you think they'd knock us off just for trying to talk to them? I'm afraid you underestimate the strength of custom among our people. 
As Rora told you, no man has entered the council chamber for as long as any of us can remember. I appreciate your warning, Mala, but we will have to take that chance if Rora brings us word that they refuse to grant our request. Will you lead us there? If that is what you wish. Is it very far from here? No. As a matter of fact, the council chamber is in this building. In this building? Where? On the highest level. Where are we? About midway. Is there a direct way to the chamber? The gravity lift at the end of this passage ends in the anteroom of the council chamber. Oh, brother, what a break. We're practically in their lab. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. The way is guarded and patrolled. However, if that is what you wish, I will guide you there. Sure. Hey. I think Rora's coming back. You're right. I'd better leave before she gets here. It will not do to arouse her suspicions. I think she already suspects me. Well, let's have it. What's the score? I'm sorry, but I accomplished nothing. Wouldn't Haru listen to you? She listened, and I believe she was impressed by what I said. But she is only one of the council. And she said that she could not, on her own, ask them to change their minds. But if she agrees with you... Please, I've done all I can... I'm afraid there's nothing more that can be done. The council's decision stands, and that is that. Our two friends must now take action. Will they try to reach the council room of the Mardi? What danger does this move present? We'll be back in a moment, but first, here is a message the Planet Man wants you to hear. again for more transcribed thrills and adventures. Rocket millions of light years into space with Dan Troll, the Planet Man. The Planet Man. National Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Sorry you're coming along, Diamond. Yeah, I'm beginning to be sorry myself. You should be. We're heading for open sea. Looks like it'll be a long ride. You don't know how long, Diamond. We're getting into open water! You're about to go swimming, deep sea style. How far is it to the shore? About five miles now. I can make it. With a hole in you? And here's another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, happy homicide. You know, that's pretty bad, that oh, is. Oh, my goodness. Walt? Yeah? Well, what can I do for the shining light of the 5th Precinct? You can get right down here. I want you to do me a favor. I'm not going to help Sergeant Otis cross the street again. Tell him to get a governess. This has nothing to do with my brainy sergeant. Now, will you come down? Well, all right. Business is slower than a drunk turtle, so I'll be there in ten minutes. Thanks. Forget it, forget it. You know what I always say, Walt? No, what do you always say? Bye. <laughs> Well, sometimes that's the way things get started. The phone rings and Lieutenant Walter Levinson, 5th Precinct Homicide, tells me to get down. One word from him and I do as he pleases. So I buttoned my collar, pushed my tie back up into strangling position, and ten minutes later walked into the squad room of the 5th Precinct where, as always, the king of the jungle was on hand to greet me. Well, good morning, Shamus. Sergeant Otis. Oh, my goodness, you look terrible. Oh, what's wrong? Well, it's pretty obvious. You've been sleeping in the wrong position. What are you talking about? Oh, Otis, stop trying to be a sport. Get rid of the bats in your house. They're used to hanging upside down. Oh, for Pete's sake. Is Lieutenant Ann? He's expecting you. Go on in. Thank you, Sergeant. Hello, Walt. How are you, Rick? 
You've been needling Otis again? Oh, a little now. Now, you've got to stop that. When you come in, he begins to sulk. i got to work with him all day. Be happy, Walt. Be happy. Think of the 16 hours you're not with him. All those other people, jumping off bridges, turning on the gas, beating each other with hot paper sacks. Okay, okay. Now, uh, what's with you? Oh, well, this is a pretty ridiculous thing, and I'm in a tough spot. Well, I'm pretty tough, and you look ridiculous, so let's have it. Huh? Oh, well, we got a tip that a guy named Wells had a stash of stolen jewelry. You said had a stash. You mean he hasn't got it anymore? That's right, we have. Well, what the world are you mixed up in it for? It's not your department. It wasn't, but when the robbery boys got over to this guy's house, they found him dead. Oh. Murder. Shot through the head with a small caliber automatic. How about the jewelry? In the water pipes underneath the sink. About a hundred grand worth. What do you want me for? Wells' wife says the jewels are hers. We don't believe it. What did you do about it? We put out traces on the jewelry. Went through all the regular channels to find the owner. Nobody identifies it. And if we don't get a claim soon... I've got to give them to her. You mean you got to turn them over when you think they're stolen? We know they're stolen. They got to be. These people don't have the fare for a fast meal at the automat, but we can't prove it. What about the guy who gave you the tip on the jewels? Said his name was Mario Cimino. Disappeared. Hmm. You got any lead on who knocked off Wells? We're holding his wife, but we haven't really got a thing. No weapon, no motive, no nothing. So you want me to see what I can do? Yeah. Hold apartments in the spot. Can you imagine what the press is going to say when I turn these jewels over to the wife? Yeah, could be rough. But what in the world can I do that your whole department can't? We've got to solve this thing fast. Or turn the jewels back. Right. Mm. We've got a murder to solve. We've got a jewel theft to solve. Oh, that's it's... nothing. It's really nothing. It should be a cinch. No, not for a cop. He wouldn't be able to put on the right kind of pressure. What do you mean by pressure? Well... Uh, uh, Mrs. Wells? Uh, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Chimino's missing. We need him to tell us how he knew the jewels were stolen. If he's a stoolie, guys like that know you'll give them an even shake. Maybe he'll come out when he hears you're looking for him. Okay, okay. Now, what about the wife, this Mrs. Wells? I was holding her till you got here. She's being questioned. You want to see her? Uh, one thing, Walt, before I do. Uh, <laughs> am I going to like this job? Knowing your taste, I say yes. When the boys brought her in, they walked her through the robbery detail. Everybody went right out and bought yo-yo. Walt got up then, hid his yo-yo in the closet, led the way downstairs to a small room. It was dark, except for the single light burning near a desk. In the circle of light sat a young girl, late twenties, blonde and... Uh, well, well, you know. If the State Highway Commission built roads with that many curves, every driver in New York would need seasick pills. She was being questioned by one of the detectives. I've told you at least a dozen times. I got home ten minutes before you got there, and I called you. Your husband had been dead over an hour. I can't help that. I came home, and I found him, and I called you. Yeah, you called us. But I'm asking you about the jewels. Oh, how many times do I have to tell you? He found them. He found them. Why this routine, Walt? You think she had something to do with it? Only suspect. We're giving it to her like this so you could take a look without her seeing you. Where did your husband get the jewels? He told me he found them. Oh, please, look. I don't know anything about the jewels or how my husband got killed. What'd you do with the gun? I told you that, too. I don't know anything about a gun. I didn't kill him. You understand? Collins! Yeah? Come here. Give her another five minutes, then send her up to my office. You got the turner loose. Okay, Lieutenant. Somebody bring in the rubber hose? All right, Mrs. Wells. Now, when did your husband find these jewels? Oh, please. How many times do I have to tell you? He found them three days ago. You heard enough, ago. Rick? Fine. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Yes. Yes, 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 yes! What do you think? Uh, what do you want me to think? The girl doesn't seem too unhappy about the loss of her husband. Well, he'd been away for about four years, up until a week ago, in the Army. Occupation forces in Germany. No criminal record on him, huh? No. Mm. Well, let's see what I can find out. Oh, here's the information on the girl. Address, phone number. Thanks. Oh, uh, do some more checking on the husband, and I'll give you a call after I see the girl. How are you going to get in to talk to her? Walt, did I ever ask you how you got promoted to head of homicide? No. Uh, you want to tell me? Well, it's simple. Seniority, experience, hard work. Well, just lose the hard work, and you've got a fair idea of how I'm going to get in to talk to Mrs. Wells. <laughs> Well, I had to solve a murder, a $100,000 jewel theft, and get the dear old police force out of hot water. All I knew was that a man named Wells had been shot, and another guy named Mario Cimino had called the law and told them about a hat full of jewels that didn't seem to have been stolen from anybody. To clean up a mess like that would take a lot of doing. So I went about it in Diamond's most routine fashion. 
as unorthodox as possible. I grabbed a cab, slipped the driver of five to romp over to Greenwich Village a little faster than usual, and before I could say, look out for that streetcar, I was standing in front of a door with a small tag over the bell that read, Vladimir Sokolovsky, artist. Vladimir was an old friend of mine who hears all, sees all, and tells all for a small price. Who is it? Come on, Vladdy, open up. Go away. It's Diamond, Vladimir. I trust no one. You might be working for my landlord. No, I'm alone. Kalchana? Cross my heart and hope to swallow my Emmys. Tovarish, trust with you. Uh, I haven't got much time, Vladimir. Huh? I want you to do me a favor. For you, a portrait costs only $50. No, uh, uh, no pictures, Vladimir. Oh. Tell me, you ever heard of a guy named Mario Cimino? Oh, but of course... No. Mm. Paid your rent? Same answer. I have a small $10 bill here. Tovaris, you would attempt a lowly bribe. Well, what do you know? Here's another 10 I would ask you to stay for lunch, but Greenbaum won't even let me look in his delicatessen window anymore. You understand. Twenty-five? Uh, I only do it because Stalin and I do not agree. Mario Cimino. <coughs> Peasant. What does he do? Keeps busy. An occasional stick-up bookmaking. Owes me eleven eighty. Marianne and the eight at Hialeah by eight lanes. <laughs> Such a filly. Vladimir. Hmm? Mario Cimino? Oh, yes, the low life. For him to find a friend would be like Rasputin running a lonely hearts club. Where can I find him? I don't know. Vladimir. It's the truth. Scout's honor? But of course. If I knew where that peasant was, would I not collect my 1180? Of course I would. Scout's honor, see? You hold up three fingers, Vladimir. Oh, <laughs> a cop scout. <laughs> when was the last time you heard from him? When he took my two bucks that wins me 1180. He was in the fish business. Oh, fish business? Yes, I know, because he brought me two halibut, which I promptly made into magnificent stew for my landlord. <laughs> was miserable. The stew? No, just the fish. Believe me, Tovarish, those two halibut were so old, they remember Jonah. Was he selling fish? Mm, catching them. Mm. He had a boat. When I went down there to collect my 1180, the bomb wasn't there. Where did he keep the boat, Vladimir? A disgusting place uh, called uh, a schooner landing. Places like that should be in Siberia. Stinks. Well, uh, thanks, Vladimir. Ничего, товарищ. До свидания. Oh, Chichonia, Greenbaum's Delicatessen. Will you be surprised? Greenbaum's Delicatessen, Greenbaum's Delicatessen, Greenbaum's Delicatessen. Hello, Abe. Send up the works. Champagne, caviar, salami. I am a capitalist again. Hello there. Hey, I, uh, I said hello. Hello. You run this landing? Yep. Know a man named Chimino? Mario Chimino? Yep. Yep. Seen him lately? Nope. When was the last time you saw him? You a cop? Nope. It's too bad. Why do you say that? Owes me a week's rent on my boat. Skipped out? Yep. Understand he was fishing down here, is that right? Yep. How long ago did he rent the boat? Two weeks ago. How long ago did he skip out? About a week. Anything unusual about the things he did? Well, he sure weren't no fisherman. Why do you say that? Didn't know the first thing about it. When he first rented my boat, he used to go out for two or three hours and come back with a couple of fish. Didn't have no rigging to speak of. No live bait, just a pole. Didn't that bother you? Nope. Weren't none of my business. Had a license. You mean a regular fishing license or a commercial? Yep. Commercial? Yep. Did he do anything unusual the last day he was down here? Well, I don't know. He went out about 4 o'clock in the afternoon and was back here by 6.30. Only thing unusual about that, it's a funny time to go fishing. What day was that? We could go tomorrow, Tuesday. Thanks, Pop. Hey, uh, sure you ain't a cop? Uh, yep. G-man? Uh, nope. Don't say no more than you have to, do you? Nope. Bye, sonny. Well, I left the old boy sitting on the dock trying to figure it out and headed for the city hall. Mario Cimino was closer now. 
I knew a little about him. His whereabouts up until a week ago and the fact that he'd taken out a commercial fishing license. The license I wanted because it would have a picture of Chimino on it. The picture I could turn over to Walt and then we could get out a description on him. I arrived at the city hall, went in, found the department that issues the licenses. They checked with Walt at the station and ten minutes later I was heading for Mrs. Wells' apartment with a fishing license and a pretty good photograph of Mario Chimino. Yes. Well, hello. What can I do for you? Well, that's a remark with a lot of answers. Right now, I want to talk. Go ahead. Oh, well, I, I get tongue-tied when I stand in the hall. You want in? That's it. Why? Ever see this picture before, Mrs. Wells? What? Come in. Seniority, experience. What? Oh, nothing, nothing. That uh, man in the picture, who is he? Don't you know him? I've only seen him once. Oh, we can sit on the couch, Mr... Uh, Diamond. Where did you see this man, Mrs. Wells? Mm, He came up to see my husband. He was leaving just as I arrived. Your husband say who he was? No. He mentioned something about some business he had with this man. Well, if it makes any difference to you, this man in the picture is Mario Cimino. Oh. The one the police are after. The man they think killed my husband. The man who called and told Lieutenant Levinson about the jewels your husband had hid in the water pipes. Are you from the police? <laughs> well, here we go again. No, honey, I'm a, I'm a private detective. Oh. Your husband just got back from Germany a week ago, didn't he? Mm-hmm. By boat? Mm-hmm. What day did he arrive? You've got big blue eyes, haven't you, Mr. Diamond? Uh, uh y- yeah. Very pretty. Uh, honey, you, you, you better sit over there. You're scorching my collar. All right. I, uh, uh where was I? I don't know where you were, Mr. Diamond. But I was thinking... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what day did your husband arrive? Last Tuesday. Uh, when did he... Uh... You must have a hard time combing your hair. Awfully curly, isn't it? I, uh, I'll stop back when i got more time. We'll straighten it out. Please do. <laughs> well, uh, Mrs. Wells. Yes? Uh, the time your husband's boat got in? In the afternoon, around five. Oh, well, thanks, Mrs. Wells. Leaving? Uh, going home and have another talk with Father. Please stop back. If he misses anything... I'll be glad to fill in. Maybe I'll send Dad instead. It was a little hard getting out of there because my shoe leather had started to burn and my number tens were beginning to turn up like skis. I rocked my way down to the cab, did a slalom around two lamp posts and a fire hydrant, slid into the back seat, and 20 minutes later I got out across the street from the 5th Precinct Police Station. I was just stepping off the curb when... Call it right here, Diamond. What? What? Don't move. Don't turn around. Oh, well, I hope that's a pipe you got in your pocket. If it is, it's the first one you'll ever see with a trigger in it. Keep smiling and walk back over to that alley. Okay, okay. Not to poke a hole in me. Better to have it poked than blown. Hey, your dialogue's pretty bad. It's fine enough. Now, your name is Diamond, isn't it? Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you mine if you'll give me the gun and let me make you tell me yours. Your dialogue's as bad as mine. Yeah, I guess I deserve that. Okay, I haven't got much time. Give me the picture. Oh, I can't do that. You better or I shoot you. What will Mom say? What's your mother got to do with it? She took it. It's the only one of me on a bear rug facing north. The picture of Mario Tamino. I'll give you three. One. Uh, okay. Thanks. Now, stay put. Count ten before you turn around. Believe me, Diamond, I mean it. I'll kill you if you move before ten. You're being pretty silly, Mario. They'll pick you up sure. I don't think so. Oh, by the way, Vladimir says to thank you for the 1180. Tell her it was nothing. Start counting. One, two, butt my shoe. Three, four, close the door. Oh, Rick, you find out something? Well, I sure did. This is the lousiest precinct to the city. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Not two minutes ago, I got stuck up right at your front door. What? Yeah. And I had that picture of Mario Cimino on the fishing license. He swiped that? You just know it. Well, don't yell at me. You haven't solved this mess, have you? No, but I'm pretty close. Well, that isn't close enough. I had to send the jewels over to the wife a few minutes ago. Oh, oh, dandy. Well, I had to. Well, what about the newspapers? They haven't gotten wind of it yet. We still have a little time. 
Now, what about Chimino? How did he know you had the picture on the license? Well, somebody gave him the tip. Gave him my description, uh, but just relax. It wasn't Chimino who stuck me up. It wasn't? Not unless he paid Vladimir Sokolowski eleven eighty in the last hour. Oh, wait a minute. I, I don't understand. Well, you're not alone. I'm a little mixed up, too. Well, let's both get untangled, shall we? Tell me what you found out. All right, all right. Now, listen. Wells arrived last Tuesday by boat in the afternoon around 5. This we know. Mario Chumino was being a fisherman then. Oh. He'd rented a boat, taken out a fishing license. Okay. The day that Wells arrived, Chimino went out in the afternoon, stayed about two hours, came back and disappeared. And then Wells shows up with a sink full of jewels. Right. Probably had them on the boat. Avoided customs by dropping them overboard, and Chimino picked them up. And Chimino killed him for the loot. Why? Why? A hundred grand in jewels? Why not? Wells was killed in his own apartment, wasn't he? Yeah. Well, if Chimino picked the jewels out of the water, why go and kill Wells? Why not just take off? Wells could never go to the police. Oh. Yeah, and another thing. The pickup was pretty carefully planned. Wells couldn't have done it. He was in Germany. Somebody here had to plan it. Knew Wells had the jewels. The wife? Could be. But where did he get the jewels in the first place? Oh, a lot of that stuff's still hidden in Germany. You check with military intelligence, and I'll bet it ties up. Well, this guy who stuck you up and lifted the picture, you say you don't think it was Chimino. Maybe there's a third party. Could be, could be, but I doubt it. I got a hunch, Walt. Take me down to the morgue. I want to take a look at Wells. Okay, let's go. Uh, 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 you owe me 25 bucks. 25? For what? Oh, small bribe. Oh, well, here. What's this? It's as good as money. Tickets. Policeman's benefit. Oh, gee, Walt. You know something? What? You're a real sport. <laughs> Right over here. Well? Bullet didn't help his face. No. Mm. Why don't you get the army records on Wells? Why? The wife identified him. Good for her, but she missed one slight detail. Yeah? Yeah. This isn't Wells. What? That's right, Walt. This is Mario Chimino. How do you know? From the picture on the fishing license. This is the same guy. Good Grief. And you had to go and give the jewels back to Mrs. Wells. But... If you still want to save those jewels along with your hide, you better grab orders and get over there. But... but I'll see you when you get there. Now step on it. But... 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 I left Walt in the middle of a butt and took off for Mrs. Wells' apartment in a hurry. On the way over, I went through the facts. Chimino was dead. The body in the morgue wasn't Wells. The jewels were undoubtedly the motive, and unless I was wrong, I'd have to move fast to stop them from leaving the state. I went out of the cab and up the steps to Mrs. Wells' apartment. I reached the door and tried it. No luck, so I went in anyway. The front room was empty. I went through the other rooms. Nothing. Clothes gone. Drawers empty. They'd taken off with a hundred grand in jewels, but where to? They had to be smart enough to know they'd never get out of town by the usual means of transportation. So what would be better than to pay up the back rent on Chimino's boat and go fishing? I left Wall to know where I was headed and took off for schooner landing. Uh, hello there, Sonny. Papa, which boat was Mario Chimino renting? And that one just getting ready to go out right over there. Thanks, thanks. Go get him, Sonny. I knew there was something fishy when they... Well, good afternoon. I represent the sleep type mortuary. Bob! What is it? We've got a passenger. Good afternoon, Bob. Diamond. Everybody seems so surprised. I'm sorry you're coming along. We're headed for open sea, Diamond. Well, I might as well take off my shirt and get a tan. Take the wheel, Lois. Leave your shirt on, Diamond. You can take it off when you go for a swim. Oh? And don't get any ideas. I don't want to shoot you until we clear the breakwater, but I will if I have to. You're Wells, aren't you? That's right. How did you figure it? Oh, partly guesswork. The fishing license tip to Chimino was dead, not me, huh? That's right. You didn't know whether I was working with the law or not, but you had to get that picture to give yourself enough time to get out of the country. Your wife called you and gave you my description. I knew the damage that picture could do if it got to the police, so I had to tag you. Pretty smart. Thanks. We're getting into open water. You can start taking your shirt off, Diamond. I swim pretty well. With a hole in you? Why'd you kill Chimino? He wanted 50% defensive stuff. I wouldn't buy that. I am phoning the police and I had to kill him. So you put your papers on him knowing your wife would identify him as you. 
Why didn't you just grab the jewels and take off? You sound like you're stalling for something. But I'll tell you anyway. Those jewels are in the sink. I knew the law would be there in ten minutes, so I had to take the chance they wouldn't find them. Bob, there's a boat coming up pretty fast. So what? Well, I hate to spoil the party, but I think it's the Coast Guard. You're nuts. I think dear old Lieutenant Levinson got my little old note. So that's what the star was Bob! about. Shut up and stay with that wheel. Bob, that boat! Shut up! All right, Diamond, down in that cabin. I'll get seasick. None of your funny cracks. Just get down there. I think I'll take this life preserver just in case. Drop it. Sure. Uh, Give me that gun. What the man said, baby. Stop the boat. Rick. Yes, Ellen? Phone for you. Walt. Oh, thanks, dear. Uh, hello? Rick, I just got a report from Mommy Intelligence. Jewels were stolen from a collection that the Germans had evidently hidden during the war. What about Mrs. Wells? She admits the whole thing. She saw her husband on a furlough a year ago, and he told her to expect word when he was ready to move. She contacted Mario Cimino for the fence. She'd probably get life. Well, uh, that's too bad. She was the type who really could have had a good time with life. What are you doing? Looking at my beautiful girlfriend, Helen. Oh, thanks. I say hello. The lieutenant says hello, honey. Hello, Walt. Why don't you two get married? Why don't you mind your own business? <laughs> Rick was just going to sing me a song, Walt. Oh, yeah? Well, leave the phone up, Helen. I'll get Otis. Otis? Uh, yeah, Lieutenant. Come here. I want you to hear something. Go ahead, Rick. All right. Oh, uh, Otis listening, Walt? Yeah, I'm listening. Well, get your nose out of my ear. Oh, oh, oh sorry, Lieutenant. What song would you like to hear, Otis? Uh, you're going to sing something for me? Sure, just for you. What's your favorite? Well, now, uh, let's see... Um... Hey, uh, do you know... Otis! Otis, that's the song. Sure. You know, Washington, that Valley Forge, cold as heck and up folk, George. Otis! Yeah. Uh, how about get out of the wheat thrasher, Mother? You're going against the grain. Oh, I don't know. It's an old spiritual. Uh, oh, look, I, I got a better idea. You just listen, huh? Okay, but I still like... Otis, you're fighting me. Okay. There's a place I'd like to be, and it's back in Tennessee, where your friendly neighbors smile and say hello. It's a pleasure and a treat to meander down the street. That's why I want the whole wide world to know. I love those dear hearts and gentle people. Who live in my hometown Because those dear hearts And gentle people Will never ever let you down They read the good book From Friday till Monday That's how the weekend goes I've got a dream house I'll build there one day With picket fence and rambling road I feel so welcome Each time that I return That my happy heart keeps laughing like a clown I love the dear hearts And gentle people Who live and love in my hometown I feel so welcome each time that I return That my happy heart keeps laughing like a clown I love the dear hearts And gentle people Who live and love in my whole town Well, did you like that, Otis? Oh, Diamond, you're dreamy. <laughs> Rick, Otis just swooned. Bye, <laughs> Walt. Come here, Helen. Mm-hmm. Aren't they silly? Yes, Rick. Oh, darling, you are dreamy. Oh, Diamond, you devil, you. (laughs) 
You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Ed Begley played Lieutenant Walt Levinson. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Francis Robinson, Jack Crucian, Yvonne Patey, and Charles Seal. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's show was written by Blake Edwards and directed by Russell Hughes. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. <laughs> Two other shows for Sunday on NBC that you want to hear tonight are The American Album of Familiar Music and Take It or Leave It. Together, they make up one hour of the very best in listening pleasure for you. Baritone Thomas L. Thomas brings you the songs you love best during the 30 minutes of restful reminiscence on the American album. And immediately following this delightful musical show, Eddie Cantor comes romping into your radio with the $64 question on Take It or Leave It. There's a solid 30 minutes of question marks and laughs when it's time for Cantor Sunday on NBC. Make it a point to hear both the American album of familiar music and Eddie Cantor's Take It or Leave It tonight and every Sunday over most of these same NBC stations. There are two more of NBC's great lineup of Sunday shows. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us next Sunday at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. James Melton and Erna Berger star next on Harvest of Stars on NBC. Fed up with the everyday grind. Tired out from the summer heat. Want to get away from it all. We offer you Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are deep in a fabulous mountain cavern, surrounded by a horde of menacing natives from a lost civilization, held at the mercy of the most beautiful woman in the world, the terrible queen called She. <laughs> Tonight, we escape to uncharted Africa and to an incredible adventure, as H. Ryder Haggard described it in his fantastic story, She. In those days, I was a professor of archaeology at Oxford. And though this may account for my being able to understand some of those strange events which occurred later... It was in no respect the reason for my becoming involved in them. No, the real reason was unbelievably simple. I walked through the caves of the dead in the terrible and ancient city of Kor, crossed the awful abyss and looked upon the flame of life, only because I was one of the ugliest men in England. Because of my appearance, I had made few acquaintances and only two close friends. Roger Vinci first, and following his death, his son, Leo, whom he left behind. And it was that friendship which brought Leo Vinci to my chambers off the quadrangle. Late in the evening of the day, he became 25 years old. Today was the first I knew of it, Holly, when the attorneys called me in. Yes. They said Father instructed them the week before he died to give me the letter and this little bronze chest on my 25th birthday. That's strange. I mean, the chest. Designs on the lid show Egyptian influence. It must be very old. Well, according to Father's letter, it contains something over 2,000 years old. Really? Must have considered it rather important. See, he's closed the cover with a lead seal. Yes, so I see. At any rate, Holly, the letter doesn't tell us much. Suppose we... Uh, suppose we see what's inside. <laughs> All right. I have a geology hammer here somewhere, my boy. Uh, oh, here we are. And a chisel. Now, you hold it in place on the table here. Uh-huh. Hmm? Go ahead. All right. Ah, there, it's pulling loose. Yes. Ah, I did it. Well, <laughs> here goes. What the devil is that? Why, it's a clay tile, an old Egyptian writing tablet. Yes, it's the kind used about the time of Nectanabes, around 340 B.C. But the writing on it, it's not Egyptian. 
It's Greek. Yes. And parts of it are broken away. Oh, it'll take some time to translate this, Leo. But Father apparently did it, Holly, according to this paper. Listen, here's his translation. Read it. I am Anates, wife of Callicrates, say this to you, my son. Forced to escape the wrath of the great Nectana bees. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I thought so. Your father and I fled southward across the waters and wandered for twice twelve moons upon the coast of Libya. Well, that's that... the old name for Africa, you know. Ah, uh, that faces the rising sun. And there by the mouth of a river where stands facing the sea a great mountain carved like the head of an Ethiopian. What is it? Ah. Here? Uh, uh, nothing, Holly. Huh? It, it, it goes on. Right. Uh, following the river, we soon fell among... There's a row of asterisks That here. must be one of the places where the tile's broken. Go yes. on, my boy. Uh, to a hollow mountain where a great city once stood, and to the terrible caves of which no man had seen the end, and, and to she who must be obeyed. She who must be... What's wrong, Leo? I don't know, Holly. There's something familiar about that name, but I've never heard it before. Strange. Well, well, come on, get on with it. She who must be obeyed, who did lead us by awesome ways to the place where the great pit is, whose voice is like thunder, and she did show to us the rolling pillar of life and did stand in the flames. And she spake unto my, and there's a large fragment missing here. Oh, let me see. There isn't very much more. Picks up, uh, carried far away on the ships where I gave birth to thee, and came hither to Athens at last. Uh-huh. So I say to thee, by these things which I have told... Seek out this place, nor stay thy will until thou hast the secret of life for thyself. Sit then on the throne with the pharaoh. And that's all, Holly. Now, what's it all about? Leo, if your father knew, he kept it to himself. I don't know. It's all very strange. Yes. (laughs) Well, we'll know as soon as we reach the place. (laughs) I was hoping you'd say that. If you decided not to... I think I should have had to try it, finding it alone. Oh, I can't do anything else, Holly. It's, it's more than curiosity. It's almost a compulsion. There's such a familiar feeling about all this. Mm. Even that mountain, Holly, shaped like the head of an Ethiopian. Yes, what about it? Well, off and on, ever since I was a kid, I've dreamed about a mountain like that. But why, Holly? Why should I? That was the beginning... And some three months later, we drifted down the east coast of Africa, south of Zanzibar, searching the miles of jungle shores for the mountain carved like a head. There were four of us in the tiny sailing dhow, Leo and I, of course, along with Abdullah, the Arab boatman we'd hired in Arden, and finally a solid north countryman named Job, my servant for many years. We'd caught no sight of our landmark as yet, but a native had told us of seeing it once years before, somewhere to the south. So our hopes held high, and we were confident luck was with us. And so it was, until one evening, just in dark. That's a pretty stiff wind, Holly. Yes. You think Abdullah knows what he's doing? We're rather close in shore, all right, Leo. I doubt if there's any danger, unless a squall hits. Hey, by Gauzy, we're strangers here in an heathen land and all. Anything could happen. It could, Joe, but let's assume that it won't. Uh-huh. Huh? How's the dory making out back there? Oh, trailing along all right behind us. Be in a bad spot if we lost it. We are guns, food, equipment, and everything in it. Yes, I know, Joe. Leo, perhaps we shouldn't have packed the stuff that way, Leo. I should have kept it on board with no, us. No, no, Holly. We want to be ready to shove off up the river as soon as we sight that head. It would be a tough job loading that boat at sea. Well, we may not have had to, Leo. We've certainly found no reason to so far. But we will. I've dreamed ah, of it. Ah, ah. Ah. Hey, Master Holly, look! It's the, the wind, wind's Holly. driving the water ahead of it. Abdallah! Lay under that tiller and head her into it. I'll give him a hand, Holly. Come right. save loose. Yeah, we've got a chance, sir. Hold on to the mast, Joe. We shall all be down. Leo. The great wave plunged over us, tore away the dory, swamped the dow beneath our feet, and hurled us headlong into the foaming sea. Half smothered, fighting to stay afloat, borne shoreward by the drive of the tempest, we were tossed at last, one by one, up onto the rain-swept beach. A calm dawn found us huddled together on the sand at the fringe of a dark and forbidding jungle. At the south lay the mouth of a small river, and to the north, the beach ended at the slope of a rocky headland. Leo and Job went to look at the wrecked dory, lying at the water's edge a hundred yards away, while I searched the shoreline for some sign of our boatman. 
I found none, and we never saw Abdullah again. Oh, Holly. Find any, any trace of him, Holly? No sign, Leo. It is gone for good. Oh, it's too bad. What shape's the door in, Job? Wrecked. Not a chance of fixing it. But the equipment seems to be all right, sir. Oh, good. It's all there, is yes, it? Yes, most of it. The lashings held and the waterproof cases stood up very well. Only trouble is we're afoot. Yes, we're going to have a lot of trouble following the coastline. We won't mm-hmm. follow any coastline, Holly. What? We're going up that river. We're... Take a look at that headland there to the north. Yeah? It shows up better from the wreck, Holly, but with the sun coming up now, you can see it from here, too. Oh, I goom it shaped like a human egg. That's it! That's the landmark! Right, Holly. And that's the river Colocrates followed with his wife, the same one we're going to follow. Oh, but Leo, with the boat gone, we shall have to break trail through that jungle and follow that riverbank. Yes, we'd better get started. Uh, look, look oh. gentlemen, why can't we just stay here and try to signal oh, some oh, ship? Oh, there's oh, not Joe. much chance of a job. They stay pretty clear of this coast. But anyway, this is what we've been looking for. I don't really know what we are looking for, Leo. It's been more than 2,000 years since Colocrates went up that river. And things must have changed a great deal by now. Holly, Holly, that carved head up there in the mountain... It looks exactly the way it always did when I dreamed about it. It's incredible. I've Gentlemen, got a not... strange feeling that whatever Colocrates and his wife found back there in the jungle will still be waiting there today. For five hot, steaming days, we pushed inland through the jungle, following the banks of the muddy river. Mile by mile, the creeping undergrowth became more dense. The river shallowed and became sluggish, and the swamplands began to stretch out from the low banks. Foul pools and stagnant lagoons full of soft black mud covered over with a green scum made every step a hazard. Crocodiles slid away at our approach, and bright-colored snakes glided out from underfoot. Mile after mile, we forced our way through those evil swamps, each mile more difficult. And finally came the morning of the sixth day. I don't know, Holly. If it gets any worse, we'll never make it. Uh, Excuse me, butting in, gentlemen. Yes, Joe. I say we should turn back. Oh, no, Joe. We've spent five days getting this far. It'd be a shame to waste it. It's just the way I feel. We'll keep on as long as we can. Oh, what, Leo? Oh, I know, I know. I stumbled over something in the mire. Here, take a look at it. It's a rock. Look. Yes. It's a square stone. It's been hand cut. There's another. It's a section of an old wall of some sort. Or of a dike. That's it, Holly. A long time ago, the river was held between stone dikes along here. Like a sort of canal. It's possible. That might account for the swampland. The dikes gradually fell to pieces, and the river spread out through the jungle. Of course. And, Holly, there could be only one reason for building them. So that boats or barges could come in from the ocean to some kind of a city. A city, gentlemen. Why don't we turn back while we can? City. City. It had to be a long time ago. Centuries ago, Leo. It could still be there, Holly. This place has never been explored. Nobody would ever try to come through these swamps. It may include us if it keeps... Uh, uh, Job, what's the matter with you? He must be... Uh, Oh, look. Natives. Ah. Where the devil did they come from? I don't know. Ooh, strange-looking brutes. Look at those clothes they're wearing. Yes, I've never seen any quite like them. Except in... Hey, go... Hey, bakani viko. Do you recognize that dialect? No, it's a little like Arabic. I might try that. Sabul al Haya. Kaifa? Hey, go... Ni bokan ni vek. I've never heard anything like it before. They seem to want us to come along with them, Holly. Yes, you think we'd better chance it? Well, they outnumber us 30 to 1, Leo. Yes, and they're all carrying those stabbing knives. Well. Back as a dango. Well, hang on to your guns. They don't seem to know what they're for. Let's go. Our strange escort moved rapidly ahead, twisting and turning as they followed some well remembered trail of their own. We rested during the night on a hummock of dry ground and struck out again at dawn. It was late afternoon when we left the swamp and climbed up a long slope to the foot of the rock-walled mountain. Reaching its base, we entered the mouth of a great cavern, and a short way inside, 
were led into a small side chamber, carved from the living rock and lighted by a reed wick floating in a jug of oil. And then the strange natives went away and left us, and we sat about on the floor, trying to plan some course of action. <sighs> oh, dear. Ah. How long do you suppose we've been here, Holly? Close to two hours, I'd say. Yeah. It must be dark outside by now. Holly, do you have any idea what race they belong to? They're not like any other natives in this part of Africa. Oh, I've seen people much like them in some of the villages in southern Egypt, Leo. But I don't know any more about it than that. They wear those odd tunics, too. Cotton or linen, I suppose. Those bronze headbands. They must have been out of contact with the rest of the world for centuries, Holly. Evens, that's what they are, and... Up to no good so far as we're concerned. That's you what I think. You may be right, think. Joe, but I still want to find out about the other things Emanatis wrote on the tile. The city of Kaur and the pillar of fire and she who must be obeyed. We found the caves, at least. Though I can't see anything so terrible about them. Perhaps we haven't seen everything the cave... Huh? Oh. Ni bohob. Oh. Ze ni bohob. Our little chum. Ze ni bohob. He seems to want us to follow him. Mm. Well... Hang on to your guns. Right you are. Stick close together. Don't let them separate us. All right, Job? Come, let's go. A strange guide led us along the twisting, branching passageways, lighting our way with a flaming torch that threw weird shadows on the walls of solid rock. Now and then we passed side chambers lined with long rows of stone slabs. And then I saw that each slab held the sheeted figure of a human body. And I realized these caves were one vast crypt filled with the mummified bodies of some vanished race. Gradually, as we moved on, a most remarkable sound began to grow louder, made up of the guttural voices of a crowd, the throbbing of drums, and the moan of some strange musical instrument. Suddenly, the narrow passage opened out into a great hollowed cavern where the natives danced and postured in the eerie glare from a hundred huge torches placed about the walls. I stared in amazement. The torches were flaming mummies tied upright to the posts, and the guide had lighted our way through the passages with a human arm. Nebok! Borg Jane! I... I think he means for us to walk toward that platform in the center. Yes. There's a pit of coal burning in the top of it. Nebok! Yes, come on. Watch it, Holly. I don't like the looks of this. All right. Keep your gun handy, Leo. Stay right with us, Joe. Yes, they look Just anything but friendly. If anything starts, try to get on the platform. They've got no weapons except those stabbing knives, remember. Well, here we are. Now what? The barn vet. It's quite some fire they've got built up. I can't understand what they mean. Oh, oh, Joe! 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 Look out, Holly! They've killed Joe! The devil's back against the wall, Leo! Uh, Watch it! Here they come! All right, you! Step, Job, without a chance there. What are you left? Holly, let's try for the free. Hagger! Uh, Hand us him out! What the deuce is this? Old man in a long white robe. Hold your gun ready, Leo. We'll see what happens. Never, Andy! Angibo! <laughs> well, they're scared to death of him, whoever he is. Wait, he's coming our way. I presume you speak English, gentlemen? Yes, uh? but you do. Occasionally, natives from the south have come through the swamps, and we have captured them. I have learned many of the languages of the outside world. I am Bilali. Uh, um, uh, Leo Vinci, and, and this is Mr. Holly. I am most sorrowful for the death of your companion. Oh, yes, poor Joe. My children had no excuse. They know the law. From now on, you will be allowed to complete freedom. No white man is ever to be eaten. Eaten? That is what would have been done to you. But rest assured, her law is just, and their punishment will be swift. Whose law? That of she who must be obeyed. Holly! This is it, Holly. We're still on the right trail. She has demanded your presence. I have come to take you to the place where she is. Tell me, Bilali, who or what is this she who must be obeyed? A goddess? A queen? A white woman? I could not say, my son. I have never seen she. Come along. A 
Again through those tortuous passages. Two of us now, with kindly old Bilali leading the way. Until he left us alone at last in a large chamber hung with brilliant colored silks, fitted with soft divans and lighted by crystal lamps. We stood there several minutes, not speaking, wondering, when suddenly the curtains across the doorway parted and a most amazing figure stood before us. It was swathed in folds of filmy white draperies with soft, gauzy veils covering even the face and hands. I bid you welcome to the city of Kor, Callicrates and friend of Callicrates. I, uh... I, I, I'm not Callicrates. I, I'm Leo Vinci, and, and this is my friend, Mr. Holly. Leo Vinci. Vengeance. No matter, you will understand. Are you? I am she. Well, you, you must forgive us if we find it difficult to understand this. What is all this? The, these caves, the natives. What is Kor? Kor is a great city that rose up and then died many thousand years ago. These are the caves of Kor. The city itself stands farther on, in a huge crater at the heart of the mountain. Are you a descendant of Kor? I came from another place far away, and Kor was dead long before I found it. The natives know me as a fearsome figure in white, and they obey me. They have never seen you? No, Holly. Not one of them has ever seen behind these veils. It's amazing to think that Callicrates must have been here in this same place. Over 2,000 years ago. 2,287 years ago. Callicrates died in this very chamber. You, you speak as though you saw it happen. I did see it happen. I killed him. But you couldn't. That was over 2,000 years ago. Yes. And at that time, I had been here in Kor for more than 500 years. Impossible. How do you know? You haven't seen me. But then you claim to be immortal. Yes, as he could have been had he stepped with me into the flames of life. As you can be, my Callicrates, if you so choose. I, I, I hope you'll forgive me, but I, I, I can't believe anything so fantastic. Is it proof you need? Proof that I once did an evil act in anger and paid for it by waiting alone through all these centuries? Proof that my waiting is ended now? Then look upon it behind this curtain. A mummy. A mummy like those out in the caves. But look at the face. Leo, huh? it's you. That's you lying there. That is the body of Callicrates, whom I loved. And whom I killed in anger when he refused to leave her and stay with me to become immortal. His wife, Amenertes, fled across the mountains and later gave birth to his son, your ancestor. Then, Leo, that clay tile has been handed down in your family for over 20 centuries. I have paid for my sin, and I have waited, knowing that someday my Callicrates would be born to me again, would come back to Kor and find me. It was as though I had to. I dreamed of that carved mountain before I'd ever seen it. And your name, she who must be obeyed. It struck some chord in my memory the first time I heard it. It is your heart that must be obeyed now, my beloved. The decision is yours whether to leave me once again now that you have found me. Or to walk with me into the pillar of life. To love me and to become immortal. Yes. I feel somehow that this is the ending of something I've been moving toward all my life. Leo! Oh. Oh, but, but it isn't possible. Immortality. And how can you love someone you've never seen? Then you shall see, my beloved. I've worn these veils for you, and for you I... Look. Oh. The soft veil slid off from her shoulders, and she stood revealed before us. The most beautiful woman the world has ever seen. Will you leave me now, my Callicrates, or come with me to the flame of life? I'll go with you anywhere. Anywhere. We talked the night away in that chamber, 
Leo and I fascinated by every word that fell from those lovely lips. She talked of the hidden knowledge of ancient lands, sang softly of her thoughts in rhyme, and spoke once again the words of long-dead poets, forgotten by the world. She made us believe in her own immortality and in ours to come. And before dawn, Bilali with us, we followed her madly and joyously through the dim and dusty passage that led to the flame of life. We came to a great abyss with a narrow ledge crossing over it like a rainbow of rock. There Bilali waited, and we three went on alone. At the sight of the awful depths beneath us, Leo and I shuddered in spite of ourselves and moved carefully step by step. She never hesitated, but swayed along gaily before us like a feather borne on a breeze. Finally, we stood in a vast circular chamber, a great bubble in the earth's crust whose walls were shining black basalt. Holly. Yes? I see there by the wall. It looks like the body of a man. An old philosopher, my beloved, oh. who came here many centuries ago. He sat and watched the flame and could not decide whether he should become immortal. Finally, he died. And you? Have you never regretted becoming immortal? I could not have waited for Callicrates, Holly, had I not been immortal. But you, Leo, perhaps you have doubts. Immortality will not even be long enough with you. Where is the flame? Listen, even now it approaches. It advances and then retreats, a never-ending cycle of life. It has moved along its path through this cavern since the beginning of time. Holly, look! Do not fear it, beloved. See, this time I will step into the flame alone. And when it comes again, you may join me. It's like the fire of the sun and the dust of a million diamonds. As the great and terrible pillar of flame approached, she threw off her veils and opened her arms to it, and the eternal fire flowed over her. It passed and left her there, Standing with her head bowed. You, I... Are you all right? It didn't harm you? No, my beloved. Can one find harm in the flame that created life itself? Do you believe that... What? That... What's wrong? I... Tell me what's wrong. The flame was... different somehow. Now that Callicrates has returned, the curse of everlasting life is lifted. Leo... She's aging, growing old. No, I... Oh, no. I do not... If I go, search for me. Search... Merciful heavens. Oh, no. No! Even as Leo's hands reached out to touch her, they closed on a dry heap of soft, gray dust. I knew now that neither of us would step into the flame. And I knew we would spend our lives searching through the world for she. I seemed to hear in my mind once again words she had spoken in those glorious hours the night before. I knew that Leo was hearing them too. And that neither of us, so long as we lived, could ever forget that lovely voice. Nay, not in Coa, but in whatever spot, in town or field, or by the insatiate sea, men brood on buried loves or unforgot, or break themselves on some divine decree or would o'erleap the limits of their lot. There, in the tombs and deathless, dwelleth she. Escape 
Produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, tonight brought you She by H. Ryder Haggard. Adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield, with editorial supervision by John Dunkel. Featured in tonight's cast were Barry Kroger, Larry Dobkin, Kay Brinker, Ben Wright, and Wilms Herbert. Special music by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, you are clinging precariously to a diving, pitching longboat lashed by mountainous seas in the center of a hurricane. And at the helm, driving you on, is a man bent on revenge and willing to kill for it. Next week, we escape with F.R. Buckley's exciting story, Habit. Good night, then, until this same time next week, when once again we offer you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat. These are the towns they fought to live in and live to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! I'm Chad Remington, a cowtown lawyer, I guess you'd call me, although a lot of the folks in Dos Rios, where I come from, look at me with respect and address me as counselor. Of course, Dos Rios is just a sprawling, boisterous frontier town buried away just down below the Continental Divide, but, well, things do happen in our neck of the woods, which not alone make exciting telling, but make exciting living. For instance, not too long ago, something happened in a hotel room of a metropolitan city which affected me. <laughs> affected me? It darn near killed me. It seems that the hotel room was being occupied by the right honorable Quade Dunstan, perhaps the most influential of all our state senators. With a bottle and some glasses handy, the senator was entertaining a so-called constituent... A rancher by the name of King Carson, who runs some 6,000 head of cattle not too far from Dos Rios, in an isolated and lawless area we call the Seminole Strip. Like a lot of political constituents, King Carson had an axe to grind. Senator, I certainly don't mean to threaten you, but if a Seminole Strip is taken into the state as a duly constituted county, you're going to have to look elsewhere for campaign funds next year. <clears throat> Here, let me light that cigar for you, King. There you are. Now, let's look at this thing sensibly. That's what I thought I was doing. Don't you see the way it stands now with no duly constituted law in this strip? The man with the most uh, influence not only runs but practically owns the entire territory? And since King Carson employs close to a hundred punchers at his various establishments, King Carson is the most influential man in the Seminole Strip today. Yeah, that's just about the size of it. And I'm not aiming on seeing it changed by having you boys vote favorably on the petition to take the strip in as part of the state. King, I realize what it would mean if the petition was passed, state militia brought in and all that. But on the other hand, the Seminole Strip is wealthy and would mean a great deal in taxes to the state. Taxes? 
Who cares about taxes? I pay for what I want, and I want that bill defeated. Well, I certainly can't defeat it single-handed. However, with a little cooperation from you, we might accomplish our ends to the satisfaction of everyone. Huh? What do you mean, cooperation from me? I figure I can create suspicion in the minds of my fellow senators about the advisability of taking in the strip as a county of the state. Suspicion based on uh, <clears throat> the uh, unbridled lawlessness down there. <laughs> and then the committee would come down to Seminole for a personal inspection. <laughs> unbridled lawlessness is the part in which you cooperate. You mean uh, stir up so much trouble in Seminole that they wouldn't want it in the state as a gift? Precisely, Mr. Carson. Precisely. Can I depend on you to blast the strip wide open with gunplay and everything else which will reflect on its citizenry? <laughs> Senator, not only can you count on me, but when you bring that committee down to inspect Seminole, they'll hear so much shooting it'll sound like a battle of Bull Run. <laughs> Well, if you'd like to know what that little conversation had to do with Chad Remington, I can only say it came about because of a quite normal cause. A girl. Now, I guess I better make that the girl. Because although Libby is Judge Fillmore's daughter today, I'm kind of looking forward to the time when her name will be Libby Remington. Libby got into this by going down to Seminole to spend a week or two with her mother's brother, Uncle Ruth Tomlinson. And not two days after, I received a telegram saying that if it was at all possible, Libby would like me to come down at once. Business. Well, I got hold of Cherokee O'Bannon, former medicine man and now owner of the Dos Rios livery stable. And on the promise of a good time in Seminole, Cherokee not only loaned me a horse, but rode along with me. And just what the business was Libby referred to in her telegram, we found out hardly had we crossed the state boundary into the Seminole Strip. Chad, now that we're here in Seminole, I don't want you to forget your promise to me. I'm looking forward with great anticipation to, uh, shall I say, a merry old time while over here. Oh, Mr. O'Bannon, I, I want to remind you that my word is as good as my bond. Ah, yes, bond. <laughs> what a beautiful word that is, bond, bottled in bond. Precisely what I have in mind. Now, you listen to me. You've already had five swigs out of that bottle of so-called genuine Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil, and as far as I... Marionated milch mackerel, Chad. Did you see that? I sure did. That feed barn blew up practically in front of our eyes. Now, who'd want to blow up a feed barn? Don't ask me, but I got a feeling this is no place for us to loiter. We better knock on these horses and get over to Ruth Tomlinson's ranch. Ralph, I don't mean to doubt the veracity of a man like you, but what you're saying is totally unbelievable. Well, I don't blame you for not believing it, Cherokee, but every word of what Uncle Rufus told you and Chad is the absolute truth. Gospel. I'm sure it is, Libby, but it, it just doesn't make sense. Suddenly, with no reason, trouble should hit Seminole like a tidal wave. Shootings, killings, fires. Shucks, if we could make head or tail out of it, I wouldn't have let my niece go sending that telegram. Yeah. Just like that feed barn you saw blown up. That makes sense? Yeah, it makes a little sense if you're as bat-brained as I am. Now, Chad, honestly, this is no time for joking. Well, Libby, you know you've both been a little too close to the picture to get an honest perspective on it, but hasn't it ever occurred to you that just perhaps someone is stirring up all this lawlessness because there's a petition up at the Capitol now to, to take Seminole in as a county? But why, Chad? Just tell me why someone would want to keep the Seminole Strip out of the state. What would they have to gain? Well, might have a lot to gain at that, Libby. Right now, this here strip is sort of a governmental orphan. No real law down here. And if the strip isn't voted into the state, there may never be any law down here, except gun law. Uh, tell me, Ruth, how do the ranchers and other folks in Seminole feel about this crime wave? Our men I've talked to are so blame upset they're ready to grab every gun and rifle they can lay a hand to. Just start blasting. Uh-huh. Once they start doing that, Roof, you're going to be in the middle of the darndest range war you ever saw. Yes, sir, Bob. And if you start shooting each other, I'll bet you one whole case of my rattlesnake oil to a gopher hole 
Those senators and politicians won't ever give you a county charter. Oh, Chad, that would be terrible. Well, what do you think Uncle Roof and the rest should do? How can they fight back against someone they don't even know? Olivia, I'll tell you. The first thing is to get the decent citizens of Seminole together and talk sense into them. Make them realize they're only hurting themselves if they fly off the handle and try to fight back right now. <laughs> but gosh almighty, Chad, how are you going to talk to a lot of wild men? Then they got plenty of cause for being wild and acting like sensible human beings. Well, I'm not guaranteeing anything, mind you, but if you can round up 20 or 30 men you can depend on and get them to attend a meeting, I'll promise you this much. I'll make the darndest speech any lawyer has since the defense of Benedict Arnold. <laughs> Ruth Tomlinson did just what I asked him. And the next morning, shortly before noon, 27 angry-faced ranchers filed into the little town hall to listen to me. <laughs> I guess I wouldn't make too good a criminal lawyer, because all of my impassioned speechifying left them pretty cold. Until a tall, swarthy man got up in the audience and started down toward the platform where I was standing. Now just a minute, men, just a minute. I think Mr. Remington's right. He's absolutely right. Well, thanks. I'm glad to find somebody who thinks I'm not all wrong. Uh, come on up here. Hey, sure thing. Hey, uh, uh, by the way, Remington, I'm King Carson, oh? cattle broker here. I own the Frying Pan Ranch and two or three smaller spreads. So, you see, I've got a real interest in what you're talking about. Oh, fine, Mr. Carson. And now, would you mind telling your neighbors just why you think they should leave their guns alone until such time as the states voted favorably on your petition? Well, all right, Remington. Although I'm not certain that making speeches is going to change the minds of this crowd. <laughs> well, sir, they say they can't rule you off the track for... Chad, the doctor! There's a man outside the window! Hey. Oh, Chad! Chad, you all right? Yeah, I'm all right, Ruth. But come on, all of you. Let's get outside after that bushwhacker. Chad, did you see? I saw him. Hit his horse and ducked into that alley the other side of the hotel. Come on, man. Carson, see you, boys. Grab your horses. Let's get after him. All right, some of you circle the other way. Come on, Remington. Let's head for that alley. I'm with you, Carson. All right, get up there, boy. Come on, boy. Come on. said he saw the man head this way. I certainly thought I did. Bring it up, boys. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Well, I'll be blamed. What do you make of this, Chad? Oh, what could anyone make of it? Someone took a shot at me at the meeting and somehow got away. Kind of makes fools out of us, too, doesn't it, Remington? Hmm? After shooting off our mouths, telling the boys not to fly off the handle and start squeezing trigger, we do that very thing ourselves. Carson, now that I've been singled out as a target, I'm starting to feel the way the other men do. What do you mean, singled out? I mean, look here. Here on the side of my neck. But, Chad, your neck's all bloody. That's right. Sixteenth of an inch closer, and those two slugs would have stopped my speech-making permanently. Well, I got an idea there's someone who doesn't want any speech-making here in this strip. When I find the man, I've got a few oratorical gestures left I'm going to use on him. Ten raw-boned knuckles swung freely to punch home the points I'm going to make. And I don't mean in speeches. We'll return to the exciting second act of our Frontier Town adventure in just about one minute. And now, Frontier Town. I imagine if a bullet creased your neck that you'd feel a little bit personal about it, too. I did. Now, freely admit it made me not only more interested, but more than a little bitter. 
It seemed apparent my first guess was right. And moreover, that someone who knew about my guess could breathe easier if I left the Seminole Strip in a long pine box. Well, after our wild goose chase, Cherokee and I went back to Ruth Tomlinson's ranch and sat around with Ruth and Libby trying to fit this jigsaw together. Chad, I know how you feel, having been shot at. Nearly killed, that's what he was. Nearly killed. And I hope you won't jump down my throat for what I'm about to say. I won't jump down your throat, Libby. Not until I have the legal right. Well, what are you aiming to say, Libby? Just this. Has it occurred to any of you that the only man at the entire meeting who claims he saw which way that gun toter went was King Carson? Well, I don't know what you're driving at. King saw him ride into the alley. King said he saw him ride into the alley. Libby, now I know why I feel like I do about you. I think you hit the nail right on the thumb. King Carson, why not? A man who owns as much land as he does certainly could stand to gain by having the state reject Seminole as a county. You're right, he'd really be a king. The king of the whole Seminole domain. Well, supposing you three are right, and I ain't saying you are, how are you ever going to find out? I don't know for sure, Ruth, but I think if Cherokee and I rode over and paid a call on his lordship, King Carson, at his office... My legal training might give me a few questions to ask him that'd prove just a little embarrassing. Come on, Cherokee. You and I are riding. Why, doggone it, King, don't go bawling me out. I done exactly what you told me to do. Oh, sure, Toby. You did exactly what I told you to do. The only thing you didn't do was to put one of those two slugs through that rattle-brained lawyer's thick skull. If I hadn't led that posse on through the alley, you'd be dangling from a tree right now. Yeah, hey, you're so smart. Maybe you better do everything yourself. There's one thing I will do myself, Toby, if you don't stop talking back. Oh. King, you got no business slapping me. I'm not going to slap you again, because I don't go around slapping corpses. And if you don't get that Chad Remington once and for all before today is over, a corpse is exactly what you're going to... What are you staring at? King, quick. Huh? See who just rode up here? Remington, that partner of his. Well, <laughs> that simplifies everything, doesn't it? Simplifies? Yeah. Since I can't trust you to take care of Remington, this gives me a chance to do it for you. Now, you stay here and stall him. I'm going out the side door and slip around to the rear window. All you have to do is to get him with his back to that window. But you'd better not slip up on that. That's all I've got to say. Well, uh, yeah, Black-hearted bag of wind. I got a good notion. I'll be right back, Cherokee. This won't take a minute. Oh, howdy, uh, King Carson around? Why, uh, uh, King be right back. Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah, right back. Uh, just, uh, just make yourself comfortable. T take that chair over there by the, by the window. Well, thanks. Don't mind if I do stretch my legs. A little. Uh, good grief. Shot twice through his back. You sneaking bushwhacker! Out of sight already. Every time I turn my back, someone else is... Here, 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 here. What's going on in my... What? Toby. Kill. Well, now, look here, Carson. Don't look at me like that. I had nothing to do with it. I was just standing here... Oh, you here. didn't, eh? Now, what are you doing just putting your gun back in your holster? Yeah. Oh, good grief. Can't you see the glass in that side window's broken? Someone shot through there. What does that prove? Nothing. And if you think we're going to stand by here and let you get away with a cold-blooded murder, my friend... You've made the biggest mistake of your life. Come on, you. We're taking you out to the nearest cottonwood and end your speech making with a rope. Have you men all been smoking local weed? What do you mean? I have Remington shot somebody. Then some bullets ought to be missing out of his gun. If he's still got six bullets in it, then he isn't the man you're looking for. Oh, yeah, that's right. Now, now, just a minute, Cherokee. I appreciate what you're trying to do. As for those shots, I... How are you wasting your breath arguing, Chad? Just hand over your gun. Here, I'll get oh, it. This is utterly ridiculous. We heard the shots and came in now, here and found him. Now, there's no use squawking, King. But he... If these slugs are in Remington's gun, he couldn't have done the killing. Blame right. Now, here's his gun. Look for yourself. Thanks. Well, I'll be hanged. There isn't one chamber empty. What? No, sir, not one. I'm mighty glad you spoke up, fella. We might have hung the wrong man. I'm plumb sorry. You're plumb sorry. Oh, friend, this is one of the happiest moments of my life. Of course, I'm sorry to disappoint Mr. Carson, because now he'll have to find someone else to charge with this particular murder. <laughs> Oh, 
Frankie, you're wonderful. <laughs> you're telling me, Libby? Why, before I got my medicine wagon, I worked the Chautauqua route with the shell game. <laughs> Here it is. Now it's not there. Which shell is it under? <laughs> best man in the business, if I say so myself. Yes, indeed. Well, you, you must have been the best man, Cherokee. Although I, I don't see how, with everybody looking at you, you still managed to palm my gun, which had two shells shot out of it, and give them the colt out of the dead man's holster. Neither do I. Well, since it's not considered ethical to give away any professional tricks of prestidigitation... I'll have to refuse to answer. Oh. But I'm mighty glad that for once I was able to help Chad instead of Chad always helping me. <laughs> By the way, wouldn't you say it calls for a little uh, libation about this time, Chad? <laughs> oh, Bannon, you can drink your fool head off. Well, thank you. Uh, just as soon as we've gotten the goods on King Carson and turned him over to the nearest marshal. Uh, I knew there'd be some string attached to that. Talking about getting the goods is a lot different from actually getting the goods, Chad. I'll say amen to that, Libby. Oh, let's save our amens for Carson's funeral if we're good and lucky. Because we'll have to be lucky to pin anything on him. We will? Yeah, he's smart. Slick as a jackrabbit in an oil well. Look at what he framed on me. What's that? Well, the way I figure it, the man he killed was a man who worked for him that he wanted to get rid of. So? So he killed him figuring the mob had killed me, thereby getting rid of both of us and keeping his own hands clean. And again, I say so. So, my dear Miss Persistence, I think that since King Carson considers himself an expert at murder, what we've got to do is plan another one for him. Just pray that we're lucky enough to stop him before it's too late. I didn't mean to sound enigmatic, but there wasn't much more I could tell him at the time. I was still a little shaken up from having escaped hanging thanks to Cherokee's quick wit and even more nimble fingers. But most of all, I, I didn't have anything definite worked out. And then when I heard the next day that Senator Quaid Dunstan and his committee had arrived from the state capitol and that the senator was putting up at King Carson's place, everything soon seemed to fit together. Of course, Senator. I can't say things worked out 100%. But I think there's been enough trouble around Seminole for your committee to refuse action on the petition to take it in as a county. Well, of course. I certainly wish you'd gotten rid of that Chad Remington instead of bungling that up. Yes, well, I... Oh, that's funny. Someone coming here at this time of night. Uh, excuse me, Senator. I'll open the door. Evening, King. Mind if I come in? Why, uh... Why, I, I'm busy at the moment, Roof. Uh, won't tomorrow do? No, I'm afraid this is one thing that won't wait. Senator, this is Ruth Tomlinson, a neighbor of mine. Oh, well, how do you do, Mr. Tomlinson? Please to know you, Senator. I, uh, I'm sorry I had to come in like this, but, uh, I'd like to talk to Mr. Carson alone. Well, what about, Ruth? Well, I, uh, happen to know who shot Toby at your place the other day. The what? Oh, really? Well, how interesting. The senator is here to find out just who it is who's been stirring up all the trouble. So he'll be just as interested as I am in finding out what you know. Now, uh, wait a minute, King. Uh, you sure you want me to tell what I saw? I certainly. We've got to bring that kind of a sneaking buzzard to justice. You know the man's name? Well, uh... Then, uh, maybe you can describe it, huh? Would you say he was about, uh, about my build? Yes, I would. And uh, would you say he looked anything like Mr. Carson? Yeah, I'd say that, too. You see, I was just turning the corner when I saw the whole thing happen. Well, Senator? King, I'm afraid this gentleman is a little too frank to be trusted for too long. That's what I was thinking, too. What did you come here for, Tomlinson? Think you could blackmail me? Why, you smooth-talking vulture... You're the one that's been trying to blow the Seminole strip to bits? You're absolutely right, Senator. He's not a man to be trusted at all. I'm sorry to have to do this to you, Roof, but our game has gone a little too far to allow you to break it up. Carson, for heaven's sake, stop wasting time. Squeeze that trigger and get it over with. Hey, who's that? Drop that gun, Carson. No, 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 drop it. What? Beautiful shooting, Chad. Blasted that gun right out of his hand. All right, open the front door, Roof. Let Cherokee in. I'm saving my strength and coming in through this window. Hey, darn right, Chad. And, Senator, you better sit right where you are. Why, you... Yeah. Well, we sure got him dead to... Chad! Carson, he's got another... A sleeve gun, huh? Well, Carson, you... 
Horse Chad, you double Carson up like a jackknife. All right, you stand still. Get your hands off of me and keep them off. Why, sure, Senator. We'll be pleased to get our hands off you, but not before a federal marshal gets his hands on you. The three of us heard more than enough out of you and Carson to guarantee the next soapbox you'll campaign from will be in the laundry of the federal penitentiary. <laughs> I'll bet both of you, the good citizens of Seminole, will keep the toxin ringing until well past midnight. I'm sure they will. This is really a celebration for them, finally getting the county charter. You're right about them, Libby, but I'm afraid that isn't what's on Cherokee's mind. He's all in a lather about not being able to participate in the celebration, the uh, libation part of the celebration. Well, after he's practically saved your life by that sleight of hand he performed changing guns, I think he's entitled to a reward. Now, now you're talking. Yes, indeed you are. Well, I fully intend to see that Cherokee gets a reward, his uh, just reward. That sounds more like it. <laughs> you know what your just reward is? Having found out what a great magician you are, uh, hereafter I'm just going to give you an empty glass so you can say hocus pocus <laughs> over it and produce your own libation. Why, of all the nefarious schemes, <laughs> Libby, come on. We'll never get back to Dos Rios if we listen to Cherokee singing How Dry I Am. And with the election of a new senator coming up, I want to get home for the boat. All right, girl. Let's get stepping. Hey, I can't ride that fast. I've got a bottle in my hip pocket. <laughs> Don't worry about that, Cherokee. If that bottle breaks, the drinks will be on the horse. Oh. Huh? <laughs> Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler, is a Bruce Ells production. Supervision by Joel Murcutt. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmar. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. This is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> it's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by The Kraft Foods Company makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Now let's see what goes on in Summerfield. For a little goes on in Summerfield that sooner or later does not involve the great Gildersleeve. 
For example, one day last week, Gildersleeve's neighbor, Mrs. Ransom, stepped into Peavy's pharmacy, made a slight purchase, and while waiting for it to be wrapped, dropped a casual remark. And how is Mrs. Peavy? Oh, she's fine, Mrs. Ransom. Just fine. That is, she's, uh, well, she's been having a little trouble lately. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. Nothing serious, I hope. Well, to hear her tell it... Well, it's, uh, how long has this been going on? In about 30 years. Oh. <laughs> now, that just goes to show. Here, I've known Mrs. Peavy all this time and never even had an inkling. I declare, some women are just martyrs. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> well, who, who's your doctor, Mr. Peavy? Have you a good doctor? Well, we usually take from Dr. Pettibone, but I... Haven't called him in on this, after all. Oh, I know. Doctors are so expensive. And operations, oh, don't even mention them. But it doesn't pay to put them off. Well, I don't think this is as serious as all that. Uh, uh, well, I dare say she'll recover. Oh, well, she will, Mr. Peavy. I'm sure she will. You've just got to believe that. You've got to keep her believing it, too. Doctors say the will to live is half the battle. There's nothing the matter with her will to live. <laughs> oh, well, I think it's so brave of both of you to take it this way, and I'm just so sorry to hear about it. Now, if there's anything I can do for, anything at all, you let me know now, you hear? <laughs> Only kidding, Mr. Ransom. Come on in. Oh, thank you. Hunt's in the living room. Marge is sewing a button on him. Well, hello, Leela. Okay, stand still. Hello, Mrs. Ransom. Hello, Marjorie. You'll have to excuse me for not having my coat on, Leela. Marjorie's sewing a button on my vest. Uh-huh. Quite the little housewife, isn't she? Stand still. You want me to stick you? Better not. You'll let the air out. <laughs> oh. Leroy, sometimes you're a little too smart for your britches. Go up and get ready for dinner. I am. Have you washed your hands? Yes. Well, go wash them. Okay. And stick in your shirt tail. Is that any way to greet Mrs. Ransom? How did I know Mrs. Ransom was coming? You can safely keep your shirt tail in at all times, my boy. You know the Boy Scout motto, be prepared. (laughs) Sorry, Leela, these little domestic affairs. There you are, Unky. Well, that's fine, my dear. Much obliged. Now, Lila? Well, I probably shouldn't even be speaking to you, Throckmorton, after the last time I saw you. But in time of trouble, I think we should forget our differences. Trouble? What do you mean, Lila? Have you heard about poor dear Mr. Peavy? What about Mr. Peavy? Mrs. Ransom, they're talking to me, my dear. Well, Marjorie may want to hear about this, too. It's Mrs. Peavy. I'm afraid she's very ill. That's a shame. Now, wait a minute. I was in Peavy's this morning. He didn't say anything to me about it. Well, you know how Mr. Peavy is. He never tells you anything anyway. That's right. Well, I had to practically pry it out of him. But I'm afraid the fact is that Mrs. Peavy needs an operation, and they can't afford it. Oh, that's terrible. Well, I guess that drugstore of his is no gold mine. Not the way he runs it. Beckman's is a lot better. Are you still here? Okay, okay, I'm going. What's better about Beckman's? Batman comics, murder comics, Captain Wonder Man, he's got them all. All Peavy's got is Donald Duck. That's the only one he likes to read. Well, Beckman's going to run him out of business if he doesn't wake up. But Peavy's such a stubborn old coot, you can't tell him anything. I know, but he's such a darling, too. I can't bear to think of him in trouble. Neither can I. Isn't there something we could do, Uncle Morris? That's why I came to you, Throck Martin. I knew you'd always been a friend of his. Peavy's all right if he weren't so stubborn. Oh, and Mrs. Peavy, the poor old soul. I can't bear to think of her needing medical attention and not being able to afford it. Well, I'll tell you. Come and get it. <laughs> Just a minute, Bertie. We have company. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Ransom. Nobody told me you were here. Good evening, Bertie. How are you? Just fine, Miss Ransom. Thank you. Just fine. Miss Gilbert, what about Miss Ransom? Is she a... Uh, is she what, buddy? Well, I just want to know. I mean, what about it? Is she a... Ain't she? Pardon me a moment, Leela. What is it you want to know, buddy? <laughs> I just want to know should I set another place. Oh! <laughs> it, 
How about it, Leela? Stay to supper? Oh, I couldn't. Oh, come on, Miss Vance. It won't be no trouble. Yes, please do. Well, I don't know that I should. What are you having for supper, Bertie? Well, if I'd known you was coming, Miss Vance, I might have done better. About all we got to offer is some stew made out of leftovers, but there's plenty of it. I don't think I'd better tonight. <laughs> Another time, perhaps. Thank you, just the same. I'll be running along. Oh, Ralph Martin, about Mr. Peavy. Yeah, I'll see what I can do, Lee. Oh, I knew you would. Yeah, the Jolly Boys are meeting this evening. I'll be seeing him at the club. Well, now, don't tell him I said anything. You know how sensitive he is. Yeah, I won't, Leela. Don't worry. Good night, y'all. Hey, good night, good y'all. Night. All right, everybody, dinner. Marjorie, where are you going? To put these things away. All right, but hurry. <laughs> Leroy, where do you think you're going? Up to wash my hands. Confound it, I told you to do that half an hour ago. All right, go ahead. I don't know why it is. As soon as dinner's announced, it's a signal for this family to scatter. Bertie, where are you going? After the food. Oh, well, bring it on. I've got a meeting. Must leave the just, uh... Hey, what's the matter, fellas? Come on. No, no, Commissioner. It's no good. Ah, uh, don't seem the same without Peavy. You're right, Floyd. Where is the Peave? I thought you said going to be here tonight, Commission. Well, I thought he was coming, Floyd, but I suppose it's possible he won't turn up. After all, I hear his wife is sick. Oh, that's too bad. Well, just because a fellow's wife's got the pips, no reason he can't get out and have a little fun, is it? Floyd. Well, I mean, he don't have to become a hermit, does he, after all? Mrs. Peavy is seriously ill, Floyd. Oh, yeah? As bad as that. And Peavy is a devoted husband. One of the few really devoted husbands I know. Yeah, I guess they are pretty thick at that. As husband and wives go. Gee, maybe we should send her some flowers or something. That's more like it, Floyd. Roses are nice. Personally, I would prefer chrysanthemums. We're not sending these to you, Hooker. <laughs> Uh, chrysanthemums stink. They smell up the house. Yeah. They don't smell at all. What about roses? Yeah, but roses smell nice. Well, all I can say... If I may have a word, please, Judge. Help yourself. Now, I'm familiar with the situation. I should like to submit that what Mrs. Peavy needs is not a bunch of roses or chrysanthemums, but an operation. Oh, that's bad. Did I ever tell you about the time that Boy, I... Boy, quiet. Okay. Now, operations cost money, fellas. Plenty of money. And just between you and me, I don't think Peavy can swing it. Of course, he wouldn't admit it, but you know how much trade he gets in that grocery, in that drugstore. A toothbrush here, a Necco wafer there. Well, uh, what do you think we ought to do, Gildy? Well, either we're jolly boys or we're not. When you say that, smile. <laughs> if the purpose of this club isn't to help a fellow member when he's down, then what is it? To play a little poker. <laughs> Floyd, the wife of a fellow member, is lying ill at home. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner. Oh, I could bite my tongue off. Well, count me in. What do you want to do, pass the hat? I feel that that would definitely be a mistake. Peavy would never accept charity. Yeah, the judge is right. You know how touchy he is. Yeah, he's funny that way. Well, then maybe we better send him the roses. Yeah, wait a minute. I've got another idea. Maybe if we were to go to Dr. Pettibone, you know, on the QT... And persuade him to go a little easy on Peavy. Hey, now you're talking. He wouldn't have to cut his rate or anything. He could just make a little mistake in his bill and undercharge him. Why shouldn't he do it for nothing? Well, now... After all, Floyd... He should do it for nothing. That's asking a good deal. All right. If Peavy was to walk into my shop flat, broke in need of a haircut, don't you think I'd give him one? You're darn right I would. I might wait on my regular customers first, but I'd give him one. <laughs> well... And I... throw in a shave, too. Well... And not charge him a cent. Well... Or expect a tip, either. These doctors. Well, that's big of you, as I started to say, Floyd. But you see, it's a little different with Dr. Pettibone. He's not a jolly boy, so it's not as if he was treating a fellow member. Or the wife of a fellow member, rather. By golly, Gildy, why don't we make him a member? The doc? That's an idea. Yeah, why not? The doc's a good fellow. When he's not looking down your windpipe. Hey, if we elected him a member, we could make him operate on Peavy's wife for initiation, like. Operator, he don't get in. <laughs> Well, I don't know that that's the way to put it, Floyd, but it's not a bad idea, not bad at all. 
Shall we put it to a vote, fellows? Do I hear the name of Dr. Pettibone proposed for membership? I so propose. Is it seconded? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The doc's a member. Who'll notify him? I propose that Mr. Gildersleeve and myself be appointed a committee of two to call upon the doctor and inform him of his good fortune. And don't forget what we elected him for. Move we adjourn. Second. Oh, wait a minute, fellas. What do you say? One more song before we go, eh? A song without Peavy? In honor of Peavy. Yeah, yeah. Peavy'd want it that way. Oh. Uh, sit down there, Floyd. You know, our big special. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, I miss you. Gildersleeve and his dear old pals will be back in just a moment. What are you going to tell us tonight about Parquet Margarine, Mr. Lang? Why, I was just thinking about that the other day while my family and I were driving through the country. As we passed by several fine-looking farms, it made me wonder how many people know that Parquet Margarine is made from choice products of our American farmlands. I'm sure we'd all like to hear about that. Because so many families use parquet margarine as a regular spread. Parquet, you see, is made from rich, highly refined vegetable oils and pasteurized skim milk, cultured for flavor. That sounds wholesome and nourishing. Indeed it does, for parquet is one of the finest energy foods you can serve. And remember, Kraft adds important vitamin A to every single pound, making parquet margarine an even more valuable food. Hmm, Well, that's something we too often take for granted. And good nutrition is so important these days. Yes, and flavor is important, too. Helps us enjoy the things that are so good for us. That's why Kraft takes special care in flavor blending the fine, wholesome farm products used in Parquet. So join the millions who prefer delicious, nourishing Parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. Now let's get back to the great-hearted Gildersleeve. Driven by his concern for his old friend Peavy, we find him with Judge Hooker, a committee of two representing the Jolly Boys, walking into the office of Dr. Pettibone. Huh. Where is he? He must be inside. He's always here at 9 o'clock. Well, pick out a magazine and make yourself comfortable, Judge. Have you seen Hygieia for August 1942? (laughs) I've read it from cover to cover. Didn't help you any. Gildy, may I suggest that since I know Pettibone better than you That you allow me to do most of the talking? You can do half of it Now let me start, let me explain the situation Pettibone's kind of touchy on some things, you know Now what is there to be touchy about? Plenty, in the first place Oh, good morning, Judge Good morning, Miss Finley (laughs) This is my friend, Mr. Gildersleeve, Miss Finley Oh, how do you do? Uh, Just fine, thank you there's nothing the matter with me, Miss Finley. We're here to see the doctor on a personal matter. Oh, we'll go right in. Thank you. <laughs> see you later. <laughs> oh, hi, Doc. Good morning, gentlemen. <laughs> Pretty nice-looking receptionist you've got there. I'm surprised your wife lets you get away with it. She's my wife's cousin. She's... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, which one of which one of you fellows is sick? Neither of us, Doctor. That is, I'm feeling as well as usual. But we didn't come for a professional reason. We didn't? Please, Gildy, if you let me. Oh. No, Doctor, we came to bring you some good news. You know, a few of us fellows have a little club. Oh, that. Club? Well, you know, what club? The Jolly Boys Club. It's just a few fellows. I guess you'd call us kindred spirits. And 
We generally get together on Saturday nights and raise Ned for a few hours. We sing, play cards, tell a few stories. Get on with it, Horace. Well, Doctor, Mr. Gildersleeve and I are a delegation, a committee of two officially chosen by the Jolly Boys Club to call on you. Now, what for? It is my pleasure and high privilege to announce your unanimous election to the Jolly Boys Club as a full participating member with all rights and perquisites pertaining thereto. The dues are 50 cents a month. Wow. I see. <laughs> do, do I know any of the other members? Chief of Police. Oh, yes, yes, Chief Gates. He has a slight systolic murmur. You'd never know it to hear him sing. And you know Floyd Munson, the barber. We meet upstairs over his shop. Floyd? I set his leg when he broke it on election night back in 1936. Of course, you know Peavy the drugger. Peavy? Asthma. Yes. Good fellow. Good fellow just the same. I think you find the Jolly Boys a pretty congenial group, Doctor. Well, I do enjoy a little card game occasionally. Dr. Pettibone, Mr. Ebert Ball is here. Oh, thank you. Now, if you fellas will excuse There's me... There's something else we have to ask you, Doctor. Let Mr. Um, Eberball wait a minute, will you? Oh, he's got an appointment. Oh? Well, then we'd better come back later. No, no, Judge. It'll only take a second. Tell Eberball to wait, Miss Finley. All right, Miss Finley. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's this way, Doc. Now that you're a jolly boy, we can speak freely. Yes, you're one of us now, Doctor. And the motto of the jolly boys is, one for all, all for one. Yeah, what are you getting at? Well, it's about Peavy. Now, we all agree Peavy is a fine fellow. Yeah, yeah. And his wife, Mrs. Peavy, is a fine woman. Well, that may be. Take my word for it, she's a splendid woman. All right, all right. She's Florence Nightingale. What about it? As a jolly boy, Doctor, you wouldn't want anything to happen to Mrs. Peavy, would you? No, Why? Is Peavy thinking of, uh, what, doing her in? Yes. I'm sure you're joking, Dr. Pettibone. They're a most devoted uh, couple. Why, Peavy thinks the world of her. He often has... Ye to... gods, Judge, don't beat around the bush all night. I was Shut just... Shut up, it's my turn to talk. <laughs> Pettibone, Mrs. Peavy needs some kind of an operation, and Peavy can't afford it. Will you do it? Gildy, that's not the way... Will you, Pettibone? Why the dickens should I? Pettibone, as a humanitarian and a jolly boy... Peavy hasn't seen fit to call me in on the case... I'm not going to take it away from another doctor. Are you going to let somebody else hold him up for a big fee? If the doctor on the case calls me in, I'll be very happy to consult with him. So Peavy can pay two bills instead of one, eh? Ha! Gildy, I don't think you understand Dr. Pettibone's position. Oh, yes, I do. You doctors are all the same, the way you back each other up. Well, let me tell you, Pettibone. Careful, Gildersleeve. Remember your hypertension. You can't... You can't scare me. <laughs> I'm certainly much obliged to your visit, gentlemen. Elect me to a club that meets over a barber shop. And then ask for a thousand dollars worth of surgery. Now, Pettibone, I don't think that's fair. If you'll excuse me, I have a two dollar cash patient in the waiting room. Huh. Come on, Judge. No, 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 this door, please. What? This way, Judge. Good day. <coughs> Shoving us out the back door. We don't even get another look at that nurse. Well, fellas, how'd you make out? Floyd, we've got to call an emergency meeting of the Jolly Boys. Yeah, right away. Can we meet tonight, Floyd? Oh, what's the matter with right now? I got the chief under the towel here. Oh? Well, open them up. We got to have a quorum. I can hear all right, boys. Go ahead with the meeting. All right, let's come to order. Now, uh, Pettibone didn't he react very favorably to our proposal. He didn't? You hear that, chief? Yep. He's a heel. Yeah, well, that may be, chief, but Peavy's as bad off as ever. Well, he runs that store like a museum. No wonder he don't make money. Modern merchandising methods would help, no doubt about it. Some of the tricks Beckman uses. Peavy's too stubborn to take advice, though. Do you think he'd accept the loan? He might. You got any money to loan him? No. Have you, Gildy? No. How about you, Floyd? Nope. We'll have to think of something else. <laughs> I know, fellas. Peavy needs money. Well, nobody's got enough to loan him, but we could spend some money... Suppose we tell all our friends to go into Peavy's and buy six months' drug supply in advance, or whatever they can afford. That's a possibility. Yeah, that sounds good, yeah. Hear that, Chief? Yeah, that's okay. Of course, we'll have to spend all we can, too. Now, why don't we get a six-month supply of hair tonic, Floyd? At retail? Listen, I'm a jolly boy, but I ain't that jolly. <laughs> well, a judge can buy his liver medicine for six months ahead. How do I know I'll live six months to enjoy it? Oh, what's the diff? You can't take it with you. What's Gildersleeve going to buy? Don't worry about me, Horace. I'll do some of my Christmas shopping. Eh, uh, how about the chief? What do you say, chief? 
Will you buy six-month drug supplies at Peavy's? Sure. What does that amount to, Chief? Three cakes of soap. <laughs> You'll have to do more than that, Chief. Okay, I'll send in some of the boys. That's the main thing. Send in lots of people. Everybody we know. High and low, rich and poor, young and old. Send them to Peavy's. Just a minute, Mrs. Ransom. I'll wait, Mr. Peavy. Good afternoon, Mrs. Buller. Oh, Mrs. Ransom. Doing a little shopping? Yes. Isn't it fun and in such a good cause, too? Yes. 85, 170, 37, that's the skin lotion, and a dollar fifty for the candy. That'll be seven forty-seven, Mrs. Bullard, and let's see, uh, 23 cents for the governor. Will that be all? Yes, thank you. Seven seventy out of ten. Seven seventy five, eight, nine, ten dollars. I'll tuck the things in my market basket. There. Goodbye, Mr. Peavy. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now, Mrs. Ransom, what can I do for you? Well, I want just lots and lots of things. Mm, don't you? Oh, yes. I'd like three lipsticks and a half a dozen toothbrushes. Yeah, just and a f- minute here, my goodness. <laughs> One thing at a time. And I also want to... Now, who... uh, Hiya, Peavy. Hello, Mrs. Ransom. How's it going? I'm very well, thank you, Mr. Munson. Uh, wrap me up a dozen of those shaving bowls when you get a chance, Peavy. A dozen? Mm-hmm. And I want a dozen boxes of face tissues, please, Mr. Peavy. Well, I just happen to have you, Mike. Good afternoon. I'd like six bottles of cod liver oil, please. Madam, you'll have to wait your turn. Yes, Leroy, but you'll have to wait till I get to you. Okay, you got plenty of it? Oh, yeah. Hey, guys, he's got barrels of it. Come on in. Oh, oh my goodness gracious. One at a time, please. One at a time. Heavens to Betsy, the world's not coming to an end, you know. crowd. I thought people would be running in and out of this store like rabbits. Well, four o'clock in the afternoon, he can't be. Ah, uh, there he is. Hey, Peavy. I see you, Peavy. Let me in. Go away. Let me in. We're closed. <laughs> let me in anyway. Come on, let me in or I'll bust the door. No, please. Now hurry up before somebody sees you. Peavy, what happened to your bell? The fuse blew out about a half hour ago. <laughs> or maybe it just wore out. <laughs> Been pretty busy today, have you, Peavy? Mr. Gildersleeve, I had to close up in self-defense. <laughs> Did you ever visit the stock exchange in Chicago? I saw the one in New York. Uh, I guess it's all the same. Fellas standing around yelling at each other. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's what's been going on in my store since about 12 noon today. The whole police force came in about 2 o'clock and bought toothpaste. (laughs) I just can't understand it. Well, the cops want to brush their teeth, that's all. And then Leroy came in and bought $5 worth of chewing gum. Chewing gum? I told that kid to get something the whole family could use and enjoy. Oh, you sent Leroy? Yes, Peavy. Um, wasn't going to tell you this, but this whole thing was cooked up by the Jolly Boys. I'm afraid I don't understand you. Well, Peavy, we heard about Mrs. Peavy's trouble. Jolly Boys decided if you needed money, the main thing to do is to chase people in here to buy merchandise. Stock up on stuff they'd need later on. So you could have the cash now. You needn't thank us. Well, thank you, but uh, who told you Mrs. Peavy had any trouble, if I may ask? Well, Mrs. Ransom told me she needed an operation. Why? Uh, well, nothing in particular. She does need an operation, doesn't she? She's never mentioned it. (laughs) Well, you can't fool me, old pal. 
Your wife's a sick woman, and she needs a doctor's attention. Well, I don't know. She stacked a half a quarter stove board yesterday. <laughs> oh, Peavy, you're an imposter. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. You are. You deliberately gave Mrs. Ransom the idea you needed money for a doctor. But I never said... You can that... expect Leroy down here tomorrow morning with that chewing gum and see that he gets his money back. The very... Uh... <laughs> that man certainly has a temper. Yeah, I'll get back to my counting here. 200, 210, 12, 15. 215 dollars. <laughs> Not bad for the old lady's rheumatism. <laughs> We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a few moments. Don't you sometimes get a hankering for different kinds of bread, such as Johnny Cake, gingerbread, or muffins? I'm sure all these tasty hot breads will make a hit at your table, served with a delicious spread to make them taste extra good. And the spread I have in mind, of course, is parquet margarine, preferred by millions because of its fresh, sweet, delicate flavor. Melting into hot breads like Johnny Cake and gingerbread, parquet really is delicious. Your first taste will tell you why it's still unmatched for fresh, delicate flavor. Another reason you'll like parquet margarine is the smooth, easy way it spreads. And remember, too, parquet is only about half the price of costly spreads. So be sure to insist on economical, flavor-fresh parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. No, Leroy. What for? Well, Piggy and I need it, just for a few minutes. My hatchet is not a toy, young man. What do you want it for? Uh, just a little Halloween trick we thought of. There'll be no tricks, no, sir. What is the trick? I don't want Marge to hear. What is it? Well, I could whisper. Hey, no fair. That is outrageous, Leroy. Absolutely not. How can you even think of such a thing? Who on earth could you think of doing such a thing to? Well, we were thinking of... Judge Hooker. The hatchet's in the garage. <laughs> but remember, I told you not to. <laughs> Go to bed, Leroy. I want to sit up and listen to Jack Benny. <laughs> Good night, everybody. The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry and is written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Youngsters get hungry at all hours. And when they do, treat them to Pab Step, the delicious golden cheese food. You can just bet they'll like Pab Step. It's so rich in cheddar cheese flavor, so easy to digest. Children simply love Pab Step spread on crackers or bread. And remember, Pabstad is equally delicious, melted into a luscious cheese sauce, toasted for sandwiches, or served in wedges with fruit or pie for dessert. Don't forget to buy Pabstad. Add delicious, nourishing Pabstad cheese food to your shopping list tomorrow. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> it's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by The Kraft Foods Company. Makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Now let's join the great Gildersleeve. But first, let's decide which Gildersleeve we want to join. For Gildersleeve is a man of many sides. Shall it be Gildersleeve, the man of action? <laughs> or Gildersleeve, the guardian and protector of his niece and nephew? Leroy, stick in your shirt tail. Or Gildersleeve, the great lover. He... 
No. Let us drop in on still another Gildersleeve. The Gildersleeve the world knows as Summerfield's water commissioner. The big shot in his private office in the city hall. Gildersleeve, the executive. <laughs> Wonder what time it is. <sighs> Quarter of five? Must be later than that. Oh, Bessie. Bessie. That Bessie, I'm going to have to let her go. Bessie! Did you call me, Mr. Gildersleeve? That I did, Bessie. What time is it by the clock out there? By the clock? Quarter of five. Oh, well, all right. Certainly feels later. Have you taken care of these things, Mr. Gildersleeve? I'd like to clear up your desk a little. Yes, it's a mess. How do you expect me to get any work done, Bessie, when you leave papers all over my desk? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gildersleeve. You told me to leave all those folders on annual rainfall so you could use them in your budget report. Oh, rainfall folders. Oh, that's what these are. But what's all this pile here? Oh, those are the monthly financial reports for 1945. You asked for them last week. I wonder what for. <laughs> yes, sir, I wondered myself. <laughs> well, take them away till I think of it. Yes, sir. What's all this stuff over here? Oh, that's your immediate file, Mr. Gildersleeve. Immediate? Getting a little behind on that, aren't we? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, no time like the present, Bessie. Let's just wade through this pile and clean it up. Now? Yes, now. Put that other stuff in the files and then bring your book. Yes, sir. Let's see here. State Association of Water Commissioners. Dear Mr. Gildersleeve, we're making a survey to determine the average power input of municipal pumps in this state. If you could get these figures from your engineer sometime in the next few days and forward them to us promptly, we'll be greatly obliged. Yours truly. Bessie. Uh, Bessie. Oh, you're here. Uh, uh, call Charlie Anderson out at the reservoir, please. Yes, sir. Take this, Bessie, while you're waiting. Uh, State Association of Water Commissioners, dear sirs, in reply to yours of August 10th, she... <laughs> Hello. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve calling. Uh, thank you, Bessie. Hello, Charlie. How's it going? Well, never mind how it's going. I want you to give me some figures. What's the power input on our pump out there? No, Charlie, that's no attitude. Th you mean you don't know? Then figure it out and call me back. It's not a waste of time. It's very important. And if you... Hello. Oh, hello. He hung up. Oh, George, if I knew where to find another engineer. But I don't. Uh, what have you got there, Bessie? In reply to yours of August 10th. August 10th. Well, the survey must be over by now. Throw that away, Bessie. We'll tackle something else. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, let's see. What's this one? Oh, yeah. Mrs. Joel Toddbinder. I can't believe I used the amount of water for which you have billed me during the month of September. Kindly explain. Oh, there's four or five letters like that. There are? What do these people think we do? Make up meter readings out of our heads? Take this. Dear Mrs. Toddbinder. Uh, several of these, you say, Bessie? Yes, sir. And we ought to have a form answer for it. I'll make up a form letter and you can send it to all these people. Yes, sir. But I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> Anything else that's, uh, pressing? Well, the whole file requires immediate answers, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, we made a good start on it, Bessie. I doubt if we could finish it tonight anyway. Suppose we get at it bright and early tomorrow morning. Yes, sir. What time is it now, Bessie? Well, my watch says a quarter to five. And your watch is slow. It's a quarter to five, ten or fifteen minutes ago. Time to close up, Bessie. If you say so, Mr. Gildersleeve. I do say so. But bright and early tomorrow, Bessie. Bright and early tomorrow. <laughs> Nobody knows my son. Hiya, Bertie. You can't have nothing to eat now, Leroy. It's too close to supper. Okay. I told you time and time again, if you want to eat, you come to me right after school and I'll fix you something. You can't come in here just before supper and fill up your stomach. I'm not even hungry. Well, you better be hungry when you sit down at the table. I got us a roast of beef tonight with our brand new November points. Yeah. What's the matter with you, Leroy? Don't you feel good? Yeah, I feel okay. I got another bad report card today. Oh, that's what's preying on your mind. I thought you'd been mighty quiet this afternoon. I'm afraid Uncle hit the roof. Oh, he won't hurt you. He sure was mad last time. I'm scared to show it to him. Make a clean breast of it, Leroy. That's the only way. Just say I done it and I'm sorry. Yeah? Yeah, that's the way I do every time I bust a cup. 
You do? Yes, sir. Everything open and above board. Handle it that way, nobody ever gets anything on Bertie. Well, I tried hiding it last time. What happened? She. <laughs> I might try your system this time. What could I lose? That's probably your uncle now, Leroy. Yeah. Go on, son. Get it over with. The sooner you show it to him, the sooner it's all over. That's what I'm afraid of. Go on. He won't hurt you. Well, I'll try it. Hi, I'm glad to see you home so early. It's not particularly early, Leroy. Oh, well, I'm glad you're home anyway. Isn't it nice that Uncle's home, Marge? What? Well, thank you, my dear. <laughs> ah, never mind her. Uh, the reason I'm glad you're home is there's something I want to talk to you about, Uncle. All right, Leroy, just as soon as I wash my hands. Okay. Gee, it sure gets dark early these days, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Probably on account of daylight saving, huh? I suppose so. I wish they'd go back to the old way. It's better for people's eyes, don't you think so? Uh, possibly. If they put back daylight saving... Leroy, could... it will not be necessary for you to supervise my washing. Well, I don't intend to supervise... Stay I... out. <laughs> Yeah, fine. Thank you. Here's tonight's paper, Unc. Haven't even opened it. Well, a treat. Thank you very much. Uh, uh. Something you wanted to ask me, was there, my boy? I got my report card today, and it's pretty bad. Oh? Let me see it. I got bad marks and everything. I don't know how to explain it. I work hard. I do all the stuff. I don't know. I must be dumb or something. Come here, Leroy. Let me see the card. Yes, sir. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, Leroy. Isn't it terrible, Unc? I feel pretty bad about it. Huh? I got my report card today, and I did swell and everything. Shut up, will you? There must be some explanation for this, Leroy. It's just my fault, Unc. That's all. I'm not blaming anybody but myself. That's no explanation. I never had any trouble when I was in the B-7. All that stuff is easy. Marjorie, I think you better leave this to me. Yeah. Well, all I know is anybody that tries can learn that stuff in their sleep. In his sleep. And I will handle this, please. Leroy, this is, well, it's very serious. I know it, Uncle. I sure hope I can do better next month. Yes. Well, I'm sure that you... I just have to work harder than ever, that's all. Are you kidding? Now, Marjorie, let's not assume Leroy is insincere. I believe your brother is ready to turn over a new leaf. I think we should help him. That's right. If you buckle down and work hard, my boy, you can show improvement. You're not stupid. I should say not. Only all the stuff is so hard. It's over my head. It's not really, my boy. Not if you understand it. Perhaps I can explain some of it to you. Could you, Unc? Help you every night of the week if you want. Gee, that'd be super. Because I really got a load. Monday night I have to do English, and Tuesday night is my arithmetic night, and Wednesday is history. Don't tell me anymore, Leroy. You'll talk me out of it. This looks like one of my bad weeks. The Great Gildersleeve will be back in just a moment. The other day, while I was waiting my turn at the grocery store refrigerator, I saw a lady trying to decide which spread to buy. Naturally, since my job is to sell parquet, I thought I'd give it a little boost. So I said, have you ever tried parquet margarine? Well, I've heard of it often. Is it really as good as people say? Yes, ma'am. I know lots of people think parquet's fine, fresh flavor is the best they've ever tried. Well, that's what I'm looking for. A spread for bread and toast that really tastes good. And I know that you're also interested in good nutrition. Now, on the package here, you'll notice that parquet is made from rich in energy vegetable oils from the farm and that it's fortified with important vitamin A. And you can plainly see from the price tag that parquet margarine is only about half the price of costly spreads. Now, I'm just repeating to you folks what I told the lady, and I'm happy to say that I helped make a sale. So next time you do your shopping, I hope you decide to buy delicious, economical parquet. 
The spread preferred by millions because it tastes so good. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. Now let's get back to our story and see how Gildersleeve has been getting along with the education of his nephew. To tell the truth, he hasn't really got around to it. Monday night... Well, Monday, something came up. Tuesday night... Tuesday night, I ran into a friend. Wednesday night... Well, Wednesday was something else. Now, it's Thursday, and even Leroy is getting uneasy. Look, Uncle, let's face it. I've got to write a composition about the Missouri Compromise, and I've got to have it in tomorrow. Confounded, Leroy. Haven't you done that yet? No, and that's not all. I've got about nine million problems in arithmetic and a map to draw and a whole lot of spelling. Why do you let it pile up this way? Why do you keep putting it off? I was waiting for you to help me like you promised. Excuses? All I get is excuses. You did say you'd help him, Uncle Mort. Thanks, Marge. When I need to be reminded of my promises, my dear, I'll ask for it. Well, holler. I'll be up in my room. Yeah. <laughs> that girl. There's such a thing as being too smart. I wish she'd get a low report card just once. Well, Leroy, come on. Let's see what seems to be the trouble here. What's your most difficult subject? History. What don't you understand about it? I don't get it, that's all. I can't learn it. Never say can't, my boy. Well, I can't. Nonsense. History can be a very interesting subject. If you approach it properly... Well, how do you approach it? By the simple process of learning it. Just learn it, that's all. But I can't. Don't keep saying that. Of course you can learn it. I learned it, you can learn it. Now, for instance, you've got to write a composition about the Louisiana Purchase. Very well. The Missouri Compromise. All right, the Missouri Compromise. It's the same thing. Are you kidding? (laughs) Well, that is, I mean they're related. Everything in history is related, my boy. That's the important thing in history. Learn the relation of things. Now, for example, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. Remember that, Leroy. That's mighty important. But it was Rogers and Clark who discovered the Northwest Territory. I don't get the relation. (laughs) Well, you're a little young, I guess. (laughs) Let's get down to this composition of yours now. What was it to be? The Missouri Compromise. Oh, yes, that. What was the Missouri Compromise, Unc? Uh, Well, it took place in Missouri, my boy. (laughs) Natch, but what was it? Uh, it took place some years ago, as I remember it. I forget the exact date. I know the date, 1820. But what was it? The Missouri Compromise? Well, it was a sort of a compromise. <laughs> that is to say, it was, well, just what it says, the Missouri Compromise. Everybody knows what the Missouri Compromise was. Uncle, um, will you tell me one thing? What? What good is history, anyway? Well, history's a lot of good. If you learn it now, it'll help you in later life. How? Well, that depends. It depends on what you do in later life. Yes. Have you given any thought to that, my boy? What do you plan to be when you grow up? How should I know? Confounded Leroy. You see, that's what's the matter with you. You have no purpose, no sense of responsibility, no plan in life. You just live from day to day. But, Uncle, I'm just a little kid. (laughs) If you're old enough to stay up till 9.30 at night, you're old enough to be responsible. You've got to organize yourself, my boy. You've got to start making sense. Doorbell. I'll get it. There you go. Right while I'm trying to talk to you. Hi, Judge. Come in. Thank you, Leroy. Is your uncle planning to go to the meeting, do you know? I don't know, but he's right in here if you want to talk to him. Oh, hello, Horace. Evening, Gildy. Going to school board meeting? I can't. I promised to help Leroy with his homework tonight. Oh, I'm sure Leroy won't mind. I never break a promise to a child, Judge. That's something I make a point of. Uh, Leroy, go to your room. I didn't mean anything, Unc. You can't work down here anyway with people dropping in all the time. Pardon me. Oh, no offense, Judge. (laughs) Stick around. Leroy, you go upstairs and get started on that composition. I'll come up later and see how you're doing. But you still haven't told me about the Missouri Compromise. Why should I? It's all in the encyclopedia. Go look it up. That's what education is for, my boy, to teach you to look things up. And that's what the encyclopedia is for, to look things up in. I still don't see what the Missouri... Don't bother me anymore with the Missouri Compromise. Ye gods, go upstairs and get to work. Okay. I wonder if I could see him. Oh, that boy. I don't know what I'm going to do about him, Horace. 
No power of concentration. Puts everything off. Completely disorganized. Oh, I don't know. I was talking to him just now. Absolutely no sense of responsibility. No thought for the future. I asked him what he wanted to be when he grows up. He doesn't know. The boy has no life plan. What's your life plan, Gildy? Huh? <laughs> I say, what's your life plan? What do you mean? Well, what thought have you given to the future? Are you going to be a small-town water commissioner all your life? The office of water commissioner, Horace, is not one to be sneezed at. Hmm. Big frog in a little puddle. <laughs> That's all you are, Gildy. I resent that. I don't know where you get off to talk about Leroy. You're not even a very good water commissioner. Horace! Well, be honest with yourself, Gildy. Are you? You aren't there half the time. You shilly-shally, you put things off. There's no saying, you know, Gildy, procrastination is the thief of time. I know, I know. Well, it's true. You've been in that office three years now, what have you done? And what did you do before that? And what are you going to do in the future? I don't know, Horace. I just don't know. I'm saying this is your friend, Throckmorton. You are my friend, Horace, and I hope I'm yours. I've always so considered you. But what you've got to realize, old friend, I'm only saying this for your own good. I know that. What you've got to realize is... You only got into that office on a political fluke. And you could be bounced out tomorrow. Horace, you haven't heard anything. No. But if they ever got on to you, if anybody ever found out how little you really know about it, why, you don't know anything about the water department. You're just a glad-hander. That's all, just a small-town politician. You don't know beans about hydraulics or anything else. And you've never taken the trouble to learn. You've just been so doggone lazy... Horace, don't! Well, it's true. All these things you accuse Leroy of, he's just a chip off the old block. You're right. I've been a bad uncle. I wouldn't go as far as that. I have. I've set him a bad example. Oh, it isn't that so much, Gildy. But what provisions have you made for the future? Suppose you were to get the can tied to you. No. (laughs) Have you made any plans? Have you saved up any money? I don't even need to ask. I'm no good. I'm not worrying about you. You'd get along somehow. But what about Marjorie and Leroy? Those two sweet children. I'm no good, Horace. I'm just no good. Have nothing to do with me. Now, now, old friend, that's not the way to take it. I'm a failure, a big, fat failure. (laughs) Well, be that as it may, and I'm not altogether denying it. (laughs) The thing to do is not to give in to it. What do you mean? Advise me, Horace. Well, you want to be a success in life? You want to be a good water commissioner? Make yourself one. But how? Work, study, improve yourself. Go to bed early, get up early. I will. I'll go to bed at 9 o'clock. Study engineering. Learn hydraulics. Learn how. I'm no chicken, you know. Why, any good correspondence school must have a course in hydraulics. Write to them. I'll do it. I'll write to them this very night, Horace. Oh, Judge, I don't know what to say to you, but thanks, old friend. Thanks a million. Say, Unc, I can't find anything in here about the Missouri Compromise. I looked under history and all it said... Don't bother me with your problems now, my boy. I have problems of my own. Well, for cat's sake... Bertie, Marjorie, where's last Sunday's paper? Last Sunday's paper, you say, Mr. Gilsley? Yes. Why is it the Sunday paper always has to be thrown out before I can get a chance to read it? This is Thursday, Uncle Morris. You... I never throw out nothing, Mr. Gilsley. I put all the papers in the wood closet there, just as always. First I ever heard of it. Well, never mind, Bertie. I'll... Hey, here it is, in the wood closet. What's the use of me talking? If you're looking for the funnies by any chance, they might just possibly be up in my room. No, I'm looking for the book section. Here. I saw it in here. I know I saw it in here. Ah, the Alexander Hamilton Institute. Now, clear out, everybody, please. I've got to write a letter. Marjorie, get that junk off the desk, will you? Come along, Leroy. I never heard such a fuss about writing a letter. Who's he writing to, President Truman? No, Alexander Hamilton. Oh, now, who's that? The minute I sit down, i got to get up and answer the... Well, hello, Leroy. Come in. Oh, thank you, Throckmorton. I just 
just dropped over to see if there was any gentleman who'd care to invite a lady to the movies. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I'd like to, Leela. But... They're showing romance in the rain. Oh, well, I'd love to go, Leela. The only thing is, in the first place, I've already seen the picture. Oh, did you see it alone? Or... No, I saw it with somebody. Oh. How did you like the picture, Throckmorton? Well, to tell the truth, I thought it was a little shallow, Leela. Oh, you went with Miss Goodwin. Yes. Well, <laughs> well, you wouldn't mind seeing it again, I'm sure. I always think what you get out of a picture depends so much on who you see it with, don't you? You bet. I'd love to go, Leela, but you see, I've got to write this letter, and I promised myself I'd get it off this evening. Oh, an old letter. Well, it's kind of important to me. You see, it's kind of a test, Leela. Of myself, I mean. Mm -hmm. I promised myself that for once I'd do something and stick to it. You know, Throckmorton, I don't think you like me anymore. Oh, but I do, Leela. Really, but you just don't understand. Well, not if I practically throw myself at you and you tell me you have to stay home and write a letter to somebody else. But, Leela, I... Gee, I'd like to, but... Leela, tell me something. Yes? You think I'm a failure? Why, certainly not. You think I'm nothing but a glad-hander and a small-time politician? Gracious, who could ever think a thing like that? <laughs> well, that's all I want to know. Let's go to the movies. Good evening, Mr. Peavy. Mm, Mr. Gildersleeve, well. Hello, Peavy. Out for a little constitutional, you two? No, we've just come from the movies. Oh. Mrs. Oh. Ransom thought she'd like a hot chocolate. Mm, it's so cold out. It is a little chilly. I I'll just warm it up a little. It won't take a minute. <laughs> Something for you, Mr. Gildersleeve? No, thanks, Peavy. Nothing. Well, it's not like you, Throckmorton. You sure? Um... Peavy, if you should see Judge Hooker, I'd be grateful if you didn't mention to him that you saw me this evening or that I went to the movies. Just as you say, Mr. Gildersleeve. What's well, right, Morton? What possible difference could it make to Horace? Oh, none. I'd just rather he didn't know, that's all. What's wrong, honey? You don't seem like yourself tonight. Nothing. You haven't seemed like yourself all evening, except when you fell asleep there. <laughs> and that was only for many. Well... I feel I've been a bad boy this evening, that's all. Why ever should you? Because, Leela, there were some things I promised myself I was going to do. I was going to help Leroy, and I didn't. And I was going to write to some people, the Alexander Hamilton Institute. Yeah, there you are, Mrs. Ransom. Oh, thank you, Mr. Peavy. It's hot, watch out. And so you folks went to the movies, eh? How was the picture? Oh, just wonderful. So, so. I don't get to go to many movies myself. Mrs. Peavy likes to go occasionally, but I have to work late here. Peavy, so. you don't know how lucky you are. I don't know. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> yes, you are, Peavy. You're one of the luckiest men I know. You know what you want out of life, and you get it. You're a real success. Yeah, I'm much obliged, but And I'm... another thing where you're lucky, you're married. I could answer that, too. <laughs> Certainly, you don't have a lot of temptations to keep you from doing what you should be doing. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say that either. Throckmorton, I just don't understand what you're talking about. You wouldn't understand if I told you, Leela. This has to do with life. Oh? Yeah, drink your chocolate. <laughs> Men are so strange sometimes. Uh, what I mean to say, Peavy, is, well, confounded, here you are working till 11 o'clock at night. You stick to things. You get them done. You have willpower. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve, I'll tell you a little about that. You might not think it, but it used to be I had a lot of trouble with my willpower. Fact, I was this way and that about things. Just couldn't seem to make up my mind. Then one summer, Mrs. Peavy and I took a little trip. Well, uh, what's that got to do with uh, willpower? Well, I'm coming to that. We took a trip to Chautauqua, you know. They have a sort of a camp meeting there with lectures and so on. There's one fellow, he's quite a talker. Big, tall fellow, I remember, with black hair and a gold tooth. His lecture was about willpower. Well, uh, what do you have to say about it? Well, it was his theory that if you believe you can do a thing, you can do it. That's what he said. If you believe it hard enough, you can do it. 
Got him there. Hmm, maybe. I'll never forget that fellow. He stood up there and sort of flung his arms around when he talked, and his eyes were black, and they seemed to bore right through you. Yeah? I remember the words he said when he was winding up. He banged on the desk, and he shouted, I am the captain of my faith and my unconquerable soul. Looked at me when he said it. <laughs> and from then on, your willpower was okay? Well, not exactly. I've always suspected that Mrs. Peavy thought the fellow was looking at her. <laughs> Because if there was ever a woman with an unconquerable soul... <laughs> keeps me on the beam, though. Yeah, but it's Mrs. Peavy's willpower. Do you think I'd be down here working till 11 o'clock at night if I had my way about it? <laughs> Why, you're no better than the rest of us, Peavy. Did you say it was? By George, you're all right. Have a hot chocolate on me. <laughs> you feeling better now, Frogwood? Oh, great. You want to know something, Peavy? That hooker, the sanctimonious old goat, he's the biggest faker in this town. Well, now, I... You may be right. Come along, Leela. Good night, Phoebe. <laughs> the great Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few moments. One of the pleasant ways I like to spend an evening at home is to relax in a big easy chair with a good book to read and a big bowl full of popcorn to eat. Now, if anyone in your family likes popcorn as much as I do, here's a simple recipe you'll surely want to try. While the kernels of corn are popping away, melt some flavor-fresh parquet margarine in a saucepan. Pour the popcorn into a big bowl, season with salt, and then drench with melted parquet. Good... Man, there's a way to really enjoy popcorn, thanks to Parquet's fine, fresh flavor. And, of course, I expect you all know that Parquet is a favorite spread for bread, preferred by millions because it tastes so good. So for a flavor that's still unmatched by delicious, economical Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, Parquet Margarine, made by Kraft. <laughs> Just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. My little niece, Marjorie, wants to say something. Well, it's about the Junior Red Cross. That's the American Red Cross for students in high school and elementary school. Yes, fine organization. Well, the Junior Red Cross does a lot of important work. During the war, we contributed millions of useful things the soldiers asked for. And now we're working to collect clothes for the orphan children in Greece and school equipment for Yugoslav and Polish children. We really do lots of good things. Don't you think all school children should join it? I do indeed, my dear. I think you presented it very nicely, too. And I hope all the children listening will join the Junior Red Cross. Good night, everybody. Goodbye. The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. It's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Now let's peep into the world of Summerfield and see what goes on there. It's Thursday night, not Saturday, but a familiar commotion upstairs over Floyd Munson's barber shop leads us to conclude that the Jolly Boys Club is assembled there. Let's get started, huh? 
order, please, gentlemen. Nobody wants order, Judge. We're trying to organize a poker game. We have a request from a member, Gildy, for a brief business session. What member? What business? Yeah, we never do any business. Floyd Munson has made the request, Chief, and I feel we should honor it. Mr. Munson, you something to bring to the attention of the cloud? I'll say. Address the chair, and you may have the floor. Address the chair, and you may have. Who made him chairman, anyway? Please, Gildy. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, fellow members, I'll say what I gotta say, and you can take it from there. And I might say before I start, I'm sorry to have to bring this up at this time. Uh, the club rooms here belong to me. Of course, the bank's got a piece of it, but the building's in my name. <laughs> and the wife's. <laughs> All right, all right. What of it? Order, order. Continue, Flo. Well, I've been letting the club use the place. Glad to have you, but something's come up. Day before yesterday, I had a chance to rent it. Rent it? Who'd want to rent this dump? Well, it was a young fellow and a girl. Just married. What do they care where they live? Anyhow, they offered me 20 bucks a month. That's a lot of money for this place, Floyd. Inflation, Chief, that's what it is. Well, the OPA said it was okay. I figure I can't afford to turn it down. You gotta turn it down. This is the Jolly Boys headquarters. You can't rent it to any Tom, Dick, and Harry that wants to go on a honeymoon. Well, I was talking it over with the wife last night, and I told her that. I said, Lovey, the fellas won't like it. The club's been a second home to them. What did she say, Floyd? Well, it's no use going into that. <laughs> To her, 20 bucks is 20 bucks, at least. But now if the club was to pay me rent, why, naturally, I'd be glad to have you fellas stay on. Oh, so that's it. You call yourself a jolly boy, Floyd? You're a hold-up man, that's what you are. If I may step from the chair for a moment, Gildersleeve, you're being ridiculous. Get back in the chair. <laughs> Let's just look at this thing sensibly. We're asking Floyd to give up $20 a month so we can have a club room. Is that the way for jolly boys to treat each other? I know. That's terrible. That's all there is to it. We've got to reimburse Floyd for the use of the club rooms. I now resume the chair. Oh, goat. <laughs> Do I hear a motion that we reimburse Floyd for the use of the club room? Won't someone make the motion? I'd be willing to make it. That's illegal <laughs> and unconstitutional. Listen, fellas, there's only five members in this club. Do you realize we'd each have to pay $4 a month dues? Many clubs charge even more. Not for a drafty room with a kitchen table and a busted piano. Oh, it ain't a bad piano. The Elks don't have no piano at all. The Elks have two pool tables. Sure, when they pay dues, they get something for it. Well, if we had more members, the dues wouldn't have to be so high. Say, you might have something there, Judge. Don't be childish, Floyd. When you ask people to join a club, they expect to get something for their money. Like a pool table. Couldn't you get hold of a pool table someplace for him? Pool tables cost a lot of money. I know who's got a pool table. Maybe he'd be willing to join the club and let us have it. Then we could put on a real membership drive. Well, who's got it? Your friend and neighbor, Gildy, Rumson Bullard. Has Bullard got a pool table? No fooling? It sure would be nice to have a pool table right in your house. That's my idea of living. Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know whether Bullard's got one or not. Have you seen it, Horace? Oh, I assumed you had. Haven't you ever been in your rich neighbor's house, Gildy? On numerous occasions, but I never saw any pool tables. Well, a pool table's pretty tough to hide. Ain't like a day bed, you know. No. He might have a billiard room in the basement. A playroom, probably. Lots of people have playrooms down in the basement right there with the furnace, I hear. Well, why don't we look into it? You drop over there tomorrow, Gildy, and see if he wants to join. Then... Ask him to lend us the pool table. Why me? It's for the Jolly Boys, Commissioner. Sounds like the only way we can hold the Jolly Boys together. Well, if you put it that way, but I'm not very anxious to call on Rumson Bullard. He's never been particularly friendly. That's probably because you never got to know him. Down underneath, he's probably a swell fella. It's not easy to get to know rich people, Chief. They're always afraid you're going to get something out of them. Like a pool table. <laughs> well... I'll see what I can do. Now, for heaven's sake, let's get our minds off money and play a little poker. Why don't you go see him tomorrow night, Gildy, and then come down here and report to us? All right, all right. Okay, everybody, Andy and Nickel, deuces and one-eyed jacks are wild, and no cheating till you're down to your last dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Howdy, Bullard. Remember me? Gildersleeve. Oh, yes, yes. Come in, won't you? Well, thank you. 
Can't stay after you get downtown, but I... Well, I thought I might just pay a neighborly call. I'm glad you did. My wife's gone to New York for a few days, so I'm all alone here. Uh, with Craig, that is. Oh, yes, Craig. Remarkably attractive little boy, Craig. Yes. <clears throat> He's going to bed, I'm glad to say. Why don't we just come into the library, Gildersleeve, as long as there's only two of us? Library? Fine. I've never seen it. Hmm. Uh, just down the hall here. Well, well. Books. <laughs> yes, yes, I've accumulated a few volumes. Sit down. Have a cigar? Yeah, thanks, but here, try one of mine. Three for a half. No, 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 I insist. Uh, I have these made up for me in Havana, if you uh, like a mild cigar. Say. Mm. Light. Why, George, that's a real cigar. Yep, yeah, it makes a nice smoke. <clears throat> Gold tip. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> well, uh, care to look at some of my first editions? Or uh, perhaps you're more interested in fine printing, bindings, and that sort of thing. Are, uh, are you a bibliophile? Oh, you bet I am. I belong to the Book of the Month for several years. <laughs> Well, I've got a... Uh, yes, I have a few nice items here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, here's something, yes. Milton's Paradise Lost, hand set in London by Alfred Royce. Printed on vellum with red and gold initials and bound in full Morocco. I've read it. Of course. <laughs> but uh, to a lover of fine printing, now... Uh, here, here, here. Just, just look at this page. Oh? Page 24. Beautiful, just as clear. Well, they, they only printed 200 of these. They, uh, they sold originally for $700 a copy. Huh? Yes, yes, but I, I was lucky. I, I picked it up at an auction in London for 560 <laughs> <laughs> I, I robbed them, didn't I? Yes, yeah, like taking pennies from a kid's bank. <laughs> Uh, find a lot of books you got here, all right. Oh, I, I'd forgotten you'd never been in this room. Uh, care to see some of the rest of the house? Uh, well, I got to be getting on. Uh, by the way... Yes? Nothing. <laughs> well, you don't have to go just yet. Let me uh, let me show you around. Well, for a minute. <laughs> Here is my, uh, my gun room. Oh, yes. A uh, gun room? Mm. Another of my hobbies. Uh, the really old pieces I, I keep in the glass case here. Now, see that, uh, that big fellow there on the end? That's a Spanish blunderbuss from the 18th century. Hand-carved barrel. Will it shoot? Well, I, I hate to try it. Now, uh, the gun on the right is an old flintlock uh, musket. My pistols and rifles are over here. Say, uh, this is a regular arsenal. You're not expecting any... Uh... <laughs> no, 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 no. But I, I dare say I could give a pretty good account of myself if necessary. <laughs> now, uh, this, this is a Derringer, early 19th century. Devilish-looking little thing, isn't it? Yes. Uh, let's go back to the library. Now, uh, we'll go back to the library later. First, I want to show you the billiard room. You've got to see that. Don't tell me you've got a billiard table. Yes, yes, I say billiards is really a gentleman's game. Well, I can't seem to get the hang of it. Ever play any pool? No, no, I never cared for pool. Or do you like it? No, billiards is the game for me. Hmm. Well, drop over any evening you care to play. Yeah, I might just do that. Uh, who do you play with generally? Oh, no one in particular. I, I haven't played a great deal of billiards since I lived in London. I uh, belong to a club in London where I got very fond of it. Oh, is that so? Uh, speaking of clubs, Mr. Bullard, I... Yes? Uh, nothing. <laughs> Yes, London's a great place for clubs. Uh, now, this was a place in German Street. Been standing right there in the same spot for over 200 years. Oh, pretty exclusive district around there? A mm, lot of fine clubs. In this club, they had oh, six or eight billiard tables, several card rooms. And many's the afternoon I've seen 5,000 pounds change hands in that card room. 
See, that's a fortune. Yes, yes, but uh, they're such gentlemen, you could hardly tell who'd won and who'd lost. Of course, one afternoon, a fellow shot himself afterward. Oh, a winner or a loser? Uh, a loser, yes. Oh. Brilliant young fellow he was, but uh, uh, wild as the devil. Youngest duke, uh, youngest son of a duke. Oh, a duke, yeah. Must have been a terrible shock to his father. Mm, frightful, frightful. The whole club was in mourning for a week. Ah, but club life is a fine thing, fine thing. Oh, you bet, you The bet. spirit of good sportsmanship. Yes, sir. The feeling of loyalty and companionship between real gentlemen. Yes, yes. Ah, I miss club life. I don't suppose there are any men's clubs here in Summerfield, are there, Gildersleeve? Um, uh, huh? I say, are there any men's clubs here in uh, Summerfield? Uh, no, Mr. Buller. There isn't a single one. Wait a minute, fellas. Wait a minute. I tried to ask him. I started several times to ask him. And then each time something would come up that I couldn't. Well, of all the chicken-hearted fellas to send on a simple errand. Watch out what you, who you're calling chicken-hearted, you old goat. Why, what's trouble? Couldn't you get him around to the subject? Well, we got to the subject, all right. We talked about clubs for quite a while. What a cinch. Just say, speaking of clubs, Mr. Bullard, there's a little spot where I and a few of my friends hang out. I'd like to have you drop around sometime. It wouldn't have worked, Floyd. Well, I'm blessed if I see why. Why didn't you ask him, Commissioner? Because he's too good for this crummy joint, that's why. Well, I'll be darned. What makes him think he's such a much? That's what I want to know. Well, it's not his idea necessarily, Floyd. It's my opinion. You mean you think he's too good for us? If you put it that way, yes. Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, shut up and listen for a minute. Bullard has a house full of first editions, fine bindings. He has a dog that costs $300. He has a gun collection that must be worth thousands. He's a fellow that's used to gracious living. He can't hang around a club like this. It wouldn't be right. Is this Bullard too good to associate with a judge of the probate court? Judge Hook is a pretty high-class fella. Thank you, Floyd. Chief of police, one of the highest jobs in this town, and a useful man to know. Thank you. And what's the matter with Peavy? Runs as nice a drugstore as you'd want to see. And Floyd, he's got the only barber shop in the south end of town. Yeah. I know, fellas. You just don't understand. Bullard's been in high-class clubs in London with dukes and gentlemen. You ask me, Gildy, this fellow's nothing but a big snob. He is not. He's a mighty nice man to know. If you ask me, our water commissioner's getting to be a snob himself. Oh! <laughs> don't call me a snob, Floyd. Uh. You fellas wouldn't know how to treat a high-class fella like Bullard anyway. All right, go treat him then. Yeah, go ahead. We don't need you around here. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve's a jolly boy. I'm not sure he is, Chief. Not if he considers himself and his friends too good for us. Go on, go play pool with Bullard. All right, I will. Can you imagine that? Just for a pool table. It's not a pool table. It's a billiard table. Billiards is a gentleman's game. You... <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve will be back in just a moment. Do you have a big Thanksgiving dinner at your house, Mr. Lang? Indeed we do. Turkey with all the trimmings. Then when Mrs. Lang planned her menu, I dropped a broad hint for some of those wonderful baking powder biscuits she serves on special occasions. Well, we prefer Parker House rolls or muffins. Well, it's a sure bet that hot breads of all kinds are popular on Thanksgiving menus. And, of course, everyone knows a delicious spread makes hot biscuits, rolls, and muffins taste extra good. That's why I always like to suggest that you serve them with parquet margarine. Why, that's our favorite spread, Mr. Lang. We always use parquet margarine. My husband likes parquet better than any spread we've ever tried. And I can well understand that, because parquet margarine's fresh, dairy-like flavor is still unmatched. So this week, when you're shopping for those good foods to serve during the Thanksgiving season, be sure to buy parquet margarine, the spread that tastes so good. That's P-A-R-K-A-Y. Delicious, economical parquet margarine, made by the Kraft Foods Company. I'm sure you'll like it, because millions prefer parquet margarine to any other brand. Now let's get back to our story. It's Saturday night, and Saturday night is the Jolly Boys Night to Howl. Ah, 
but a voice is missing. For the first time in many weeks, Gildersleeve is not to be found with his old associates. Gildersleeve this evening has hurried through dinner, stuffed a pocket with expensive cigars, and set out to take advantage of Bullard's invitation to drop in any time. Scarcely 24 hours have passed, and here he is, dropping in. Oh, <laughs> Hello, Craig. Is your father in? Where's Leroy? Leroy? <laughs> well, he's at home, I guess. Uh, tell your father, will you, Craig, that Mr. Gildersleeve is here. Craig, get away from that door. Come upstairs. Uh, who's that? My nurse. She stinks. <laughs> Craig? <laughs> You'd better answer her, hadn't you? Why should I? Where's Leroy? I want him to come over. Well, Leroy can't just now, I'm afraid, Craig. Run up and tell your father he has a caller, will you? Craig, shut that door and come up to bed. There's a man here. Yeah. <laughs> Tell her it's Mr. Gillisleeve. Uh, it's Mr. Gillisleeve from across the street. Well, there's nobody home. Oh, well, Mr. Bullard will be back, maybe. I'll just amuse myself in the billiard room while... There's I... nobody home. Yes, <laughs> you said that. <laughs> but he said I might use his billiard table any time, so if you don't mind, perhaps... He didn't say anything to me. Guess he didn't. <laughs> Fine way to treat a man. Invite him to use your billiard table, then sick the nurse on him. Oh, well. Now what'll I do? Saturday night. Only 7.30. Can't just go home and go to bed. Besides, it's Saturday night. No, I won't go down there. <laughs> but what can I do? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Saturday night. <laughs> Here she comes. Boo! Surprise! Oh, it's you. <laughs> well, aren't you surprised to see me, Leela? No. I suppose you'd be around sooner or later. Oh, is that so? <laughs> well, get your things on, Leela. We're going places Saturday night. I'm sorry. I have a previous engagement which I'm just about to make. But, Leela... It's time you learn, Throckmorton. I have better things to do than sit here and wait for you to turn up. And it's time you learn there's more to caught in a lady than just whistling at her. She... <laughs> Some Saturday night. Now, what am I going to do? What is there to do? Nope, I will not go down there. <laughs> Suppose I could stroll down to the drugstore, see what's doing there. No, I'm always hanging around there. Won't go there either. Well, I guess all that leaves is home. <laughs> Saturday night at home. Anki, you back? I thought you were out for the evening. Yes, well, I changed my mind, Marjorie. You going somewhere, my dear? Over to Francie's. She has some of the gang coming in. Oh, well, have a good time. Thanks. Oh, um... Yes? You wouldn't care to stay home and play a quiet game of dominoes or something with your old uncle, I suppose. Unky, I'd love to. I'd just love to. But I promised Francie and the gang, and I wouldn't want to disappoint them. Ask me another time, will you? Yes, yes. Run along. Have a good time. Thanks. Oh, um... Uh, yes? Where's your brother? What's he doing? Leroy? Oh, he's going to the movies, if he hasn't already gone. Oh, here he comes now. Yes. Well, Leroy, you're dressed up for once. Yeah. My boy, how would you like it if your old uncle went to the movies with you? Well, I wasn't going to the movies exactly. Bertie was going to take me to hear Famous Jones and his orchestra at the Majestic. Hey, Bertie, it's ten after. I'm coming. <laughs> now, wait a minute, my boy. I thought you and I might just stay home together tonight and have a good game of dominoes. Are you kidding? Come along, Leroy. 
wasn't my luck, that friend don't let go out the back way. Then if we stayed home tonight, why, next Saturday I'd take you to that football game you've been wanting so much to go to. How would that be? Well... Leroy, you tell me? Of course, it's up to you, my boy. You get your choice. The movies with Bertie this evening or the football game with me next Saturday. Makes no difference to me one way or the other. Well, if it makes no difference to you, Unc, I think I'll go with Bertie. All right, go on then. Go on, all of you. Leave me alone here all by myself. I am nobody. I just pay the bills around here, that's all. Oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, that's just about giving you up for this evening. I've just about given myself up. How do you mean? Peavy, have you ever tried spending an evening alone? Worst darn thing in the world. Well, I wouldn't say that. Well, it's terrible. That's why I came down here, to have somebody to talk to. Well, as a matter of fact, I was planning to close up here a little early so that I could stop by the Jolly Boys Club on the way home. Oh, well, in that case... How does it happen you're not over there this evening, Mr. Gildersleeve? You always seem to be pretty faithful. I uh, couldn't make it. Oh. Well, if you care to stop by there with me now... Well, I think I'd better not, thanks. Well, shoot yourself, but you said you wanted somebody to talk to. Well, truth of it is, Peavy, I've had a little falling out over there with some of the less desirable element. Talking about Floyd? Well, him and some others. Chief Gate? Him, too. Okay. Uh-huh. That leaves you and me. <laughs> well, these little differences of opinion are bound to occur, I'd say, even among jolly boys. It was more than a difference of opinion, Petey. Floyd called me a big, fat snob. There's no difference of opinion about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there? What did you call Floyd, Mr. Gildersleeve? I didn't call him a thing. Not a thing. You gave him no provocation? None whatever. He just walked in and said, Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve, you big fat snob, huh? <laughs> well, I may have made some trifling reference to his social standing. That's what I say. Now, why not let bygones be bygones? I'm sure if you come over there with me now and everybody apologizes... That's that... one thing I'll never do. Apologize. No, I don't. Just come over there with me. Let them come over here. I'm closing up here. Well? You just come along and leave everything to me, Mr. Gildersleeve, and I'll see if I can't straighten it all out. Well, all right, Peavy. But remember, I won't apologize. Well, aren't you coming up, Mr. Gildersleeve? I'll wait down here. What for? You go up and see how the land lies, Peavy. That's a good fellow. I'll wait down here. Yeah. Yeah. Call me if it's all right. Well, if it ain't Steve. Welcome, stranger. Good my friend. I suppose they're hashing me over up there now. I don't know that I like this. What are they taking so darn long about? Can't keep me waiting down here like a lackey. Wonder what a lackey is. <laughs> Got a good mind to walk out and leave him flat. After all, I didn't want to come over here in the first place. This has been about long enough, by George. Gosh, you don't think they'd blackball me? Commissioner, you down there, pal? <laughs> <laughs> I hear you calling me. Uh. Come ahead, the coast is clear. You called me when the moon had veiled her light. Before I went from you into the night, I came. Do you remember? Hi, fellas. Evening, Scott Martin. Lloyd? Hi. Hi. Come in, come in, Commissioner. Join the happy throng. Uh, thank you, Chief. <laughs> now, uh, we've been talking it over here, Commissioner. The pros and the cons. Floyd has got something he wants to say to you. Go ahead, Floyd, say it. Yes, Floyd, say it. Well, Commissioner, I'm sorry if I got a little out of line here the other night. 
The fact is, I didn't say what Peavy says I said. I only told him what you told me. You said, Floyd, that I was a big, fat snob. I never said you were fat. (laughs) Everybody knows that. Floyd. I didn't come down here, gentlemen, to be re-insulted. Floyd, now apologize nice. Like you said you would. Go ahead, Floyd. Uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner. I don't know what come over me. I could bite my tongue off. Well, ain't that good enough? I think that's very handsome, Floyd. Commissioner? Well, maybe it was my fault a little too, Floyd, now that I come to think of it. Ah, <laughs> you old swindler. You old horse thief. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the stuff. My golly, it does my heart good to hear you talk like that. Let's say we shake hands all around, eh? I'm game. Shake your lips. Shake, shake. There is a tavern in the town, in the town. And there my true love sets him down, sets him down and breaks his wine with laughter free. And never, never thinks of me. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a few moments. During the Thanksgiving and holiday season, there's usually a little strain on the family food budget. So on your shopping trips now, I imagine most of you ladies have an eye out for the best values in food. And when it comes to spreads for bread, one of the best values I know of is delicious parquet margarine. Parquet is only about half the price of costly spreads, and it provides your family with such rich, wholesome nourishment. Parquet is one of the best energy foods you can serve, and it's fortified with important vitamin A. And as for flavor, Parquet is preferred by millions because it tastes so good on bread, toast, rolls, and waffles. So if you want to make a real saving on a quality food, buy this nourishing spread that tastes so good. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. He said I'd be back, and he was right. Good night, everybody. <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meacham. This is John Lang speaking for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. Ladies, here's how to be ready at the drop of a hat with sandwiches, snacks, and appetizers. Keep a package of delicious Pabstet cheese food in your refrigerator. Pabstet is ready in a jiffy, can be served a hundred different ways. It spreads, melts, slices, toasts to perfection. Any way you serve it, any time you serve it, your family and guests are sure to like Pabstet's mellow cheddar cheese flavor. Pabstet comes in two popular varieties, golden cheddar and pimento. So head up your shopping list with delicious Pabstep cheese food. This is the National Broadcasting Company.